and they turned southwestward, more sails set to bring them full before the wind. The ship picked up speed, and Aratha could hear gulls crying overhead. Suddenly, he was struck with the knowledge they were now out of Criddy. He felt chilled and gathered his cloak tightly around him. Aratha stood on the quarter deck, sword held ready. Martin to one side, notching an arrow to his bowstring. Amos Trask and his first mate Vasco also had weapons drawn. Six angry-looking seamen were assembled upon the deck below, while the rest of the crew watched the confrontation. One sailor shouted from the deck, "You lied to us, Captain. You've not put back north for Criddy as you said in Tulan. Unless you mean for us to sail on to Kessie and Alario, there's nothing south save the streets." Do you mean to pass the streets of darkness? Amos roared. Damn you, man! Do you question my orders? Aye, Captain. Tradition holds there's no valid compact between Captain and crew to sail the streets in winter, save by agreement. You lied to us, and we are not obliged to sail with you. Aratha heard Amos mutter, "A bloody sea lawyer." To the sailor he said, "Very well." And handed his cutlass to Vasco. Descending the ladder to the main deck, he approached the seaman with a friendly smile upon his face. Look, lads, he began as he reached the six recalcitrant sailors, all holding belaying pins or marlin spikes. I'll be honest with you. The prince must reach Crondor, or there'll be hell to pay come spring. The Sirani gather a large force which may come against Criddy. He placed his hand upon the shoulder of the sailor's spokesman and said, "So when it comes down to is this, we must sail to Crondor." With a sudden motion, Amos had his arm around the man's neck. He ran to the side of the ship and heaved the helpless sailor over. "If you don't wish to come along," he shouted, "you can swim back to Tulan." Another sailor started to move toward Amos when an arrow struck the deck at his feet. He looked up and saw Martin taking a bead upon him. The hunt's master said, "I wouldn't." The man dropped his marlin spike and stepped back. Amos turned to face the sailors. By the time I reach the quarter deck, you had better be in the rigging or over the side. It makes no difference to me. Any man not working will be hanged for the mutinous dog he is. The faint cries for help of the man in the water could be heard as Amos returned to the quarter deck. To Vasco he said, "Toss that fool a rope, and if he doesn't relent, pitch him overboard again." Amos shouted, "Set all sails, make for the Straits of Darkness." Aratha blinked sea water out of his eyes and held on to the guide rope with all the strength he possessed. Another wave crashed over the side of the ship, and he was blinded once more. Strong hands grabbed him from behind, and in the darkness he heard Martin's voice, "Are you all right?" Spitting water, he shouted, "Yes!" and continued to make his way toward the quarter deck. Martin close behind. The wind of dawn pitched and rolled beneath his feet, and he slipped twice before he reached the ladder. The entire ship had been rigged with safety lines, for in the rough sea it was impossible to keep a footing without something to hang on to. Aratha pulled himself up the ladder to the quarter deck and stumbled as much as walked to Amos Trask. The captain waited beside the helmsman, lending his weight to the large tiller when needed. He stood as if rooted to the wood of the deck, feet wide apart, weight shifting with each move of the ship, his eyes peering into the gloom above. He watched, listened, each sense tuned to the ship's rhythm. Aratha knew he had not slept for two days and a night, and most of this night as well. How much longer? Aratha shouted. One, two days. Who can say? A snap from above sounded like cracking spring ice upon the river Criddy. Hard a port! Amos shouted, leaning heavily into the tiller. When the ship heeled, he shouted to Aratha, "Another day of these gods' cursed winds buffeting this ship, and we'll be lucky if we can turn and run back to Tulan." They were nine days out of Tulan. The last three spent in the storm.
The ship had been relentlessly pounded by waves and wind, and Amos had been in the hold three times inspecting the repairs to the keelson. Amos judged them due west of the straits, but couldn't be sure until the storm passed. Another wave struck the ship and it shuddered. Weather break! Came the shout from above. Where are we? Cried Amos. Dead starboard. Come about! Ordered Amos, and the helmsman leaned against the tiller. Arthur strained his eyes against the stinging salt spray and saw a faint glow seem to swing about until it stood off the bow. Then it grew larger as they drove for the thinning weather. As if walking out of a dark room, they moved from gloom to light. The heavens seemed to open above them, and they could see grey skies. The waves still ran high, but Arthur sensed the weather had turned at last. He looked over his shoulder and saw the black mass of the storm as it moved away from them. Moment by moment, the comas subsided, and after the raging clamour of the storm, the sea seemed suddenly silent. The sky was quickly brightening, and Amos said, "It's morning. I must have lost track of time. I thought it's still night." Arthur watched the receding storm and could see it clearly outlined, a churning mass of darkness against the lighter grey of the sky above. The grey quickly turned to slate, then blue grey, as the morning sun broke through the storm. For the better part of an hour, Arthur watched the spectacle, while Amos ordered his men about their tasks, sending the night watch below and the day watch above. The storm raced eastward, leaving a choppy sea behind. Time seemed frozen as Arthur stood in awe of the scene on the horizon. A portion of the storm seemed to have stopped between distant fingers of land. Great spouts of water spun between the boundaries of the narrow passage in the distance. It looked as if a mass of dark, boiling clouds had been trapped within that area by a supernatural force. The Straits of Darkness," said Amos Trask at his shoulder. "When do we put through them?" Arthur asked quietly. "Now," answered Amos. The captain turned and shouted, "Day watch aloft!" Midwatch, turn to and stand ready. Helmsman, set course due east. Men scrambled into the rigging, while others came from below, still haggard and showing little benefit from the few hours' sleep since they last stood watch. Aratha pulled back the hood of his cloak and felt the cold sting of the wind against his wet scalp. Amos gripped him by the arm and said, "We could wait for weeks and not have the wind favourable again." That storm was a blessing in disguise, for it will give us a bold start through. Arthur watched in fascination as they headed for the straits. Some freak of weather and current had created the conditions that held the straits in water-shrouded gloom all winter. In fair weather, the straits were a difficult passage, for though they appeared wide at most points, dangerous rocks were hidden just below the water in many critical places. In foul weather, they were considered impossible for most captains to negotiate. Sheets of water or flurries of snow blown down from the southernmost peaks of the grey towers tried to fall, only to be caught by blasts of wind and tossed back upward again to try to fall once more. Water spouts suddenly erupted upward to spin madly for minutes, then dissolve into blinding cascades. Ragged bolts of lightning cracked and were followed by booming thunder as all the fury of colliding weather fronts was unleashed. The sea's running high! Yelled Amos. That's good. We'll have more room to clear the rocks, and we'll be through or dashed to pieces in short order. If the wind holds, we'll be through before the day is done. What if the winds change? That is not something to dwell on. They raced forward, attacking the edge of the swirling weather inside the straits. The ship shuddered, as if reluctant once again to face foul weather. Arthur gripped the rail tightly as the ship began to buck and lurch. Amos picked his way along, avoiding the sudden wayward gusts, keeping the ship in the westerly trail of the past storm. All light disappeared. 
The ship was illuminated only by the dancing light of the storm lanterns, casting flickering yellow darts into murk. The distant booming of waves upon rocks reverberated from all quarters, confusing the senses. Amos shouted to Aretha, "We'll keep to the center of the passage. If we slip to one side or the other or get turned, we'll stave in the hull on the rocks." Aretha nodded, as the captain shouted instructions to his crew. Aretha fought his way to the forward rail of the quarter deck and shouted Martin's name. The huntmaster answered from the main deck below that he was well, though waterlogged. Aretha held tight to the rail as the ship dipped low into a trough and then started to rise as it met a crest. For what seemed minutes, the ship strained upward, climbing and climbing. Then suddenly, water swept over the bow and they were heading downward again. The rail became his only contact with the solid world amid a cold, wet chaos. Aretha's hands ached from the effort of hanging on. Hours passed in cacophonous fury, while Amos commanded his crew to answer every challenge of wind and tide. Occasionally, the darkness was punctuated by a blinding flash of lightning, bringing every detail into sharp focus, leaving dazzling afterimages in the darkness. In a sudden lurch, the ship seemed to slip sideways. And Aretha felt his feet go out from under him as the ship heeled over. He held to the rail with all his strength, his ears deafened by a monstrous grinding. The ship righted itself, and Aretha pulled himself around to see, in the flickering glow of the storm lanterns, the tiller swinging wildly back and forth, and the helmsman slumped down upon the deck, his face darkened by blood flowing from his open mouth. Amos was desperately scrambling upright, reaching for the lashing tiller. Risking broken ribs as he seized it, he fought desperately to hang on and bring the ship back under control. Aretha half stumbled to the tiller and threw his weight against it. A long, low grinding sound came from the starboard side, and the ship shuddered. "Turn, you motherless bitch!" Cried Amos as he heaved against the tiller, marshalling what strength he had left. Aretha felt his muscles protesting in pain as he strained against the seemingly immobile tiller. Slowly it moved, first an inch, then another. The grinding rose in volume until Aretha's ears rang from the sound of it. Suddenly the tiller swung free once more. Aretha overbalanced and went flying across the deck. He struck the hard wood and slid along the wet surface until he crashed into the bulwark, gasping as wind exploded from his lungs. A wave drenched him and he spluttered, spitting out a lungful of sea water. Groggily, he pulled himself up and staggered back to the tiller. In the faint light, Amos's face was white from exertion. But it was set in a wide-eyed, manic expression as he laughed. Thought you'd gone over the side for a moment. Aretha leaned into the tiller, and together they forced it to move once more. Amos's mad laughter rang out, and Aretha said, "What's so damn funny? Look!" Panting, Aretha looked where Amos indicated. In the darkness, he saw huge forms rearing up alongside the ship. Blacker shapes against the blackness. Amos yelled, "We're clear in the great south rocks. Pull, Prince of Criddy, pull if you ever wish to see dry land again." Aretha hauled upon the tiller, forcing the bulky ship away from the terrible stone embrace, mere yards away. Again, they felt the ship shudder as another low grinding sound came from below. Amos whooped. If this barge has a bottom when we're through, I'll be amazed. Aretha felt a gut-wrenching stab of panic, followed immediately by a strange exultation. He found himself seized by a nameless, almost joyless feeling as he struggled to hold the ship on course. He heard a strange sound amid the cacophony and discovered he was laughing with Amos, laughing at the fury erupting around him. There was nothing left to fear. He would endure, or he wouldn't. It didn't matter now. All he could do was give himself over to one task: keeping the ship heading past the jagged rocks. Every fibre of his being laughed in terror 
enjoy at being reduced to this lower level of existence, this primal state of being. Nothing existed save the need to do this one thing upon which all was wagered. Aratha entered a new state of awareness. Seconds, minutes, hours lost all meaning. He struggled with Amos to keep the ship under control, but his senses recorded everything around him in minute detail. He could feel the grain of the wood through the wet leather of his gloves. The fabric of his stockings was gathered between his toes in his water-soaked boots. The wind smelled of salt and pitch, wet wool caps and rain-drenched canvas. Every groan of timber, smack of rope against wood and shout of men above could be clearly heard. Upon his face he felt the wind and cold touch of melting snow and seawater, and he laughed. Never had he felt so close to death, and never had he felt more alive. Muscles bunched, and he pitted himself against forces primeval and formidable. On and on they plunged, deeper and deeper into the madness of the Straits of Darkness. Aratha heard Amos as he shouted orders, orchestrating every man's move by the second. He played his ship as a master musician played a lute, sensing each vibration and sound, striving for that harmony of motion that kept the wind of dawn moving safely through perilous seas. The crew answered his every demand instantly, risking death in the treacherous rigging, for they knew their safe passage rested solely upon his skill. Then it was over. One moment they were fighting with mad strength to clear the rocks and pass through the fury of the straits, the next they were running before a stiff breeze with the darkness behind. Ahead the sky was overcast, but the storm that had held them for days was a distant gloom upon the eastern horizon. Aratha looked at his hands, as if at things apart, and willed them to release their hold upon the tiller. Sailors caught him as he collapsed and lowered him to the deck. For a time his senses reeled. Then he saw Amos sitting a short way off as Vasco took the tiller. Amos's face was still mirthful as he said, We did it, boy. We're in the bitter sea. Aratha looked about. Why is it still so dark? Amos laughed. <laughs> it's nearly sundown. We were on that tiller for hours. Aratha began to laugh too. Never had he felt such triumph. He laughed until tears of exhaustion ran down his face, until his sides hurt. Amos half crawled to his side. You know what it is to laugh at death, Aratha. <laughs> You'll never be the same man again. Aratha caught his breath. I thought you mad there for a time. Amos took a wineskin a sailor handed him and drew a deep drink. He passed it to Aratha and said, Aye, as you were. It is something only a few know in their lives. It is a vision of something so clear, so true, it can only be a madness. You see what life is worth, and you know what death means. Aratha looked up at the sailor standing by them and saw it was the man Amos had pitched over the rail to head off the mutiny. Vasco threw the man a frown as he watched, but the man didn't move. Amos looked up at him, and the seaman said, Captain, I just wanted to say I was wrong. Thirteen years a sailor, and I'd have wagered my soul to limbs cragma no master could pilot a ship such as this through the straits. Lowering his eyes, he said, I'd willingly stand for flogging for what I'd done, Captain. But after, I'd sail to the seven lower hells with you, and so would any man here. Aratha looked about and saw other sailors gathering upon the quarter-deck, or looking down from the rigging, shouts of, Oi, Captain! and, He has the truth of it! could be heard. Amos pulled himself up, gripping the rail of the ship, his legs wobbling a little. He surveyed the men gathered around, then shouted, Night watch above, mid watch and day watch stand down. He turned to Vasco. Check below for damage to the hull. 
then open the galley. Set course for Crondor. Arthur came awake in his cabin. Martin Longbow was sitting by his side. Here, the huntmaster held out a steaming mug of broth. Arthur levered himself up on his elbow, his bruised and tired body protesting. He sipped at the hot broth. How long was I asleep? You fell asleep on deck last night, just after sundown, or passed out, if you want the truth. It's three hours after sunrise. The weather, fair, or at least not storming. Amos is back on deck. He thinks it might hold most of the way. The damage below is not too bad. We'll be all right if we don't have to withstand another gale. Even so, Amos says there are a fair few anchorages to be found along the Keshian coast. Should the need arise, Arthur pulled himself out of his bunk, put on his cloak, and went up on deck. Martin followed. Amos stood by the tiller, his eyes studying the way the sail held the wind. He lowered his gaze to watch as Arthur and Martin climbed the ladder to the quarter deck. For a moment, he studied the pair, as if struck by some thought or another, then smiled as Arthur asked, "How do we fare?" Amos said, "We've a broad reach to the winds. Had it since we cleared the straits. If it holds from the northwest, we should reach Crondor quickly enough. But winds rarely do hold, so we may take a bit longer." A lookout shouted, "Sail ho!" "We're away!" shouted Amos. Two points abaft port." Amos studied the horizon. And soon, three tiny white specks appeared. To the lookout, he shouted, "White ships, galleys, captain!" Amos mused aloud, "Quaggan, this is a bit south for their usual patrols if they're warships, and I don't think it likely they're merchantmen." He ordered more canvas on the yards. If the wind holds, we'll be past before they can close. Their fat-bottomed tubs under sail, and their rowers can't maintain speed over this distance. Arthur watched in fascination as the ships grew on the horizon. The closest galley turned to cut them off, and after a while, he could make out the hulking outline of the galley, its majestic sails above a high fore and aft deck. Arthur could see the sweep of oars three banks per side. As the captain attempted a short burst of speed, but Amos was right, and soon the galley was falling away behind. As the distance between the wind of dawn and the galley slowly increased, Arthur said, "They were flying the Royal Quaggan standard. What would Quaggan war galleys be doing this far south?" The gods only know," said Amos. "Could be they're out looking for pirates." Or they could be keeping an eye out for Cassian ships straying north. It's hard to guess. Quag treats the whole of the bitter sea as her pond. I'd as soon avoid finding out what they're up to as not. The rest of the day passed uneventfully, and Arthur enjoyed a sense of respite after the dangers of the last few days. The night brought a clear display of stars. He spent several hours on deck studying the bright array in the heavens. Martin came on deck and found him looking upward. Arthur heard the arrival of the huntsmaster and said, "Culgan and Tully say the stars are suns, much like our own, made small by vast distances." Martin said, "An incredible thought, but I think they are right." Have you wondered if one of those is where the Sirani homeworld lies? Martin leaned upon the rail. Many times, Highness, in the hills you can see the stars like this. After the campfires are out, undimmed by lights from town or keep, they blaze across the sky. I also have wondered if one of them might be where our enemies live. Charles has told me their sun is brighter than ours, and their world hotter. It seems impossible. To make war across such a void defies all logic. They stood quietly together, watching the glory of the night, 
ignoring the bite of the crisp wind that carried them to Crondor. Footfalls behind caused them to turn as one, and Amos Trask appeared. He hesitated a moment, studying the two faces before him, then joined them at the rail. Stargazing, is it? The other said nothing, and Trask watched the wake of the ship, then the sky. There is no place like the sea, gentlemen. Those who live on land all their lives can never truly understand. The sea is basic, sometimes cruel, sometimes gentle, and never predictable. But it is nights like this that make me thankful the gods allowed me to be a sailor. Aretha said, and something of a philosopher as well. Amos chuckled. <laughs> Take any deep-water sailor who has faced death at sea as many times as I have and scratch him lightly. Underneath you'll find a philosopher, Highness. No fancy words, I'll warrant you, but a deep abiding sense of his place in the world. The oldest known sailor's prayer is to Ishap. Ishap, thy sea is great and my boat is small. Have mercy on me. That sums it up. Martin spoke quietly, almost to himself. When I was a boy, among the great trees, I knew such feelings. To stand by a bowl so ancient it's older than the oldest living memory of man gives such a sense of place in the world. Aretha stretched. It is late. I shall bid you both a good night. As he started to leave, he seemed taken by some thought. I am not given to your philosophies, but I am pleased to have shared this voyage with you both. After he was gone, Martin watched the stars for a time, then became aware Amos was studying him. He faced the seaman and said, You seem taken by some thought, Amos. Aye, Master Longbow. Leaning against the rail, he said, Nearly seven full years have passed since I came to Criddy. Something has tickled my mind since first meeting you. What is that, Amos? You're a man of mysteries, Martin. There are many things in my own life I'd not wish recounted now. But with you, it's something else. Martin appeared indifferent to the course of conversation, but his eyes narrowed slightly. There's little about me not well known in Criddy. True, but it is that little which troubles me. Put your mind at ease, Amos. I am the Duke's huntmaster, nothing more. Quietly, Amos said, I think more, Martin. In my travels through the town overseeing the rebuilding, I've met a lot of people, and in seven years I've heard a lot of gossip about you. Some time back I put the pieces together and came up with an answer. It explains why I see your manner change, only a little, but enough to notice when you're around Arthur, and especially when you're around the princess. Martin laughed. You spin an old and tired bard's tale, Amos. You think I am the poor hunter desperate for love of a young princess. You think me in love with Carline? Amos said, No, though I have no doubt you love her, as much as any brother loves his sister. Martin had his belt knife half out when Amos's hand caught his wrist. The thickest seaman held the hunter's wrist in a vice-like grip, and Martin could not move his arm. Stay your anger, Martin. I'd not like to have to pitch you over the side to cool you off. Martin ceased his struggling against Amos and released his knife, letting it slide back into its sheath. Amos held the hunter's wrist a moment longer, then let go. After a moment, Martin said, She has no knowledge, nor do her brothers. Until this time, I thought only the Duke and one or two others might know. How did you learn of it? 
Amos said, It was not hard. People most often don't see what is right before them. Amos turned and watched the sails above, absently checking each detail of the ship's crew as he spoke. I've seen the Duke's likeness in the Great Hall. Should you grow a beard like his, the resemblance would shout for the world to see. Everyone in the castle remarks how Arthur grows to resemble his mother less and father more each passing year, and I have been nagged since first we met why no one else noticed he resembles you as well. I expect they don't notice because they choose not to. It explains so much. Why you were granted special favour by the Duke in placing you with the old Huntmaster, and why you were chosen Huntmaster when a new one was needed. For some time now I have suspected, but tonight I was certain. When I came up from the lower deck and you both turned in the darkness, for a moment I couldn't tell which of you was which. Martin spoke with no emotion, just a statement of fact. It's your life, should you breathe a word of it to anyone. Amos settled himself against the rail. I'm a bad man to threaten, Martin Longbow. It is a matter of honour. Amos crossed his arms over his chest. Lord Boric is not the first noble to father a bastard, nor will he be the last. Many are even given offices and rank. How is the Duke of Criddy's honour endangered? Martin gripped the rail, standing like a statue in the night. His words seemed to come from a great distance. Not his honour, Captain. Mine. He faced Amos, and in the night his eyes seemed alive with inner light as they reflected the lantern hung behind the seaman. The Duke knows of my birth and for his own reasons chose to bring me to Criddy when I was still little more than a boy. I am sure Father Tully has been told, for he stands highest in the Duke's trust, and possibly Culgan as well. But none of them suspect I know. They think me ignorant of my heritage. Amos stroked his beard. A nutty problem, Martin. Secrets within secrets and such. Will you have my word? From friendship, not from threat, I'll not speak to anyone of this, save by your leave. Still, if I judge Arthur right, he would sooner know as not. That is for me to decide. No one else. Some day, Amos, perhaps I'll tell him, or I may not. Amos pushed himself from the rail. I've much to do before I turn in, Martin, but I'll say one more thing. You have plotted a lonely course. I do not envy your journey upon it. Good night. Good night. After Amos had returned to the quarterdeck, Martin watched the familiar stars in the sky. All the companions of his solitary travels through the hills of Criddy looked down upon him. The constellations shone in the night, the beast hunter and the beast hound, the dragon, the kraken and the five jewels. He turned his attention to the sea, staring down into the blackness, lost in thoughts he had once imagined buried forever. Land ho! shouted the lookout. Where away? answered Amos. Dad ahead, Captain! Aratha, Martin and Amos left the quarter-deck and quickly made their way to the bow. As they stood waiting for land to heave into sight, Amos said, And you feel that trembling each time we breast a trough? It's that keelson. If I know how a ship's made, and I do, we'll need to put in at a shipyard for refitting in Crondor. Aratha watched as the thin strip of land in the distance grew clearer in the afternoon light. While not bright, the day was relatively fair only slightly overcast. We should have time. I want to return to Criddy as soon as Erlen's convinced of the risk, but even if he agrees at once, it will take some time to gather the men and ships. Martin said dryly, 
and I would not care to pass the Straits of Darkness again until the weather is a bit more agreeable. Amos said, Man of faint heart, you have already done it the hard way. Going to the far coast in the dead of winter is only slightly suicidal. Aratha waited in silence as the distant landfall began to resolve in detail. In less than an hour, they could clearly make out the sights of Crondor's towers rising into the air and ships at anchor in the harbour. Well, said Amos, if you wish a state welcome, I'd better have your banner broken out and run up the mast. Aratha held him back, saying, Wait, Amos, do you mark that ship by the harbour's mouth? As they closed upon the harbour, Amos studied the ship in question. She's a beastly bitch, look at the size of her. The prince is building the madame site bigger than when I was last in Crondor. Three masted and rigged for thirty, or better sail from flying jib to spanker. From the lines of her hull she's a greyhound, no doubt. Well, I'd not want to run up against her with less than three quag and galleys. You'd need the rowers, for those oversized crossbows she mounts fore and aft would quickly make a hash of your rigging. Now we know why those quag and galleys were so far from home. If the kingdom's bringing warships like this to the bitter sea, Quegg's... Mark the banner at her masthead, Amos, said Aratha. Entering the harbour, they passed near the ship. On her bow was painted her name, Royal Griffin. Amos said, A kingdom warship, no doubt. But I've never seen one under any banner but Crondor's. Atop the ship's highest mast, a black banner emblazoned with a golden eagle snapped in the breeze. I thought I knew every banner seen on the bitter sea, but that one is new to me. The same banner lies above the docks, Arthur, said Martin, pointing toward the distant city. Quietly, Arthur said, That banner has never been seen on the bitter sea before. His expression turned grim as he said, Unless I say otherwise, we are Natalie's traders. Nothing more. Whose banner is that? asked Amos. Gripping the rail, Aratha replied, It is the banner of the second oldest house in the kingdom. It announces that my distant cousin Guy, the Duke of Bastira, is in Crondor. Chapter 24 Crondor. The inn was crowded. Amos led Arthur and Martin through the common room to an empty table near the fireplace. Snatches of conversation reached Arthur's ears as they took their seats. On close inspection, the mood in the room was more restrained than it had first appeared. Arthur's thoughts raced. His plans for securing Erland's help had been crushed within minutes of reaching the harbour. Everywhere in the city were signs that Guy de Bastireur was not simply guesting in Crondor, but was now fully in control. Men of the city watch followed officers wearing the black and gold of Bastireur, and Guy's banner flew over every tower in the city. When a dowdy serving wench came, Amos ordered three mugs of ale, and the men waited in silence until they were brought. When the serving woman was gone, Amos said, We'll have to pick our way carefully now. Arathur's expression remained fixed. How long before we can sail? Weeks. At least three. We've got to get the hull repaired and the keelson replaced correctly. How long will depend on the shipwrights. Winter's a bad time. The fair-weather traders haul out their ships so they'll be fit come spring. I'll begin inquiries first thing tomorrow. That may take too long. If needs be, buy another. Amos raised an eyebrow. You funds? In my chest aboard ship. With a grim smile, he said, The Sirani aren't the only ones who play politics with war. To many of the nobles in Crondor and the East, the war is a distant thing, hardly imaginable. It's gone on for nearly nine years, and all they ever see is dispatches. And our loyal kingdom merchants don't donate supplies and ships out of love for King Roderick. My gold is a hedge against underwriting the cost of bringing Crondorian soldiers to Criddy, both in expenses and bribes. Well then, said Amos, even so it'll be a week or two. 
You don't usually stroll into a ship's brokerage and pay gold for the first ship offered, not if you wish to avoid notice. And most of the ships sold are fairly worthless. It will take time. And, put in Martin, there are the straits. That's true, agreed Amos, though we could take a leisurely turn up the coast to Sarth and wait to time our run through the straits. No, said Aratha. Sarth is still in the Principality. If Guy's in control of Crondor, he'll have agents and soldiers there. We won't be safe until we're out of the Bitter Sea. We'll attract less attention in Crondor than in Sarth. Strangers are not uncommon here. Amos looked long at Aratha, then said, Now, I don't claim to know you as well as some men I've met. But I don't think you're as concerned for your own skin as something else. Aratha glanced about the room. We better find a less public place to talk. With a sound between a sigh and a groan, Amos heaved himself out of his chair. The sailor's ease is not where I'd prefer to stay, but for our purposes it'll serve. He made his way to the long bar and spoke at length to the innkeeper. The heavy-set owner of the inn pointed up the stairs, and Amos nodded. He signed for his companions to accompany him, and led them through the press of the common room, up the stairs, and down a long hall to the last door. Pushing it aside, he motioned for them to enter. Inside, they found a room with little to recommend itself by way of comforts. Four straw-stuffed pallets rested on the floor. A large box in the corner served as a common closet. A crude lamp, a simple wick floating in a bowl of oil, sat upon a rude table. It burned with a pungent odour when Longbow struck a spark to it. Amos closed the door, as Aratha said. I can see what you meant about choices in rooms. I've slept in far worse, answered Amos settling down on one of the pallets. If we're to keep our liberty, we'd best establish believable identities. For the time being, we'll call you Arthur. It's close enough to your own to afford a passable explanation should someone call out your real name and cause you to turn or answer. Or so, it will be easy to remember. Aratha and Martin sat down, and Amos continued. Arthur, get used to that name of navigating cities you know less than a thimbleful, which is twice as much as Martin knows. You'll do well to play the role of some minor noble son from some out-of-the-way place. Martin, you are a hunter from the hills of Natal. I can speak the language passing well. Aratha gave a half-smile. Get him a grey cloak and he'd make a fair ranger. I don't speak the language of Natal or the Keshian tongue, so I'll be the son of a minor eastern noble visiting for recreation. Few in Crondor could know half the barons of the east. Just so long as it's not too close to Bastira, with all those black tabards about, it would be a pretty thing to run into a supposed cousin among Guy's officers. Aratha's expression turned dark. You were correct about my concerns, Amos. I'll not leave Crondor until I've discovered exactly what Guy is doing here and what it means for the war. Even should I find us a ship tomorrow, said Amos, which is unlikely, you should have plenty of time to snoop about. Probably find out more than you'll want to know. The city's a lousy place for secrets. The rumour mongers will be plying their trade in the market, and every commoner in the city will know enough to give you a fair picture of what's taken place. Just remember to keep your mouth shut and ears open. Rumour mongers will sell you what you want to know, then turn around and sell news of your asking to the city guard so fast it'd make you spin to watch. Amos stretched, then said, It's still early, but I think we should have a hot meal then to bed. We've a lot of prowling about to accomplish. With that, he rose and opened the door, and the three men returned to the common room. Aratha munched upon a nearly cold meat pie. Lowering his head, he forced himself to continue consuming the pieman's greasy ware. 
He refused to consider what was contained within the soggy crust in addition to the beef and pork the seller claimed. Casting a sidelong glance across the busy square, Aretha studied the gates to Prince Erlin's palace. Finishing the pie, he quickly crossed to an ale stand and ordered a large mug to wash away the aftertaste. For the last hour, he had moved seemingly without purpose from seller's cart to seller's cart, purchasing this and that, posing as a minor noble's son. And in that hour, he had learned a great deal. Martin and Amos came into sight nearly an hour before the appointed time. Both wore grim expressions and kept glancing nervously about. Without comment, Amos motioned for Aretha to follow as they walked by. They pushed through the midday throng and passed quickly away from the Great Square district. Reaching a less hospitable-looking, though no less busy, area, they continued until Amos indicated they should enter a particular building. Once through the door, Aretha was met by a hot, steamy atmosphere as an attendant came to greet them. A bathhouse, said Aretha. Without humour, Amos said, You need to get rid of some road dirt, Arthur. To the attendant, he said, A steam for us all. The man led them to a changing room and handed each a rough towel and a canvas bag for belongings. They undressed, wrapped the towels about them, and carried their clothing and weapons in the bags into the steam room. The large room was completely tiled, though the walls and floors were stained and showed patches of green. The air was close and fetid. A small, half-naked boy squatted in the centre of the room, before the bed of rocks that supplied the steam. He alternately fed wood to the huge brazier below the stones and poured water upon them, generating giant clouds of steam. When they were seated upon a bench in the farthest corner of the room, Aretha said, why a bathhouse? Amos whispered, Our inn has very thin walls, and a great deal of business is conducted in places such as these, so three men whispering in the corner won't draw undue attention. He shouted to the boy, You lad, run and fetch some chilled wine. Amos tossed a silver coin at the boy, who caught it in midair. When he didn't move, Amos tossed him another, and the boy scampered off. With a sigh, Amos said, oh, The price of chilled wine has doubled since I was last here. He'll be gone for a while, but not too long. What is this? asked Aretha, not taking pains to hide his ill humour. The towel itched, and the room stank, and he doubted if he'd be any cleaner for the time spent here than if he'd stayed in the square. Martin and I both have troublesome news. As do I. I already know Guy is Viceroy in Crondor. What else have you learned? Martin said, I overheard some conversation that makes me believe Guy has imprisoned Erland and his family in the palace. Aretha's eyes narrowed, and his voice was low and angry. Even Guy wouldn't dare harm the Prince of Crondor. Martin said, He would should the king give his leave. I know little of this trouble between the king and the prince, but it is clear Guy is now the power in Crondor and acts with the king's permission, if not his blessing. You told me of Caldric's warning when you were last in Rilanon. Perhaps the king's sickness has grown worse. Madness, if you mean to speak clearly, snapped Aretha. To further cloud things in Crondor, said Amos, it seems we are at war with Great Kesh. What? said Aretha. A rumour. Nothing more. Amos spoke quietly and quickly. Before finding Martin, I was nosing around a local joy house not too far from the garrison barracks. I overheard some soldiers at their ease saying they were to leave at first light for a campaign. When the object of one soldier's momentary ardour asked when she should see him again... He said, as long as it takes to march to the Vale and back, should luck be with us. At which point he invoked Ruthia's name, so that the Lady of Luck would not view his discussion of her province disfavourably. The Vale, said Aretha, that can only mean a campaign down into the Vale of Dreams. Kesh must have hit the garrison at Shamata with an expeditionary force of dog-soldiers. 
He's no fool. He'll know the only answer's a quick, unhesitating strike from Crondor to show Great Cash's Empress we can still defend our borders. Once the dog soldiers have been driven south of the Vale, we'll have another round of useless treaty talks over who has the right to it. That means, even should Guy wish to aid Criddy, which I doubt, he could not. There's no time to deal with Kesh, return and reach Criddy by spring or even early summer. Aratha swore. This is bitter news, Amos. There is still more. Earlier today I took the trouble to visit the ship, just to ensure Vasco had everything in hand and that the men weren't chafing too much at being kept aboard. Our ship is being watched. Are you sure? Certain. There's a couple of boys who stand around playing at net mending, but they do no real work. They watched closely as I rode out and back. Who do you think they are? I can't begin to guess. They could be Guy's men, or men still loyal to Ireland. They could be agents of Great Cash, smugglers, even mockers. Mockers? asked Martin. The Guild of Thieves, said Arthur. Little goes on in Crondor without notice by their leader, the upright man. Amos said, That mysterious personage runs the mockers with tighter control than a captain has over his crew. There are places in the city where even the prince cannot reach, but no place in Crondor is beyond the upright man. If he's taken an interest in us, for whatever reason, we have much to fear. The conversation was interrupted by the serving boy's return. He set down a chilled pewter pitcher of wine and three cups. Amos said, Fetch yourself to the nearest incense vendor, boy. This place stinks. Buy something sweet to toss upon the fire. The boy regarded them a little warily, then shrugged as Amos tossed him another coin. He ran from the room, and Amos said, He'll be back soon and I've run out of reasons to send him away. In any event, this place will soon be thick with merchants taking an afternoon steam. When the boy comes back, sip some wine, try to relax, and don't leave too soon. Now, in all this bleak mess, there is one small glimmer of light. <sighs> then I would hear what it is, said Aratha. Gee will soon be gone from the city. Aratha's eyes narrowed. Still, his men will be left in charge. But what you say does have some aspect of comfort. There are few in Crondor likely to mark me by sight, for it's nearly nine years since I was last here, and most of those have likely disappeared with the prince. Also, there is a plan I've been considering. With Guy out of Crondor, I would have an even better chance of success. What plan? asked Amos. I'll tell you when I've had more time to dwell upon it. Where could we safely meet? Amos considered. Brothels, drug houses and gambling halls are all as bad as inns. Either the mockers control them and note everyone coming and going, or there are others about looking for information to sell. If someone overheard you speak in the wrong phrase, the mockers or the city guards could be down on you in minutes. He was quiet for a moment. Then he smiled. I have the very place. When the town watch rings the hour bell two hours after sunset, meet me at the east end of Temple Square. The boy returned and tossed a small bundle of incense upon the fire cutting off conversation. Aratha settled back and drank the chilled wine, rapidly warming in the heat of the steam room. He closed his eyes, but was not relaxing as he considered the situation. After a while, he began to feel his plan might work if he could reach Julanic. Running out of patience, he was the first to rise, rinse off, dress and leave. Aratha waited as Martin and Amos approached from different parts of the city crossing Temple Square. On all sides the temples of the greater and lesser gods rose up. Several were busy with pilgrims and worshippers entering and leaving, while others were nearly deserted. Reaching the prince, Amos said, How fared you this afternoon? Aratha spoke softly. 
I occupied my time in a tavern, keeping to myself. I did overhear some conversation about Erlen, but when I tried to get closer, the speakers moved off. Otherwise, I considered the plan I spoke of. Martin glanced about them, then said, An ill-omened place you picked, Amos. Gathered at this end of the square are all the gods and goddesses of darkness and chaos. Amos shrugged. Which means few travellers nearby after nightfall, and a clear view of anyone approaching. To Aratha he said, Now, what is the plan? Quietly and quickly, Aratha said, I noticed two things this morning. Erlen's personal guards still patrol the palace grounds, so there must be limits to Guy's control. Second, several of Erlen's courtiers entered and left freely enough, so some large portion of the daily business of governing the Western realm must remain unchanged. Amos stroked his chin, thinking, That would seem logical. Guy brought his army with him, not his administrators. They're still back running Bastyrra. Which means Lord Julanic and others not entirely sympathetic to Guy might still be able to aid us. If Julanic will help, I can still succeed with my mission. How? asked Amos. As Erlen's night marshal, Julanic has control of vassal garrisons to Crondor. Upon his signature alone, he could call up the garrisons at Duroni's Vale and Malak's Cross. If he ordered them to march to Sarth, they could join the garrison there and take ship for Criddy. It would be a hard match, but we could still bring them to Criddy by spring. And no hardship to your father, either. I was going to tell you. I have heard Guy has sent soldiers from the Crondorian garrison to your father. Arthur said, That seems strange. I can't imagine Guy wishing to aid father. Amos shook his head. Not so strange. To your father it will seem as if Guy has been sent by the king only to aid Erland, for I suspect the rumours of Erland's being a prisoner in his own palace are not as yet widespread. Also, it's a fine pretext to rid the city of officers and men still loyal to the prince. Still, it is no small boon to your father. From all accounts, nearly four thousand men have left or are leaving for the north. That might be enough to deal with the Tsirani should they come against the Duke. Martin said, But should they come against Criddy? For that, we must seek aid. We must get inside the palace and find Julanic. How? Amos asked. It was my hope you might have a suggestion. Amos looked down then said, Is there anyone in the palace you know to be trustworthy? Well, before I could have named a dozen, but this business makes me doubt everyone. Who stands with the Viceroy and who with the Prince, I can't begin to guess. Then we'll have to know about some more, and we'll have to listen for news of likely ships for transport. Once we've hired a few, we'll slip them out of Crondor one or two at a time every few days. We'll need at least a score to carry the men of three garrisons. Assuming you get Julanic support, which brings us back to gaining entrance to the palace. Amos swore softly. Are you sure you wouldn't care to chuck this business and become a privateer? Arthur's expression clearly showed he was unamused. Amos sighed. I thought not. Arthur said, you seem to know the underside of the city well, Amos. Use your experience to find us a way into the palace, even if through the sewer. I'll keep my eyes open for any of Erlen's men who might wander through the great square. Martin, you'll simply have to keep your ears open. With a long sigh of resignation, Amos said, Getting into the palace is a risky plan, and I don't mind telling you I don't care for the odds. He hiked his thumb at a nearby temple. I may even bounce into Ruthia's temple and ask the Lady of Luck to smile upon us. Arthur dug a gold coin from his purse and tossed it to Amos. Say a prayer to the Lady for me as well. I'll see you back at the tavern later. Arthur strode off into the gloom, and Amos inclined his head toward the temple of the Goddess of Luck. Care to make a votive offering, Martin? 
The night silence was ruptured by trumpets calling men to arms. Arthur was the first to the window, thrusting aside the wooden shutters and peering through. With most of the city asleep, there were few lights to mask the glow in the east. Amos reached Arthur's side. Martin a step behind. Martin said, "Campfires, hundreds of them." The huntmaster glanced heavenward, marking the stars' positions in the clear sky, and said, "Two hours to dawn." Guy's readying his army for the march," said Arthur quietly. Amos leaned far out of the window. By craning his neck, he could catch a glimpse of the harbour. In the distance, men were calling aboard ships. Sounds like they're ready in ships as well. Arthur leaned with both hands upon the table by the window. Guy will send his foot soldiers by ship down the coast into the Sea of Dreams to Shamata, while his cavalry rides to the south. His foot will reach the city fresh enough to help bolster the defence, and when his horses arrive, they aren't sick from travelling by ship, and they'll arrive within days of one another. As if to prove his words, from the east came the sounds of marching men. Then, a few minutes later, the first company of Bastira's foot soldiers came into view. Arthur and his companions watched them march past the open gate of the inn's courtyard. Lanterns gave the soldiers a strange, otherworld appearance as they marched in columns down the street. They stepped in cadence, their golden eagle banners snapping above their heads. Martin said, "They are well-schooled troops." Arthur said, "Guy is many things, most of them unpleasant, but one thing cannot be argued: he is the finest general in the kingdom. Even father is forced to admit that, though he'll say nothing else good about the man." Were I the king, I would send the armies of the east under his command to fight the Sirani. Three times Guy has marched against Kesh, and three times he has thrashed them. If the Keshians do not know he's come west, the very sight of his banner in the field may drive them to the peace table, for they fear and respect him. Arthur's voice became thoughtful in tone. There is one thing. When Guy first came to be Duke of Bastira, he suffered some sort of personal dishonour. Father never told what that shame was, and took to wearing only black as a badge of sorts, earning him the name Black Guy. That type of thing takes a strange brand of personal courage. Whatever else can be said of Black Guy du Bastira, none will call him craven. While the soldiers continued to pass below, Arthur and his companions watched in silence. Then, with the sun rising in the east, the last soldiers disappeared along the streets to the harbour. The morning after Guy's army had marched, it was announced the city was sealed, the gates closed to all travellers, and the harbour blockaded. Arthur judged it a normal practice. To prevent Keshian agents from leaving the city by fast sloop or fast horse to carry word of Guy's march, Amos used a visit to the Wind of Dawn to view the harbour blockade, and discovered it was a light one, for Guy had ordered most of the fleet to stand off the coast at sea ambush, waiting for any Keshian flotillas should Kesh learn the city was stripped of her garrison. The city was now policed by city guards in Guy's livery. As the last Crondorian soldiers departed for the north, rumor had it Guy would also send the garrison at Shamata to the front once the fighting with Kesh had been settled, leaving every garrison in the principality manned by soldiers loyal to Bastira. Arthur spent most of his time in taverns, places of business, and the open markets, most likely to be frequented by those from the palace. Amos prowled near the docks or in the city's seedier sections, especially the infamous poor quarter, and began making discreet inquiries about the availability of ships. Martin used his guise as a simple woodsman to blunder into any place that looked promising. Nearly a week went by this way, with little new information being unearthed. Then, late the sixth day after Guy had quit the city. Arthur found himself being hailed in the middle of the busy square by Martin. Arthur, shouted the hunter as he ran up to Arthur. Best come quickly. He set off toward the waterfront and the sailors' ease. 
Back at the inn, they found Amos already in the room, resting upon his pallet before his nightly sojourn into the poor quarter. Once the door was closed, Martin said, I think they may know Arathas in Crondor. Amos bolted upright as Arathas said, What? How? I wandered into a tavern near the barracks just before the midday meal. With the army gone from the city, there was little business. One man did enter, just as I was readying to leave. A scribe with the city's quartermaster, he was fit to burst with a rumour and in need of someone to tell it to. So, with the aid of some wine, I obliged him by playing the simple woodsy and by showing respect for so important a personage. Three things this man told me. Lord Julanic has disappeared from Crondor, gone, the night Guy left. There's some business of his having retired to nameless estates to the north now that Guy's viceroy, but the scribe thought that unlikely. The second thing was news of Lord Barry's death. Arthur's face showed shock. The prince's Lord Admiral, dead. This man told me Barry had died under mysterious circumstances, though there's no official announcement planned. Some eastern lord, Jessop, has been given command of the Crondorian fleet. Jessop is Guy's man, said Arthur. He commanded the Bastira squadrons of the king's fleet. And lastly, the man made a display of knowing some secret concerning a search for someone he only called the Viceroy's royal cousin. Amos swore. I don't know how, but someone's marked you. With Erland and his family virtual captives in the palace, there's hardly a chance another royal cousin's come wandering into Crondor in the last few days, unless you've a few out in a boat you've not told us of. Arthur ignored Amos's feeble humour. In the span of time it took for Longbow to tell his tale, all his plans for aiding Criddy were dashed. The city was firmly in control of those either loyal to Guy or indifferent to who ruled in the king's name. There was no one in the city he could turn to for help, and his failure in bringing aid home was a bitter thing. Quietly, he said, And there's no other course but to return to Criddy as soon as possible. That may not be so easy, said Amos. There's more strange things occurring. I've been in places where a man can usually make contact with those needed for a dishonest task or two, but everywhere I've made inquiries, discreet, have no doubt, I come up against only hard silence. If I didn't know better, I'd swear the upright man's closed-up shop, and all the muckers are now serving in Guy's army. I have never seen such a collection of dumb barmen, ignorant whores, uninformed beggars, and tongueless gamblers. You don't need to be a genius to see the words gone out. No one is to talk to strangers, no matter how promising a transaction is being offered. So we can look for no aid in getting free of the city, and if Guy's agents know you're in Crondor... There'll be no lifting of the blockade or opening of the gates until you have been found, no matter how loudly the merchants scream. We're deep in the snare, said Martin. But if Guy's men only suspect I'm in Crondor, they may tire of the search. True, agreed Amos, and after a while the mockers may open up as well. Should they agree to help, for a significant price you can be certain, we'll have powerful help in leaving the city. Arthur balled his fist and struck the pallet upon which he sat. Damn Bastira! I'd gladly murder him this instant. Not only does he imperil the West, he risks a greater schism between the two realms by taking the Principality under his own banner. Should anything happen to Erland and his family, it's almost certainly civil war. Amos slowly shook his head. A bollocksed mission, this, and through no fault of yours, Arthur. He sighed. Still, we can't be startled into panic. Friend Martin may have misunderstood the scribe's last remark, or the man may have been speaking simply to hear himself talk. We'll have to be cautious, but we can't bolt and run. Should you vanish from sight completely, someone might take notice. 
Best if you stay close to the inn, but act as you have been for the time being. I'll continue to make attempts at reaching someone who may have ways to get us clear of the city. Smugglers, if not the mockers. Arith arose from the pallet and said, I've no appetite, but we've eaten together in the common room every night. I expect we'd best go down for supper soon. Amos waved him back to his bed. Stay a while longer. I'm going to run down to the docks and visit the ship. If Martin's scribe was not just breaking wind, they'll certainly search the ships in the harbour. I'd best warn Vasco and the crew to be ready to go over the side if necessary and find some place to store your chest. We aren't due to be hauled out for refitting for another week, so we must act with care. I've run blockades before. I wouldn't want to risk it in a hulk as leaky as the wind of dawn. But if I can't find another ship... At the door, he turned back to face Arthur and Martin. It's a black storm, boys. But we've weathered worse. Arthur and Martin sat quietly as Amos entered the common room. The seaman pulled out a chair and called for ale and a meal. Once he was served, he said, Everything's taken care of. Your chest is safe as long as the ship is left moored. Where did you hide it? It's snugly wrapped in oilcloth and tied securely to the anchor. Arthur looked impressed. Underwater? We can buy new clothes, and gold and gems don't rust. Martin said, How are the men? Grumbling over being in port another week and still aboard ship. But they're good lads. The door to the inn opened, and six men entered. Five took chairs near the door, while one stood surveying the room. Amos hissed, See that rap-faced fellow who just sat down? He's one of the boys who've been watching the docks for the last week. Looks like I've been followed. The man who remained standing spotted Amos and approached the table. He was a plain-looking man of open countenance. His reddish-blonde hair was flyaway around his head, and he wore a common sailor's clothing. He clutched a wool cap in his hand as he smiled at them. Amos nodded, and the man said, If you're the master of the wind of dawn, I'd have words with you. Amos raised an eyebrow but said nothing. He indicated the free chair, and the man sat. Name's Radburn. I'm looking for a berth, Captain. Amos looked about, seeing Radburn's companions were pretending not to notice what was transpiring at the table. Why, my ship? I've tried others. They're all full up. Just thought I'd ask you. Who was your last master? And why did you leave his service? Radburn laughed, a friendly sound. Well, I last sailed with a company of barge ferrymen taking cargo from ship to shore in the harbour. Been stuck doing that for a year. He fell silent as the serving wench approached. Amos ordered another round of ale, and when one was set before Radburn he said, Thank you, Captain. He took a long pull and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Before I came to be beached, I sailed with Captain John Avery aboard the Bantamina. I know the little rooster, and John Avery, though I haven't seen him since I was last in Durban five or six years back. Well, I got a little drunk, and the captain told me he'd have none who drank aboard his ship. I drink no more than the next man, Captain. But you know Master Avery's reputation being an abstentious follower of Sung the White. Amos looked at Martin and Aretha, but said nothing. Radburn said, These your officers, Captain? No, business partners. When it was clear Amos was going to say nothing more, Radburn let the topic of identities drop. Amos finally said, We've been in the city little more than a week and I've been busy with personal matters. What news? Radburn shrugged. The war goes on, good for the merchants, bad for the rest. Now with the business with cash. Before the troubles was along the far coast, but now... Crondor might not prove such a healthy spot if the Viceroy doesn't chase the dogs of cash back home. Otherwise, there's the usual gossip. 
He glanced around, as looking for anyone who might overhear. And some not so usual. Amos lifted his mug to his lip, saying nothing. Since the viceroy's come, said Radburn quietly, things haven't been the same in Crondor. An honest man isn't safe on the streets any more, what with Durbin slavers running about and the press gangs almost as bad. That's why I need a ship, Captain. Press gangs! Amos exploded. There hasn't been a press gang in a kingdom city in thirty years. Once was, but now things have changed again. You get a little drunk and don't find a safe berth for the night, the press gang comes along and slaps you into the dungeon. It just isn't right, no sir. Just because a man's between ships doesn't give anyone the right to ship him out with Lord Jessop's fleet for seven years. Seven years of chasing pirates and fighting Quegg and war galleys. Amos's eyes narrowed. How is it that Guy rules in Crondor? We've heard stories, but they seem confused. Radburn nodded. Right you are, Captain. For it is confusing. A month ago, Lord Guy rides in with his army behind, flags are waving, drums beating and the rest. The prince, so they say, welcomes him and treats him real friendly, even though Du Bastira is carrying the king's writ, naming him Viceroy. The prince even helps him, they say, until this business of the press gangs and such comes to his ears. Lowering his voice more, he said, I heard that when he complained, Guy locks him up in his rooms. Nice rooms, I expect, but same as a cell if you can't leave, so I hear. Arathur was so outraged by the story, he was on the verge of speaking. Amos gripped his arm quickly, warning silence, then said, Well, Radburn, I can always use a good man who sailed with John Avery. I'll tell you what, I've one more trip to the ship to make tonight, and there's some personal belongings in my room I'll want aboard. You come along and carry them. Amos rose and, giving the man no time to object, gripped him by the arm and propelled him toward the stairs. Arthur shot a glance at the group who entered with Radburn. They seemed unaware for the moment of what was transpiring across the crowded common room as Amos took Radburn up the stairs, Arthur and Martin following behind. Amos hustled Radburn down the hall and once through the door to their room spun and delivered a staggering blow to Radburn's stomach, doubling him over. A brutal knee to the face and Radburn lay stunned upon the floor. What's this all about? said Arthur. That man's a liar. John Avery's a marked man in Kesh. He betrayed the Durbin captains to a Quaggan raiding fleet twenty years ago. Yet Radburn didn't bat an eye when I said I saw Avery in Durbin six years ago. And he's too free in showing disrespect to the Viceroy. His story stinks like a weak dead fish. We go out the door with him, and inside of two blocks a dozen men or more will be upon us. What shall we do? said Arthur. We leave. His friends will be up those stairs in a minute. He pointed to the window. Martin stood by the door as Arthur ripped aside a dirty canvas shade and pushed open the wooden shutters. Amos said, Now you can see why I chose this room. Less than a yard below, the window's ledge was the roof of the stable. Arthur stepped out. Amos and Martin following. They hurried carefully down the steeply sloping roof until they reached the edge. Arthur leaped down, landing quietly, followed a moment later by Martin. Amos landed more heavily, but suffered only a minor bruise to his dignity. They heard a cough and an oath, and looked up to see a bloodied face at the window. Radburn shouted, They're in the courtyard! as the three fugitives started for the gate. Amos swore, I oh, should have cut his throat! They ran to the gate, and as they entered the street, Amos grabbed at Arthur. A group of men were running down the street toward them. Aratha and his companions fled the opposite way, ducking into a dark alley. Hurrying along between the blank walls of two buildings, they cut across a busy street, overturning several pushcarts, and ducked into another alley, the cart owner's curses following. They continued to run, the sounds of pursuit never far behind, following a twisting maze of back alleys and side streets through darkened Crondor. 
Turning a corner, they found themselves intersecting a long, narrow street, little more than an alley, flanked on both sides by tall buildings. Amos rounded the corner first and motioned for Arthur and Martin to halt. In low tones, he said, "Martin, hurry down to the corner and take a look around. Arthur, go the other way." He pointed toward a spot where dim light could be seen. I'll stand watch here. If we become separated, make for the ship. It'll be a desperate chance breaking the blockade. But should you win free, have Vasco make for Durbin. Your gold will buy you enough protection there to get the ship refitted and you back to Criddy. Now go. Arthur and Martin ran down the street in opposite directions, and Amos stood watch behind. Abruptly, shouts came down the narrow street, and Arthur looked back. At the other end of the street, he could see the dim figure of Martin struggling with several men. He started back, but Amos shouted, "Go on! I'll help him. Get away!" Arthur hesitated, then resumed his run toward the distant light. He was panting when he reached the corner and nearly skidded to a halt as he entered a well-travelled, brightly lit avenue. From carts decorated with lanterns, hawkers sold their wares to passing citizens out for a stroll after supper. The weather was mild; there looked to be little chance of snow this winter, and large numbers of people were about. From the conditions of the buildings and the fashions of those in the area, Arthur knew he was in a more prosperous section of the city. Arthur stepped into the street and forced himself to walk at a leisurely pace. He turned and made a display of examining a garment seller's wares as several men appeared from the street he had just fled. He tugged a garish red cloak from among the goods and swirled it about his shoulder, pulling the hood over his head. "Here now, what do you think you're doing?" asked a dried-faced old man in a reedy whisper, affecting a nasal voice. Arthur said, "My good man." You don't expect me to purchase a garment without seeing if it fits. Suddenly confronted by a buyer, the man became unctuously friendly. Oh no, certainly, sir. Looking at Arthur in the ill-tailored cloak, he said, "It's a perfect fit, sir, and the colour suits you well, if I may say." Arthur chanced to glance at his pursuers. The man called Radburn stood at the corner. Blood dried upon his face and his nose swollen, but still able to direct his men's search. Arthur adjusted the cloak, a great cumbersome thing that hung nearly to the ground. In a display of fussiness, he said, "You think so? I wouldn't care to appear at court looking like a vagabond." "Oh, court is it, sir? Well, it's just the thing. Mark me, it adds a certain elegance to your appearance." How much is it? Arthur saw Radburn's men walking through the busy crowd. Some looking into each tavern and storefront as they passed. Others hurrying on to other destinations. More followed from the smaller street, and Radburn spoke quietly to them. He set some to watching those in the street, then turned and led the rest back the way they had come. It's the finest cloth made in Rand, sir," said the seller. "It was brought at great expense from the shore of the Kingdom Sea." I couldn't let it go for less than twenty golden sovereigns. Arthur blanched, and for a moment was so struck by the outrageous price he nearly forgot himself. Twenty! He lowered his voice as a passing member of Radburn's company threw him a quick glance. "My dear man," he said, returning to character, "I seek to purchase a cloak, not establish an annuity for your grandchildren." Radburn's man turned away and disappeared into the press of the crowd. It is rather a plain wrap, after all. I should think two sovereigns more than sufficient. The man looked stricken. Sir, you seek to beggar me. I couldn't think of parting with it for a sum of less than eighteen sovereigns. They haggled for another ten minutes, and Arthur. Finally, departed with the cloak for the price of eight sovereigns and two silver royals. It was double the price he should have paid, but the searchers had ignored a man haggling with the street seller, and escaping detection was worth the price a hundred times over. Arthur kept alert for signs he was being watched as he made his way along the street. Unfortunately, he knew little of Crondor. 
and had no idea where he was after the flight. He kept to the busier part of the street, staying close to larger groups, seeking to blend in. Aratha saw a man standing at the corner, seemingly idling the night away, but clearly watching those who passed. Aratha looked around and saw a tavern on the other side of the street, marked by a brightly painted sign of a white dove. He quickly crossed the street, keeping his face turned away from the man at the corner, and approached the doorway of the tavern. As he reached for the door, a hand gripped his cloak, and Aratha spun his sword halfway out of its scabbard. A boy of about thirteen stood there, wearing a simple, oft-patched tunic, and men's trousers cut off at the knees. He had dark hair and eyes, and his smudged face was set in a grin. Not there, sir, he said, with a merry note in his voice. Aratha slipped his sword back into the scabbard and fell into character. Be gone, boy. I've no time for beggars or panderers, even those of limited stature. The boy's grin broadened. If you insist, but there are two of them in there. Aratha dropped his nasal accent. Who? The men who chased you from the side street. Aratha glanced about. The boy appeared alone. He looked into the boy's eyes and said, "What are you talking about?" I saw how you acted. Quick on your feet, sir, but they've blanketed the area, and you'll not be slipping by them yourself. Aratha leaned forward. Who are you, boy? With a toss of his ragged hair, he said, "Name's Jimmy. I work hereabouts." I can get you out, for a fee, of course. And what makes you think I wish to get out? Don't play the fool with me, like you did with the merchant, sir. You need to get clear of somebody who's likely to pay me to show him where you are. I've run afoul of Radburn and his men before, so you have more of my sympathy than he's likely to get. As long as you can bid more for your freedom than he will for your capture. You know Radburn. Jimmy grinned. Not so as I care to admit, but yes. We've had dealings before. Aratha was struck by the boy's cool manner, not what he would have expected from the boys he knew back home. Here stood an old hand at negotiating the treacherous byways of the city. How much? Radburn will pay me twenty-five gold to find you, fifty if he especially wants your skin. Aratha took out his coin pouch and handed it to the boy. Over a hundred sovereigns in there, boy. Get me out of here and to the docks, and I'll double it. The boy's eyes flickered wide a moment, but he never lost his grin. You must have offended someone with a lot of influence. Come along. He darted away so quickly, Aratha almost lost him in the heavy crowd. The boy moved with the ease of experience through the press, while Aratha had to struggle to keep from jostling people in the street. Jimmy led him into an alley several blocks away. When they were a short way down the alley, Jimmy stopped. Better toss that cloak. Red's not my favourite colour for looking inconspicuous. When Aratha had pitched the cloak into an empty barrel, Jimmy said, "You'll be pointed at the docks in a moment. If someone tumbles onto us, you're on your own. But for that other hundred gold, I'll try to see you all the way." They worked their way back to the end of the alley, apparently seldom used from the heavy accumulation of trash and discarded objects, packing crates, broken furniture, and nameless goods against the walls around them. Jimmy pulled aside a crate revealing a hole. This should put us outside Redburn's net. At least I hope so," said Jimmy. Aratha found he had to crouch to follow the boy through the small passage. From the rank odor in the tunnel, it was clear something had crawled in here to die fairly recently. As if reading his mind, Jimmy said, "We toss a dead cat in here every few days. Keeps others from sticking their noses too far in." We said, "Aratha." Jimmy ignored the question and kept moving. Soon they exited into another alley overburdened with trash. At the mouth of the alley, Jimmy motioned for Aratha to stop and wait. He hurried along the dark street, then returned at a run. Radburn's men—they must have known you dead for the arbor. Can we slip past them? No chance. They're as thick as lice on a beggar. The boy took off in the opposite direction down the street they had entered from the alley. Aratha followed as Jimmy turned up another small byway. Aratha hoped he hadn't bargained wrongly in trusting the street boy. 
After a few minutes of travelling, Jimmy stopped. I know a place you can hold up a while until I can find some others to help you get onto your ship, but it'll cost you more than a hundred. Get me to my ship before dawn, and I'll give you whatever you ask. Jimmy grinned. I can ask a lot. He regarded Aretha for a moment longer, then, with a curt nod of his head, led off. Aretha followed, and they wound their way deeper into the city. The sounds of people in the streets fell off, and Aretha judged they were moving into an area less well travelled at night. The buildings around them showed they were heading into another poor area of the city, though not close to the docks as far as Aretha could tell. Several sharp turns through dark, narrow alleys, and Aretha was completely lost. Abruptly, Jimmy turned and said, "We're there." He pulled open a door in an otherwise blank wall and stepped through. Aretha climbed a long flight of stairs after him. Jimmy led him down a hall at the top of the stairs to a door. The boy opened it and indicated Aretha should enter. Aretha took a single step, then halted, as he discovered three sword points levelled at his stomach. Chapter Twenty-Five. Escape. A man motioned for Aretha to enter. He sat behind a small table facing the door. Leaning forward into the light of the small lamp on the table, he said, "Please come in." The light revealed his face was covered with pock marks, and he possessed a large hooked nose. His eyes never strayed from Aretha as the three swordsmen stepped back, allowing the prince entrance. Aretha hesitated as he saw the bound and unconscious forms of Amos and Martin slumped against the wall. Amos groaned and stirred, but Martin remained motionless. Aretha measured the distance between himself and the three swordsmen, his hand hovering near the hilt of his rapier. Any notion of leaping back and drawing his sword vanished when he felt a dagger point pressed against the small of his back. A hand snaked round from behind. And relieved him of his sword. Jimmy then stepped around the prince, examining the rapier as he carefully hid his dagger in the folds of his loose tunic. He grinned broadly. "I've seen a few of these about. It's light enough. I could use it." Dryly, Aretha said, "Under the circumstances, it might not be inappropriate to make it my legacy to you. Use it in good health." The pock-faced man said. You keep your wits about you," as Aretha was ushered farther into the room by a swordsman. Another put away his weapon and tied Aretha's arms behind him. He was then roughly thrust into a chair opposite the man who had spoken, who continued, "My name is Aaron Cook, and you've already met Jimmy the Hand." He indicated the boy. These others prefer to remain anonymous at present. Aretha looked at the boy. Jimmy the Hand. The boy executed a fair imitation of a courtly bow, and Cook said, "The finest pickpocket in Crondor, and well on his way to becoming the finest thief as well, should you be inclined to believe his self-appraisal." Now to matters of business. Who are you? Aretha related the story of being Amos's business partner, calling himself Arthur, and Cook studied him stoically. With a sigh. He nodded, and one of the silent men stepped forward and struck Aretha across the mouth. Aretha's head snapped back from the force of the blow, and his eyes watered. "Friend Arthur," said Aaron Cook, shaking his head, "we can go about this interview two ways. I'd advise you not to make the choice of the difficult way. It will prove most unpleasant, and we shall know what we want in the end in any event. So please consider your answers carefully." He stood and came around the table. Who are you? Aretha began to repeat his story, and the man who struck him stepped forward again, ending his answer with another ringing blow. The man called Cook leaned down so his face was level with Aretha's. Aretha blinked to clear the tears from his eyes, and Cook said, "Friend, tell us what we ask now, so as not to waste time." He pointed at Amos, that he is the captain of your ship. We concede, but you, his business partner, I think not. 
That other fellow played the part of a hunter from the mountains in several taverns about town, and I think it no mummery. He has the look of one who knows mountains better than city streets, a look hard to forge. He studied Arthur. But you, you are a soldier at least, and your rich boots and fine sword mark you a gentleman. But I think there is more. Looking into Arthur's eyes, he said, "Now, why is Jocko Radburn so intent upon finding you?" Arthur looked Aaron Cook squarely in the eyes. I don't know. The man who had struck Arthur began to step forward again, but Cook held up his hand. That may be true. You've been something of a fool the way you've been popping up here and there, hanging around the gates of the palace, playing the innocent. You are either poor spies or poor fools, but there is no doubt you've aroused the interest of the viceroy's men and therefore ours. Who are you? Cook ignored the question. Jocko Radburn's the senior officer in the viceroy's secret police. Despite that open, honest face on him, Radburn is one of the most steel-nerved, unmovable bastards the gods ever graced this world with. He'd happily cut his grandmother's heart out if he thought the old girl was making free with state secrets. The fact he put in a personal appearance shows he, at the very least, judges you potentially important. We first learned three men were nosing about town a day or two after you arrived. And when our people heard some of Radburn's men were keeping an eye upon you, we decided to do likewise. When they began offering small bribes for information about you three, we became especially interested. We were content to simply keep watching you, waiting until you showed your hand. But when Jocko and his men showed at the sailors' ease, we were forced to act. We snatched those two. From under Jocko's nose, but Jocko and his bully boys came down the alley between you and us, so we hurried them away. Jimmy's finding you was a bit of luck, for he didn't know we were ready to bring you in. He nodded approval to the boy. You did right bringing him here. Jimmy laughed. I was on the rooftops watching the old thing. I knew you wanted him in as soon as you grabbed the other two. One of the men swore. You better not have been trying for a boost without writ from the night master boy. Cook raised his hand, and the man fell silent. It will not hurt for you to know that some here are mockers, others are not, but we are all united in an undertaking of great importance. Mark me well, Arthur. Your only hope of leaving here alive rests upon our being satisfied. You do not endanger that undertaking I spoke of. It may be Radburn's interest in you is only coincidental to his interest in other matters, or there may be a weaving of threads here, some pattern as yet unseen. In any event, we shall have the truth, and when we are satisfied with what you have told us, we shall set you free. Perhaps even aid you and your companions, or we shall kill you. Now start at the beginning. Why did you come to Crondor? Arthur considered. There was little but pain to be gained by lying. Yet he was not willing to tell the entire truth. That these men were not working with Guy's men wasn't proved. This could be a ploy, with Radburn in the next room listening to every word. He decided what part of the truth to tell. I'm an agent for Criddy. I came to speak to Prince Erland and Lord Julanic in person. To ask for aid against a coming Tirani offensive, when we learned Guy de Bastira was in possession of the city, we decided to gauge the temper of things before committing ourselves to a course of action. Cook listened closely, then said, "Why should an emissary of Criddy slip into the city? Why not come in with banners flying and receive a state welcome?" Because Black Gee had just as soon toss him into a cell as not, you stupid bastard. Cook's head snapped around. Amos was sitting up against the wall, groggily shaking his head.、Uh, I think you busted my skull, Cook. Aaron Cook looked hard at Amos. You know me. 
Ay, you wooden-headed sea rat, I know you. I know you well enough to know we're not speaking another word until you go fetch Trevor Hull. Aaron Cook rose from the table, an uncertain expression on his face. He motioned to one of the men by the door who also looked discomforted by Amos's words. The man nodded to Cook and left the room. Minutes later, he returned, followed by another man, tall, with a shock of grey hair, but still powerful looking. A ragged scar ran from his forehead through his right eye, which was milky white, and down his cheek. He took a long look at Amos, then laughed aloud and pointed at the captives. Untie them. Amos was lifted by two men, then untied. As his ropes were loosened, he said, I thought they'd hung you years ago, Trevor. The man clapped Amos on the back. And I you, Amos. Cook looked questioningly at the new arrival, while Arthur was untied, and Martin revived with a cup of water thrown in his face. The man called Trevor Hull looked at Cook and said, Have your wits fled, man? He's grown a beard and cut his famous flowing locks, and lost some on top and put on a few pounds as well. But he's still Amos Trask. Cook studied Amos a moment longer, then his eyes widened. Captain Trenchard! Amos nodded, and Arthur looked on in astonishment. Even in Far Criddy they had heard of Trenchard the pirate, the dagger of the sea. He'd had a short career, but a famous one. It was reputed even Quaggan war galleys had turned and fled at the sight of Trenchard's fleet, and there wasn't a town along the coasts of the bitter sea that did not fear his marauders. Aaron Cook extended his hand. Sorry, Captain. It's been so many years since we last met. We couldn't be certain you weren't part of some plot of Radburns to locate us. Who are you? asked Aretha. All in good time, answered Hull. Come. One of the men helped the still groggy Martin to his feet, and Cook and Hull led them to a more comfortable room with chairs enough for all. When all were sitting, Amos said, This old rogue is Trevor Hull, Captain Whiteye, Master of the Red Raven. Hull shook his head sadly. No longer, Amos. Burned off a of Ilariel she was three years ago by Imperial Cassian Cutters. My mate Cook here and a few of my boys got to shore with me, but most of the crew went down with the Red Raven. We made our way back to Durbin, but things are changing. What with the wars and all. Came to Crondor a year ago and have been working here since. Working? You, Trevor? The man smiled, his scar wrinkling as he said. Smuggling, in fact. That's what brought us together with the mockers. Not much can happen in Crondor along those lines without the upright man's permission. When the Viceroy first came to Crondor, we started running up against Jocko Radburn and his secret police. He's been a thorn in our side from the first. This business of guards sneaking about dressed as common folk, there's just no honour in it. Amos muttered. I knew I should have cut his throat when I had the chance. Next time I won't be so damned civilised. Slowing down a bit, Amos. Well, a week ago we got word from the upright man he had a precious cargo to leave the city. We've had to bide our time until the right ship was ready. Radburn's very anxious to find that cargo before it leaves Crondor, so you see it's a most delicate situation. We can't ship it until the blockade's lifted, or we find a blockade captain we can bribe. When we first caught wind, you three were asking questions. We thought it might be some grand plot of Jocko's to find that cargo. Now we've cleared the air, I'd like to hear the answer to Cook's question explained. Why should an emissary from Criddy fear discovery by the Viceroy's men? Listening in, were you? Amos turned to Arthur, who nodded. This is no simple emissary, Trevor. Our young friend is Prince Arthur, son of Duke Boric. Aaron Cook's eyes went wide, and the man who struck Arthur paled. Trevor Hull nodded understanding. Uh, the Viceroy would pay handsomely to get his hands upon the son of his old enemy, 
especially when it came time to press his claim in the Congress of Lords. What claim? said Arthur. Hull leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees. You'd not know, of course. We only heard the news a few days ago ourselves, and it's not common knowledge. Still, I'm not free to speak plainly without permission. He rose and left the room. Arthur and Amos exchanged questioning glances, then Arthur looked toward Martin. Are you all right? Martin carefully touched his head. I'll recover, though they must have hit me with a tree. One of the men grinned in a friendly, almost apologetic way, patting a wooden billy in his belt sash. He said, There's a hard one to bring down, that's for certain. Hull returned to the room, followed by another. The men in the room rose, and Arthur, Amos, and Martin slowly followed suit. Behind Hull came a young girl no more than sixteen years of age. Arthur was instantly struck by the promise of beauty in her features. Large sea green eyes, straight and delicate nose, a slightly full mouth. A faint hint of freckles dusted her otherwise fair skin. She was tall and slender and walked with poise. She came across the room to Arthur, rose up on tiptoes, and kissed him lightly upon the cheek. Arthur looked surprised at this gesture and watched as she stepped back with a smile upon her lips. She wore a simple dress of dark blue, and her red brown hair hung loosely to her shoulders. After a second, she said, Of course. How silly I am. You'd not know me. I saw you when you were last in Crondor, but we never met. I'm your cousin, Anita, Erland's daughter. Arthur stood thunderstruck. Besides the girl's disquieting effect upon his composure, with her winning smile and clear gaze, he was doubly surprised to find her in this company of brigands. He sat down slowly and she took a chair. So used to the informality of his father's court, he was somewhat surprised when she gave the others permission to sit. How? Aretha began. Amos interrupted. The upright man's precious cargo. Hull nodded, and the princess spoke, her pretty face clouded with emotion. When the Duke of Bastyra came with orders from the king, father greeted him warmly and offered no resistance. At first, father did all he could to aid him in taking command of the army. But when he heard of the things Guy was doing with his secret police and press gangs, father protested. Then... When Lord Barry died and Guy put Lord Jessop in command of the fleet over father's objections and Lord Julanic disappeared so mysteriously, father sent a letter to the king demanding Guy's recall. Guy intercepted the message and ordered us kept under guard in a wing of the palace. Then Guy came to my room one night. She shuddered. Arthur nearly spat when he said, You don't have to speak of such things. The sudden rage startled the girl. No, she said. It was nothing like that. He was very proper, nearly formal. He simply informed me we were to be wed, and that King Roderick was to name him heir to the throne of Crondor. If anything, he seemed irritated by the bother of having to take such a course. Arthur slammed his fist against the wall behind. That tears it. Guy means to have Erland's crown and Roderick's after. He means to be king. Anita looked at Arthur shyly. So it seems. Father's not well and couldn't resist, though he refused to sign the proclamation of betrothal. Guy had him taken to the dungeon until he would sign. Her eyes teared as she said, Father cannot live long in such cold and damp quarters. I fear he will die before agreeing to Guy's wishes. She continued to speak, her face a mask of control, though tears ran down her cheeks as she talked of her mother and father's imprisonment. Then one of my ladies told me a maid knew some people in the city who might be willing to help. Trevor Hull said, With your permission, Highness, <coughs> one of the girls in the palace is sister to a mocker. With everything up in the wind, the upright man decided it might be to his advantage to take a hand. He arranged to smuggle the princess out of the palace the night of Guy's departure, and she's been here since. Amos said, 
in the rumour we overheard before we fled the sailor's ease about there being a hunt on for a royal cousin was about Anita, not Aratha. Hal pointed at the prince. It may be Radburn and his boys still have no idea who you are. Most likely they jumped on you in the hope you'd turn out to be party to the princess's escape. We're almost certain the Viceroy has no idea she has gone from the palace, for she fled after he rode out. I expect Radburn is desperate to get her back before his master returns from the war with Kesh. Aratha studied the princess, feeling a strong desire to do something on her behalf, a desire beyond the consideration of foiling Guy. He shunted aside the strange tug of emotions. He asked Trevor Hull, Why does the upright man wish to contend with Guy? Why isn't he turning her in for a reward? Trevor Hull looked to Jimmy the Hand, who answered with a grin. My master, a most perceptive man, saw at once his own interests were best served by aiding the princess. Since Erland has been Prince of Crondor, the business of the city runs smoothly, an environment conducive to the success of my master's many undertakings. Stability profits us all, you see. With Guy here, with his secret police about upsetting the normal commerce of our guild, and whatever else, we are most loyal subjects of His Highness the Prince of Crondor. If he does not wish his daughter to marry the Viceroy, we do not wish it as well. With a laugh, Jimmy added, Besides, the princess has agreed to pay 25,000 gold sovereigns to our master should the guild get her free of Crondor, to be delivered when her father returns to power or some other fate places her upon the throne. Aratha took Anita's hand and said, Well, cousin, there is nothing else to be done. We must take you to Criddy at the first chance. Anita smiled, and Aratha found himself smiling back. Trevor Hull said, as I said before, we were waiting for the right opportunity to smuggle her from the city. He turned to Amos. You're the man for this, Amos. There's no better blockade runner on the bitter sea. Excepting myself, of course, but I've other matters to take care of here. Trask said, We can't leave for a few weeks yet. Even if the blockade was lifted, my ship's in a desperate need of refitting. And if we left now... We'd have to sail a boat until the weather in the straits breaks. With Jessup's fleet at sea ambush, that would be risky. I'd rather hide here a while, than a quick run west through the straits and up the far coast with no delay. Hull slapped him on the shoulder. Good, that'll give us time. I've heard of your ship. The boys tell me it's little better than a barge. We'll find you another. I'll send word to your men when the time is right. Rabburn will most likely leave your crew alone, hoping you'll turn up. We'll slip them aboard the new ship a few at a time at night and replace them with my own boys so Rabburn's men won't notice anything unusual aboard. He turned to Aratha. You'll be safe enough here, Highness. This building is one of many owned by the Mockers, and none will get close without our having ample warning. When the time is right, we'll get you all free of the city. Now we'll take you to your room, so you may rest. Aratha, Martin and Amos were shown to a room down the hall from the one where they had met Anita, while the princess returned to her own quarters. The room they entered was a simple affair, but clean. All three men were tired. Martin fell heavily on one pallet and was quickly asleep. Amos lowered himself slowly, and Aratha watched him for a moment. With a slight smile, he said, when you first came to Critty, I thought you were a pirate. Struggling to remove a boot, Amos said, In truth, I tried to leave that behind me, Highness. He laughed. Perhaps it was the gods working their revenge upon me. But you know, for fifteen years, man and boy, I was a corsair and a captain. Then when I try my hand at honest trading for the first time, my ship is captured and burned, my crew slaughtered, and I find myself beached as far from the heart of the kingdom as you can get and still be in it. Aratha lay down upon his pallet. You've been a good counsellor, Amos Trask, and a brave companion. Your help over the years has earned you a good deal of forgiveness for past wrongdoings, but... 
He shook his head. Trenchard, the pirate. God's man, there is so much to forgive. Amos yawned and stretched. And when we return to Creddy, you can hang me, Arthur. But for now, please have the good grace to keep silent and put out the light. I'm getting too old for this foolishness. I need some sleep. Arthur reached over and covered the wick of the lamp with a snuff. He lay back in the darkness, images and thoughts crowding his mind. He thought of his father and what he would do were he here. Then wondered how his brother and sister were. Thoughts of Carline caused him to think of Roland and to speculate how the fortifications of Jonrill were progressing. He forced aside the buzzing thoughts and let his mind drift. Then, before sleep took him, he remembered Anita as she rose up on tiptoes to kiss his cheek and felt again a not entirely comfortable churning within. A faint smile crossed his lips as he fell asleep. Anita clapped appreciatively as Arthur turned aside the point of Jimmy's sword. The boy thief blushed at his awkwardness, but Arthur said that was better. He and Jimmy were practicing basic sword work. Jimmy using a rapier purchased with some of the gold Arthur had given him. For a month they had passed the time this way, and Anita had taken to watching. Whenever the princess was around, the usually brash Jimmy the Hand became subdued, and he blushed furiously whenever she spoke to him. Arthur was now certain the boy thief was afflicted by the worst sort of infatuation for the princess, only three years older than himself. Arthur appreciated Jimmy's distress, for he also found the girl's presence a distraction. Still in the first years of womanhood, she nevertheless carried herself with court-bred grace. Had wit and education, and showed the promise of mature beauty. Arthur found it easier to turn his thoughts to other topics than the princess. The basement where they worked on their swordplay was damp and poorly ventilated, so it soon became close and humid. Arthur said, "That's enough for today, Jimmy. You're still impatient to close, and that can be fatal. You've plenty of speed, and it's good to learn young." But you lack arm strength to bash about as many older men do. With the rapier, that can also prove fatal. Remember, the edge is for cutting, and the point is for killing. Finished Jimmy with a self-conscious grin. I can see how you'd have to be cautious against a man with a broadsword. He could break your blade if you tried to block instead of parry. But what'd you do if one of those alien warriors comes at you with that great sword you described? Arthur laughed. You find out who can run faster. Anita's laughter joined with Arthur's and Jimmy's. Arthur said, "Seriously, you must stay to the off-hand side. With the big swords, your opponent gets one swing, then you've got an opening." The door opened, and Amos walked in with Martin and Trevor Hull. Amos said, "The worst damn luck!" Begging the princess's pardon, Arthur, the worst has occurred. Arthur wiped the perspiration off his brow with a towel and said, "Well, don't stand there waiting for me to guess what." News came this morning," said Hull. "Guy is returning to Crondor." "Why?" asked Anita. Amos said, "It seems our Lord of Bastira rode into Shemata and ran his banner up above the walls. The Cassian commander had the good grace to mount one more attack for the sake of form, then nearly gave himself a ruptured gut racing back home." He left a handful of minor nobles haggling with Guy's lieutenants over the conditions of armistice until a formal treaty can be drawn up between the king and the Cassian Empress. There is only one reason Guy can be hurrying back here. Quietly, Anita said, "He knows I've escaped." Trevor Hull said, "Yes, Highness, this Black Guy's a wily one. He must have a spy in Rabboon's company." It appears he doesn't even trust his own secret police over much. Luckily, we still have people inside the palace loyal to your father, or we would never have learned of this turn. Arthur sat down near the princess. Well, then we must soon be gone. It's either sail for home or toward Ilith to reach father. Amos said, "Looking at the choices, it seems there is little to recommend one course over the other." Both have dangers and advantages. Martin looked at the girl, then said, "Though 
I don't think the Duke's war camp any place for a young woman. Amos sat down by Arthur. Your presence in Criddy is not vital, at least not for now. Fannon and Garden are able men, and should the need arise, I think your sister would prove no mean commander. They should be able to keep things under control as well as you. Martin said, But you must ask yourself this. What will your father do when he learns Guy does not simply rule in Crondor as Erlen's aid, but holds the city completely in his power? that he's sending no aid to the far coast, and that he means to have the throne. Aretha nodded vigorously. You're right, Martin. You know father well. It will mean civil war. There was sorrow on his face. He'll withdraw half the armies of the west and march down the coast to Crondor, and not stop until Guy's head is on a pole before the city gates. Then the course will be set. He'll have to turn east and march against Roderick. He'd never wish the crown for himself, but once begun... He cannot stop short of total victory or defeat. But we'd lose the west of the Sirani in time. Brukel couldn't hold them long with only half an army. Jimmy said, This civil war sounds a nasty sort of business. Aretha sat forward, wiping his forehead. He looked up from under damp locks. We've not had one in 250 years since the first Boric slew his half-brother, John the Pretender. Compared to what this would be, with all the East marshalled against the West, that was only a skirmish. Amos looked at Aretha with concern upon his face. History is not my strong suit, but it seems to me you'd do best by your father keeping him in ignorance of this turn of events until the Sirani spring offensive is finished. Aretha exhaled a long, low breath. There's nothing else for it. We know no aid will be forthcoming for Criddy. I can best decide what to do when I return. Perhaps in council with Fannon and the others we can work out some defence for when the Sirani come. His tone was one of near resignation. Father will learn of Guy's plotting in due time. This sort of news is hard to keep. The best we can hope for is he'll not hear of it until after the Sirani offensive. Perhaps by then the situation will have changed. It was obvious from his tone he didn't think that likely. Martin said, It may be the Sirani will choose to march against Elvendar, or carry the battle to your father. Who can say? Aretha leaned back and became aware of Anita's hand resting gently upon his arm. What a choice we have, he said quietly, to face the possible loss of Criddy in the far coast of the Sirani, or to plunge the kingdom into civil war. Truly the gods must hate the kingdom. Amos stood. Trevor tells me he has a ship. We can sail in a few days. With luck, the straits will be clearing when we arrive. Lost in the gloom of his own personal defeat, Aretha barely heard him. He had come to Crondor in such confidence. He would win Erlen's support for his cause, and Criddy would be rescued from the Sirani. Now he faced an even more desperate situation than had he stayed home. Everyone left him alone save for Anita, who spent silent minutes just sitting at his side. Dark figures moved quietly toward the waterfront. Trevor Hull led a dozen men with Aretha and his companions down the silent street. They hugged the walls of the buildings, and every few yards Aretha would cast a backward glance to see how Anita fared. She returned his concern with brave smiles, faintly perceived in the pre-dawn darkness. Aretha knew that over a hundred men moved down adjacent streets, sweeping the area of the City Watch and Radburn's agents. The mockers had turned out in force so Aretha and the others could safely quit the city. Hull had carried word the night before that for a considerable cost the upright man had arranged for one of the blockade ships to drift off station. Since learning the true situation, including Guy's plan to become Prince of Crondor, the upright man had given over his not inconsiderable resources to aid the Prince's and Anita's escape. Anita wondered if anyone outside the Guild of Thieves would ever learn the mysterious leader's true identity. 
From what chance remarks Arthur had overheard, it seemed only a few within the mockers knew who he was. With Guy on his way back to the city, Jocko Radburn's men had increased their searching to a near frenzied pitch. Curfew had been instituted, and homes randomly entered and searched in the middle of the night. Every known informant in the city, and many of the beggars and rumour mongers as well, had been dragged off to the dungeons and questioned. But whatever else Radburn's men accomplished, they did not learn where the princess was hidden. No matter how much the denizens of the street feared Radburn, they feared the upright man more. Anita heard Hull speaking quietly to Amos. She's a blockade runner called the Sea Swift, and she's well named. There's no faster ship left in the harbour with all the big warships out with Jessup's fleet. You should make good time westward. The prevailing winds are northerly, so you'll have a broad reach most of the way. Amos said, "Trevor, I've sailed the bitter sea a bit. I know how the winds blow this time of year as well as any man." Hull snorted. "Well then, as you say, your men and the prince's gold are all safely aboard, and Radburn's watchdogs don't seem to have a notion. They still watch the wind of dawn like a mouse or a rat hole, but the sea swift is left alone. We've arranged for false papers to be posted with a broker announcing she's for sale. So even if there was no blockade, they'd not imagine she'd be leaving harbour for some time." They reached the docks and hurried along to a waiting longboat. There were muffled noises, and Arthur knew the mockers and Trevor's smugglers were disposing of Radburn's watchmen. Then, to the rear, shouts erupted. The clamour of steel broke the still of the morning, and Arthur heard Hull shout, "To the boat!" The pounding of boots upon the wood of the docks set up a racket as mockers came swarming out of nearby streets, intercepting whoever sought to cut off the escape. They reached the end of the dock and hurried down the ladder to the longboat. Arthur waited at the top of the ladder until Anita was safely down, then turned. As he stepped upon the top rung, he heard the sound of hoofbeats approaching and saw horses crashing through the press of mockers who fell before the onslaught. Riders in the black and gold of Bastira hacked down with swords to break free of those seeking to slow them. Martin shouted from the boat, and Arthur hurried down the ladder. As he reached the boat, a voice from above shouted, "Farewell." Anita looked up and saw Jimmy the Hand hanging over the edge of the dock, a nervous grin on his face. How the boy had managed to join them when everyone thought him safely back at the hiding place, Arthur couldn't guess. Seeing the unarmed boy gave the prince a momentary start. He unbuckled his rapier and tossed it high. Here, use it in good health. As quick as a striking serpent, Jimmy caught the scabbard, then vanished. Sailors pulled hard against the oars, and the boat sped away from the docks. Lanterns appeared upon the wharves as the sound of battle became louder. Even in the pre-dawn hour, many cries of "What passes?" and "Who goes there?" came from those set to guard the ships and cargo in the harbour. Anita watched over his shoulder, trying to see what was occurring behind. More lanterns were being brought, and a fire erupted on the docks. Large bales of something stored under canvas exploded into flames. Those in the boat could now clearly see the fight. Many of the thieves were escaping down city streets or leaping into the icy water of the harbour. Arthur couldn't see the grey-haired figure of Trevor Hull anywhere, or the small one of Jimmy the Hand. Then, clearly. He saw Jocko Radburn dressed in a simple tunic as before. Radburn came to the edge of the dock and watched the retreating boat. He pointed at the fleeing longboat with his sword and shouted something lost in the clamour. Arthur turned and saw Anita sitting opposite him, her hood thrown back, her face clearly visible in the blaze of light from the wharf. Her gaze was caught by the spectacle on shore, and she seemed unaware of her discovery. Arthur quickly pulled her cloak hood about her face, snapping her from her glamour. But he knew the damage was done. He looked back again and saw Radburn ordering his men after the fleeing mockers, retreating down the docks. He stood there alone, then turned away, vanishing in the gloom. By the time the longboat reached the Sea Swift, 
As soon as they were all aboard, Amos's crew cast mooring lines and scrambled aloft to set sails. The Sea Swift began to move from the harbour. The promised gap in the harbour blockade appeared, and Amos set course for it. He was through before any attempt to cut them off could materialise, and suddenly they were outside the harbour in the open sea. Arthur felt a strange elation as it struck him they were free of Crondor. Then he heard Amos swear, "Look!" In the faint light of the false dawn, Arthur saw the dim shape where Amos pointed. The Royal Griffin, the three-masted warship they had seen when coming into the harbour, was at anchor beyond the breakwater, hidden from the view of any in the city. Amos said, "I thought her out with Jessop's fleet. Damn that Radburn for a crafty swine! She'll be on our wake as soon as he can get aboard." He shouted for all sails to be set, and then watched the retreating ship behind. "I'd say a prayer to Ruth, your Highness." If we can steal enough time before she gets under way, we may still be free. But we'll need all the good fortune the Lady of Luck can spare. The morning was clear and cold. Amos and Vasco watched the crew work with approval. The less experienced men had been replaced by men hand-picked by Trevor Hull. They did their work quickly and well, and the Sea Swift raced westward. Anita had been shown to a cabin below. And Arthur and Martin stood on deck with Amos. The lookout reported the horizon clear. Amos said, "It's a close thing, Highness. If they've gotten that brute of a ship under way as quickly as possible, we've only stolen an hour or two on them. Their captain may choose the wrong course, but seeing as we're trying to stay free of Jessop's sea ambush, they're a good bet to follow close to the Keshian coast and risk running into a Keshian warship rather than losing us." I'll not feel comfortable until we're two days free of pursuit. But even if they started at once, they'll only make up a small distance each hour. So until we know for certain they have us in sight, we'd all do with a bit of rest. Go below, and I'll call you should anything occur. Arthur nodded and left. Martin followed. He bid Martin a good rest and watched as the huntmaster entered the cabin he shared with Vasco. Arthur entered his own cabin and stopped when he saw Anita sitting on his bunk. Slowly he closed the door and said, "I thought you were asleep in your own cabin." She shook her head slightly. Then suddenly she was across the short space separating them, her head buried against his chest. Sobs shook her as she said, "I've tried to be brave, Arthur, but I have been so frightened." He stood there. Awkwardly for a moment, then gently placed his arms around her. The self-reliant pose had crumbled, and Arthur now realised how young she was. Her court training and manners had served her well in maintaining poise among the rough company of the mockers over the month, but her mask could no longer withstand the pressure. He stroked her hair and said, "You'll be fine." He made other reassuring sounds, not aware of what he was saying, finding her closeness disturbing. She was young enough to make him judge her still a girl, but old enough to make him doubt that judgment. He had never been able to banter lightly with the young women of the court like Roland, preferring a straightforward conversation, which seemed to leave the ladies cold. And he had never commanded their attention the way Liam had. With his blond good looks and his laughing easy manner, on the whole, women made him uncomfortable, and this woman or girl, he couldn't decide which, more than usual. When the tears subsided, he ushered her to the single chair in the cramped cabin and sat upon the bunk. She sniffed once, then said, "I'm sorry. This is so unseemly." Suddenly, Arthur laughed. "What a girl you are!" He said with genuine affection, "Were I in your place, smuggling myself from the palace, hiding amid cutthroats and thieves, dodging Radburn's weasels and all, I'd have fallen apart long since." She drew a small handkerchief from her sleeve and delicately wiped her nose. Then she smiled at him. "Thank you for saying that, but I think you'd have done better. Martin has told me a lot about you over the last few weeks, and you." A rather a brave man by his accounts. Arthur felt embarrassed by the attention. 
Oh, the, the Huntmaster has a tendency to overboast, he said, knowing it to be untrue, and changed the subject. Amos tells me if we don't sight that ship for two days, we'll have one free. She lowered her eyes. That's good. He leaned forward and brushed a tear from her cheek, then, feeling self-conscious, pulled his hand away. You will be safe with us in Criddy, free from Guy's plottings. My sister will make you a welcome guest in our house. She smiled faintly. Still, I am worried about father and mother. Aretha tried his best to lay her fears to rest. With you safely gone from Crondor, Guy cannot gain by causing your parents harm. He may still force a consent to marry from your father, but Erland could do no harm by giving it now. With you out of reach, it's a hollow betrothal. Before this is all done, we shall have an accounting with dear cousin Guy. She sighed, and her smile broadened. Thank you, Aretha. You have made me feel better. He rose and said, Try to sleep. I'll use your cabin for the time being. She smiled as she went to his bunk. He closed the door behind him. All at once he felt little need for rest and returned to the deck. Amos stood by the helmsman, eyes fixed astern. Aretha came to stand at his side. Amos said, There, on the horizon. Can you see it? Aretha squinted and made out a faint white speck against the blue of the sky. Radburn. Amos spat over the transom. My guess. Whatever start we've had is being slowly eaten away. But a stern chase is a long chase, as the saying goes. If we can keep far enough ahead for the rest of the day, we might slip them at night. If there's enough cloud cover so the moons don't mark our passage. Aretha said nothing watching the faint speck in the distance. Throughout the day they had watched the pursuing ship grow slowly in size. At first the tiny speck grew with maddening slowness, but now with alarming speed. Aretha could see the sails clearly defined, no longer a simple blur of white, and he could see a hint of a black speck at the masthead, undoubtedly Guy's banner. Amos regarded the setting sun directly ahead of the fleeing Sea Swift, then watched the following ship. He shouted to the watch aloft, Can you mark her? The lookout cried down, Three-masted warship, Captain! Amos looked at Aretha. It's the Royal Griffin. She'll overtake us at sundown. If we had but ten more minutes or some weather to hide in, or she was just a trifle slower. What can you do? Little. In a broad reach she's faster. Fast enough that we can't shake her with any sort of fancy sailing. If I tried to turn a beam reach just as she came near, I could put a bit of space between us, for we'd both lose speed, but she'd fall off faster for a time. Then as soon as they trimmed sails, they'd overhaul us. But that'd send us southward, and there are some fairly nasty shoals and reefs along this stretch of coast, not far from here. It'd be chancy. No. She'll come in somewhat to the windward. When she's alongside, her taller masts will cut out our wind, and we'll slow enough for them to board without so much as a by your leave. Aretha watched the closing ship for another half hour. Martin came on deck and watched as the distance between the two ships shrank by a few feet each minute. Amos held the ship tight to the wind, driving her to the limit of her speed, but still the other closed. Damn, said Amos, nearly spitting from frustration. If we were running east, we'd lose them in the dark, but westward will be outlined against the evening sky for some time after the sun sets. They'll still be able to see us when we'll be blind to them. The sun sank, and the chase continued. As the sun neared the horizon, an angry red ball above the black-green sea, the warship followed by less than a thousand yards. Amos said, They might try to foul the rigging or sweep the decks clear with those oversized crossbows, but with the girl aboard, Radburn might not risk it for fear of injuring her. Nine hundred, 
800 yards, the Royal Griffin came on rolling inexorably toward them. Aretha could see figures, small silhouettes in the rigging, black against sails turned blood red by the setting sun. When the pursuing ship was 500 years behind, the lookout shouted, Fog! Amos looked up. Where are we? South by west, a mile or more. Amos sped for the bow, and Aretha followed. In the distance they could see the sun setting, while off to the left a hazy white band stretched across the top of the Black Sea. Gods! shouted Amos. We have a chance! Amos shouted for the helmsman to come to a southwest heading, then sprinted for the stern, Aretha behind him by a step. When they reached the stern, they saw the turn had halved the distance between the ships. Amos said, Martin, can you mark their helmsman? Martin squinted, then said, It's a bit gloomy, but he's not a difficult mark. Amos said, See if you can take his mind off holding course. Martin uncovered his ever-present bow and strung it. He drew out a cloth-yard shaft and sighted on the pursuing ship. He waited, shifting weight to compensate for the rolling of the ship, then let fly. Like an angry bird, the arrow arched over the water, clearing the stern of the following ship. Martin watched the shaft's flight, then quickly hummed an ah to himself. In a single fluid motion he drew out another arrow, fitted it to the bowstring, pulled and released. It followed the path of the first, but instead of clearing the rear of the other ship, struck in the transom quivering mere inches from the helmsman's head. From the Sea Swift, they could see the Royal Griffin's helmsman dive for the deck, releasing the tiller. The warship swung over and began to fall away. Martin said, A little gusty for fine shooting, and sent another arrow to strike within inches of the first, keeping the tiller unmanned. Slowly, the distance between the ships began to widen, and Amos turned to his crew. Pass the word. When I give the order for silence... Any man who drops so much as a whisper is fishbait. The warship wobbled behind a minute, then swung back on course. Martin said, Looks like they'll keep a little less broad to us, Amos. I can't shoot through sails. No, but if you'd oblige me by keeping those lads in the bow away from their ballista, I'd be thankful. I think you irritated Radburn. Martin and Aretha saw the ballista crew readying their weapons. The Huntmaster sent a flurry of arrows at the pursuing ship's bow, one arrow following the last before it was halfway to the target. The first struck a man in the leg, felling him, and the other men dove for cover. Fog dead ahead, Captain, came the shout from above. Amos turned to the helmsman. Hard to port! The Sea Swift angled to the south. The Royal Griffin came hard after, now less than four hundred yards behind. As they changed course, the wind died. Approaching the fog bank, Amos said to Aretha, The winds fall off to less than a bilious fart in there. I'm reefing sails so the sounds of flapping canvas doesn't give us away. Abruptly, they entered a wall of grey, murky fog, quickly becoming black as the sun sank over the horizon. As soon as the warship vanished from sight, Amos said, Reef sails! The crew hauled in sails, quickly slowing the ship. Then Amos said, Hard to starboard, and pass the word for silence. Suddenly, the ship became graveyard quiet. Amos turned to Aretha and whispered, There's currents here running to the west. We'll let them carry us away from here, and hope Radburn's captain is a kingdom seaman. Tiller to midships, he whispered to the helmsman. To Vasco he said, Pass the word to lash down the yards, and those aloft are to remain motionless. Suddenly, Aretha became aware of the quiet. After the clamour of the chase, with the fresh north wind blowing, the ropes and sheets singing in the yards, the canvas snapping constantly, this muffled fog bank was unnaturally silent. An occasional groan of a yard moving or the snap of a rope were the only sounds in the murk. 
fear dragged the minutes out in the seemingly endless vigil. Then, like an alarm ringing out, they heard voices and the sounds of a ship. Creaking yards and the snap of canvas as it moved in the faint wind echoed from all quarters. Aratha couldn't see anything for minutes, until a faint glow pierced through the murk to the rear, passing from northeast to southwest, lanterns from the pursuing Royal Griffin. Every man aboard the Sea Swift on deck and above stayed at his station, afraid to move for the noise that would carry over the water like a clarion. In the distance they could hear a shout from the other ship, Quiet, damn it! We can't hear them for our own noise! Then it was suddenly still, save for the rippling of canvas and ropes from the Royal Griffin. Time passed without measure as they waited in the blackness. Then came a hideous grinding sound, ringing like a thunder peal, a tearing, cracking shriek of wood being crushed. Instantly the cries of men could be heard, shouts of panic. Amos turned to the others, half seen in the darkness. They have shoaled out. From the sound they've torn the hull right from the under. They're dead men. He ordered the helm put over to the northwest, away from the shoals and reefs, as sailors hurriedly set sail. A bad way to die, said Aratha. Martin shrugged, half lit by the lanterns being brought up on deck. Is there a good way? I've seen worse. Aratha left the quarter-deck, the faint, pitiful cries of the drowning men still carrying across the water, a grisly counterpoint to Vasco's more mundane shout to open the galley. He closed the door to the companionway and shut out those unhappy sounds. He quietly opened the door to his cabin and saw Anita lying asleep in the faint light of a shuttered candle. Her red-brown hair looked nearly black as it lay spread about her head. He started to close the door when he heard her say, Aratha? He stepped in, finding her watching him in the dim light. He sat on the edge of the berth. Are you well? he asked. She stretched and nodded. I've been sleeping soundly. Her eyes widened. Is everything all right? She sat up, bringing her face close to his. He reached out and put his arms around her, holding her close. Everything is fine. We're safe now. She sighed as she rested her head on his shoulder. Thank you for everything, Aratha. He said nothing, suddenly caught up in strong emotion, a protective feeling, a need to keep Anita from harm's way, to care for her. For long moments they sat this way. Then Aratha regained control over his surging feelings. Pulling away a little, he said, You'd be hungry, I'd think. She laughed an honestly merry sound. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm famished. He said, I'll have something sent down, though it will be plain fare, I'm afraid, even compared to what you were given by the mockers. Anything. He went on deck and ordered a seaman to the galley to fetch something for the princess, then returned to find her combing her hair. I must look a mess, she said. Aratha suddenly found himself fighting the urge to grin. He didn't know why, but he was inexplicably happy. Not at all, he said. You look quite nice, actually. She stopped her combing, and Aratha marvelled at how she looked so young one minute, so womanly the next. She smiled at him. I remember sneaking a peek at you during Father's court dinner when you were last in Crondor. At me? What in heaven's name for? She seemed to ignore the question. I thought you looked nice then as well, though a bit stern. There was a boy there who held me up to see. He was with your father's party. I've forgotten his name, but he said he was apprenticed to a magician. Aratha's smile faded. That was Pug. Whatever happened to him? He was lost in the first year of the war. She put aside her comb. I'm sorry. He was kind to a bothersome child. He was a kind lad, given to doing brave things, and he was very special to my sister. 
She grieved for a long time when he was lost. Fighting back a gloomy mood, he said, "Now, why did a princess of Crondor want to sneak a look at a distant and rural cousin?" Anita watched Aratha for a long moment, then said, "I wanted to see you because our fathers thought it likely we would marry." Aratha was stunned. It took all his control to retain his composure. He pulled over the single chair and sat. Anita said. Didn't your father ever mention it to you? For want of anything clever to say, Aratha merely shook his head. Anita nodded. I know the war and all. Things did get quite frantic soon after you left for Rilanon. Aratha swallowed hard, finding his mouth suddenly dry. Now, what is this about our father's plans for our marriage? Aratha looked at Anita. Her green eyes flickering with reflected candlelight and something else. Matters of state, I'm afraid. Father wanted my claim to the throne bolstered, and Liam's too dangerous a match, being the older. You'd be ideal for the king; would not likely object, or wouldn't have then, I guess. Now, with Guy set upon having me, I suppose the king is in agreement. Arthur became suddenly irritated, though he wasn't certain why. And I suppose we're not being consulted in the matter," his voice rose. "Please, it's not my doing. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to offend you. It's only I'd never given much thought to marriage, and certainly not for reasons of state." The wry grin reappeared. That is usually the province of eldest sons. We second-born, as a rule, are left to get by as best we can. An old widowed countess or a, a rich merchant's daughter. He tried to make light of it, a rich merchant's beautiful daughter, if we're lucky, which we usually are not. He couldn't manage a light tone and sat back. Finally, he said, "Anita, you will stay at Criddy as long as need be. It, it may prove dangerous because of the Sirani for a time, but we'll see that through somehow. Send you down to Cast, perhaps. When this war is over, you'll go home in safety." I promise you, and never, never shall anyone force you to do anything against your will. The conversation was interrupted by a knock on the door, and a seaman entered with a steaming bowl of chowder, hard bread, and salted pork on a platter. As the seaman placed the food on the table and poured a cup of wine, Aratha watched Anita. When the sailor was gone, Anita began to eat. Arthur spoke of little things with Anita, finding himself once more captivated by the girl's open, appealing manner. When he finally bade her good night and closed the door, he was abruptly aware the idea of a state marriage was causing him only a little discomfort. He went up on deck. The fog had lifted, and once more they were running before a light breeze. He watched the stars above and. For the first time in years, whistled a happy air. Near the helm, Martin and Amos shared a wine skin and spoke low. The prince seems unusually cheerful tonight," said Amos. Martin blew a puff of smoke from a pipe, which was quickly carried away on the wind. And it's a good bet he's not even aware why he feels so cheerful. Anita's young. But not so young, he'll be able to ignore her attentions for very long. If she's made up her mind, and I think she has, she'll have him snared within the year, and he'll be glad to be caught. Amos laughed. Though it will be some time before he owns up to it, I'm willing to wager a young Roland is hauled up before the altar sooner than Anita. Martin shook his head. That's no wager. Roland's been caught for years. Anita has some work to do yet. You've never been in love, then, Martin. Martin said, "No, Amos. Foresters, like sailors, make poor husbands. Never at home long, and spending days, even weeks, alone tends to make them a, a brooding, solitary lot. You." Not so as you'd notice," Amos sighed. "The older I get, the more I wonder what I've missed. 
But would you change anything? With a chuckle, Amos said, Probably not, Martin. Probably not. As the ship put in at the quayside, Fannin and Garden dismounted. Aratha led Anita down the gangway and introduced her to the swordmaster of Criddy. We've no carriages in Criddy, Highness, Fannin said to her. But I'll have a cart sent for at once. It's a long walk to the castle. Anita smiled. I can ride, Master Fannin. Any horse that's not too spirited will do. Fannin ordered two of his men to ride to the stable and bring one of Carline's palfreys with a proper side saddle. Aratha asked, "What news?" Fannin led the prince off a short distance and said, "A late thaw in the mountains, Highness. So there has been no major Surani movement as yet. A few of the smaller garrisons have been raided, but there is nothing to indicate a spring offensive here. Perhaps they'll move against your father." I hope you're right. The father has received most of the Crondorian garrison. He quickly outlined what had occurred in Crondor, and Fannin listened closely. You did well not sailing for your father's camp. I think you judged things correctly. Nothing could prove more disastrous than a major Surani offensive against Duke Boric's position as he was marshalling to march against Guy. Let us keep this to ourselves for a time. Your father will learn what has occurred soon enough. But the more time it takes for him to discover Guy's treachery, the more chance we have of keeping the Sirani at bay another year. Aratha looked troubled. This cannot continue much longer, Fannin. We must soon see an end to this war. He turned for a moment and saw townspeople begin to gawk at the princess. Still, we at least have a little time to come up with something to counter the Sirani if we can but think of it. Fannin thought for a moment. Started to speak, then stopped. His expression became grim, almost painful. Aratha said, "What is it, Swordmaster?" I have grave and sorry news to greet you with, Highness. Squire Roland is dead. Aratha was rocked by the news. For a brief moment, he wondered if Fannin had made some tasteless joke, for his mind would not accept what he had heard. Finally, he said. How? News came three days ago from Baron Talbot, who is most sorely grieved. The squire was killed in a Sirani raid. Aratha looked at the castle upon the hill. Carline, as you would expect, she weeps, but she also bears up well. Aratha fought back a choking sensation. His face was a grim mask as he moved back to Anita, Amos, and Martin. Word had spread that the Princess of Crondor was upon the wharf. The soldiers who had ridden with Fannin and Gardan formed a quiet ring around her, keeping the townsfolk at a respectful distance, while Aratha shared the sad news with Amos and Martin. Soon the horses arrived, and they were in the saddle, riding toward the castle. Aratha spurred his horse on and was dismounted before the others had entered the courtyard. Most of the household staff awaited him, and with little ceremony he shouted to Halfskull Samuel, "The Princess of Crondor is guesting with us. See, rooms are made ready. Escort her to the great hall and tell her I will join her shortly." He hurried through the entrance of the keep, past guards who snapped to attention as their prince strode by. He reached Carline's suite and knocked upon the door. "Who is it?" came the soft voice from within. Aratha. The door flew open, and Carline rushed into her brother's arms, holding him tightly. Oh, I'm so glad you are back! You don't know how glad. She stepped back and looked at him. I'm sorry. I was going to ride down to meet you, but I just couldn't seem to gather myself together. Fannin just told me. I am so very sorry. She regarded him calmly, her face set in an expression of acceptance. She took him by the hand. And led him to her chambers, sitting upon a divan. She said, "I always knew it might happen. It was the silliest thing, you know." Baron Talbot wrote a very long letter. The poor man, he saw so little of his son and was stricken. Tears began to come, and she swallowed hard, looking away from Aratha. Roland died. You don't have to tell me. She shook her head. It's all right. It hurts. Again, tears came, but she spoke through them. 
Oh, it hurts, but I'll get over the pain. Roland taught me that, Aretha. He knew there were going to be risks, and should he die, I'd have to keep living my own life. He taught me well, I think, because I finally learned how much I loved him and told him so. I gained the strength to cope with his loss. Roland died trying to save some farmer's cows. Through the tears she smiled. Isn't that like him? He spent the entire winter building up the fort, and then the first time there's trouble it's some hungry Sirani trying to steal some skinny cows. Roland went riding out with his men to chase them away, but got shot by an arrow. He was the only one hurt, and he died before they could get him back to the fort. She sighed long. He was such a jester at times, I almost think he did it on purpose. She began to weep, and Aratha watched in silence. Quickly she regained control over herself and said, No good comes from this, you know. She rose and looked out a window and said quietly, Damn this stupid war. Aratha came over to her, holding her tightly for a moment. Damn all wars, he said. For a few more minutes they were quiet. Then she said, Now tell me, <clears throat> what news from Crondor? Aratha gave her a brief account of his experiences in Crondor, half his attention on her. She seemed much more accepting of Roland's loss than she had been when grieving for Pug. Aratha shared her pain, but also felt certain she would be all right. He was pleased to discover just how much Carline had matured over the last few years. When he finished telling of Anita's rescue, Carline interrupted. Anita, the Princess of Crondor is here. Aratha nodded, and Carline said, I must look a fright, and you bring the Princess of Crondor here. Aratha, you are a monster. She rushed to a polished metal mirror and fussed with her face, daubing it with a damp cloth. Aratha smiled. Under the mantle of mourning, his sister still showed a spark of her natural spirit. Combing her hair out, Carline turned to face her brother. Is she pretty, Aratha? Aratha's wry smile was replaced by a grin. Yes, I, I'd say she's pretty. Caroline studied Aratha's face. I can see I'll have to get to know her well. She put down her comb and straightened her gown. Extending her hand to him, she said, Come, we can't keep your young lady waiting. Hand in hand, they left the room and walked down the stairs to the main hallway to welcome Anita to Criddy. Chapter 26 Great One An abandoned house overlooked the city. The site upon which the house had been constructed had once seen the lights of a great family manse. On top of the highest of many rolling hills surrounding the city of Ontoset, it was considered the choicest view of the city and the sea beyond. The family had come to low estate, the result of being on the losing side in one of the Empire's many subtle but lethal political struggles. The house had fallen into disrepair, and the property been ignored, for while it was a fine a building site as any found in the area, the association of ill fortune with the property was too real for the superstitious Tsirani. One day news reached the city that some cooler herders had awakened to the sight of a single black-robed figure walking up the hill toward the old house. They all acted with haste to avoid him in the socially correct fashion for their station. They stayed within the area, tending their animals, the source of their meagre income, cooler wool, when, near midday, they heard a great noise, as if the heavens above them had erupted with the grandfather of all thunder peals. The herd scattered in terror, some running up the hill. The herders were no less terrified, but, true to their trade, they put aside their fears and chased after the animals. One herder, a man named Xanathis, came to the top of the once famous hill to be greeted by the sight of the black-robed magician he had seen earlier, standing upon the crest. Where the run-down great house had stood moments before, a large patch of smoking land was laid bare several feet below the level of the grass that surrounded it. 
Fearing he had intruded upon some business of a great one, Xanathis started to back away, hoping to avoid detection, for the great one's back was to the herder and his cowl was drawn over his head. As he took the first step backward, the magician turned to face him, fixing him with a pair of unsettlingly deep brown deep eyes. The herder lowered himself as custom demanded on his knees, eyes cast downward. He did not fully abase himself, for he was a free man, and while not a noble, he was head of his family. Stand up, the magician ordered. Slightly confused, Xanathis rose, eyes still cast downward. Look at me. He looked up and found the face in the cowl regarding him closely. A beard as dark as the eyes framed a fair face, a fact that added to Xanathis's discomfort, as only slaves wore beards. The magician smiled at this obvious confusion and walked around the herder, inspecting him. The magician saw a man tall for a Sirani, an inch or two taller than his own five feet eight. His skin was dark, like unclouded chocha or coffee. His eyes were black, and his hair was black as well, save where it was shot with white. The herder's short green robe revealed the powerful build of a former soldier, a fact the magician gleaned from the man's erect posture and several scars. Past fifty, he looked, but still capable of the strenuous life of a herder. Though shorter, this man resembled Gardan of Criddy slightly. Your name? asked the magician, as he came round to stand before the herder. Xanathis answered, his voice betraying his unease. The magician then startled him by asking, Would you agree that this is a good place for a home, herdsman? Confused, Xanathis stammered, If... if it... is your will, great one. The magician snapped, Ask not what I think, I ask your thoughts. Xanathis could barely hide his anger at his own shame. Great ones were sacrosanct, and to be false with one was to do a dishonour. Forgive me, great one. It is said this spot is ill-favoured by the gods. And who is it that says so? The sharpness in the magician's voice caused the older man's head to snap up as if he had been struck. His eyes hid little of his anger, but his voice remained calm as he said, Those who live in the city, great one, and others about the countryside. The herdsman met the magician's gaze and held it. The corners of the magician's eyes wrinkled in mirth, and his mouth turned up a little, but his voice still rang out. But not you, herder. I was fifteen years a soldier, great one. I have found it often the case that the gods favour those who take care of their own welfare. The magician smiled at this, though it was not an entirely warm expression. A man of self-reliance. Good. I am glad we are of a like mind, for I plan to build my estate here as I have a taste for the view of the sea. A certain stiffness of posture in the herder's stance at this remark caught the magician's notice, and he said, have I your approval, Xanathis of Ontoset? Xanathis shifted his weight from one foot to the other, then said, The Great One jests with me. My approval or disapproval is of no consequence, I am certain. True. But you still avoid my question. Have I your approval? Xanathis's shoulders sagged a little as he said, I will have to move my herds. Great one, that is all. I mean no disrespect. Tell me of this house, Sanathis, that stood here before this day. It was the home of the Lord of the Almach, Great One. He backed the wrong cousin against Almecho when the office of warlord was contested. He shrugged. I was once a patrol leader of that house. I was a prideful man which limited my advancement as a soldier. My lord gave me permission to leave his service and marry, so I took over my wife's father's herds. Had I stayed a soldier, 
I would now be a slave, dead, or a grey warrior. He glanced out toward the sea. What more would you know, great one? The magician said, You may keep your herds upon this hill, Xanathis. The grazers keep the grass neat, and I have no liking for unkempt grounds. Just keep them away from the main house where I will be working, else I cook one for my supper now and again. Without another word, the magician pulled a device from within his robe and activated it. A strange hum was emitted for a moment, then the black-robed figure disappeared with a small popping sound. Xanathis stood quietly for a few minutes, then resumed his search of his lost animals. Later that night around a campfire, he told his family and the other herders of his meeting with the Great One. None doubted his word, for whatever his other faults might be, Xanathis was not one to expand upon the truth, but they were amazed. And they never quite got used to one other thing. Over the following months, while a new great house was being built, one or another of the herdsmen would occasionally catch sight of Xanathis engaged in conversation with a great one atop the hill, while Cooler grazed below them. Now a new and strange house stood atop the hill. It was the source of both some speculation and a little envy. The speculation was about its owner, the strange great one. The envy was over its design and construction, something of a revolution in Sirani architecture. Gone was the traditional three-storey open centre building. In its place was a long single-storey building, with several smaller ones attached to it by covered walkways. It was a rambling affair, with many small gardens and waterways winding between the structures. Its construction was as much a sensation as its design, for it consisted mainly of stone, with fired brick tiles upon the roof. Some speculated that it offered cool protection during the heat of summer. Two other facts added to the fascination evidenced over the house and its owner. First was the manner in which the project had been commissioned. The magician had first appeared in Ontoset one day at the home of Tumakel, the richest moneylender in the city. He appropriated over 30,000 imperials in funds and left the moneylender stricken over his loss of liquidity. This was Milimba's method of dealing with the Sirani passion for bureaucracy. Any merchant or tradesman commanded to render service to a great one was forced to petition the imperial treasury for repayment. This resulted in slow delivery of ordered materials, less than enthusiastic service, and resentment. Milimba simply paid in advance and left it to the moneylender, who was better able to account for his losses than most other merchants, by nature of his bookkeeping, to recover from the treasury. The second fact was the style of decoration. Instead of the garishly bold wall paintings, the building was left mostly unpainted, except for an occasional landscape in muted natural colours. Many fine young artists were employed on this project, and when it was done, the demand for their services was phenomenal. Within a month, a new wave in Sirani art was in progress. Fifty slaves now worked the outlying fields, all free to come and go as they wished, dressed in the garb of their homeworld, Midkemia. All had been taken from the slave market one day, without payment, by the Great One. Many travellers to Ontoset would make an afternoon of climbing the hills nearby to see the house. From a respectable distance, of course, the herder, Xanathis, was questioned many times about the strange Great One who lived in that house. But the former soldier said nothing, only smiling a great deal. The belief that the current great rift to Midkemia is controllable is only partially correct. Milimba paused, allowing his scribe to finish copying the dictation. It can be stated that rifts may be established without the release of destructive energies associated with their accidental creation, either through poorly affected magic spells or by the proximity of too many unstable magic devices. 
Millenbaugh's research into the special aspects of rift energies would be added to the Assembly's archives when completed. Like other projects he had read of in the archives, research into rifts had shown what Millenbaugh took to be a grievous flaw in most of his brother magician's work. In general, projects were not carried through to completion, showing a lack of thoroughness. Once the procedure to establish rifts safely had been developed, further research into their nature had been halted. Continuing, he dictated, What is lacking in the concept of control is the ability to select the terminus of contact, the ability to target the rift. It has been shown by the appearance of the ship carrying Fanatha on the shores of Criddy, on the world of Midchemia, that a certain affinity between a newly forming rift and an existing one is probable. However, as shown by further testing, this affinity is limited, such limits being as yet not fully understood. While there is increased probability of a second rift appearing within a regional proximity to the first, it is by no means a certainty. When the scribe had caught up, Millenba added, Also there is a question of why rifts show certain inconsistencies. Size appears relative to the energy employed in their formation, but other characteristics seem without pattern. Some rifts are single direction. Millenba had lost several valuable devices discovering this fact, while others allow movement in two directions. And then there are bonded pairs, two single-direction rifts that appear simultaneously, both allowing one-way travel between origin and terminus. Though they may appear miles apart, they are related. Millenbaugh's narration was interrupted by the sound of the chimes announcing the arrival of someone from the assembly. He dismissed his scribe and made his way to the pattern room. As he walked, he mused on the real reason for his submersion in research over the last two months. He was avoiding the decision he must soon make, whether or not to return to the Shinzawai estate for Katala. Millenbaugh knew there was a chance she had become the wife of another, for their separation had been nearly five years, and she would have no reason to think he'd ever be returning. But time and training had done nothing to dull his feelings toward her. As he reached the transporting room with its tiled pattern, he made his decision. Tomorrow he would go to see her. As he entered the room, he saw Hotcher Pepper step off the pattern in the tile floor. Ah, said the plump magician. There you are. Since it has been two weeks since I last saw you, I decided to pay a visit. I'm glad to see you. I have been deeply involved in study and could do with a short respite. They walked from the room into one of the several gardens nearby. Hotcher Pepper said, I've been meaning to ask you, what is the significance of the pattern you chose? I don't recognise it. Millimber said, It's a stylized recreation of a pattern I once saw in a fountain. Three dolphins. Dolphins? Millimber explained about the Midkemian sea mammals while they seated themselves upon cushions between a pair of dwarf fruit trees. Why the dolphins from that fountain? I don't know. A compulsion, perhaps. Also, when I underwent my final testing on the tower, I saw something that didn't register for a month or two after. What does one have to do with the other? In the representation of the final challenge to the stranger, do you remember a single brown-robed magician who bent the rift to keep Kelowan from entering the enemy's universe? Hotcher Pepper looked thoughtful. I can't say as I do, Millimber. But then the spell used to create that image affects each of us differently. If you compare visions with others, you'll discover a great deal of variation. But at the time of the stranger, we were all black robes. Who could this odd, brown-robed magician be? Millimber said, A man I've met, years ago. Impossible. That scene took place centuries ago. Millimber smiled and said, 
Nevertheless, I have met him. I made my pattern of three dolphins as something of a commemorative to our meeting. How very strange. There has been some speculation on time travel, which would have to be the answer in this case, unless your barbaric mind played false with you upon the tower. He said the last with a smile. Millenbeck clapped his hands, and a servant arrived with a platter of refreshments. The servant, Netoha, at one time had been Hadonra for the family that resided there previously. Millenbeck had found him while securing someone to plant the varieties of vegetation he wanted in his gardens. The man was bold enough to approach, something that singled him out from the common Sirani. Unable to find the work he was trained for since the demise of his employer's estate, Netoha had scratched out a meager living over the years. Milimba had taken him on as much out of sympathy as out of any real need. He had quickly made himself useful in a hundred ways the young magician had never dreamed of, and the relationship was mutually satisfactory. Hodger Pepper took the offered sweets and drink. I have come to tell you some news. There is to be an imperial festival in two months' time with games. Will you come? Milimba found his curiosity piqued. With a wave, he dismissed Netaha. And what makes this festival so special? I can't remember having seen you so animated before. This festival is being given by the warlord in honor of his nephew, the emperor. He has plans for a major new offensive the week before the games, and it is hoped he will announce the success of the campaign. He lowered his voice. It's no secret to those with access to court gossip. He is under a great deal of pressure to justify his conduct of the war before the high council. Rumor has it he has been forced to offer major concessions to the Blue Wheel Party to regain their support in the war. But what will make the games unusual is that the light of heaven will leave his palace of contemplation, breaking with ancient tradition. It would be a proper occasion for you to make some sort of entrance into court society. I'm sorry, Hotcho, Milimba said. I have little desire to attend any festivals. I have been to one earlier this month in Ontoset as part of my studies. The dances are boring, the food tends towards the awful, and the wine is as flat as the speeches. The games are of less interest still. If this is the court society you speak of, then I'll be fine without it. Milumba, there are many holes in your education. Gaining the black robe did not mean instant mastery of our craft. There is quite a bit more involved in protecting the empire than sitting about dreaming up new ways of tossing energy around or creating economic chaos with the local moneylenders. He took another suite and returned to his chiding. There are several reasons you must come with me to the festivities, Milimba. First, you are something of a celebrity to the nobles of the realm. For news of your wondrous house has spread from one corner of the empire to the other, mostly by the aid of those young bandits you paid so well to execute the delicate paintings you love so much. It is now considered the mark of some distinction to have the same sort of work done. And this place, his hand inscribed an arc before them, mock wonder upon his face. Anyone who could be so clever to design such an edifice. Must surely be worthy of attention. His mocking tone vanished as he added, oh, "By the way, this entire bit of nonsense has not been diminished one whit by your mysterious isolation here in the hinterlands. If anything, it has added to your reputation." Now, to more important reasons than social ones, as you no doubt know, there is growing concern that the news from the war is somehow being downplayed. In all these years, there has been little gain, and some talk is going about that the emperor may take a stand against the warlord's policies. If so, he let the thought go unfinished. Milimba was silent for a time. Hotcho, I think it's time that I told you something, and if you feel it's sufficient to warrant my life, then you may return to the assembly and bring charges. Hotcha Pepper was raptly attentive, all quips and sharp remarks put aside. You who trained me 
did your work well, for I am filled with a need to do what is best for the empire. I hold only a little feeling for the land of my birth any more, and you will never know what that signifies. But, in the process of making me what I am, you could never create the love of home within my being that I once felt for my own criddy. What you have created is a man with a strong sense of duty, untempered by any love of that thing he feels duty toward. Hodge Pepper remained silent as the impact of what Millenbe had said penetrated. Then he nodded as Millenbe continued. I may be the greatest threat to the Empire since the stranger invaded your skies. For if I become involved with its politics, I will be justice without mercy. I have known of the factions within the parties, the crossover of families from one party to another, and the consequences of those acts. Do you think because I sit atop my hill in the Eastlands, I am unaware of the shifts and stirrings of the political animals in the capital? Of course not. If the Blue Wheel Party collapses, and its members realign with the War Party or the Imperials, every street merchant in Ontoset is speculating on the news the next day in the marketplace. I know what is taking place as well as any other who is not directly involved. And in the month since I came to live here, I have come to one conclusion. The Empire is slowly killing itself. The older magician said nothing for a moment, then asked, Have you wondered at all why our system is such that we are killing ourselves? Millimba stood and paced a little. Of course. I am studying it and have chosen to wait before I act. I need more time to understand the history you taught me so well. But I do have some speculations of sorts on what's wrong, and they will give me a starting point. He inclined his head, asking if he should go on. Hotcher Pepper nodded that he should. It seems to me there are several major problems here, problems I can only guess at in terms of impact upon the Empire. First, he held up his index finger, those in power are more concerned with their own grandeur than with the well-being of the Empire. And as they are those who appear to the casual eye to be the Empire, it's an easy thing not to notice. What do you mean? the older magician asked. When you think of the Empire, what comes to mind? A history of armies warring across the lands? Or the rise of the Assembly? Perhaps you think of a chronicle of rulers. Whatever it is, most likely the single most obvious truth is overlooked. The Empire is all those who live within its borders, from the nobles to the lowest servant, even the slaves who work the fields. It must be seen as a whole, not as being embodied by some small but visible part, such as the warlord or the high council. Do you understand that? Hotcher Pepper looked troubled. I'm not sure, but I think... Go on. If that is true, then consider the rest. Second, there must never be a time when the need for stability overrules the need for growth. But we have always grown, objected Hotcher Pepper. Not true, countered Millenbe. You have always expanded. And that seems like growth if you don't investigate closely. But while your armies have been bringing new lands into your borders, what has happened to your art, your music, your literature, your research? Even the vaunted assembly does little more than refine that which is already known. You implied earlier that I was wasting my time finding new ways to toss energy around. Well, what's wrong with that? Nothing. But there is something wrong with the type of society that looks upon the new as suspect. Look around you, Hotcher. Your artists are in shock because I described what I had seen in paintings in my youth, and a few young artists became excited. Your musicians spend all their time learning the old songs perfectly to the note, and no one composes new ones, just clever variations on melodies that are centuries old. No one creates new epics, they only retell old ones. Hotcho, 
You are a people stagnating. This war is but one example. It is unjustified, fought from habit to keep certain groups in power, to reap wealth for those already wealthy, and to play the game of the council. And the cost. Thousands of lives are wasted each year. The lives of those who are the empire, its own citizens. The empire is a cannibal devouring its own people. The older magician was disturbed by what he heard. In total contradiction with what he believed, he saw a vibrant, energetic, alive culture. Third, said Melember, if my duty is to serve the empire. And the social order of the empire is responsible for its own stagnation. Then it is my duty to change that social order, even if I must destroy it. Now Hotcher Pepper was shocked. Millenbeer's logic was without fault, but the suggested solution was potentially fraught with danger to everything Hotcher Pepper knew and revered. I understand what you say, Millenbeer. But what you speak of is too difficult to contemplate all at once. Millenbeer's voice took on reassuring tones. I do not mean to imply that the destruction of the present social order is the only solution, Hotcho. I use that to shock and to drive home a point. That is what much of my research is about: not only the visible mastery of energy, but also investigations into the nature of the Tsirani people and the empire. Believe me, I am more than willing to spend as much time on the question as I need. I plan on spending some time in the archives. Hotcho Pepper's brows furrowed, and he studied his younger friend's face. Be warned. You may find some unsettling things in those archives. As I said, your education is not complete. Millenbeer let his voice drop. I have already found some unsettling things, Hotcho. Much of what is held to be common truth by the nations is based upon falsehoods. Hotcho Pepper became concerned. There are things that are forbidden for any but members of the assembly to know, Millenbeer. And even then, it is unwise to speak about them to even one of your brethren. He glanced away, thinking, then said, "Still, when you have finished prowling around in those musty old vaults, if you need to discuss your findings, I'll be a willing ear." He looked back at his friend. "I like you, and think you're a refreshing change of pace for us, Millenbeer." But there are many who would rather see you dead as not. Don't go chattering on to anyone but Shimon or myself about this social research you're doing. Agreed. But when I reach a judgment as to what must be done, I shall act. Hotcho Pepper stood, an expression of concern on his face. It is not that I disagree with you, my friend. It is simply that I must have time to assimilate what you have said. I could only speak the truth to you, Hotcho, no matter how disturbing. Hotcho Pepper smiled. A fact I appreciate, Millenbeer. I must spend some time considering the proposition. Some of his usual humour crept back into his voice. Perhaps you will accompany me to the assembly. You have been absent much of the time with this. House building and all, you would do well to put in an appearance now and again. Millenbeer smiled at his friend. Of course, he indicated that Hotcho Pepper should lead the way to the pattern. As they walked, Hotcho Pepper said, "If you wish to study our culture, Millenbeer, I still suggest you come to the Imperial Festival. There will be more political activity in the seats of the arena in that one day." And could be observed in a month in the High Council. Millenbeer turned toward Hotcher Pepper. Perhaps you're right. I shall think about it. When they appeared on the pattern of the assembly, Shimon was standing close by. He bowed slightly in greeting and said, 
Welcome. I was about to go looking for you two. Hot Chip Pepper said with mild amusement, "Are we so vital to the business of the assembly that you must be sent to fetch us back?" Shimon inclined his head a little. Perhaps, but not today. I merely thought you would find the business at hand interesting. Milumba asked, "What is happening?" The warlord has sent messages to the assembly, and Hodiku raises questions about them. We best hurry, for they are nearly ready to begin. They walked quickly to the central hall of the assembly and entered. Arrayed about a large open area was an amphitheatre of open benches. They took seats in a lower row. Already, several hundred black-robed great ones were in place. In the centre of the floor, they could see Fumita. The one-time brother of the Shinzawai Lord, standing alone, he would be presiding over the business of the day. The presidency was allotted by chance to one of those in attendance. Milumba had seen Fumita in the assembly only twice since being brought here. Shimon said, "It's been nearly three weeks since I saw you in the assembly, Milumba. I must apologise, but I've been busy getting my home in order. So I hear." You're something of a source of gossip in the imperial court. I hear the warlord himself is anxious to meet you. Perhaps some day. Hot Chip Pepper said to Shimon, "Who can understand such a man, taking to building such a strange home?" He turned to Milumba. Next, you'll be telling me that you're taking a wife. Milumba laughed. Why, Hot Chip? How did you guess? Hot Chip Pepper's eyes grew wide. You're not. And why shouldn't I, Milumba? It is not a wise course, believe me. To this day, I have regretted my own marriage. Hotcho, I didn't know you were a married man. I choose not to speak of it much. My wife is a fine woman, though given to an overly sharp tongue and scathing wit. In my own home, I am not much more than another servant to be ordered about. That is why I see her only on prescribed holidays. It would be bad for my nerves to see her more often," Shimon said. "Who is your intended, Milumba? A noble daughter? No. She was a slave with me at the Shinzawai estate." Hotcho Pepper mused. "A slave girl. Hmm. That might work out." Milumba laughed, and Shimon chuckled. Several other magicians regarded them with curiosity, for the assembly was not a regular forum for mirth. Fumita held up his hand, and the assembly became quiet. Today, there is a matter being brought before the assembly by Hodiku. A thin, great one with shaved head and hooked nose, walked from his seat in front of Milumba and Hotcho Pepper to the centre of the floor. He surveyed the magicians in the hall, then spoke. I come today, so that I may speak about the empire. It was the formal opening of any business brought before the assembly. I speak for the good of the empire, he added, completing the ritual. I am concerned about the demand made today by the warlord for aid. So he may broaden the war against the Mikedian world. A chorus of jeers and cries of politics and "sit down" erupted from around the room. Soon, Shimon and Hotcha Pepper were on their feet, with others crying, "Let him speak!" Fumita held up a hand for silence, and soon the room quieted. Hodiku continued. We are precedented. Fifteen years ago, the assembly sent an order to the warlord to end the war against the Thuril Confederation. Another magician jumped to his feet. If the Thuril conquest had continued, there would have been too few in the north to repulse the Thun migration that year. It was a clear case of the salvation of the Setak province and the Holy City. Now our borders in the north are secure. The situation is not the same. Arguments erupted over the entire hall, and it took several minutes for Fumita to restore order. 
Hot Chip Pepper rose and said, "I would like to hear Hodiku's reasons for considering this request vital to the security of the Empire. Any magician who is willing is free to work on behalf of the conquest." That is the point," responded Hodiku. There is no reason for any magician who feels this war into another space-time is right and proper for the Empire not to work in support of the conquest. Without the black robes who already served the warlord, the rift would never have been prepared for such an undertaking. It is that he now makes demands of the assembly itself I find objectionable. If five or six magicians choose to serve in the field, even to travelling to this other world to risk their lives in the battle, then it is their own concern. But if one magician responds to this demand without considering the issues, it will appear the assembly is now subject to the will of the warlord. Several magicians applauded this sentiment, and others seemed to weigh its merits. Only a few booed and jeered. Hotcho Pepper stood again. I would like to offer a proposal. I will undertake, on behalf of the assembly, to send a message to the warlord expressing our regret that the assembly, as a body, may not order any magician to perform as requested, but that he is free to seek the services of any magician willing to work on his behalf. A general murmur of approval ran through the room, and Fumita asked. Hotcha Pepper offers a proposition to send a statement of policy to the Warlord on behalf of the Assembly. Does anyone find this objectionable? When no objections were forthcoming, he said, "The Assembly thanks Hotcha Pepper for his wisdom." He paused for a moment, then said, "Another matter needs our attention. The novice Shiro." Has been found lacking in the moral qualities necessary for the greater art. The mind probes reveal that he harbors anti-imperial feelings learned as a youth from his maternal grandmother, a Turil woman. Is the assembly agreed? Hands were raised, and each bore a nimbus of light as the magicians voted: green for life, red for death, and blue for abstention. Millember abstained, but the vote was otherwise unanimous for death. One black robe rose, and Millember knew that within minutes the novice would be stunned senseless, then teleported to the bottom of the lake, where his lifeless body would remain, too cold to rise to the surface. After the meeting broke up, Shimon said, "You should make a point of coming more often, Millember. We hardly see you any more." And you spend too much time alone. Millember smiled. That is true, but I plan to remedy the situation tomorrow. The chime sounded throughout the house, and servants jumped to make ready for the great one's visit. Kamatsu, Lord of the Shinzawai, knew that a great one had struck a chime in the halls of the assembly, willing the sound to come here to announce his imminent appearance. In Kasumi's room, Lori and the elder son of the house sat engrossed in a game of pashawa, played with painted pieces of stiff paper. It was common to alehouses and inns in Midkemia, and was one more detail in the young Surani's drive to master every facet of Midkemian life. Kasumi stood. It is most likely he who once was my uncle. I had best go. Lori smiled. Or could it be that you wish to stem your losses? The Sirani shook his head. I fear I have created a problem in my own house. You were never a good slave, Lori, and if anything, you have grown more intractable. It is a good thing I like you. They both laughed, and the elder son of the house left. A few minutes later, a house slave came running to Lori and informed him that the lord of the house commanded him to come at once. Lori jumped up. More from the slave's obvious agitation than from any inbred obedience, he hurried to the lord's room and knocked on the door jamb. The door slid to one side, and Kasumi held it. Lori stepped through and saw the Shinzawai lord and his guest, and then confusion overtook him. The guest was wearing the black robe of the Surani great ones, but the face was pugs. 
he started to speak, stopped, and started again. Pug. The lord of the house looked outraged at this forward behaviour by the slave, but his nearly voiced command was stopped by the great one. May I have the use of this room for a few minutes, lord? I wish to speak to this slave in private. Kamatsu, lord of the Shinzawai, bowed stiffly. Your will, great one. He left the room with his son behind. He was still in shock over the appearance of the former slave and confused at the conflicts within himself. The great one he was. There could be no thought of fraud. His manner of arrival proved it. But Kamatsu couldn't help feeling that his arrival heralded disaster for the plan he and his son had so carefully nurtured for the last nine years. Milumba spoke. Shut the door, Lorry. Lorry shut it. Then studied his former friend. He looked fit, but vastly changed. His bearing was nearly regal, as if the mantle of power he now wore reflected some inner strength he had lacked before. I, Lorry began, then lapsed into silence, confused about what to say. Finally, he said, "Are you well?" Millenbe nodded. I am well, old friend. Lorry smiled and crossed the room and embraced his friend. Then pushed himself away. Let me look at you. Millenbe smiled. I am called Millenbe, Lorry. The boy you knew as Pug is as dead as last year's flowers. Come sit, and we will talk. They sat at the table and poured two cups of chocha. Lorry sipped at the bitter brew and said, "We heard nothing about you." After the first year, I gave you up for lost. I'm sorry. Millenbe nodded. It's the way of the assembly. As a magician, I'm expected to forego all my former ties except for those that can be maintained in a socially acceptable manner. Being without clan or family, I had nothing to forego. And you were always a poor slave who never knew his place. What better friend for a renegade barbarian magician? Lorry nodded. I'm glad you've returned. Will you stay? Millenbe shook his head. No. I have no place here. Besides, there is work I must be about. I now have an estate of my own near the city of Ontoset. I have come for you, and Katala. If his voice trailed off, as if he were fearful of asking about her. Sensing his distress, Lorry said, "She's still here and has not taken a husband. She would not forget you." He broke into a grin. Gods of me, Kemia! It completely slipped my mind. You would have no way of knowing. What? You have a son. Millenbe sat dumbstruck. A son. Lorry laughed. He was born eight months after you were taken. He's a fine boy, and Katala is a fine mother. Millenbe felt overwhelmed at the news and said, "Please, would you bring her here?" Lorry jumped to his feet. At once, he rushed from the room. Millenbe sat, fighting down the upsurge of emotion. He composed himself, using his magician's skills to relax his mind. The door slid open, and Katala was revealed. Uncertainty on her face. Lorry stood behind, a boy of about four in his arms. Millenbe rose and spread his arms to her. Katala rushed to him, and he nearly cried in his joy. They clung quietly for a moment. Then she murmured, "I thought you'd gone. I hope, but I thought you'd gone." They stood for several minutes, each lost in the pure pleasure of the other's presence, until she pushed herself away. "You must meet your son, Pug." Lorry brought the boy forward. He regarded Millenbe with large brown eyes. He was a well-formed boy with a stronger likeness to his mother, but something in the way he tilted his head made him resemble the boy from Criddy Keep. Katala took him from Lorry and passed him to Millenbe. William, this is your father. The boy seemed to take this in with some scepticism. He ventured a shy smile, but leaned back, keeping his distance. I want down," he said abruptly. Millenbe laughed and put the boy down. He looked at his father, then immediately lost interest in the stranger in black. "Ooh!" he cried, 
and rushed over to play with the Lord of the Shinzawai's shah pieces. Millenbaugh watched him for a moment, then said, "William." Katala stood next to him with her arm around his waist, hugging him as if afraid he would disappear again. Laurie said, "She wanted a Mikemium name for him, Millenba." Katala started. Millenba. It is my new name, love. You must get used to calling me that. She frowned, not entirely pleased with the thought. Millenba. She repeated, testing the sound. She then shrugged. It is a good name. How did he become William? Laurie went over to the boy who was trying to stand the pieces one atop the other and gently took them away. The boy threw him a black look. I want to play, he said indignantly. Laurie picked him up and said, "I gave her a bunch of names and she picked that one." I liked its sound," she said, "William." At the sound of his name, the boy looked at his mother. "I'm hungry." I favoured James or Owen, but she insisted. Laurie said, while the boy tried to wriggle out of his arms. Katala took him. "I must feed him. I'll take him to the kitchen." She kissed Melamba and left the room. The magician stood quietly for a moment. It is all more than I had hoped for. I was afraid she'd have found another. Not that one, Milumba. She would have nothing to do with any of the men who paid court to her, and there were a few. She's a good woman. You need never doubt her. I never will, Laurie. They seated themselves. A discreet cough at the door made them turn. Kamatsu stood at the door. May I enter? Great one. Millenbaugh and Laurie started to rise, and the Lord of the House waved them back into place. Please, stay seated. Kasumi entered behind his father and closed the door. Millenbaugh noticed for the first time that the son of the house was wearing garments that were Midkemian in fashion. He raised an eyebrow but said nothing. The head of the Shinzawai family looked deeply troubled and tried to collect his thoughts. After a few moments, he said. Great one, may I be frank with you? Your arrival today is something unexpected, and the source of some possible difficulty. Please," said Melamba, "I do not intend to cause disruption in your household, Lord. I want only my wife and son, and I will require this slave also." He indicated Laurie. Your will, great one. The woman and the boy should, of course, go with you. But if I may beg of you, please allow the slave to remain. Milumba looked from face to face. The two Shinzawai maintained control, but by the way they glanced from one to the other and at Lori, their distress was poorly hidden. Something had changed here in the last five years. The relationship between the men in the room was not what it should have been between masters and slave. Laurie, Millenbaugh looked at his friend. What is this? Laurie looked at the other two men, then at Millenbaugh. I will have to ask you to promise me something. Kamatsu's shock was signalled by a sharp intake of breath. Laurie, you dare too much. One does not bargain with a great one. His words are as law. Millenba held up a hand. No, let him speak. In imploring tones, Laurie said to his friend, "I know little of these matters, Millenba. You know I have no sense about protocol. I may be violating custom, but I ask you, for the sake of our former friendship, will you keep a trust, and vow to keep what you hear in this room to yourself?" The magician pondered the matter. He could command the Shinzawai Lord to tell all, and the man would, as automatically as a soldier following orders. But his friendship with the troubadour was important to him. I give you my word that I will not repeat what you tell me. Lori gave a sigh and smile, and the Shinzawai seemed to lose some of their tension. Lori said, "I." Have struck a bargain with my lord here. 
When we have completed certain tasks, I am to be given my freedom. Milimba shook his head. That's not possible. The law does not permit a slave to be freed. Even the warlord cannot free a slave. Laurie smiled. And yourself? Milimba looked stern. I am outside the law. None may command me. Are you claiming to be a magician? No, Milimba, nothing like that. It is true that I can only be a slave here, but I won't be here. I will return to Midkemia. Milimba looked puzzled. How is that possible? There is only one rift into Midkemia, and that is controlled by the warlord's pet magicians. There are no others, or I would know of them. We have a plan. It is involved, and will take much explaining, but simply put, it is this. I will accompany Kasumi, disguised as a priest of Turakamu, the Red. He will be leading soldiers, replacing troops at the front. No one's likely to notice my height, for the Red One's priests are given wide berth. The troops are all loyal to the Shinzawai. Once in Midkemia, we will slip through the lines and find our way to the kingdom forces. Milimba nodded. Now I understand the language lessons and the clothes. But tell me, Lorry, are you willing to spy for the Surani in exchange for your freedom? There was no disapproval in his voice. It was a simple question. Lorry flushed. I'm not going as a spy. I'm going as a guide. I am to take Kasumi to Rilanan for an audience with the king. Why? Milimba was surprised. Kasumi interrupted. I go to meet the king and bring him an offer of peace. Milimba raised an argument. How can you possibly expect to end the war with the war party still in control of the High Council? There is one thing in our favour, responded Kamatsu. This war has lasted for nine years, and the end is nowhere in sight. Great One, I don't presume to instruct you, but if I may explain some things. Milimba nodded that he should continue. Kamatsu sipped his drink and went on. Since the end of the war with the Turul Confederation, the war party has been pressed to maintain its dominance over the High Council. Each border clash with Turul brought the call for a renewal of the conflict. Between the fighting on the border and the constant attempts by the Thun to break through the passes in the north and regain their former southern range, the war party managed barely to maintain a majority. A coalition led by the Blue Wheel Party was on the verge of dislodging them ten years ago, when the Assembly discovered the rift into your former homeland. The call for war rang out in the Council as soon as the rich metals of your homeland were known to exist. All the progress we had made over the years was lost in that instance. So we began, at once, to counter this madness. The metals being mined on your former world are, from what Laurie has told us, the leavings of abandoned mines, not considered worth the bother by those you call dwarves. There is nothing in this for Surarwani but an excuse to raise the war banner again and shed blood. You know our history. You know how difficult it is for us to settle our differences in a peaceful manner. I have been a soldier and know the glories of war. I also know its waste. Laurie has convinced me that my suspicions about those who live in the kingdom were correct. You are not a very warlike people, in spite of your nobles and their armies. You would have been willing to trade. Millenber interrupted. Well, this is all true but I'm not sure that it has any bearing on things as they stand now. My former nation had not fought a major war in nearly fifty years, except for skirmishes with the goblins of the north and along the Cassian border. But now the battle drums sound in the west. The armies of the kingdom have been blooded. The nation has been invaded without cause. They would not, I think, be willing simply to stop and forgive. There would be demands for retribution or at least reparation. Would the High Council be willing to surrender the honour of Surawani and make restitution for the wrong done at the hands of its soldiers? The Shinzawai Lord looked troubled. The Council would not, I am sure. 
but the emperor would. The emperor, Milimba was surprised. What has he to do with this? Ichinda, may heaven bless him, feels the war is bleeding the empire of its resources. When we campaigned against the Turil, we learned that some frontiers are simply too vast and far from the empire to control, save at costs far greater than the victories are worth. The light of heaven understands that nowhere could there be a frontier as vast or as far as that we have found on Midkemia. He is taking a hand in the game of the council. It is perhaps the greatest game ever played in the history of Suranwani. The light of heaven is willing to command the warlord to peace, to have him removed from office if need be. But he will not take the risk of so great a break with tradition unless he is guaranteed the willingness of King Roderick to come to terms. He must go before the High Council with peace a fait accompli. Otherwise, he risks too much. Regicide has been committed only once in the history of the Empire, Great One. The High Council hailed the killer and named him Emperor. He was the son of the man he slew. His father had tried to order taxes imposed upon the temples, the last time an emperor played in the game of the council. We can be a hard people, Great One, even with ourselves, and never has an emperor sought to do what Ichinda seeks, what others, many others, will see as laying down the honour of the empire, an unthinkable act. But if he can deliver peace to the council, then it will clearly show the gods give their blessing to such an undertaking, and none will dare challenge him. You risk much, Lord of the Shinzawai. I love my nation, and the Empire, Great One. I would willingly die in the field for her, and I risked that often when I was younger during the Turil campaigns. I would also risk my life, my sons, the honour of my house, family and clan to bring the Empire to sanity, as would the Emperor. We are a patient people. This plan is years in preparation. The Blue Wheel Party has long been secretly allied with the Party for Peace. We withdrew in the third year of the war to embarrass the warlord and set the stage for Kasumi's training for the coming journey. Over a year was spent in travelling to various lords within the Blue Wheel and Peace Parties, ensuring cooperation that every member would play his part in the game of the Council before you and Lori were brought here to be his tutors. We are Surani, and the light of heaven would not allow an overture to be made until he had a ready messenger. We have made Kasumi that messenger, seeking to give him the best possible chance of reaching your former king safely. It must be this way, for should any outside our faction learn of the attempt if it fails, many heads, including my own, would fall. The price of losing the game. If you take Lori away, Kasumi has little chance of reaching your former king, and the peace effort will be postponed until we can find another trustworthy guide, a delay almost certain to last one or two more years. The situation is now critical. The Blue Wheel Party is again part of the Alliance for War after years of negotiation with the War Party and thousands of men are being sent to fight so that Kasumi may slip through kingdom lines into your former homeland. The time will soon be ripe. You must consider what even another year of war would mean. With the conquest of your former homeland, the Warlord could become invulnerable to any move we make. Milimba considered, then to Kasumi said, How soon? Kasumi said, Soon, great one. A matter of weeks. The warlord has spies everywhere and has some hint of our plans. He has little trust of the blue wheel's sudden shift in the council, but he cannot refuse the aid. He feels the need to strike a great victory. He plans the major spring offensive against the forces of Lords Boric and Brukel, the kingdom's main strength. It will be time to occur just before the Imperial Festival orchestrated so he can announce the victory at the Imperial Games, for his own personal glory. Kamatsu said, It is much like an end-game gambit in Shah, Great One. 
A smashing victory will gain the warlord all he needs to take control of the High Council. But we risk this to play for our final move. The front line will be in confusion as preparations are being made for the offensive. Kasumi and Lori will have their best opportunity to slip through the lines. Should King Roderick agree, then the light of heaven can appear in the High Council with an announcement of peace, and all that the Warlord's power and influence is based upon will crumble. In terms of Shah, we expose our last peace to capture so that our Emperor may checkmate a Warlord. Milimba was thoughtful for a time. I think you have embarked on a bold plan, Lord of the Shinzawe. I will honour my pledge to say nothing. Lori may continue here. He looked at Lori. May the gods of our forefathers protect you and bring you success. I pray this war may end soon. He stood up. If you don't mind, I will take my leave. I would have my wife and child come now. Kasumi rose and bowed. I should like to say one thing more, great one. Milimba indicated he should proceed. Years ago, when you asked for Katala for your wife, and I told you the request would be refused, I also told you there was a reason. It was our plan you would also return to your homeworld. I trust you understand that now. We are a hard people, Great One, but not cruel. It was apparent as soon as the plan was revealed. He looked at Lorry. For what I am now, this is my homeland. But there is still a part of me unchanged within, and for that reason I envy you your homecoming. You will be well remembered, old friend. So saying, Milimba left the room. Outside the great house he found Katala waiting in a garden, watching their son at play. She came to him, and they embraced, savouring sweet reunion. After a long moment he said, Come, beloved, let us take our son home. Chapter 27 Fusion Longbow wept in silence. Alone in a glade near the edge of the elven forests, the huntmaster of Criddy stood over three fallen elves. Their lifeless bodies lay sprawled upon the ground, with arms and legs bent at impossible angles, their fair faces covered in blood. Martin knew what death meant to the elves, where one or two children to a family in a century was the norm. One face he knew well, Algavin's, Gallane's companion since boyhood, less than thirty years of age, still a child by the elven folk's measure. Footsteps from behind caused Martin to wipe away the tears and resume his usually impassive expression. From behind he heard Garrett say, There's another bunch down the trail, Huntmaster. The Shirani went through this part of the forest like a bad wind. Martin nodded, then set out without comment. Garrett followed. For all his youth, Garrett was Longbow's best tracker, and they both moved lightly along the trail towards Elvendar. After travelling for hours, they crossed the river west to a Tsurani enclave, and when they were safely into the elven forests, a voice hailed them from the trees. Well met, Martin Longbow. Martin and Garrett halted, and waited as three elves appeared from among the trees, seemingly forming out of the air. Gallane and his two companions approached the huntmaster and Garrett. Martin inclined his head slightly back toward the river, and Gallane nodded. It was all the communication they needed to exchange the fact both knew of Algavin's death, along with the others. Garrett noticed the exchange, though he was far from conversant with the subtleties of elvish ways. Thomas? Carlin? asked Martin. In council with the Queen, do you bring news? Messages from Prince Aratha. Are you bound for council? Gallane smiled the elvish half-smile that indicated ironic humour. It has fallen to us to guard the way. We must remain for a time. We will come as soon as the dwarves cross the river. They are due any time now. 
The comment was not lost on Martin as he bade them goodbye and continued toward Elvinda. Approaching the clearing surrounding the elvish tree city, he wondered at the exclusion of Galen and the other young elves from council. They were all constant companions of Thomas since he came to take up permanent residency in Elvinda. Martin had not been there since just before the siege of Criddy, but in those years he had spoken to some of the Natalie's rangers who ran messages from the Duke of Elvinda to Criddy. On several occasions he had spent hours talking with Long Leon and Grimsworth of Natal. While close-mouthed, when not among their own kind, they were less guarded with Longbow, for in the Huntmaster of Criddy they sensed a kindred spirit. He was the only man not a ranger of Natal who could enter Elvendar unbidden. The two Natalie's rangers had indicated great changes in the Elf Queen's court, and Martin felt a strange sort of silent disquiet. As they approached Elvendar in an easy, loping run, Garrett said, Huntmaster, will they not send someone to fetch the fallen? Martin stopped and leaned upon his bow. Garrett, it is not their way. They will let the forest reclaim them, for they believe their true spirits are now abiding in the blessed isles. He thought a moment, then said, Among my trackers, you are perhaps the best I've known. The still young man blushed at the compliment, but Longbow said, No flattery, but simply fact. I mention it because you are the one most likely to replace me, should anything happen. Garrett's usual hang-dog expression gave way to one of close attention to what Martin was saying. Martin continued, If something should occur that takes me from this life, I would hope that someone would continue to keep Elvendar and the human world from drifting apart. Garrett nodded. I think I understand. You must, for it would be a sad thing for the two races to grow away from one another. He spoke softly. About their beliefs you must learn as you can, but a few things you should know, especially in this time of war. Do you remember how it is claimed that certain priests can recall the dead if they are no more than an hour departed? Garrett said, I have heard the story, but I have never met anyone who claims to have seen it done, or even claims to know someone who has seen it. It is true. Father Tully says so, and he's not the sort to be less than forthright on matters of faith. Martin looked down at the soil. There is a story. An important priest, of which order I do not know, found himself grown away from the gods and caught up in the human world. He cast off his fine robes and golden ornaments and donned the simple homespun of an itinerant monk. He wandered the wilderness, seeking humility. Time and chance brought him to Elvendar, where he came upon a newly fallen elf, dead by accident but a few minutes before the priest arrived. He began to recall the elf from death, for he was a priest of great powers and sought to share his abilities with all in need. He was halted by the elf's wife, and when he asked her why, she said, It is not our way. He is now in a far better place, and should you recall him, he will not return but against his will and to our sorrow. That is why we will not speak his name, lest he hear longing in our voices and return to comfort us at a cost of his own. From what I know, no elf has ever been recalled from death. I have been told by some that no elf can be revived by human arts. Others have said that elves have no true souls, which is why they do not return. I think both are false, and they have a finer sense of where they live in the world. Garrett was quiet for a moment while he digested this information. But it's a strange tale, Hunt Master. What brought it to mind? The death of those elves in your question. It is to show you how they differ from us and how you must work to learn their ways. You will spend time among them. Is the tale of the dead elf true? Yes. The newly fallen elf was the late elf king. Queen Aglorana's husband. I was but a boy then, thirty years ago, but I remember it. 
I was with the hunting party when the accident happened, and I met the priest. Garrett said nothing, and Martin picked up his weapon and resumed his journey. They soon came to the edge of Elvendar. Martin stopped while Garrett stood enraptured by the sight of the great trees. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows through the forest, but the high boughs were already glimmering with their own fairy light. Martin took Garrett by the elbow and gently guided the gawking tracker along to the Queen's court. He reached the council ring and entered, saluting the Queen. Aglarana smiled at the sight of him. Welcome, Martin Longbow. It has been too long since you last came to us. Martin introduced Garrett, who bowed awkwardly before the Queen. Then another figure entered the court from where he had stood in the shadows. Martin had grown alongside elven children and was as able as any man in hiding his emotions when need be. But the sight of Thomas rocked him to the point of nearly exclaiming. Biting back a comment, he forced himself not to stare and heard Garrett's indrawn breath of amazement. They had heard of the changes in Thomas, but nothing had prepared either Martin or Garrett for the sight of the towering man before him. Alien eyes regarded them. There was little remaining of the happy, grinning boy who had once followed Martin through the woods begging for tales of the elves or played barrel ball with Garrett. Without cordiality, Thomas stepped forward and said, What word from Criddy? Martin leaned upon his bow. Prince Aretha sends his greetings, he said to the Queen, and his affections as well as his hope for your good health. Turning to Thomas, who had obviously usurped some kind of position of command within the Queen's council, he said, Aretha sends the following news. Black Guy, Duke of Bastira, now rules in Crondor, so no help will be forthcoming to the far coast. Also, the Prince has good cause to believe the Outworlders plan to mount a major offensive soon. Whether against Criddy, Elvendar, or the Duke's army, he cannot tell. However, the southern enclaves are not being reinforced through the dwarven mines, though they are strongly dug in. My trackers have had some signs of northward movement, but nothing on a large scale. It is Arith's guess the most likely offensive will be against his father and Brukel's army. Then he said, And I bring word that Arith's squire has been slain. He observed the elven avoidance of naming the dead. Thomas's eyes betrayed a glint of emotion at the news of Roland's death, but all he said was, In war, men die. Carlin realised the exchange was something of a personal matter between Longbow and Thomas. No one else in the court had known Roland well, though Carlin remembered him from the dinner that night so many years ago in Criddy. Martin was troubled by Thomas's reaction to the news of his boyhood friend's death. Returning to the business of the war, the elf prince said, It is a logical thing. Should the kingdom army in the west be broken, the outworlders could then turn their full attention on the other fronts, gaining the free cities and criddy quickly. Within a year, two at the most, all of what was once Keshian Bosania would be under their banners. Then they could march easily upon Yarbon. In time they could march to the gates of Krondor. Thomas faced Carlin, as if to speak, his eyes narrow. A flash of communication passed between the Queen and Thomas, and he stepped back into his place in the council circle. Carlin continued, If the outworlders are not staging to the west of the mountains, then we should be joined by the dwarves soon. We've had sorties across the river from the outworlders, but no sign of major attacks to come. I think Aretha is correct in his surmise, and should the Duke's call... We should try to aid them. Thomas turned upon the elf prince. Leave Elvendar unprotected. His face showed outrage. Martin was startled by the ferocity of Thomas's barely checked anger. Without stripping the elven forests of defenders, we could not mount enough numbers to matter in such a battle. Carlin's face remained impassive, but his eyes mirrored Thomas's anger. His words came forth quietly. I am war leader of Elvendar. I would not leave our forests unprotected. 
but should the outworlders mount a major offensive against the dukes, they will not leave sufficient soldiers along the river to menace our forests. They have not come back against us since we defeated them with the sorcerer's aid and their black robes were killed. But should they battle Lords Borick and Brukel, and should the battle be a close thing, our numbers might tip the balance, especially as we can strike against their weaker flank. Thomas maintained his self-control, standing rigidly for a moment. Then, in icy tones, he said, The dwarves follow Dolgan, and Dolgan follows my lead. They will not come unless I call them to battle. Without another word, he left the council circle. Martin watched Thomas leave. His skin crawled as he felt for the first time the power contained within this strange blend of man and whatever else lived inside the boy from Criddy. He had caught only a glimpse of what was within Thomas, but it had been enough. Thomas was a being to be feared. Martin then saw a flicker of expression on Aglarana's face. She rose and said, I had better have words with Thomas. He has been overwrought of late. As she left, Martin was struck by a certainty. Whatever else he had seen, he had witnessed a conflict between the elf queen's son and her lover, and a deep conflict within herself as well. Aglarana had worn the expression of one caught in a hopeless fate. When the queen had left, Carlin said, You have come at a propitious time, Martin. We have need of your wisdom. Martin nodded. He sent Garrett away to get something to eat, and when he was gone, Martin studied the elf prince, then the others in the council. Tathar stood at his usual place to the right of the queen's throne. Others he knew, all old and trusted advisers of the queen. Many were ancient spell weavers. Martin sat down, patiently waiting for Carlin to speak. The elf prince remained silent for a time. Martin studied Carlin, for he knew him and could sense his disquiet. As a boy, Martin had thought the elf prince the finest embodiment of all elven virtues. While his boyish hero worship had passed, he still regarded Carlin with undiminished respect. Carlin said, Martin, of all here, you are the only one to have known Thomas before this change. What can you say of the transformation you've seen? Martin spent time considering his reply. I have only glimpsed these changes over the years until this day. That they are great is obvious, but as to what they herald, I cannot begin to guess. He was a good enough boy, one not overly given to mischief, though with enough curiosity to find it. He had a tender side, and did not hold back in his affections. His temper was moderate, though he could lose control when a friend was threatened or struck. In all, he was much like other boys, a dreamer. And now? Martin was troubled and took no pains to hide this. He is something beyond my understanding. Tathar said, Your words are clear to us, Martin, and true, for he has also gone beyond our understanding. Carlin spoke softly. Of men... You know our history more than any. You know of our hatred for the ages spent in bondage to the Valheru. You know we reject the dark path they trod. We fear the return of that power as much as we do this invasion of outworlders and their black robes. You have seen Thomas. You must know what we are forced to consider. Martin nodded. Yes. You weigh his life. Many of the younger elves follow him blindly, said Tatha. They lack the maturity and wisdom to withstand the subtle influence of the Valheru magic with him. And while the dwarves do not follow blindly, still they follow, for they have none of our heritage of fear, and they put great faith in his leadership. He has proved the means of their survival for eight years now, saving many of them from death repeatedly. 
But while Thomas has been a boon to us in this struggle against the invaders, we may have to put aside all other considerations save one. Will this half man, half Valheru, attempt to become our master? Tathar frowned. If so, he must be destroyed. Martin felt cold inside. Of all the boys he had known at Criddy, he had held special affection for three: Garrett, Thomas, and Pug. He had mourned silently when Pug had been taken by the Tsirani, and had often wondered if it had been to his death or captivity. Now he mourned for Thomas. For whatever else might occur, Thomas would never again be as he once was. Martin said to Carlin, "Can nothing be done?" Carlin indicated Tatha should answer the question. The old spellweaver looked around the circle, gaining silent agreement from the other spellweavers. To Martin, he said, "We do what we can to bring this to a good ending, but should the Valheru come forth in his might, he would not withstand. So we are fearful. We harbour no hatred for Thomas, but even as you pity a rabid wolf." You must kill it. Martin looked grimly out at the lights of Elvendar as darkness deepened. As long as he remembered, it had been a comforting sight. Now he felt only cold bitterness. When shall you decide? Tatha said, "You understand our ways. We shall decide when we must decide." Martin rose slowly to his feet. My counsel to you then is this: until the change has clearly shown itself to be toward the dark path, do not mistakenly give too much weight to ancient fears. I have long been taught that those who now rule in Elvendar are of heartier nature and more independent mind than those who were first set free by the Valheru. Stay your hand until the last. Something good may come of this yet, or if not that, something that is not entirely ill. Tafar nodded. Your counsel is given well. It is well received. Martin looked heavily burdened. I will do what I can. Once I was able to influence Thomas, perhaps I may yet again. I will go meditate upon the matter, then seek him out and speak with him. None in the circle around the Queen's court spoke as he left. They knew his heart was as troubled as their own. The throbbing had become worse, not quite a pain, but a discomfort that grew unnervingly more persistent. Thomas sat in the cool glade near the quiet pool, struggling within himself. Since coming to live in Elvendar, he had found his dreams little more than vague, shadowy images with half-remembered phrases and names to grasp. They were less troublesome, less fearful, less a presence in his daily life. But the pressure within his head, the dull near ache, had grown. When he was in battle, he became lost in red rage, and there was no sense of the ache. But when the battle lust subsided, especially when he was slow to return to Elvendar. The throbbing returned. Footsteps sounded lightly behind, and without turning, he said, "I wish to be alone." Aglarana said, "The pain, Thomas." A faint stirring of some strange feeling rose briefly within, and he cocked his head as if listening for something. Then he answered curtly, "Yes, I will return to our rooms soon. Leave now and prepare for me to join you later." Aglarana stepped back. Her proud features showing pain at being addressed in such a tone, she turned quickly and left. As she walked through the woods, her emotions churned within. Since surrendering to Thomas's desire and her own, she had lost the ability to command him or to resist his commands. He was now lord over her, and she felt shame. It was a joyless union, not the return of lost happiness she had hoped for. But there was a will-sapping compulsion, a need to be with him, to belong to him, that stripped away her defences. Thomas was dynamic, powerful, and sometimes cruel. 
She corrected herself, not cruel, just so removed from any other being, no comparison could be made. He was not indifferent to her needs, he simply was unaware she had any. As she approached Elvendar, the soft fairy lights reflected in the shimmering tears that touched her cheeks. Thomas was only partially aware of her departure. Under the dull ache within his head, a voice faintly called to him. He strained to listen, knowing its timbre, its colour, knowing who called. Thomas. Yes. Ashen Shugar looked across the desolation of the plains, dry, cracked lands devoid of moisture save for bubbling alkali pots that spewed foul odours into the air. Aloud to his unseen companion he said, It has been some time since we last spoke. Tatha and the others seek to keep us apart. You are often forgotten. The fetid winds blew from the north, cold but cloying. The smell of decay was everywhere, and in the residue of the mighty madness that had gripped the universe around, only faint stirrings of life reasserting itself were felt. No matter. We are together again. What is this place? The desolation of the chaos wars. Draken Corin's monument, the lifeless tundra that was once great grasslands. Few living things abide here. Most creatures flee to the south and more hospitable climes. Who are you? Ashen Shugar laughed. I am what you are becoming. We are one. So you have said many times. I have forgotten. Ashenshigar called, and Shuriga sped towards him over a grey landscape, while black clouds thundered overhead. The mighty dragon landed, and his master climbed upon his back. Casting a glance at the spot marked by Ash, the only reminder of Draken Corin's existence, the Valheru said, Come, let us see what fate has wrought. Shuriga leaped into the heavens, and above the desolation they flew. Ashen Shigar was silent as he rode upon Shuriga's broad back, feeling the wind blowing across his face. They flew, and time passed them by as they shared the death of one age and the birth of another. High in the blue sky they soared, free of the horror of the chaos wars. It is worthy of sorrow. I think not. There is a lesson, though I cannot bring myself to know it. Yet I sense you do. Ashen Shigar closed his eyes as the throbbing returned. Yes, I remember. Thomas? Thomas's eyes snapped open. He found Gelaine standing a short way off near the edge of the clearing. Shall I return later? Thomas rose slowly from where he had sat, dreaming. His voice was rough and tired. No. What is it? Dolgan's dwarven band has reached the outer forest and waits for you near the winding brook. The dwarves struck an outward enclave as they crossed the river. There was a merry smile upon the young elf's face. They have finally captured prisoners. A strange look of mixed delight and fury passed over Thomas's face. Gelaine felt strange emotions as he regarded the reaction of the warrior in white and gold to this news. As if listening to a distant call, Thomas spoke distractedly. Go to the dwarven camp. I will join you there presently. Gelaine withdrew, and Thomas listened. A distant voice grew louder. Have I erred? The hall echoed with the words, for now it was vacant, the servants having slipped away. Ashen Shigar brooded upon his throne. He spoke to shadows. Have I erred? Now you no doubt, answered the ever-present voice. This strange quietness within, what is it? It is death approaching. Ashen Shigar closed his eyes. I thought as much. 
So few of my kind lived beyond battle. It was a rare thing. I am the last. Still, I would like to fly Shuruga once more. He is gone. Dead. Ages past. But I flew him this morning. It was a dream. As is this. Am I then also mad? You are but a memory. This is but a dream. Then I will do what is planned. I accept the inevitable. Another will come to take my place. So it has happened already, for I am the one who came, and I have taken up your sword and put upon your mantle. Your cause is now mine. I stand against those who would plunder this world. Then I am content to die. Opening his eyes, he took one last look at his hall, now cloaked in ancient dust. Closing them for the last time, the ruler of the eagle's reaches cast his final spell. His waning powers, still unmatched upon this world by any save the new gods, flowed from his tired body, infusing his armour. Smoky wisps wafted upward from where his body had rested, and soon only the golden armour, white tabard, shield and sword of white and gold remained. I am Ashen Shugar. I am Thomas. Thomas's eyes opened, and for a moment he was confused to find himself in the glade. A strange passion grew within as he felt a new strength flowing throughout his being. In his mind rang a clarion call, I am Ashen Shugar, the Valheru. I will destroy all who seek to plunder my world. With a terrible resolve he left the glade to find the place the dwarves had brought his enemies. It is good to see you again, friend Longbow, said Dolgan, puffing away on his pipe. They had not seen each other since a chance meeting several years before when the dwarves passed through the forest east of Criddy on their way to Elvendar. Martin, Carlin and a few elves had come to see the dwarves' prisoners who were still bound. They waited in a group in a corner of the clearing, glaring at their captors. Gelaine entered the clearing and said, Thomas is coming soon. Martin said, How is it, Dolgan? After all these years you managed to capture prisoners and an entire enclave at that. Behind the eight bound warriors stood a fearful group of Tsurani slaves, unbound but huddled together, uncertain of their fate. Dogan gave an off-handed wave. Usually we're raiding across the river and prisoners tend to slow things down during a withdrawal, being either unconscious or uncooperative. This time we had little choice in the matter, as we needed to cross the river Criddy. In past years we'd wait to sneak across in darkness, but this year... They're as close as nettles in a thicket everywhere along the river. We found this band in a relatively isolated spot with only these eight to guard the slaves. They were repairing an earthwork, one that I judge was overrun a short while ago during an elven sortie. We slipped around them, then a few of the lads climbed into the trees, though they liked it little. We dropped down upon the three outer guards, silencing them before they could shout the alert, and the other five were napping the lazy louts. We slipped into camp, and after a few well-placed strokes with our hammers, we bound them. These others, he indicated the slaves, were too timid to make a sound. When it was clear we had not alarmed the nearby enclaves, we thought to bring them along. It seemed a waste to leave them behind. Thought we might learn something useful. Logan tried to keep an impassive expression, but pride over his company's work shone through like a beacon in the night. Martin smiled his approval, and said to Carlin, I hope we may learn what is coming, if the feared offensive is really to be mounted and where. I have learned a few phrases of their tongue, but not enough to make any sense of what they might tell us. Only Father Tully and Charles, my Surani tracker, can speak to them fluently. Perhaps we should attempt to move them to Criddy. Carlin said, We have the means to learn their tongue, given time. I doubt they would lend much cooperation in their transport. Most likely they would try to raise the alarm every step of the way. Martin conceded the point. Then a disturbance caused him to turn. Thomas came striding into the clearing. 
Dogan began to greet him, but something in the young warrior's manner and expression silenced him. There was madness in Thomas's eyes, something the dwarf had glimpsed before as a glimmer, but which now shone forth brightly. Thomas regarded the bound prisoners, then pulled his sword slowly and pointed at them. The words he spoke were alien to both Martin and the dwarves, but the elves were rocked by what they heard. Several of the older elves dropped to their knees in supplication, and the younger ones drew away in reflexive fear. Only Carlin stood his ground, though he appeared shaken. Then slowly the elf prince turned to Martin, his face drained of colour. In terrified tones he said, "At last." The Valhero is truly among us. Ignoring all others in the clearing, Thomas walked up to the first Cyrani prisoner. The bound soldier looked up with a mixture of fear and defiance. Suddenly, the golden sword was raised high and arced down, severing the man's head from his shoulders. Blood splattered the white tabard, then flowed off, leaving it spotless. A low moan of fear came from the huddled slaves, and the remaining soldiers' eyes were wide in terror. Slowly, Thomas turned to face the next prisoner, and again his sword took a life. Martin freed himself from shocked paralysis, forcing his eyes away from the butchery. He felt terrible dread, but it appeared as nothing to what the elves revealed in their abasement before Thomas. Carlin's face showed a struggle within as he tried to overcome a nearly instinctive obedience to the words spoken in the ancient language of the Valheru, masters of all ages past. The younger elves, less studied in the old wisdom, simply had no understanding of the overwhelming need to obey this man in white and gold. The language of the Valheru was still the language of power. Thomas turned away from his slaughter, and Martin felt struck by the strength of his gaze. Gone was any vestige of the boy from Criddy. Now an alien presence suffused his being. Thomas's arm drew back. And Martin tensed to dodge the blow. Any human was a potential victim, and even the dwarves drew back at the awesome menace Thomas projected. Then, a faint spark of recognition entered Thomas's eyes, and he said in a distant voice, "Martin, by the love I once bore you, be gone, or your life is forfeit." Mustering courage against the most consuming fear he had ever felt, Martin shouted. I'll not stand and watch you slaughter helpless men. Again, a distant voice answered, steeped in ancient majesty and lost grandeur, regained. These come into my world, Martin. None may seek that which is my domain, my preserve, mine alone. Shall you too come into my world, Martin? With inhuman speed, Thomas wheeled, and two Surani died. Martin charged, crossing the gap between them in a bound, and knocked Thomas away from the prisoners. They went down in a heap, and Martin grabbed at the wrist that held the golden sword. A strong man, capable of carrying a freshly killed buck for miles, Martin was no match for Thomas. As easily as picking up a bothersome infant, Thomas pushed Martin aside and came lightly to his feet. Martin sprang at Thomas again, but this time Thomas stood ready. He simply seized Martin by the tunic and said, "None may interfere with my will." He tossed Martin across the clearing as if he weighed less than a tenth his weight. Martin's arms flailed the air as he arced high over the ground, striving to control his fall. He landed hard, and all around could hear the breath explode from his lungs as he struck. Dolgan rushed to his side, for the elves were still held in thrall by what they had witnessed. The dwarven chief poured water from a skin at his side upon Martin's face and shook him awake. The strangled cries of terror from the Cyrani slaves watching soldiers being butchered greeted Martin as he regained his wits. Martin struggled to focus his vision. The scene before him swimming and shifting. When he could see, he drew a hissing breath in horror. Thomas struck down the last Cyrani soldier and began to advance upon the cringing slaves. They appeared unable to move, watching with wide eyes the bringer of their destruction, looking like nothing so much to Martin as a band of deer startled by a sudden light in the night. A ragged cry came from Martin's lips as Thomas killed the first Cyrani slave, 
a pitiful-looking willow of a man. Longbow struggled to rise, senses reeling, and Dolgan helped him to his feet. Thomas raised his sword, and another died. Again, the golden blade was raised, and he looked into the face of his victim. Eyes round with fear, a young boy no more than twelve years old stood waiting for the blow that would end his life. Suddenly, time expanded for Thomas, the moment frozen in his mind. He studied the shock of dark hair and the large brown eyes of the boy. The child crouched, awaiting the death he saw over him, his head shaking no as his lips formed a single phrase over and over. In the faint light of the clearing, Thomas saw an old ghost, the spectre of a friend long forgotten. A remembered bond from his earliest memories as a child reassociated itself within his consciousness. Images blurred, past and present confused, and he said, Pug? Within his mind, pain exploded, and another will sought to overwhelm him. Pug! it shrieked. Kill him! came a raging answer, and within him two wills battled. No! screamed the other. To everyone in the glade, Thomas stood frozen, shaking with some inner struggle, his sword still held high, waiting for release. These are the enemy. Slay them. He is a boy, only a boy. He is the enemy. A boy. Thomas's face became a mask of pain. His teeth clenched, and every muscle drew taut, stretching skin tightly over skull. His eyes grew round, and perspiration began to flow from under his helm, down his brows and cheeks. Martin stumbled to his feet. He moved slowly, every gesture bringing pain from the battering he had taken. Thomas's hand slowly moved downward, each inch a shaking, trembling passage as he warred within. The boy was transfixed, unable to move, his eyes following the movement of the blade. I am Ashen Sugar. I am Valheru, sang a voice within him, in a torrent of anger, battle madness and bloodlust. Against this sea of rage stood a single rock, a calm, small voice within that said simply, I am Thomas. Again and again the sea of hate crashed over the rock of calm, each time engulfing it, then sliding back to come again. But each time the tide diminished and the rock stood clear, rising above the mad surf. A shattering of something, the thundering of ages lost and passing, rocked Thomas's mind. He reeled, then swam within an alien landscape, seeking a pinpoint of light he knew was his way to freedom. Tides swept him along and he battled, struggling to keep his head above the strangling black sea. A shrieking, evil wind blew overhead, and to his ears it sang a song of woeful meter. He struck out, and again he saw a pinpoint of light, Again the tide engulfed him, forcing him away from his goal, but this time it was weaker. Once more he struggled toward the light, then came a surge, a last terrifying assault, culminating in a total attack upon him. I am Ashen Sugar! There came a breaking of the will, something snapping like the dead branch of a tree under the weight of newly fallen snow, like the sound of old winter ice breaking at spring's touch, as if the last assault took too great a toll. The Black Sea lost its fury and subsided, and he was again standing upon firm ground, a single rock. I am Thomas. In the distance, the pinpoint of light began to expand before his eyes, racing forward to engulf him. I am Thomas. Thomas! He blinked and saw he was again in the glade. Before him crouched the boy, waiting to die. He turned his head and saw Martin sighting along a clothyard arrow drawn hard against his cheek. The huntmaster of Criddy said, Put down your sword, or by the gods, I'll kill you where you stand. Thomas's gaze wandered about the glade, and he saw the dwarves with weapons drawn, as had some of the older elves. Carlin, still shaking, had his sword out and was slowly advancing upon him. Martin watched Thomas closely, not fearing him, but respectful of his awesome strength and speed. He waited 
and saw the flicker of madness still in Thomas's eyes. Then, as if a veil were lifted, saw them clear. Abruptly, the golden sword fell from his hand, and the pale, nearly colourless eyes filled with tears. Thomas dropped to his knees, and a moan of terrible anguish was torn from his lips. And Thomas cried out, "Oh, Martin, what have I become?" Martin lowered his bow, watching as Thomas gathered his arms about himself. Into the glade came Tathar and the other spellweavers. They approached Thomas and then surveyed the others in the glade. So terrible were Thomas's sobs of anguish, so filled with sorrow and remorse, that many of the elves discovered they also wept. Tathar said to Martin Longbow, "We felt the fabric of our spells torn asunder a short while ago and came at once." We feared the Valheru had come, rightly it seems. Martin said, "Now, the other side of the balance. That the Valheru is at last displaced by the boy, there can be no doubt. But the boy now must feel the weight of ages of slaughter and the guilt over joy felt when taking other lives. The burdens felt by mortals are again his." And we shall now see if he can withstand them. This agony may prove his end. Martin left the ancient elf and crossed to Thomas. In the dim light, he was the first to perceive the change. Gone were the alien cast to his features, the gleaming eyes, the haughty brow. Again, he was Thomas, a man. Though there were still legacies of his experience that would for ever proclaim him something more than a man, the elven ears, the pale eyes, gone was the Lord of Power, the old one, the Valheru, where before a dragon lord had stood, now crouched a troubled, sick man in torment over what he had done. Thomas raised his head as Martin touched him upon the shoulder. Red-rimmed eyes, nearly mad from grief, regarded Martin for a brief moment, then closed, as if seeking oblivion to all around. For some time, the elves and dwarves watched, and the Surani slaves were silent, aware that some miracle had occurred, not understanding, but suddenly sure they were spared. For some time, they watched as Martin Longbow cradled the sobbing man in white and gold. Who cried in anguish so terrible to hear? Aglarana sat upon her sleeping pallet, brushing her long red gold hair. As before, she waited for Thomas, half hoping, half fearing he would come. A shout from outside caused her to rise. She gathered her robes around her and left her quarters. Standing upon a platform, she watched as a group of elves and dwarves came toward Elvendar's heart. With them came Martin Longbow and some humans, clearly outworlders from their dress. Her hands went to her mouth as she gasped. In the center of the group walked Thomas. At his side, a young boy with eyes wide at the splendor of Elvendar. Aglarana was unable to move, fearful that what she witnessed was the product of delusion born of hope. Time sped past as she waited. Then Thomas stood before her, leaving the boy. He stepped forward. Martin took the boy by the hand and led him away. The others following, giving the elf queen and Thomas the solitude they needed. Thomas reached out slowly and touched her face, and he drank in the sight of her as if seeing her as he had first at Criddy. Then, without words, he slowly, gently enfolded her in his arms. He held her in silence, letting her feel the warmth of the love that filled him at sight of her. After a time, he whispered in her ear, "For each moment of sorrow I have visited upon you, oh my lady, I pray the gods grant me a year to gift you with joy. I am again your adoring subject." Too filled with happiness to speak, the elf queen simply clung to him. Her sorrow, only a dim memory. Chapter Twenty-Eight. Emissary. The troops stood quietly. 
Long columns of men awaited their turn at passing through the rift into Midkemia. Officers walked by, their presence ensuring discipline in the lines. Lorry, in the mask and robe of a red priest, was impressed at the level of control these officers had over their men. He judged the Tsirani code of honour, where orders were followed without question, a very alien thing. He and Kasumi moved quickly down the line, heading for the first detachment behind the one now entering the rift. Lorry bent his knees and stooped to detract from his noticeable height. As they had hoped, more soldiers than not looked away as the bogus red priest passed. When they reached the head of the column, Kasumi fell in. His younger brother, who had been promoted to strike leader for this offensive, seemed to pay no attention to his commander's late arrival or to the priest of Turakamu, who arrived with him. After a seemingly interminable delay, the command came and they stepped forward into the shimmering glow of nothingness that marked the rift between the two worlds. There was a brief flash of lights, a momentary dizziness, and they found themselves walking forward into a light Midkemian rain. Sheets of wetness, little more than a heavy mist, fell around them. The Surani soldiers, hot weather bred, wrapped cloaks about themselves. A staging officer briefly conferred with Kasumi, and the troops were ordered to move off to the northeast, a specified distance, and erect a camp. Kasumi and Hokanu were then to report to the warlord's tent for briefings. The warlord himself was back in Kentasani, the holy city, preparing for the imperial games, but his sub commander was to instruct them in their duties and areas of responsibility until his return. They quickly moved up toward the front and set up camp. Once the commander's tent was up, Lori and the Shinzawai brothers ducked inside. While bundles containing Midkemian clothing and weapons were unpacked, Kasumi said, As soon as we return from our meeting with the sub-commander, we will eat. Tonight we will lead a patrol of our area and try to slip through the lines. Kasumi looked at his brother. After we have gone, brother. It will be your responsibility to hide our departure for as long as possible. Once there has been fighting reported, you may claim we have been lost to the enemy. Hokanu agreed. We have best report now. Kasumi looked at Lori. Stay inside. We want no risk. You are the tallest damned priest I've ever seen. Lori nodded. He sat upon some cushions and waited. The patrol moved silently through the trees. The rain had stopped, but the weather had turned colder, and Lorry suppressed a shiver. Years in the hot climbs of Kelawan had driven away his ability to ignore the chill. He wondered about the new troops from Suroani and how they would react when the first snowfalls came. Most likely with studied indifference, regardless of what they felt inside. A Surani soldier would never let himself appear upset by anything as trivial as solid water falling from the sky. They elected the North Pass, for it led to the largest front, and they were less likely to be noticed passing through the lines. They reached the head of the pass, and a station guard passed them along. Once outside the valley, they struck slightly more eastward than their patrol called for. Beyond the rolling hills and light woods was the road from Lamut to Zun. Once the two travellers had left their patrol and reached the road, they would head for Zoon, buy horses, and ride south. With luck they would reach Krondor in two weeks. There they would change mounts and head for Salador, where they would find passage on a ship for Rilanon. The only obstacle between them and the road was a large portion of the kingdom's army. If they were discovered by a kingdom patrol, they would try to pass themselves off as travellers who had been captured by the Surani and escaped. There could be no question of Lori being Tsurani, and Kasumi's command of the king's tongue was so complete that he could easily pass for a kingdom citizen from the Vale of Dreams. Several languages were spoken in that border area with great Kesh, so Kasumi's slight accent would be reasonable. The patrol moved at a dog trot that ate up miles. Lori ran beside Kasumi, marvelling at the soldier's stamina. They might not be showing fatigue, but he was feeling it. Hokanu signalled for the patrol to stop at the head of a large flat area near the woods. Here we will start our swing back to our patrol area. We should not see any Surani soldiers from here. 
Let us hope for your sake we don't meet with kingdom troops either. He gave a signal, and they moved out. Lori and Kasumi were handed backpacks and clothing. They quickly changed, then followed the route taken by the patrol. They would follow for a short distance, using the patrol for cover should any kingdom troops be nearby. They moved into a small vale and found the patrol held up by something ahead. The last man in line motioned them for quiet. They moved to the head of the line, and Lori looked around for a quick exit route should there be any trouble. Hokanu said softly, "I thought I heard something, but there has been no sound for several minutes." Kasumi nodded. Then move forward. We will wait until you have crossed that open area ahead. Then follow to the woods. He indicated a stand of trees on the other side of the clearing. When the patrol had reached the center of the open area, the clouds parted and shafts of moonlight lit up the area. Damn! Kasumi swore under his breath. They might as well light torches now. Suddenly, the trees erupted with motion and sound. The ground trembled as riders came charging forward out from the trees that hid them. Each wore heavy chainmail and a full helm. Long lances were levelled at the surprised Surani soldiers. The Surani had barely enough time to ready a rude line for defence before the riders were upon them. Cries of horses and men filled the air, and Surani fell before the charge. The riders rode over the Surani and reformed at the end of the vale, where the two fugitives hid. They wheeled about and charged again. The Surani survivors of the last charge, less than half the men, moved quickly up the west side of the vale, where the trees and incline of the hillside would counter the horsemen's ability to charge. Lori touched Kasumi's arm and motioned to the right. It was evident the Surani officer was barely holding himself in check from joining his men. Suddenly, Kasumi was off, hugging the edge of the trees as he ran low. Lori followed and spotted what appeared to be a rough path heading eastward. He grabbed Kasumi's sleeve and pointed. They turned their backs to the fighting and moved off. The next day found two travellers moving down the road to Zun. Both wore woolen shirts, trousers, and cloaks. Closer examination by a trained eye would have revealed that the material was not really wool, but something like it. Their belts and boots were made from nidra hide, dyed to resemble leather. The fashion was Midkemian, as were the swords they wore on their belts. One was obviously a minstrel, for he wore a lute slung over his backpack. The other looked to be a freebooter mercenary. Any casual observer would have been unlikely to guess their origins, or the riches carried in those backpacks, for each had a small fortune in gems tucked away in the bottom of his pack. A northbound troop of light cavalry passed them on the road, and Lori said, "Things have changed since I was last here. Those men in the forest were royal Crondorian lancers, and those who just passed wore the colours of Quester's View. All the forces of the armies of the West must be marshalling here. Something seems to be in the air. Perhaps they have somehow gleamed your warlord's plan for a major offensive. I don't know." Whatever is happening does not seem to indicate that things are as stable as we have been led to believe back home. Alliances are very uneasy since the death of the Lord of the Minwanabi, and the emergence of new forces in the Great Game. The Warlord may be more desperate than my father judged, and the concentration of troops here makes me think the Warlord's victory may not be easily won. Kasumi was quiet for a moment as they walked along the road. I hope that Hokanu. Was among those who reached the trees. It was the first time he had mentioned his brother, and Lori could think of nothing to say. Two days later, Lori, a minstrel late of Tear Sog, and Kenneth, a mercenary from the Vale of Dreams, sat in the Green Cat Inn in the city of Zun. Both ate with hearty appetite, for they had lived on soldiers' rations, cakes of grain and dried fruit, for two days. Lorry had spent over an hour negotiating with a less than reputable gem broker for several smaller stones' value. He had settled for one third their actual worth, stating, "If he thinks they're stolen, he'll not be too quick to ask questions." Kasumi asked, "Why didn't you sell him all the stones?" <laughs> "Your father has given us enough to retire on for the rest of our days. I doubt if all the brokers in Zoom could raise the gold to pay for him." 
We'll sell a few as we travel. Besides, they weigh less than gold. Finishing their meal, the two men paid and left. Kasumi could only just refrain from staring at all the metal he could see everywhere, a lifetime's riches on Kelawan. Just the cost of the meal in silver could support a Tsurani family for a year. They hurried along one of the city's business streets, heading to the south gate. Near there, they had been informed, a reputable trader in horses would sell them mounts and tack for a fair price. They found the man, a thin, hawk-beaked fellow by the name of Bryn. Lorry spent the better part of an hour haggling with the horse trader for two of his better mounts. They left him expressing concern over their ability to sleep nights after cheating an honest businessman out of the money he needed to feed his starving children. As they rode through the gate that put them on the road to Ilith, Kasumi said, Much of this land of yours seems odd, but as you haggled with that merchant, I was reminded of home. Our traders are much more polite. I would never think of raising their voices in such a manner, but it is still the same thing. They all have starving children. Lorry laughed and spurred his mount forward. Soon they were out of sight of the city. South of Quester's view, they passed more troops on the road, this time kingdom regulars and auxiliaries, trudging along on foot while their officers rode. Lori and Kasumi had stopped to untack and graze their horses while the column moved past. The fighter watched the soldiers passing with an expert's eye. Red-uniformed soldiers marched in tight formation, while the more ragged auxiliaries still managed a look of organisation. The baggage train moved in good order, experienced cart drivers keeping the animals in proper intervals. When they passed, Kasumi said, those soldiers are better than any I've so far seen on your world, Lorry. Those in red look like professionals. They march well. All those others seem experienced, despite their motley look. Lorry nodded. I recognise the standard. That's the garrison of Shamatra in the Vale of Dreams. They have had their fair share of fighting Keshe's dog soldiers and are a veteran outfit. And those others are auxiliaries, Valemen mercenaries, a less tender band of lads you'd be hard-pressed to find. Lorry started to resaddle his horse. There is seasoned a force of men as your countrymen will have faced, in truth. When the horses were tacked up, Lorry and Kasumi remounted and rode on. Soon they could see the bitter sea as the road rounded the hills of Quester's view. Lorry pulled up his horse and stared out to sea. What is it? asked Kasumi. Lorry shaded his eyes. Ships. A whole fleet of them sailing north. He sat for a moment watching, and at last Kasumi could see dots of white upon the blue of the sea. Where are they bound? Kasumi asked. Ilith is the only major point north of here. They must be carrying supplies for the war. They resumed their ride. A sense of urgency descended upon them both, as everything they saw pointed to an intensification of the war, and the longer they tarried, the less likely the success of their mission. Fourteen days later, they reached the northern gate of Krondor. As they rode through, they were regarded suspiciously by several guards dressed in black and gold. Once beyond earshot of the gate guards, Lorry said, Those are not the prince's tabards. The banner of Bastira flies over Krondor. They rode slowly for a minute. Then Kasumi said, What does it mean? I don't know, but I think I know a place we can find out. They rode through a series of streets bounded on each side by warehouses and commercial enterprises. Sounds from the docks several streets away could be heard. Otherwise, the district was quiet. Strange, remarked Lorry as they rode on. This part of the city is usually busiest at this time of day. Kasumi looked around, not sure of what he expected to see. The Midkemian cities, compared to those of the Empire, seemed small and dirty. Still, there was something strange about the lack of activity here. Both Zun and Ilith had been teeming with soldiers, traders and citizens at midday, even though they were smaller cities than Krondor. As they rode, a feeling of disquiet visited Kasumi. They entered a section of the city even more run down than the warehouse district, 
Here, the streets were narrow, with four- and five-storey buildings hugging closely to either side. Dark shadows abounded, even at noon. Those in the street, a few traders and women going to market, moved quietly and with speed. Everywhere the riders looked, they could see expressions of caution and distrust. Lorry led Kasumi to a gate, behind which the upper part of a three-storey building could be seen. Lorry leaned over in the saddle and pulled on a bell rope. When there was no answer after a few minutes, he pulled again. A moment later, a peak window in the door slid aside. Two eyes could be seen, and a voice said, What's your business? Lorry's tone was sharp. Lucas, is that you? What's happening when travellers can't gain entrance? The eyes widened and the peak window slid shut. The gate swung open with a creaking protest and a man stepped out to push it wide. Lorry, you scoundrel, he said as he admitted the riders. It's been five, no, six years. They rode in and Lorry was shocked by the condition of the inn. Off to one side was a dilapidated stable. Opposite the gate, a sign hung over the main entrance, depicting in faded hues a parrot of many colours with wings spread. They could hear the gate close behind them. The man called Lucas, tall and gaunt with grey hair, said, You'll have to stable the animals yourself. I'm alone here and must return to the common room before my guests steal everything there. I'll see you and your friend inside and we can talk. He turned away, and the two riders were left to tend their mounts. As they removed the saddles from the horses, Lorry said, There's a lot happening here that I don't understand. The Rainbow Parrot was never a show place, but it was always one of the better taverns in the poor quarter. He quietly rubbed down his animal. If there's any place we can find out what's truly going on in Crondor, this is it. And one thing I have learned over my years of travelling through the kingdom is when gate guards are watching travellers closely... It's time to stay somewhere they're not likely to visit. You can get your throat cut quickly in the poor quarter, but you'll rarely see a guardsman about. And if they do come, the man who is trying to cut your throat will more than likely hide you until they're gone. And then try to cut your throat. Lorry laughed. You learn quickly. When the horses were cared for, the two travellers carried their saddles and packs into the inn. Inside, they were greeted by the sight of a dimly lit common room with a long bar along the rear wall. On the left stood a large fireplace, and on the right, a stairway leading upward. There were a number of empty tables in the room, and two with customers. The newcomers were given a quick look by the guests, who then returned to their drinks and quiet conversation. Laurie and Kasumi crossed over to the bar, where Lucas stood cleaning some wine cups with a less-than-clean rag. They dropped their packs at their feet, and Laurie said, Any Keshian wine? Lucas said, A little, but it's expensive. There's been little trade with Kesh since the trouble started. Laurie looked at Lucas, as if weighing the cost. Then uh, two ales. Lucas drew two large tankards of ale and said, it's good to see you, Laurie. I've missed that tender voice of yours. Laurie said, That's not what you said the last time. As I recall, you likened it to the screeching of a cat looking for a fight. They chuckled over that. And Lucas said, With things so bleak, I have mellowed toward those who were true friends. There are a few of us left. He threw a pointed look at Kasumi. Laurie said, This is Kenneth, a true friend of mine, Lucas. Lucas continued to regard the Sirani for a moment, then smiled. Laurie's recommendation counts heavily. Welcome. He extended his hand, and Kasumi shook with him, kingdom fashion. I am pleased at your welcome. Lucas frowned at the sound of his accent. An outlander? From the Vale of Dreams, said Kasumi. The kingdom side, added Laurie. Lucas studied the fighter. After a moment, he shrugged. Whatever. It matters not a whit to me, but, uh, be wary. These are suspicious times, and there's little love wasted on strangers. Take care who you speak with, for there are rumours that Keshi's dog soldiers are ready to move north again, and you're not far from being Keshian. Before Kasumi could say anything, Laurie said, Is there to be trouble with Kesh, then? Lucas shook his head. 
I can't say. The market has more rumours than a beggar has boils. His voice lowered. Two weeks back, traders arrived with word the empire of Great Kesh was again fighting far to the south, seeking to subdue their former vassals in the Confederacy once more. So things should stay quiet for a while. They learned the folly of a two-front war over a hundred years back when they managed to lose all of Bazania and still not beat the Confederacy. Laurie said, We've been travelling for a very long time and have heard little news. Why is Bastira's banner over Crondor? Lucas quickly looked around the room. The drinkers seemed oblivious to the conversation at the bar, but Lucas motioned for silence. I will show you a room, he said loudly. Both Laurie and Kasumi were a little surprised, but picked up their belongings and followed Lucas upstairs without comment. He led them to a small room with two beds and a nightstand. When the door was closed behind, he said, I'll trust you, Laurie, so I'll ask no questions. But no, things have changed greatly since you were last here. Even in the poor quarter, there are ears that belong to the Viceroy. Bastira has the city under his boot heel, and is a foolish man who speaks without seeing who's listening. Lucas sat down on one of the beds, and Laurie and Kasumi sat across from him. Lucas continued. When Bastira came to Crondor, he carried the king's warrant naming him ruler of Crondor with full viceregal powers. Prince Erland and his family were locked up in the palace, though Guy calls it protective custody. Then Guy come down hard on the city. Press gangs roam the waterfront, and many a man now sails in Lord Jessop's fleet without his wife or children knowing what became of their old pa. Since then, any who speak against the Viceroy or King simply vanish, because Guy's got secret police listening at every door in the city. Taxes increase each year to pay for the war, and trade's drying up, except for those selling to the army for the war, and they're getting paid in worthless vouchers. These are hard times, and the Viceroy's doing nothing to make them easier. Food is scarce, and there's little money to pay for what there is. Many farmers have lost their farms for taxes, and now the land lies fallow for want of someone to till it. So the farmers wander into the city, swelling the population. Most of the young men have been drafted into the army or the fleet. Be careful you ain't picked up by the guards for whatever reason, and be wary of the press gangs. Still, Lucas said with a chuckle, things got lively around here for a time when Prince Arifa came to Crondor. Boric's son? He's in the city? asked Laurie. A twinkle of pleasure showed in Lucas's eyes. No longer, he chuckled again. Last winter, as bold as bright brass, the prince comes sailing into Crondor. He must have taken the straits of darkness during the winter, or he never would have reached the city when he did. He quickly told them of Aretha and Anita's escape. Laurie said, Did they return to Criddy? Lucas nodded. A trader in from Cars a week ago was full of news of this and that. One thing he heard was Tsurani were acting up around Jonril, and the Prince of Criddy was ready to come down to help if needed, so Arifa must have got back. Laurie said, He must have been fit to burst at the news. Lucas's smile vanished. Well, he was Laurie. He had tossed Prince Erland into the dungeon to get his permission to marry Anita. He kept him there after he heard of Anita's escape. I guess he thought the girl would come back rather than let her father stay in a damp cell, but he was wrong. Now, the word's on the street, the prince is near death from the chill. That's why the city's in such a state. No one knows what'll happen if Erlen dies. He's well liked, and there might be trouble. Laurie looked at Lucas with an unspoken question. Nothing like rebellion, Lucas answered. We're too dispirited but a few of Guy's guards may turn up missing at muster, and there'll be many inconveniences getting supplies to the garrison and palace and the like, and I wouldn't wish to be the Viceroy's taxman when he's next sent into the poor quarter. Laurie considered what he had heard. We're headed east. What about conditions on the road? Lucas slowly shook his head. Well, there is still some travelling done. Once past Darkmoor, you should have scant trouble, I'm thinking. We hear that things in the east are more as they used to be. Still, I've moved carefully. Kasumi asked, Will we be troubled leaving the city? The north gate's still the best way. 
It's undermanned as usual. For a small fee, the mockers can see you safely through. Mockers? asked the fighter. Lucas raised his brows in surprise. You are from a long way off. The Guild of Thieves. They remain in control of the poor quarter and the uh, upright man still has influence with the merchants and traders, especially along the docks. The warehouse district is their second home after the poor quarter. They can get you out if you have any trouble at the gate. Laurie said, We'll keep that in mind, Lucas. What of your family? I ain't seen them around. Lucas seemed to shrink into himself. My wife's dead, Laurie, of the fever, a year ago. My sons are both in the army. I've heard little of them in a year. Last time I received a message, they were in the north with Lords Borick and Brukel. The city's full of veterans of the war. You see them everywhere. They're the ones with missing limbs or blind eyes. But they always wear their old tabards. And a prophetic sight they are too. He got a faraway look in his eyes. I just hope my boys don't end up like that. Laurie and Kasumi said nothing. Lucas came out of his reverie. I must return downstairs. Supper will be ready in four hours, though nothing like I used to serve. As the innkeeper turned to go, he said, If you need to contact the mockers, let me know. After he had left, Kasumi said, It is a hard thing to know your country, Laurie, and still look upon the war as glorious. Laurie nodded. The warehouse was dark and musty. Except for Laurie and Kasumi and two fresh horses, it was empty. They had stayed at the Rainbow Parrot the night before and had purchased new mounts at great expense, then had tried to leave the city. When they had reached the city gates, they had been stopped by a detachment of Bastira's guards. When it was obvious that the guards were not likely to let them leave without trouble, Laurie and Kasumi had broken away from them, and a mad dash through the city had followed. They had lost their pursuers in the poor quarter and had returned to the Rainbow Parrot. Lucas had sent word to the upright man, and now they waited for a thief to guide them out of the city. A whistle broke the silence, and Laurie and Kasumi had their swords in hand in an instant. A high-pitched chuckle greeted them, and a small figure dropped from above. In the dark it was difficult to see where the figure sprang from, but Laurie suspected their visitor had been hiding in the rafters for some time. The figure stepped forward, and in the dim light they could see it was a boy, no older than thirteen. There's a party at Mother's, the newcomer said. And a good time will be had by all, Laurie answered. You're the travellers, then? You're the guide, asked Kasumi, taking no effort to hide the surprise in his voice. The boy's voice was filled with bravado. Aye, Jimmy the Hand is your guide, and a better one in all Crondor you'll not find. Laurie said, What's to be done? First, there's the matter of payment. It's hundred sovereigns each. Without comment, Laurie dug out several small gems and handed them over. What these do? The boy turned to the warehouse door and cracked it slightly, admitting a shaft of moonlight. He inspected the gems with an expert's eye and returned to stand before the two fugitives. These'll do. For another hundred you can have this. He offered a piece of parchment. Laurie took it but couldn't make out what was written on it in the dim light. What is it? Jimmy chuckled. A royal warrant allowing the bearer to travel the king's highway. Is it genuine? asked the minstrel. My word. I nicked it myself from a trader from Ludland this morning. It's valid for another month. Done, said Laurie, and the minstrel gave the boy another gem. When the gems were safely in the thief's pouch, he said, Soon we'll be hearing a brouhaha at the gate. A few of the boys will put on some mummery for the guards. When everything's up in the wind, we'll slip through. He returned to the door and looked out without further comment. While they waited, Kasumi whispered, Can he be trusted? No. But we have no choice. If the upright man could show a larger profit by turning us in, he might. But the mockers have little love for the guards, and now less than usual, according to Lucas. So it's unlikely. Still, keep your wits about you. Time stretched on interminably. Then, suddenly, shouts could be heard. 
Jimmy signalled with a sharp whistle, which was answered by another from outside. It's time, he said, and was out of the door. Lorry and Kasumi led their horses out after him. Follow closely and quickly, their small guide said as he set off. They rounded the corner of a building and could see the north gate. A group of men were involved in a brawl, many appearing to be sailors from the docks. The guards were doing their best to restore order, but each time one pushed a combatant out of the fray, another would appear from the shadows around the gate and join in. In a few minutes, every guard was involved in breaking up the fight, and Jimmy said, Now! He broke from the building with the travellers close behind and dashed to the wall next to the gatehouse. They edged their way along in the shadows, the horses' clatter covered by the noise of the brawl. When they were near the gate, a single guard could be seen on the other side, whom they hadn't been able to see from their previous location. Laurie gripped Jimmy's shoulder. We'll have to take him quickly. Jimmy said, No, if weapons are drawn, the guards will leave that little bit of fun like a burning whorehouse. Leave him to me. Jimmy sprang forward and ran to the guard. As the guard brought his spear forward across his chest and shouted, Halt! Jimmy kicked him hard in the leg above the boot. The man let out a howl, then looked at his small assailant with fury on his face. Why, you little... Jimmy stuck out his tongue and started to run toward the docks. The guard set out in hot pursuit, and the two travellers slipped through the gate. Once outside the city, they mounted quickly and rode off. As they rode away from Crondor, they could hear the sounds of the brawl. They rested a day at Darkmoor in an inn in the town below the castle. They had been two days in the hills and needed to rest their mounts before journeying over the grasslands to Malak's Cross. The town was quiet and little of interest occurred until the inn door opened and a man in dirty brown robes entered. The man was old and bent with years and thin to the point of gauntness. The innkeeper looked up from cleaning ale cups and said, What do you wish? Softly, the old man said, Please, sir, a, a little food. Can you pay? I can fashion spells to rid your inner vermin, should you be plagued by rats, sir. Perhaps... Be gone. I have no food for beggars or magicians. Get out. And if I find my milk clabbered, I'll set my dogs upon you. The magician looked around. Lorry reached across the table and touched Kasumi upon the arm. His Tsirani heritage was betraying him, as he was showing open astonishment at what he saw. Before him stood a magician, being treated as shabbily as his clothes. Laurie's touch caused him to regain his composure. The magician slowly turned and left the inn. Laurie sprang up and crossed to the innkeeper. Slapping some coins on the table, he said, Quick, a joint of cold meat, a loaf of bread and a skin of wine. The innkeeper looked surprised, but the coins on the bar convinced him to do as ordered. When the items ordered were upon the bar, Laurie scooped them up. He paused a moment to grab a wedge of cheese off a platter and rushed out the door. Kasumi was as amazed as the innkeeper appeared to be. Laurie looked down the road and saw the old man, his posture erect as he moved along with a staff in one hand, using it as a walking stick. He ran after the man and, when he had overtaken him, said, Excuse me, but I was in the tavern a moment ago and, um, he held out the food and wineskin. He saw pride diminish in the old man's eyes. Why are you doing this, minstrel? Laurie said, I have a friend who is a magician, a special friend. He did me a great kindness once, and I... It's something of a repayment. The magician accepted this explanation and took the food. While he struggled with the burden, Laurie slipped a pair of gems into the magician's empty belt pouch. There would be enough to ensure the magician never had to go hungry again, if he lived modestly. What is this magician's name? Perhaps I know him. Milumba. The old man shook his head. I have not heard of him. Where does he abide? Laurie looked to the west, where the sun set behind the hills. With strong emotions in his voice, he said, Far from here, my friend. Very far from here. The ship beat against the waves while the crew reefed the sails. Laurie and Kasumi stood on deck watching the spires and towers of Rilanan as the ship put into harbour. A fabulous city, said the former Surani officer. 
Not as large as the cities of home, but so different. All those tiny fingers of stone and the colours of the banners make it look like a city of legend. Strange, said Laurie. Pug and I felt the same when we first saw Jamar. I suppose it's simply that they're so different from each other. They stood on the open deck, cool in the breezes, but still able to feel the warmth of the sun. Both were dressed in the finest clothing they could buy in Salador, for they wished to be presentable at court, and knew they had little chance of being admitted to see the king should they look like simple vagabonds. The ship's captain ordered the last sails taken in, and the ship slid into place alongside the docks a few moments later. Ropes were thrown to men waiting on the quay, and the vessel was quickly made fast. As soon as they were able, the two travellers were down the gangway and making their way through the city. Rilanon, the fabled and ancient capital of the Kingdom of the Isles, stood bedecked in colours, flashing brightly in the sunlight, but there was an undercurrent of tension in the atmosphere of the streets and markets. Everywhere they passed, people spoke in hushed tones, as if they feared someone might overhear them, and even the hawkers in the street stalls seemed to offer their wares half-heartedly. It was nearly the noon hour, and without seeking rooms they headed straight for the palace. When they reached the main gate, an officer in the purple and gold of the royal household guard inquired their business. Laurie said, We bring messages of the greatest importance to the king regarding the war. The officer considered. They were dressed well enough, and didn't appear to be the usual madmen with predictions of doom or prophets of some nameless truth, but they were not officials of the court or army either. He decided on the course of action followed most often in the armies of all nations in all times, passing them along to a higher authority. A guard escorted them to the office of an assistant of the royal chancellor. Here they were made to wait for half an hour before the assistant would see them. They entered the man's office and were confronted by the steward of the royal household, a self-important little man with a pot belly and a chronic wheeze when he spoke. What business do you gentlemen have? he inquired, making it clear that his estimation of them was provisional. We carry word to the king regarding the war, Laurie answered. Oh, he sniffed. And why aren't these documents or messages or whatever they are being delivered by the proper military pouch? Kasumi, obviously frustrated with the wait now that they were in the palace, said, Let us speak with someone who can take us to the king. The steward of the royal household looked outraged. I am Baron Grey. I am the one to whom you will speak, man, and I have a good mind to have the guards toss you into the street. His Majesty cannot be bothered with every charlatan who tries to seek an audience. I am the one you must satisfy, and you have not. Kasumi stepped forward and gripped the man by the front of his tunic. And I am Kasumi of the Shinzawai. My father is Kamatsu, Lord of the Shinzawai, and war chief of the Kanazawai clan. I will see your king. Lord Grey paled visibly. He frantically pulled at Kasumi's hand and tried to speak. His shock at what he had just heard and what he felt at being handled this way raced within him. It all proved to be too much for him to speak. He nodded frantically until Kasumi released him. Brushing at his tunic front, the man said, The Royal Chancellor will be informed at once. He walked to a door, and Laurie watched him in case he called for guards, thinking them madmen. Whatever else the man thought, Kasumi's manner convinced him he was something quite different from anything heretofore seen. A messenger was sent, and, in a few minutes, an elderly man entered the room. He simply said, What is it? Your Grace, said the steward, I think you had best talk to these men and consider if His Majesty should see them. The man turned to study the two other men in the office. I am Duke Caldrick, the Royal Chancellor. What reason do you have to see His Majesty? Kasumi said, I bring a message from the Emperor of Suranuani. The king sat in a pavilion on a balcony overlooking the harbour. 
Below, a mountain river passed directly before the palace, part of the original defence design, though no longer needed as a moat. Graceful bridges could be seen arching above it, carrying people from one side of the river to the other. King Roderick sat, seemingly attentive to what Kasumi was saying. He toyed absently with a golden ball in his right hand, while Kasumi outlined in detail the emperor's message of peace. Roderick was silent for a while after Kasumi finished, as if weighing what he had heard. Kasumi handed a sheaf of documents to Duke Caldrick, then waited for the king's answer. After another moment of silence, Kasumi added, "The emperor's proposals." Are outlined in these parchments in detail, Your Majesty. Should you wish to study them at your leisure, I will wait upon your convenience to carry your reply. Still, Roderick was silent, and the courtiers gathered nearby looked at one another nervously. Kasumi was about to speak again when the king said, "I'm always amused when watching my little subjects hurrying about the city like so many ants." I often wonder what they think, living out their simple little lives. He turned to look at the two emissaries. You know, I could order any one of them put to death. Just pick one out from this very balcony. Should I choose? I could just say to my guards, "See that fellow in the blue cap? Go hack his head off," and they would, you know. That's because I'm king. Lorry felt a chill run up his back. This was worse than anything he had imagined. The king seemed not to have heard a single word spoken. Kasumi said very quietly in the Surani language, "If we should fail, one of us must carry word back to my father." At this, the king's head snapped up, his eyes grew wide, and he spoke with a tremble in his voice. "What is this?" His voice rose in pitch. "I will have no one whispering." His face took on a feral appearance. You know, they are always whispering about me, the disloyal ones. But I know who they are, and I will see them on their knees before me. Yes, I will. A traitor, Kerus, was on his knees before I had him hanged. I would have hanged his family had they not fled to Kesh. He then studied Kasumi. You think to trick me with your strange story and these so-called documents? Any fool could see through your guise. You are spies. Duke Caldrick looked pained and tried to calm the king. Several guards stood nearby, shifting their weight from foot to foot, uncomfortable at what they were hearing. The king pushed the solicitor's duke away. His voice took on a near hysterical tone. You are agents of that traitor Boric. He and my uncle were plotting to take my throne, but I stopped that. My uncle Erland is dead. He paused for a moment, as if confused. No, I, I, I mean he is ill. That is why my loyal Duke Guy was sent from Bastira to rule Crondor until my beloved uncle was well. His eyes seemed to clear for a moment. Then he said, "I am not feeling well. Please excuse me. I will speak to you again tomorrow." He rose from his chair. After he had taken a step, he turned back to look at Lorry and Kasumi. What was it you wanted to see me about? Oh yes, peace. Yes, that's good. This war's a terrible thing. We must end it so that I can go back to my building. We must begin the building again. A page took the king's arm and led him away. The royal chancellor said, "Follow me, and say nothing." He hurried them through the palace and led them to a room with two guards before the door. One guard opened the door for them, and they entered. Inside, they found a bedroom with two large beds and a table with chairs in the corner. The chancellor said, "Your arrival is poorly timed. Our king is, as you can no doubt see, a, a sick man, and I fear he will not recover. I hope he will be able to understand your message tomorrow. Please stay here until you are sent for. A meal will be brought to you." He crossed over to the door. And before he left, said, "Until tomorrow." A shout awoke them in the night. Lorry rose quickly and went to the window. Peering through the curtains, he could see a figure on the balcony below. In his nightshirt, King Roderick stood, sword in hand, poking into the bushes. Lorry opened the window as Kasumi joined him. From below, they could hear the king's cries: "Assassins! They've come!"
Guards ran out and searched the bushes, while court pages led the shrieking monarch back to his room. Kasumi said, "In truth, the gods have touched him. They must surely hate your nation." Lori said, "I'm afraid, friend Kasumi, that the gods have little to do with this. Right now, I think we are best see to find a way out of here. I have a feeling that His Royal Majesty is ill suited for the finer points of negotiating a peace. I think we best make our way west and speak with Duke Boric." Will he be able to stop the war, this duke? Laurie crossed over to the chair upon which his clothing was draped. Picking up his tunic, he said, "I hope so. If the lords here can watch the king behave in such a manner and do nothing, then we will have civil war soon. Better to settle one war before beginning another." They dressed quickly. Laurie said, "Let us hope we can find a ship putting out on the morning tide. If the king orders the port closed, we're trapped. It's a long swim." As they gathered up their belongings, the door opened and the royal chancellor entered. He stopped and saw them standing there, fully dressed. "Good," he said, quickly closing the door. "You have as much sense as I had hoped you would. The king has ordered the spies put to death." Lorry was incredulous. He thinks us spies. Duke Caldrick sat in one of the chairs by the table, fatigue clearly showing on his face. Who knows what His Majesty is thinking these days? There are a few of us who try to stay his more terrible impulses, but it becomes more and more difficult each day. There is a sickness in him that is terrible to watch. Years ago, he was an impetuous man. It's true, but there was also a vision to his plans, a certain mad brilliance that could have made this the greatest nation in Midkemia. There are many in the court now who take advantage of him, using his fears to further their own designs. I'm afraid that soon I will be branded a traitor, and join the others in death. Kasumi buckled on his sword. Why stay, Your Grace? If this is true, why not come with us to Duke Boric? The Duke looked at the older son of the Shinzawa. I am a noble of the kingdom, and he is my king. I must do whatever I can to keep him from harming the kingdom, even if the price is my life. But I cannot raise arms against him, nor aid those who do. I don't know how things are with your world, Sirani, but here I must stay. He is my king. Kasumi nodded. I understand. In your place, I would do the same. You are a brave man, Duke Caldrick. The duke stood. I am a tired man. The king has taken strong drink from my hand. He will drink from no other, for he fears poison. I had the chirurgeon give him something for sleep. You should be out to see when he awakens. I don't know if he will remember your visit, but rest assured that someone will remind him within a day or two at the outside. So do not linger. Make straight for Lord Boric and tell him what has happened. Laurie said, "Is Prince Erland truly dead?" Yes. Word reached us a week ago. His failing health could not withstand the cold dungeon. Boric is now heir to the throne. Roderick has never wed. His fear of others is too deep. The fate of the kingdom rests with Boric. Tell him so. They crossed to the door. Before the duke opened it, he said, "Also, tell him that it is likely I will be dead should he come to Rilanon. It will be a good thing." For I would have to stand against any who raised arms against the royal standard. Before Lori or Kasumi could say anything, he opened the door. Two guards stood outside, and the duke ordered them to escort Lori and Kasumi to the docks. The Royal Swallow is anchored in the harbour. Give this to the captain. He held out a piece of paper to Lori. It's a royal warrant commanding him to carry you to Salador. He held out a second paper. This is another. Commanding any of the armies of the kingdom to aid your travel. They grasped each other by the hand. Then the two emissaries followed the guards down the corridor. Lorry looked over his shoulder at Caldrick as they left. The old duke waited, stoop-shouldered and tired, his face lined by worry and sorrow as well as fear. As they turned a corner, losing sight of the duke, Lorry thought no price in the world would make him exchange places with that old man. 
The horses were lathered. The riders whipped them up the hill. They were on the last leg of their journey to Lord Borick, begun over a month before, and the end was in sight. The Royal Swallow had sped them to Salador, where they had left at once for the west. They had slept little along the way, trading for fresh mounts or commandeering them whenever possible, from horse patrols with the royal warrant given them by Caldrick. Lorry wasn't sure, but he suspected they had covered the distance faster than it had ever been travelled before. Several times since leaving Zoon, they had been challenged by soldiers. Each time they had presented the Chancellor's warrant and were passed through. Now they approached the Duke's camp. The Sirani warlord had unleashed his major offensive. The kingdom forces had held for a week, then collapsed, when ten thousand fresh Sirani soldiers had come pouring through their lines, tipping the balance. The fighting had been bitter then, a raging, running battle lasting three days before the kingdom army was finally routed. When it was over, a large portion of the front had fallen, and the Sirani had thrown up a salient out of the North Pass. Now the elves and dwarves, as well as the castles of the far coast, were cut off from the main force of the kingdom army. There was no communication of any sort, for the pigeons used to carry messages had been destroyed when the old camp had been overrun. The fate of the other fronts was unknown. The armies of the west were regrouping, and it took Lorry and Kasumi some time to find the headquarters camp. As they rode up to the command pavilion. They saw signs of bitter defeat on every side. It was the worst setback of the war for the kingdom. Everywhere they looked, they saw wounded or sick men, and those who showed no wounds had the look of despair. A guard sergeant inspected their warrant and sent a guard with them to show them where the duke's tent stood. They reached the large command tent, and a lackey took their mounts from them as the guard went inside. A moment later, a tall young man. Blond bearded and wearing the tabard of Criddy came out. Behind him, another, a stout man with a grey beard, a magician by his garb, and another man, large, with a ragged scar down his face. Lorry wondered if they might be old friends Pug had spoken of, but quickly focused his attention on the young officer who stopped before him. I bring a message to Lord Borick. The young man smiled a bitter smile, then said. You may give me the message, sir. I am Liam, his son. Lorry said, "I mean no disrespect, Highness, but I must speak with the Duke in person. So I was instructed by Duke Caldrick." At mention of the Royal Chancellor's name, Liam exchanged glances with his companions, then held aside the tent flap. Lorry and Kasumi entered, the others following. Inside, there was a small brazier burning and a large table with maps upon it. Liam led them to another section of the huge tent, curtained off from the rest. He pulled back the hanging, and they saw a man lying upon a sleeping pallet. He was a tall man with dark hair streaked with grey. His face was drawn, drained of blood. His lips nearly blue. His breathing was ragged, each breath rattling loudly as he slept. He wore clean bedclothing, but heavy bandages could be seen beneath his loose collar. Liam put back the hanging. As another man entered the tent, old with a near white mane of hair, he was still erect and broad-shouldered. Softly he said, "What is this?" Liam answered, "These men bring messages for Father from Caldrick." The old warrior stuck out his hand, "Give them to me." When Laurie hesitated, the man nearly barked, "Damn it, fellow! I'm Brukel." With Borick wounded, I'm commander of the armies of the West. Lorry said, "I've no written message, Your Grace." Duke Caldrick says to introduce my companion. This is Kasumi of the Shinzawai, emissary of the Emperor of Suarawani, who carries an offering of peace to the king. Liam said, "Is there to be peace at last?" Lorry shook his head. Sadly, no. The duke also said to say this: the king is mad, and the duke of Bastira has slain Prince Erland. He fears only Lord Borick can save the kingdom. Brukel was visibly shaken by the news. To Liam, he said quietly, "Now we know the rumours to be true. 
Erland was Guy's prisoner. Erland dead. I can scarcely believe it. Shaking off his shock, he said, Lam, I know your mind is upon your father now, but you must bend your thoughts to this. Your father is near death. You will soon be Duke of Criddy, and with Erland dead, you will also be heir to the throne by right of birth. Brukel sat heavily upon a stool near the map table. This is a heavy burden thrust upon you, Liam, but others in the West will look to you for leadership, as they once looked to your father. If there was any love between the two realms, it is now strained to breaking point, with Guy upon the throne in Crondor. It is now clear for all to see Bastira means to be king, for a mad Roderick cannot be allowed his throne much longer. He fixed Liam with a steady gaze. You will soon have to decide what we in the West shall do. Upon your word, we have civil war. Chapter 29 Decision The holy city was festive. Banners flew from every tall building. People lined the streets, throwing flowers before the nobles who were carried on their litters to the stadium. It was a day of high celebration, and who could feel troubled on such a day? One who did feel troubled arrived in the pattern room of the stadium, the final reverberations of a chime signalling the appearance of a great one of the Surinuani. Millember shrugged off his preoccupation for a moment as he left the pattern room near the central gallery of the Grand Imperial Stadium. The crowd of Surani nobles, idling away the time before the games began, parted to allow Millember to pass through the archway leading to the magician's seats. Glancing around the small sea of black robes, he noticed Shimon and Hotchapepper, who were keeping a place for him. They signalled greetings as he left the aisle between the magician's section and the imperial parties and joined them. Below, on the arena floor, some of the dwarf-like folk from Tsubar, the so-called lost land across the Sea of Blood, were fighting large insect creatures like Choja, but without intelligence. Soft wooden swords and essentially harmless bites from mandibles provided a conflict more comic than dangerous. The commoners and lesser nobles already in their seats laughed in appreciation. These contests kept them amused while the great and near-great were waiting to enter the stadium. Tardiness in Siruani became a virtue when one reached a certain social level. Shimon said, It's a shame you took so long getting here, Melamba. There was a singularly fine match a short while ago. I was under the impression the killing wasn't to begin just yet. Hotcher Pepper, munching nuts cooked in sweet oil, said, True, but our friend Shimon is something of an aficionado of the games. Shimon said, Earlier, young officers of noble family fought with training weapons to first blood to better display their skills and win honours for their clans. Not to mention the fruits of some rather heavy wagering interjected Hotcher Pepper. Ignoring the remark, Shimon continued, There was a spirited match between sons of the Oran Almar and the Kedar. I have not seen a better display in years. While Shimon described the match, Milimba let his gaze wander. He could see the small standards of the Kedar, Minwanabi, Oxatukan, Zacatecas, Anasati, and other great families of the empire. He noticed that the banner of the Shinzawai was absent and wondered at it. Hotcher Pepper said, You seem much preoccupied, Milimba. Milimba nodded agreement. Before leaving for today's festival, I received word that a motion to reform land taxes and abolish debt slavery had been introduced in the High Council yesterday. The message came from the Lord of the Tuklamekla, and I couldn't for the life of me understand why he sent it until, near the end, he thanked me for providing the concepts of social reform the motion was intended to enact. I was appalled at such an action. Shimon laughed. Had you been so thick-witted a student, you'd still be wearing the white robe. Millember looked back blankly, and Hotcher Pepper said, You go about causing all sorts of rumblings with your speeches before the assembly, constantly harping on all manner of social ills, and then sit dumbfounded because someone out there listened. What I said to our brother magicians was not intended for discussion outside the assembly halls. How unreasonable, said Hotcher Pepper. Someone in the assembly spoke to a friend who wasn't a magician. What I'd like to know, said Shimon, 
is how this potful of reforms placed before the High Council by the Hunzan clan has your name appended to it. Millenba looked uncomfortable. To the delight of his friends, one of the young artists who worked on the murals at my estate is a son of the Tuklamekla. We did discuss differences between Sirani and kingdom cultures and social values, but only as an outgrowth of our discussions of the differences in styles of art. Hotcho Pepper looked skyward, as if seeking divine guidance. When I heard the Party for Progress, which is dominated by the Hunzan clan, which is dominated by the Tuklamekla family, cited you as inspiration, I could scarcely believe my hearing. But now I can see your hand is in every problem plaguing the Empire. He looked at his friend with a mock serious expression. Tell me, is it true the Party for Progress is going to change its name to the Party of Milimba? Shimon laughed, while Milimba fixed Hotcha Pepper with a baleful look. <sighs> Katara thinks it amusing when I get upset by this sort of thing, Hotcho, and you might think it funny as well, but I want it publicly known I did not intend for this to happen. I simply offered some observations and opinions, and what the Hunzan clan and the Party for Progress does with them is not my doing. Hotcho Pepper said in chiding tones, I fear that if so famous a personage as yourself wishes not to have such things occur then such a personage should have his mouth sewn shut. Shimon laughed, and Milimba felt his own mirth rise. Very well, Hotcho, answered Milimba. I will take the blame. Still, I, I don't know if the Empire is yet ready for the changes I think needed. Shimon said, We have heard your arguments before, Milimba, but today is not the time, nor is this the place for social debate. Let us attend to the matters at hand. Remember, Many of the assembly are offended by your concerns over matters they judge political, and while I tend to support your notions as refreshing and progressive, keep in mind you are making enemies. Trumpets and drums sounded, signalling the approach of the Imperial Party and cutting off further conversation. The Tsuba folk and the insectoids were chased from the arena, handlers herding them away. When the field was cleared, groundskeepers hurried out with rakes and drags to smooth the sand. The sound of the trumpets could be heard again, and the first members of the imperial procession, heralds in the imperial white, entered. They carried long, curved trumpets, fashioned from the horns of some large beast, which curled around their shoulders to end above their heads. They were followed by drummers, who beat a steady tattoo. When they were in position in front of the imperial box, the warlord's honour guard entered. Each wore armour and helm, finished in nidrahide, bleached free of all colour. Around the breastplate and helm of each, precious gold trim gleamed in the sun. Milimba heard Hotcho Pepper mutter at the waste of this rare metal. When they were stationed, a senior herald announced, Almecho! Warlord! And the crowd rose, cheering. He was accompanied by his retinue, including several in black robes, the warlord's pet magicians, as the others of the assembly referred to them. Chief among these were the two brothers, Elgahar and Ergoran. Then the herald cried, Ichindar! Ninety-one times emperor! The crowd roared its approval as the young light of heaven made his entrance. He was attended by priests of each of the twenty orders. The crowd stood, thundering. On and on it went, and Milimba wondered if the love of the Tsirani people would sustain the light of heaven should a confrontation between warlord and emperor take place. In spite of the Tsirani reverence for tradition, he did not think the warlord a man to step down meekly from his office, a thing unheard of in history, should the emperor so order. As the noise died down, Shimon said, It seems, friend Melumba, that the contemplative life doesn't suit the light of heaven. Can't say that I blame him. Sitting around all day with no one for company but a lot of priests and silly girls chosen for their beauty instead of conversational ability. Must become frightfully boring. Melumba laughed. I doubt most men would agree. Shimon shrugged. I constantly forget you were quite old when you were trained. And you have a wife also. At mention of wives, Hotcho Pepper looked pained. He interrupted. The warlord is going to make an announcement. Almecho rose and held his hands aloft for silence. 
When the stadium fell quiet, his voice rang out. The gods smile upon Sir Nuani. I bring news of a great victory over the other world barbarians. We have crushed their greatest army, and our warriors celebrate. Soon, all the lands called the kingdom will be laid at the light of heaven's feet. He turned and bowed deferentially to the emperor. Milumba felt a stab at the news. Without being aware, he began to stand, only to have Hotcho Pepper grip his arm and hiss, You are Surani! Milumba shook himself free of the unexpected shock and composed himself. Thank you, Hotcho. I nearly forgot myself. Hush! said Hotcho Pepper. They returned their attention to the warlord. And, as a sign of our devotion to the light of heaven, we dedicate these games to his honour. A cheer rang through the arena, and the warlord sat down. Milumba spoke quietly to his friends. It seems the emperor is less than ecstatic at the news. Hotcha Pepper and Shimon turned to watch the emperor, who was sitting with a stoic expression upon his face. Hotcha Pepper said, He hides it well. But I think you're right, Milumba. Something in all this disturbs him. Milumba said nothing, knowing well enough the cause. This victory would blunt the Blue Wheel Peace Initiative and would gain the warlord more power at the Emperor's expense. Shimon tapped Milumba upon the shoulder. The games begin. As the doors on the arena floor opened to admit the combatants, Milumba studied the Emperor. He was young, in his early twenties, and possessed a look of intelligence. His brow was high, and his reddish-brown hair was allowed to grow to his shoulders. He turned in Milumba's direction to speak with a priest at his side, and Milumba could see his clear green eyes glint in the sun. Their eyes made contact for a moment, and there was a brief flicker of recognition, and Milumba thought, So you have been told of my part in your plan. The Emperor continued his conversation without missing a beat, and no one else saw the exchange. Hotchi Pepper said, This is a clemency spectacle. They will all fight until only one stands. He will be pardoned for his crimes. What are their crimes? Milumba asked. Shimon answered, the usual. Petty theft, begging without temple authority, bearing false witness, avoiding taxes, disobeying lawful orders and the like. What about capital crimes? Murder, treason, blasphemy, striking one's master, all are unpardonable crimes. His voice rose to carry over the crowd noises. They are put in with war prisoners who will not serve as slaves. They are sentenced to fight over and over until they are killed. A guard of soldiers left the floor, abandoning the sand to the prisoners. Hotche Pepper said, Common criminals, there will be little sport. There seemed to be accuracy in the remark, for the prisoners were a sad-looking lot. Naked but for loincloths, they stood with weapons and shields that were foreign to them. Many were old and sick, seemingly lost and confused, holding their axes, swords and spears loosely at their sides. The trumpet sounded the start of combat, and the old and sick ones were quickly killed. Several had never even raised their weapons in defence, being too confused to try to stay alive. Within minutes, nearly half the prisoners lay dead or dying on the sand. Shortly, the action slackened, as combatants came face to face with opponents of more equal skill and cunning. Slowly, the numbers diminished, and the free-flowing, riotous nature of the contest changed. Occasionally, when an opponent fell, a combatant was left standing next to another fighting pair. Often this resulted in three-way combat, which the mob approved with loud cheering, as the awkward combat would result in an excess of bloodshed and pain. At the end, three fighters remained. Two of them had not managed to resolve their conflict. Both were on the verge of exhaustion. The third man approached cautiously, keeping equal distance between himself and both men, looking for an advantage. He had it a few seconds later. Using knife and sword, he jumped forward and dealt one of the combatants a blow to the side of the head that felled him. Shimon said, The idiot! Couldn't he see the other man is the stronger fighter? He should have waited until one man was clearly at an advantage, then struck at him, leaving the weaker opponent to fight. 
Millenba felt shaky. Shimon, his former teacher, was his closest friend after Hotcho Pepper. Yet for all his education, all his wisdom, he was howling after the blood of others as if he were the most ignorant commoner in the least expensive seat. No matter how he tried, Millenba could not master the Tsirani enthusiasm for the death of others. He turned to Shimon and said, I'm sure he was a little too busy to trouble himself over the finer points of tactics. His sarcasm was lost on Shimon, closely watching the combat. Millenba noticed Hotcho Pepper was ignoring the contest. The wily magician was taking note of every conversation in the stands. To him, the games were only another opportunity to study the subtle aspects of the game of the council. Millenba found this blindness to the death and suffering below as disturbing as Shimon's enthusiasm. The fight was quickly over, the man with the knife winning. The crowd greeted the victory with enthusiasm. Coins were thrown on the sand so that the victor would return to society with a small amount of capital. While the arena was being cleared, Shimon called over a herald and inquired about the balance of the day's activities. He turned to the others, obviously pleased at the news. There are only a few matched pairs, then two special matches, a team of prisoners against a starving Harulth, and a match between some soldiers from Midkemia and captured Thuril warriors. That should prove most interesting. Milimba's expression indicated that he didn't agree. Judging the right time for the question, he said, Hodjo, have you noticed any of the Shinzawai family in attendance? He glanced around the stadium, looking for the family banners of the more prominent houses of the Empire. Minwanabi, Anasati, Kedar, Tonmagu, Zacatecas, Akoma. No, Milumba. I can't say if any of your former, ah, uh, benefactors are to be seen about. Not that I would expect them to be. Why? They uh, find themselves in the warlord's bad graces of late. Something to do with failing some task or another he gave them. And I have heard that they are considered suspect, despite their clans suddenly rejoining the war effort. The Kanazawai clan is lost in all its past glories, and the Shinzawai are the most old-fashioned of the lot. Through the afternoon the matches wore on, each more artful than the previous, as the skill level of the opponents increased. Soon, the last pairs were done. Now, the crowd waited in hushed anticipation. Even the nobles quieted, for the next event was unusual. A team of twenty fighters, mid Kemian from their size, marched out into the centre of the arena. They carried ropes, weighted nets, spears and long curved knives. They wore only loincloths, their bodies oiled and gleaming in the late afternoon light. They stood around, looking relaxed, but the soldiers in the crowd recognised the subtle signs of tension common to fighters before a battle. After a minute, the large double doors at the opposite end of the stadium opened, and a six-legged horror came shambling into the arena. The Harulth was all long teeth and sharp claws, complete with a belligerent attitude and a hide-like armour, and close to the size of a Midkemian elephant. It hesitated only long enough to blink at the light, then charge straight at the party of men before it. They scattered before the creature, seeking to confuse it. The Harulth, through simple or single-mindedness, pursued one hapless fellow. In three enormous strides he ground the man underfoot, then gobbled him down in two bites. The others regrouped behind the animal and quickly deployed the nets. The hexapod spun about, faster than looked possible for a creature of such bulk, and charged again. This time the men waited until the last moment, tossed the nets, then dived away. The nets were edged with hooks to catch in the thick hide of the beast. It stepped into them, and soon was busily tearing apart the mesh. While it was momentarily occupied, the spearmen ran in to strike. The Harulth reacted in confusion, not being sure from which quarter its torment originated. The spears were proving ineffectual, for they could not penetrate the hide of the beast. Quickly realising the futility of this approach, one fighter grabbed another 
and pointed to the rear of the creature. They dashed back toward the tail, which was sweeping back and forth along the ground with the force of a battering ram. They conferred momentarily, then dropped their spears as the creature decided upon a target. It lashed forward and had another man in its maw. For a moment it was still as it swallowed its prey. The two men at the rear ran forward, leaping high up onto the tail of the animal. It seemed not to notice for a moment, then reacted by swinging about violently, throwing the second man off. Having come completely about, it stopped to devour the stunned man. The other somehow contrived to hang on and employed the few moments the Harulf used to eat his comrade to pull himself higher on the creature's tail, where it joined the animal's haunches. With an overhand stroke, he plunged his long-bladed knife between two vertebrae, where they were outlined by loose-hanging skin. It was a desperate gamble, and the stadium crowd screamed approval. The knife penetrated the tough cartilage between the bone segments and pierced the spinal column. The creature bellowed with rage and started to spin, threatening to toss the unwelcome rider. But in a moment, the rearmost pair of legs collapsed. The Harulth stood baffled for a moment, its two forward pairs of legs pulling against the dead weight of its hind quarters. Twice it tried vainly to snap at its small tormentor, but its thick neck was insufficient for the task. The man pulled the blade loose and crawled forward along the spine, while the surviving spearmen darted in and out, distracting the creature. Three times he was nearly tossed off the animal's back, but somehow he managed to retain his position. When he found himself slightly forward of the middle pair of legs, he drove his blade between vertebrae. The central legs collapsed an instant later, and the man was thrown clear of the animal's back. The Harulth screamed its rage and pain, but was effectively immobilised. The fighters backed away and waited. Two spinal cuts proved to be enough. For minutes later, the Harulth fell over in shock, thrashed its forelegs for a time, and lay still. The crowd shouted its enthusiastic approval of the contest, for never had a group of fighters bested a Harulth without losing at least five times as many men. In this contest, only three had died. The fighters stood around, exhaustion causing weapons to fall from limp fingers. The battle had lasted less than ten minutes, but the expenditure in energy, concentration, sweat and fear had worn each man to near prostration. Numbly oblivious to the crowd's cheering, they stumbled toward the exit. Only the man who had actually driven in the knife showed any expression, and he was openly weeping as he moved across the sand. "'Why do you think that man is so distraught?' asked Shimon. "'It was a grand triumph.' Millimber said in a voice forced to calmness, Because he is exhausted and afraid and sick from it. He then added softly, And he is very far from home. He swallowed hard, struggling against outrage, then said, He knows it is for nothing. Again and again he will march into this arena to fight other creatures, other men, even friends from his homeland, and sooner or later he will die. Hodger Pepper stared at Millimber, and Shimon looked confused. But for chance, I might have been with those below, added Millimber. Those who fought are men. They had families and homes. They loved and laughed. Now they wait to die. Hodger Pepper waved a hand absently. Millimber, you have a disturbing habit of taking things personally. Millimber felt sickened and angered by the bloody spectacle, but forced those emotions down within himself. He was determined to stay. He would be Tsurani. The sand was cleared, and trumpets blew again, signalling the final match of the afternoon. A dozen proud-looking warriors dressed in leather battle harnesses, wristbands set with studs and headdresses plumed in many colours, came striding out of one end of the arena. Millimber had never seen their like in person, but recognised their dress from his vision on the tower. These were the descendants of the proud serpent riders, the Turil. 
each wore a hard-eyed expression of grim determination. From the other end, twelve warriors in colour-splashed imitations of Midkemian armour marched out. Their own metal armour had been deemed both too valuable and too dull for the contest, and Sirani artisans had provided stylized imitations. The Thuril stood watching the newcomers with implacable contempt. Of all the races of humanity, only the Thuril had been able to withstand the Empire. The Thuril were uncontestedly the finest mountain fighters in Kelawan, and their mountain holds and high farm pastures were impossible to conquer. They had held the Empire at bay for years until peace had been declared. They were a tall people, the result of their lack of interbreeding with the shorter races of Kelawan, whom they considered inferior. The trumpets blew again, and a hush fell over the crowd. A herald shouted in a clear voice, as these soldiers of the Turil Confederacy have violated the treaty between their own nations and the Empire by making war upon the soldiers of the Emperor, they have been cast out by their own people who have named them outlaws and bound them over for punishment. They will fight the captives from the world of mid -Kemia. All will strive. Until one is left standing! The crowd cheered. The trumpet sounded, and the fighters squared off. The Midkemians crouched, weapons at the ready, but the Thuril stood tall, defiant looks upon their faces. One of the Thuril strode forward, halting before the nearest Midkemian. With contemptuous tones, he spoke rapidly and made a sweeping motion around the arena. Millenba felt a hot flush of anger begin to grow inside, coupled with shame at what he was seeing. There were games in Midkemia, he had heard of them, but they were nothing like this. The men who fought in Krondor and other places throughout the kingdom were professionals, who made a living by fighting to first blood. Occasionally a duel to the death would be fought, but it was always a personal matter, after all other means of settling the dispute had been exhausted. This was a mindless waste of human life for the titillation of the bored and idle, the satiated in search of more and more vivid reminders that their own lives were worth something. Milimba looked around and felt disgust at the expressions on the faces of those nearby. The Thuril warrior continued his ranting while the Midkemian watched, with something in their manner suggesting a shift of mood. Before they were tensed, battle-ready, now they seemed almost relaxed. The Thuril continued pointing up at the assembled throng. Then a Midkemian, tall and broad-shouldered, stepped forward as if to speak. The Thuril came on guard, his sword high, ready to strike. A voice rang out from behind as another warrior said something that carried a note of reassurance. The first Thuril visibly relaxed. The Midkemian slowly removed his helm, revealing a tired, haggard face framed by damp, stringy black hair. He looked about the arena while the crowd began to whisper and grumble at the unexpected behaviour of the warriors, and then gave a curt nod. He dropped his sword and shield and said something to his companions. Quickly, the other fighters in the arena followed suit, and soon all weapons were lying upon the ground. Milimba wondered at this strange behaviour, and Shimon said, this will end a shambles. The Thuru will not fight their own kind, and it seems they won't fight the barbarians either. I once saw six Thuril kill everyone sent against them, then refuse to fight one another. When the guards came to kill them, they fought, driving them back. Finally, bowmen on the wall had to shoot them down. It was a disgrace. The crowd rioted and the game's director was torn to bits. Over a hundred citizens died. Milumba felt relief. At least he would be spared the spectacle of Katala's people and his own killing one another. Then the crowd began to shout their disapproval, jeering the reluctant combatants. Hotcho Pepper nudged Milimba and said, The warlord appears less than amused by this. Milimba saw the warlord's livid expression as he watched his presentation to the emperor turned into a farce.
Almecho slowly rose from his place near the light of heaven and bellowed, "Let the fighting begin!" Burly handlers, guards who worked on behalf of the game's director, ran into the arena wielding whips. They circled the motionless fighters and began lashing out at them. Millenbe felt his gorge rise as the handlers laid about, tearing the exposed skin from the arms and legs of the Turil and Midkemian soldiers. No stranger to the whip when in the swamp, he knew its terrible touch. He felt each stroke as it fell upon those on the sand below. The crowd began to grow restive, for watching motionless men being whipped was not what they had come to see. Jeers and catcalls rang down upon those in the imperial box, and a few bolder souls threw litter and small coins into the arena, showing what they thought of such sport. Finally, one of the handlers grew impatient, stepped up to a Thuril warrior, and struck him across the face with a whip handle. Before the handler could react, the Thuril sprang forward and tore the whip from the startled man's hands. In an instant, he had it firmly wrapped about the man's throat, choking him. The other handlers turned their attention to the warrior attacking their companion and began to flail wildly at him. After a dozen or so blows, the Thuril began to wobble and fell to his knees, but he held tightly to the whip, strangling the gasping handler. Again and again, blows rained down upon the Thuril until all his armor ran red with blood from the lashing. Still, he held on to his victim. When the handler died. Eyes protruding from a blue face, whatever strength left to the Thuril seemed to die as well. As the handler's limp body came to rest on the sand, the Thuril warrior fell beside him. It was a Midkemian soldier who reacted first. With cold detachment, he simply picked up a sword and ran one of the handlers through. Then. As one, the Thuril and Midkemian soldiers had weapons in hands, and within a minute, all the handlers were dead. Then, again as one, the prisoners threw their weapons to the ground. Milimba battled to stay calm in the face of such display. He felt nothing but admiration for those men. They accepted death rather than slay one another. Possibly. Some of those men had ridden through the valley with him on the raid to discover the rift machine so many years before. Outwardly, he appeared calm, a Surani, but inwardly he seethed. Hotcho Pepper whispered, "I have a bad feeling here. Whatever gain Almecho sought from this day to bolster his position with the Emperor is badly shaken. I fear he is not taking well your former countryman's reluctance to die for the entertainment of the light of heaven." Milimba nearly spit when he said, "Damn such entertainment!" He looked at Hotcho Pepper with a burning expression, one never seen by the fat magician before. Milimba half stood as he added, "And damn all those who find pleasure in such bloody sport!" Hotcho Pepper seized him by the arm and tried to pull him firmly into his seat, saying, "Milimba, remember yourself." Milimba pulled himself free, ignoring the command. Milimba and his companions looked to the imperial box, where a guard captain conferred with the warlord. Milimba felt a strange hot flush inside, and for a moment battled a sudden impulse to use his powers to put the warlord amid those below, to see how he fared against those who refused to die gracefully at his command. Then Almecho's voice rang out, silencing all those nearby. No, no bowmen. Those animals will not die a warrior's death. He turned to one of his pet magicians and issued instructions. The black-robed man nodded and began to incant. Milimba felt his neck hairs rise as the presence of magic made itself known. A hushed sound of awe swept about the stadium as those on the sand below fell senseless to roll about in a daze. The warlord shouted. Now go bind them, build a platform, and hang them for all to see. Stunned silence greeted his words. Then shouts of, "No, they are warriors!" and "This is without honor!" rang throughout the crowd. Hotcho Pepper closed his eyes and sighed audibly. He spoke to himself as much as his companions. <sighs> the warlord lets his famous temper get the best of him once more, and now we have a debacle before us. This will not help his position in the High Council or the stability of the Emperor.
Like an enraged beast at bay, the warlord turned, and all nearby fell silent. But those at greater distances picked up the cries. By Tsurani standards, this was too much of an indignity to be visited on any save those without honour. While balking the mob's sport, the prisoners had shown they were still fighting men, and as such, deserved an honourable death. Hotchopepper turned to speak to Milimba, then stopped himself as he saw the expression on his friend's face. Milimba's anger was now fully revealed, his rage a match for the warlords. Sensing something terrible was about to occur, Hotcho Pepper sought Shimon's attention, only to find he was also silently watching Milimba's fearsome countenance. All Hotcho Pepper could manage to say was a quiet, Milimba, no! Then, the slave become magician was moving. He swept past the shocked Hotcho Pepper, saying only, See to the Emperor's safety. Milimba was reeling with the impact of sudden emotion bottled up for years, now surging free. A strange and powerful certainty struck him. I am not Sirani, he acknowledged to himself. I could not be a party to this. For the first time since donning the black robe, his two natures were in harmony. This was a dishonour by the standards of both cultures, something that filled him with a dread purpose free of any doubt. Save those near the imperial box, the entire crowd was chanting, The sword! The sword! The sword! Demanding a warrior's death for each man below. The rhythm became a pounding pulse beat for Milimba, heightening his nearly unchecked fury. Reaching a point between the magicians and the imperial box, Milimba regarded the soldiers and carpenters rushing onto the arena floor. The stunned Midkemians and Thuril were being bound like animals for slaughter, and the crowd's anger was reaching a dangerous level. Some of the younger officers of noble families in the lower levels of the stadium seemed ready to take swords and jump onto the sand to contest personally for the prisoners' right to die as warriors. These had been valiant foemen, and many of those watching had fought against both Thuril and Kingdom soldiers. They would willingly kill these men on the field of battle, but would not watch this humiliation visited on brave enemies. A black flood of anger, loathing and sorrow poured through Milimba. His mind screamed in outrage, despite his attempts to control it. His head tilted back, and his eyes rolled up into his head, and, as had happened twice in his life before, letters of fire appeared in his mind's eye. But never before had he had the strength to seize the moment, and, with a nearly animal joy, he dived into the newly opening well of power within. His right arm shot forward, and energy exploded from his hand. A bolt of blue flame, scintillating even in the sunlight, hurled downward to strike the sand amid the warlord's guards. Living men were swept in all directions, like leaves before the wind. Those just entering with the materials for the scaffolding were knocked to their knees by the blast, and those in the lower seats were stunned by its fury. All noise in the arena stopped as the crowd fell into mute shock. All eyes turned to the source of that bolt, while those near him reflexively drew back. He was red-faced with anger, and the whites of his eyes showed around dark irises as he scanned the arena. With a short, chopping motion of one hand, the magician said, No more! No one moved, save Hotcho Pepper and Shimon. They had no idea what Milimba's intentions were, but in the face of this act they took his command seriously. They hurried to where a half-stunned, half-fascinated young emperor sat, watching, with everyone else in the stadium. They quickly conferred with Ichindar, and a moment later the emperor's seat was empty. Milimba looked to his left as a bellow of outrage sounded. Who dares this? Milimba was confronted by the sight of the warlord, standing like an enraged demigod in his white armour. The warlord's expression matched Milimba's. I dare this! Milimba shouted back. This cannot be! This will not be! No more will men die for the sport of others! Barely holding himself in check, Almecho, Warlord of the nations of Surinuani screamed, By what right do you do this thing? 
The cords on his neck stood out clearly, and every muscle of his body quivered as sweat beaded his brow. Milumba's voice lowered, and his words came carefully, measured with controlled, defiant rage. By my right to do as I see fit. He then spoke to a nearby guard. Those on the arena floor are to be released. They are free. The guard hesitated for a moment. Then his Tsurani training came to the fore. Your will, great one. The warlord shouted, "You will stay." The crowd hissed with intake and breath. In the history of the empire, such a confrontation between great one and warlord had never occurred. The guard stopped. And Milumba spoke through a snarl, "My words are as law. Go." Suddenly, the guard was moving, and the warlord screamed his rage, "You break the law! No one may free a slave." His anger boiling back up again, Milumba shouted back, "I can! I am outside the law." The warlord fell back, as if struck by an invisible blow. In his life, no one had dared to thwart his will in this manner. No warlord in history had ever been forced to endure such public shame. He was dazed. Near the warlord, another magician leapt to his feet. "I call you traitor and false great one. You seek to undermine the warlord's rule and bring chaos to the order of the empire. You will recant this effrontery." Instantly. There was frantic activity as all within earshot scrambled to get clear of the two magicians. Milumba regarded the warlord's pet. Do you think to match your powers against mine? The warlord looked at Milumba with naked hatred on his face. He never took his eyes from the young magician's face as he said to his pet, "Destroy him." Milumba's arms shot upwards, crossing at the wrists. Instantly, a soft golden nimbus of light surrounded him. The other magician hurled a bolt of energy, and the blue ball of fire struck harmlessly against the gold shield. Milumba tensed, suffused with anger. Twice before in his life, when attacked by the trolls and when fighting with Roland, he had reached into hidden reservoirs of power and drawn upon them. Now he tore aside the last barriers between his conscious mind and those hidden reserves. They were no longer a mystery to him, but the wellspring from which all his power stemmed. For the first time in his experience, Milan became to understand fully what he was, who he was, not a black robe limited by the ancient teachings of one world, but an adept of the greater art, a master in full possession of all the energy provided by two worlds. The warlord's magician regarded him in fear. He was more than a curiosity, a barbarian magician. Here stood a figure to awe. Arms stretched upward, body trembling with rage, eyes seemingly aglow with strength. Milumba clapped his hands above his head, and thunder pealed, rocking those around him. Energy exploded upward from his hands held high above his head. A vortex of coruscating forces spun above him, rising like a bowshot. The fountain continued until it was high overhead. It began to flatten, covering the stadium like a great canopy. The dazzling display continued briefly. Then the skies seemed to explode, blinding many who were looking upward. The sky turned dark, and the sun faded as if grey veils were slowly being drawn before it. Milumba's voice carried to the farthest corner of the stadium as he said, "That you have lived as you have lived for centuries is no license for this cruelty. All here are now judged." And all are found wanting. More magicians departed, disappearing from their seats, but many yet remained. More judicious commoners fled by nearby exits, but still many waited, thinking this but another contest for their amusement. Many were too drunk or excited by the spectacle for the magician's warning to reach them. Milumba's arm swept an arc around him. You who would take pleasure from the death and dishonor of others, see then how well you face destruction.
A gasp from the crowd answered his pronouncement. Millenbar raised one hand high overhead, and all became silent. Even the light summer breeze ceased. Then, with a terrible strength, he spoke. They paled at his words, for it was as if death had become incarnate and had spoken. Echoing throughout the stadium were the words of Millenbar: "Tremble and despair, for I am power." A shrill, keening sound began, with Millenbar at its source. The very air shuddered as mighty magic was forged. Wind, Millenbar cried. A bitter breeze, reeking of carrion, foul and loathsome in its touch, blew through the stadium. A low moan of sorrow and fear was carried away by the wind. It blew stronger, and each moment it grew carried more menace, more despair. It turned colder until it was stinging to those who had rarely known cold. Men wept at its biting caress, and high above the stadium, clouds formed in the murk. The winds howled, drowning out the cries of the multitude in the arena. Nobles tried to flee, now too terrified to do anything but claw past their own families, trampling the old and slow underfoot. Many were buffeted to their knees or knocked from the seats to the sands of the arena floor. Great thunderheads, black and grey, raced overhead, seeming to swirl around a point directly over Millenbar's head. The magician was engulfed in an eerie light, pulsating with energy. He stood at the center of the storm, a terrible figure in the dark. The wind shrieked its fury, but Millenbar's voice cut through the sound like a knife. Rain. A cold rain fell, blown hard before the gale. Quickly it grew in tempo, becoming a pounding torrent, then a deluge. The cascade pelted those below, painfully driving them down, beating them senseless with a frightening strength clearly unnatural. A few managed to flee to the tunnels, while others clutched at one another in terror. Other magicians tried to counter the spells, but could not, and fainted from the exertion. Never had there been such a display of raw power. Here was a true master of magic, one who could control the very elements come into his own. The magician who had challenged Millenbar lay back across his seat, stunned, his eyes blinking as he struggled to some sort of semblance of order out of the chaos around. The warlord tried to withstand the storm, struggling to remain upright and refusing to submit to the terror of those around him. Millenba dropped his arm, then raised one hand before him, stretching outward. Fire! He shouted, and again all could hear him. The clouds seemed to burn. The heavens erupted as sheets of terrible colours. Flames of every hue ran riot through the darkness. Jagged bolts of lightning flashed across the sky, as if the gods were announcing the final judgment of mankind. People screamed in primitive terror at the element gone mad. Then the rain of fire began. Drops struck arms and clothing, faces and cloaks, and began to burn. Shrieks of pain came from all sides, and people tried vainly to swat out the fires that burned their flesh. More magicians disappeared from the arena, taking their unconscious comrades. Melamba stood alone in the magician section. The stink of burned flesh filled the air, mixed with the acrid odor of fear. Melamba crossed his arms before him. He turned his gaze downward. Earth. From below, a deep rumbling commenced. The ground under the stadium began to tremble slightly. The vibrations grew in intensity, and the air was filled with an angry buzzing, as if a swarm of giant insects had surrounded the area. Then a low rumbling added its harmony to the buzzing, and the ground began to move. The vibrations became a shaking, then a violent rolling, surging motion. Melamba stood calmly, as if on an island. It was as if the soil, the earth, had become fluid. People were thrown down onto the arena floor. The huge stadium throbbed from forces primeval. Statues tumbled from their pedestals, and the huge gates were ripped from their hinges in a cracking splintering of ancient wood.
They moved from before the tunnels in a staggering, drunken walk, then fell to the sand, crushing those who lay before them. Many of the beasts below the arena were driven mad by the earthquake and thrashed in their cages, smashing locks and opening doors. They fled the tunnels and raced over the fallen gates. They bellowed, howled and roared at the fire rain. Enraged by terror, they fell upon the stunned spectators lying on the sand, killing at random. A man would sit dazed, absently slapping at the burning drops from the skies, while another a few feet away was being gutted by some horror from the distant forests. Now the arena itself began to wail as the ancient stones moved, slipping across one another. Mortar, a millennium old, turned to dust in an instant as the very stadium crumbled. Cries for mercy were swept away by the winds or drowned in the cacophony of destruction. The fury mounted and the world seemed ready to be torn asunder. Millenber raised his hands above his head again. He brought his palms together, and the mightiest thunder peal of all sounded. Then, abruptly, the chaos ceased. Above, the sky was clear and sunny, a light breeze once more blowing from the east. The ground stood as it should, motionless and solid, and the rain of fire was a memory. The silence that followed was deafening. Then the groans of the injured and the sobs of the terrified could be heard. The warlord remained standing, his face drained of all colour, small burns scarring his features and arms. In place of the mighty leader of the empire stood a man bereft of any emotion save terror. His eyes were wide enough to show whites. His mouth moved as if he were trying to speak, but no words were forthcoming. Milamba raised his hands overhead again, and the warlord fell back with a sob of fear. The magician clapped his hands and was gone. The afternoon breeze carried the scent of summer flowers. In the garden, Katala was playing a word game with William. She had insisted they should both learn the language of her husband's homeland. It was almost evening, for they were farther east than the holy city. The sun was low in the west, and the shadows in the garden were long. Without the chime announcing Milamba's arrival, Katala was startled when her husband appeared in the doorway of their home. She rose slowly from her seat, for she sensed at once something was wrong. Husband, what is it? William ran up to his father, while Milamba said, I will tell you everything later. We must take William and flee. William tugged on his father's black robe, Papa, he cried, demanding attention. Milamba picked up his son and hugged him tightly, then said, William, we are going on a journey to my homeland. You must be a brave boy and not cry. William stuck out his lower lip, for if his father was asking him not to cry, then there must be a very good reason to do so. But he nodded and held back the tears. Natoha, Amarella. Milamba called, and in a moment the two servants entered the garden. Natoha bowed, but Almarella rushed to Katala's side. Katala had insisted she accompany them to Milamba's new home when he brought his family from the Shinzawai estate. She was more sister to Katala and aunt to William than a slave. She could see at once that something was wrong, and tears came unbidden to her eyes. You're leaving, she said, a statement more than a question. Natoha looked at his master. Your will, great one? Milamba said, We are leaving. We must. I'm sorry. Natoa took the news stoically, in the proper Sirani fashion, but Almarella embraced Katala openly weeping. Milamba said, I wish to ensure that you are both provided for. I have prepared documents against this day. When we have gone, you will find all my work catalogued in my study. Above my study table on the top shelf, you will find a parchment with a black seal upon it. I am giving the estate to you, Natoha. He said to Almarella, I know you two care for each other. The document giving Natoha the estate also contains a provision granting you your freedom, Almarella. He will make you a good husband. Even the emperor cannot set aside a document bearing a great one's seal, so do not worry. Almarella's expression was a mixture of complete disbelief, happiness and sorrow. 
She nodded slowly that she understood, thanks clearly showing in her eyes. Milimba returned his attention to Natoha. I am deeding the lower pasture land to Zanothis, the herdsman. Provide well for the others of this household, Natoha. Now, in my study you will also find several parchments sealed with red wax. These must be burned at once. Whatever you do, do not break the seals before you burn them. All other works are to be sent to Hotcher Pepper of the Assembly, with my deepest affection and the wish that he find them useful. He will know what to do with them. Almarella again embraced Catala, then kissed William. Natoha said, Quickly, girl, you're not mistress of this estate yet, and there is important work to do. The Hadonra started to bow, then said haltingly, Great one, I... I wish you well. He quickly bowed and started for the study. Millenburg could see a hint of moisture in his eyes. Almarella, tears running down her cheeks, followed Natoha into the house. Katala turned to Millenburg. Now? Now. As he took them to the pattern room, he said, There is one thing I must find out before we attempt the rift. He held his wife with their son between them and willed himself to another pattern. They were shrouded in a white haze for an instant, then were in a different room. They hurried through the door, and Katala saw they went into the home of the Shinzawai lord. They hurried to Kamatsu's study and opened the door without ceremony. Kamatsu looked up, annoyed at the interruption. His expression changed immediately when he saw who was at the door. Great one! What is it? he asked as he arose. Milimba quickly conveyed the events of the day, and Katala paled at the recounting. The lord of the Shinzawai shook his head. You may have set processes in motion that will forever change the internal order of the Empire, Great One. I hope it is not a death blow. In any event, it will take years to gauge their effects. Already the Party for Progress is making overtures to the Party for Peace for Alliance. In a short time, you have had great effect upon my homeland. Kamatsu continued, preventing Milimba from speaking. That is not a thing of the moment, though. You, who were once my slave, have learned greatly. But you are still not Surani. You must understand the warlord cannot allow such a setback and save face. He most likely will take his life in shame. But those who follow his lead, his family, his clan, his subordinates, will all mark you for death. Already there may be assassins hired or magicians who are ready to act against you. You have no choice but to flee to your homeland with your family. William decided it was appropriate now to cry, for in spite of his attempts at bravery, his mother was frightened, and the boy felt it. Milimba turned away from Kamatsu and incanted a spell, and William was immediately asleep. He will sleep until we are safe. Katala nodded, and knew it was for the best, but still she disliked the necessity. I have no fear of any magician, Kamatsu, Milimba said, but I fear for the Empire. I know now that no matter how hard my teachers in the assembly tried, I can never be Tsurani. But I do serve the Empire. In my disgust over what I witnessed in the arena, I became sure of what I've suspected for some time now. The Empire must change its course, or it is doomed to fall. The rotten, weak heart of this culture cannot support its own weight much longer, and like an gaggy tree with a rotten core, it will collapse under its own weight. There are other things, things of which I may not speak that I have learned in my time here, that tell me great change must come. I must leave, for should I stay, the Assembly, the High Council, all the Empire will be divided. I would have difficulty leaving the Empire, were it not in the best interest of Suranuani for me to depart. That is my training. But before I leave, I must know, has there been word from Lorry and your son of the Emperor's overture of peace? No. We know they disappeared during a skirmish the first night. Okanu's men searched the area after the fight and found no signs of them, so it is assumed they were safely away. My younger son is certain they reached a road behind Kingdom Lines. Since then we have had no further word. Other members of our faction wait with as much trepidation as I. Milimba considered. Then the Emperor is still not ready to act. 
I had hoped it might be soon, so we could safely leave under the truce before opposition to me becomes organised. Now, with the warlord's announcement of victory over Duke Boric's army, we may never see peace. Kamatsu said, "It is clear you are not Surani, Great One. With the warlord in disgrace from your destruction of games, he dedicated to the light of heaven. The war party will be in disorder. Now." The Kanazawa clan will once more remove itself from the alliance for war. Our allies in the Blue Wheel will work doubly hard to press for a truce in the High Council. The War Party is without an effective leader. Even should the Warlord prove shameless and not kill himself, he will be quickly removed. For the War Party needs a strong leader, and the Minwanabi are ambitious. For three generations they have sought the White and Gold, but others in the High Council will press the claims as well. The war party will be in disarray, and we shall gain time to strengthen our position as the game of the council continues. Kamatsu looked long at Milimba, as I have said. There are those who are already plotting to take your life. Make for your homeworld now. Do not delay, and you should likely win safely through. It might not occur to any but a few that you will strike for the rift at once. Any other great one would take a week putting his house in order. He smiled at Milimba. Great one, you were a fresh breeze in a stale room while you were with us. I am sorry to see you leave our land, but you must go at once. I hope the day will come when we may meet again as friends, Lord of the Shinazawai, for there is much that our two people could learn from one another. The Shinazawai Lord placed his hand upon Milimba's shoulder. I hope also for that day, Great One. I will send prayers with you. One thing more. If you should perchance see Kasumi in your homeworld, tell him his father thinks of him. Now go, and goodbye. Goodbye," said Melimba. He took his wife by the arm and hurried back toward the pattern room. When they reached it, a chime sounded, and Melimba pushed his wife and son behind him. A brief haze of white appeared over the pattern in the floor, and Fumita stood there, startled. Melimba," he said, stepping forward. "Stop, Fumita." The older magician stood still. "I mean you no harm. Word of what occurred has reached those of the assembly not attending the games. The assembly is in turmoil. Tapek and other warlords' pets demand your life. Hotsu Pepper and Shimon argue on your behalf. Never has such discord been seen." In the High Council, the War Party demands an end to the independence of the Assembly during times of war, and the Party for Progress and the Party of Peace are in open alliance with the Blue Wheel Party. The Empire is upside down. The older magician seemed to droop visibly as he related this. He looked years older than Milimba had ever remembered seeing him. I think you may have been right in many of your beliefs, Milimba. We must have changes in the Empire if we are not to decay. But so many changes so quickly, I don't know. There was a moment of silence between them. Milimba said, "What I did was for the Empire, Fumita. You must believe that." The older magician nodded slowly. "I believe you, Milimba, or at least I wish to." He seemed to stand more erect. "Whatever the outcome, there will be much for the assembly to do when things have settled." Perhaps we can steer the empire to a healthier course, but you must go quickly. No soldier will try to stop you, for only a few outside the holy city know of your actions. But the warlord's pets may already be seeking you out. You caught our brothers by surprise at the games, and none singly could stand against you. But if they coordinate against you, even your vaunted powers will avail you little. You would have to kill another magician or be killed in turn. Yes, Fumita. I know. I must go. I have no desire to kill another magician, but I shall if I must. Fumita looked pained at hearing this. How are you to reach the rift? You haven't been to the staging area, have you? No, but I go to the city of the plains, and from there I can command litter. It is too slow. The litter would take over an hour to reach the staging area. He reached into his robe and pulled out a transfer device. He held it out to Milimba. The third setting will take you directly to the rift machine. Milimba took it. 
Fumita. I mean to try to close the rift. Fumita shook his head. Melamba, even with your powers, I don't think you can. Scores of magicians worked to create the great rift, and the controlling spells were established only on the Kelowan side. The Midkemian machine is only to stabilize the rift's location. I know, Fumita. You'll soon know, for I've sent my works to Hotcho. My mysterious research has been an intensive study of rift energies. I may know more about them than any other magician in the assembly. I know it would be a desperate, possibly destructive action from the Midkemian side, but this war must end. Then get free to your homeworld and wait. The Emperor will act soon, I'm sure. The Warlord could not have been handed a bigger blow by losing the war than the one you handed him in the arena. If the Light of Heaven orders peace, then perhaps we can deal with the question of the Rift. Stay your hand until you have learned what the King's reaction to the peace offer is. Then you also play the great game. Fumita smiled. I'm not the only magician to descend into playing politics, Milimba. Hot Pepper and I have been part of this from the onset. Go now, and may the gods be with you. I wish you a safe journey and a long, prosperous life on your homeworld. He then walked past Milimba and his family. Once he was out of sight, Milimba activated the device. The soldier jumped. One moment he had been sitting under a tree shaded from the setting sun's heat, then the next moment a magician with a woman and child suddenly appeared before him. By the time he was on his feet, they were moving toward the rift machine several hundred yards away. When they reached the machine, a platform with tall poles rising up on either side of it, between which a glimmering nothingness could be seen, an officer who was in charge of the troops moving through snapped to attention. Get these men back from the platform. Your will, great one. He barked orders, and the men fell back. Milimba took Katala by the hand and led her through the rift. One step, a moment of disorientation, and they were standing in the middle of the Sirani camp in the valley in the Grey Towers. It was night, and campfires burned brightly. Several officers were startled at the unusual arrival, but stepped out of their way. Milimba said, have you captured horses? One of the officers nodded dumbly. Bring two at once, saddled. Your will, great one, said the man, and rushed off. Soon a soldier brought two horses toward him. When the soldier came close, Milimba could see it was Hakanu. The younger Shinzawai son looked quickly about as he handed the reins to Milimba. Great one. We have just received word something terrible has occurred at the Imperial Games, though the reports are vague. I suspect your sudden appearance here has something to do with those reports. You must be away quickly, for these are the Warlord's men in camp, and should they arrive at the same conclusion, there is no telling what they might risk. Milimba held William while Katala mounted with Hokanu's aid. He handed their son up to her and mounted his own steed. Hokanu. I have just seen your father. Go to him. He has need of you. I will return to my father's estate, great one. The young Surani hesitated, then added, Should you see my brother, tell him I live, for he does not know. Melamba said he would, then turned to Katala and took the reins of her horse. Hold to the saddle horn, beloved. I will carry William. Without another word, they rode out of the camp. Several times guards started to challenge them, but the sight of the black robe stopped them. They rode for hours in the moonlight. Milimba could hear the shouts of soldiers as he led his family to safety. Katala bore up under it all like the warriors she was descended from, and Milimba marvelled at her. She had never sat a horse before, but she made no complaint. To be taken from her home and whisked away to a strange dark world where she knew no one must be a frightening experience. She revealed a tough fibre to her character he had only guessed at before. After the seemingly endless ride, a voice sounded from out of the darkness. Dim, shadowy figures could be seen moving among the trees. Halt! Who rides this night? The voice was speaking the king's tongue. The three riders halted, and the man in front, 
with relief in his voice, shouted, Pug of Criddy! Chapter 30 Upheaval Kulgan sat quietly. It was a reunion tempered with sadness. Pug stood near Lord Boric's bed, openly showing his grief as the dying duke smiled wanly up at him. Liam, Brukel and Meacham waited a short way off, speaking softly, and Katala distracted William while the duke and Pug spoke. Boric's voice came softly, weak from his illness, and his face contorted with pain as he struggled for breath. I am glad to see you return to us, Pug. And doubly glad to see your wife and child. He coughed, and a foam appeared at the corner of his mouth, flecked with blood. Katala's eyes were tearing, for the open affection her husband held for this man touched her. Boric motioned toward Culgan, and the stout magician came to stand next to his former pupil. Yes, your grace. Boric whispered, and Culgan turned to Meacham. Will you see Katala and the boy to our tent? Lori and Kasumi are waiting there. Katala threw Pug a questioning look, and he nodded. Meacham had already picked up the boy, who regarded him with some scepticism. When they had left, Boric struggled to sit higher, and Kulgan helped him, placing pillows behind his back. The duke coughed loudly and long, his eyes clenched tightly shut from pain. When at last he could breathe again, he sighed, then spoke slowly. Pug, do you remember when I rewarded you for saving Carline from the trolls? Pug nodded, afraid to speak for the emotions he felt. Boric continued. Do you remember my promise of another gift? Again Pug nodded. Would that Tully were here to give it to you now, but I will tell you in brief. I have long thought the kingdom wastes one of its greatest resources by regarding magicians as outcasts and beggars. Kulgan's faithful service over the years has shown me I was right. Now you return, and though I understand only a little of what you have told, I can see you have become a master of your arts. It was my hope you would. For I have had a vision. I had left a sum of gold in trust for you against the day you became a master magician. With it, I would like you and Kolgan and other magicians to establish a center for learning where all may come and share. Tully will give you the documents with my instructions, explaining in detail my design. But for now, I can only ask... Will you accept this charge? Will you build an academy for the study of magic and other knowledge? Pug nodded, tears in his eyes. Kulgan stood agape, not trusting what he had heard. His fondest wish, his life's ambition, shared with the Duke in the idle hours of speaking of dreams over cups of wine, was now granted. Porrick began to cough again. Then, when the fit passed, said... I hold title to an island in the heart of the great star lake near Shamata. When this war is at last done, go there and build your academy. Perhaps someday it will be the greatest center for learning in the kingdom. Again, the duke was racked by coughing, the sound more terrible than before. He gasped after the attack, barely able to talk. He motioned for Liam to come close, pointed to Pug, and said, Tell him, then fell back upon his pillows. Liam swallowed hard, fighting back the tears, and spoke to Pug. When you were taken by the Shirani, Father wished for some memorial in remembrance. He considered what would be proper for you had shown bravery on three occasions 
twice saving Kulgan's life in addition to my sister's. He judged the only thing you lacked was a name, for none knew your parentage. So he ordered a document drawn up and sent to the royal archives, inscribing your name on the rolls of the family Condouin, adopting you into our house. Liam forced a smile. I only wish times were gladder to share such news with you. Overcome with emotion, Pug sank to his knees at the Duke's side. He took the Duke's hand and kissed his signet, unable to speak. Softly, Boric said, I could be no more proud of you than were you my own son. He gasped for breath. B bear our name with honour. Pug squeezed the once powerful hand, now weak and limp. Boric's eyes began to close and he struggled for breath. Pug released his hand and the Duke motioned for all to come closer. Even old Brukel was red-eyed as they waited for the Duke's life to slip away. To Brukel he whispered, You are witness, old companion. The Duke of Yabon raised an eyebrow and looked questioningly toward Kulgan. What does he mean? Kulgan said, He wishes you to witness his dying declaration. It is his right. Boric looked at Kulgan and said, Care for all my sons, old friend. Let the truth be known. Liam said to Kulgan, Why does he say all my sons? What truth? Kulgan stared at Boric, who nodded weakly. The magician's words came quietly. Your father acknowledges his eldest son, Martin. Liam's eyes grew wide. Martin? Boric's arm shot out in a sudden surge of strength, catching at Liam's sleeve. He pulled Liam to him and whispered, Martin is your brother. I have wronged him, Liam. He is a good man, and well do I love him. To Brukel, he croaked a single word. Witness. Brukel nodded. With tears streaming down his white moustache, he swore, So do I, Brukel, Duke of Yabon, bear witness. Suddenly, Boric's eyes went blank. His death rattle sounded deep in his chest and he lay still. Liam fell to his knees and wept, and the others also let their grief come unrestrained. Never to Pug had a moment been so bittersweet. That night it was a quiet group in the tent that Meacham had commandeered for Pug and his family. The news of Boric's death had cast a pall over the camp, and much of Culgan's joy at seeing his apprentice return safely had been blunted. The day slowly passed, with everyone becoming reacquainted, though they spoke softly and felt little joy. Occasionally one would leave the tent, wandering off to be alone with his thoughts for a while. Nine years of history had been exchanged slowly, and now Pug spoke of his flight from the Empire. Katala kept one eye on William, who lay curled up on a bed with one arm thrown over Phantus. The fire drake and the boy had taken one look at each other and decided they were friends. Meacham sat by the cook fire, watching the others carefully. Lorry and Kasumi sat on the floor, Sirani fashion, while Pug finished his narrative. Kasumi was the first to speak. Great one, how is it that you could leave the Empire now and not before? Kulgan raised one eyebrow. He was still absorbing the changes in his former apprentice. This talk of greater path and lesser path was still difficult to understand, and he couldn't believe the Tsirani attitude toward the boy. He amended that, the young man. After my confrontation with the warlord, it became clear to me that I would serve the Empire by leaving, for my continued presence could only bring divisiveness at a time the Empire needs to heal itself. The war must be ended and peace established, for the Empire is being drained. Aye, added Meacham, 
as is the kingdom. Nine years of war are bleeding us dry. Kasumi was equally discomforted by the casual tone these people took toward Pug. Great one, what if the emperor cannot stop the new warlord? The council will surely be quick to elect one. I don't know, Kasumi. I will then have to try to close the rift. Kolgan pulled long on his pipe, then blew a thick cloud. I am still not clear on everything you have said, Pug. From what you have said, I can see nothing that will prevent them from opening another rift. There is nothing, except that rifts are unstable things. There is no way to control where a rift will go. It was mere chance that caused the one between this world and Kaliwan. Once that one was established, others could follow, as if the path between the two worlds acted to other rifts like a lodestone to metal. The Sirani could attempt to re-establish the rift, but each attempt would probably take them to other new worlds. If they returned here, it would be by the merest chance, one in thousands. If the rift is closed, it would be years before they returned, if ever. From what you have said about the warlords taking his own life, said Kalgan, can we expect a respite in the fighting? It was Kasumi who answered, I fear not, friend Kalgan, for I know this warlord's sub-commander. He is Minwanabi, a proud family from a powerful clan, and it would serve his cause well when the High Council meets for his clan to bring word of a great victory. Most likely he will attack in force within days. Kalgan shook his head. Meacham, you had best ask Lord Liam to join us. He must hear this. The tall Franklin rose and left the tent. Kasumi frowned. I have come to know this world a little, and I agree with the Great One. Peace would surely profit us both, but I do not see it coming. The young duke followed Meacham into the tent a few minutes later, and Kasumi repeated his warning. We had best be ready then for the attack, said Liam. Kasumi looked uncomfortable. Lord, I must beg your pardon, but should fighting come, I, I cannot stand against my own people. May I have your permission to return to my own lines? The Duke considered this, and Pug noticed that his face was becoming lined with the strain of command. Gone were the laughing eyes and ever-present smile. Now he resembled his father more than ever. I understand. I will order you pass through the lines. If I have your parole that you will repeat nothing you have heard here. Kasumi agreed and rose to leave. Pug stood also and said, I will issue one last order to you, Kasumi, as a magician of Chisoruani. Return to your father, for he has need of you. One more soldier dying will aid your nation little. Kasumi bowed his head. Your will, great one. Kasumi embraced Lori and left with Liam. Kalgan said, You have told me so much that it's difficult to absorb. I think for now we had best retire, for I feel the need of resting. As the old magician rose, Pug said to him, There is one thing I've been waiting to ask. What of Thomas? Your childhood friend is well, and with the elves of Elvendar. He is a warrior of great renown, as he had wished to be. Pug smiled. I am glad to hear that. Thank you. Kulgan, Lori, and Meacham bade them good night and left. Katala said, Husband, you are tired. Come, rest. Pug crossed over to the bed she sat upon. You amaze me. You have been through so much tonight, and yet you fret about me. She took his hand. When I am with you, everything is as it should be. But you look as if the weight of the world sits upon you. The weight of two worlds, I fear, love. They were awakened by the sound of trumpets. 
As they rose from the bed, Pug and Katala were startled by Laurie rushing into the tent. From the light behind him as he tossed aside the tent flap, it was evident that they had slept late. The king comes. He held out some clothing to Pug. Put these on. Seeing the wisdom of not walking the camp in the black robe, Pug complied. Katala pulled her robe over her head while Laurie turned his back. She went over to William, who was sitting up in his bed, looking frightened. He quickly calmed down and started to pull on Fantasy's tail, causing the drake to snort a protest over such indignities. Pug and Laurie left the tent and walked to the commander's pavilion, overlooking the camp of the kingdom armies. Away to the southeastern end of the camp, they could see the royal party quickly approaching and could hear the cheers of the soldiers as they saw the royal banner pass. Thousands of soldiers took up the cheer, for they had never seen the king before, and his presence served to lift their spirits, badly sagging since the rout by the Tsirani. Laurie and Pug stood off to one side of the command tent, but close enough to ensure they could hear what transpired. Duke Brukel kept his eyes on the king. But Liam noticed the two and nodded his approval of their presence. The two lines of royal household guard rode up to the front of the tent, then parted so the king might ride to the fore. Roderick, king of the realm, rode on a huge black warhorse who pawed at the ground as he came to a halt before the two dukes. Roderick was dressed in a gaudy array of gold-trimmed battle armor with many flutings and reliefs fashioned into the breastplate. His helm was golden with a circlet crown. A royal purple plume flew from the crest, blown by the morning wind. When he had been sitting for a moment, he removed his helm and handed it to a page. He stayed atop his horse and studied the two commanders looking down at them with a crooked smile. What? Have you no greeting for your liege lord? The dukes bowed. Brukel said, Your Majesty, we were just surprised. We had no word. Roderick laughed, and the sound was tinged with madness. That's because I sent no word. I wanted to surprise you. He looked at Liam. Who is this? In the tablet of Criddy? Liam, your majesty, answered Brukel. The Duke of Criddy. The king shouted, He is Duke only if I say he's Duke. With a sudden change of mood, he said in solicitous tones, I am sorry to hear of your father's death. He then giggled. But he was a traitor, you know. I was going to hang him. Liam tensed at Roderick's words, and Brukel gripped his arm. The king saw and screamed, you would attack your king? Traitor! You are one with your father and the others. Guards, seize him! He pointed at the young man. Royal guards dismounted, and the soldiers of the West who stood nearby moved to stop them. Stop! commanded Brukel, and the Western soldiers stopped. He turned to Liam. On your word, we have civil war, he hissed. Liam said, I submit, Your Majesty. The Western soldiers grumbled. The king said coldly, I shall have to hang you, you know. Take him to his tent and keep him there. The guards complied. The king turned his attention to Brukel. Are you loyal to me, my lord Brukel, or shall there be a new duke in Yabon as well as Criddy? I am ever loyal to the crown, your majesty, came the answer. The king dismounted. Yes, I believe that, he giggled again. You knew my father thought highly of you, didn't you? He took the duke's arm, and they entered the command tent. Laurie touched Pug's shoulder and said, We had best stay in our tents. If one of those courtiers recognises me, I may join the duke on the gibbet. Pug nodded. Get Colgan and Meacham and have them meet us in my tent. Laurie hurried off, and Pug returned to his tent. Katala was feeding William from a bowl of stew from the night before. I fear we have found another pot of trouble, love, Pug said. The king is in camp, and he's madder than I dreamed possible. We must leave soon, for he has ordered Liam imprisoned. Katala looked shocked. Where will we go? I can manage to take us to Criddy, to Prince Arthur. I know the court of Castle Criddy as well as if there were a pattern there. I should have no trouble transporting us. 
Laurie, Meacham, and Culgan joined them a few minutes later, and Pug outlined his plan for escape. Culgan shook his head. You take the boy and Katala, Pug, but I must stay. Meacham added, and I. Pug looked incredulous. Why? I served Liam's father, and now I serve him. If the king tries to execute Liam, there will be fighting. The armies of the West will not stand idly by and watch Liam hanged. The king has only the royal guard, and they will be easily defeated. Once that happens, it is civil war. Bastira will lead the armies of the East. Liam will need my aid. Meacham said, The issue won't be quickly decided. The armies of the West are veteran, but they're tired. There's little spirit left in them. The armies of the East are fresh, and Black Guy is the best general in the kingdom. Liam's unproved. It'll be a long struggle. Pug understood what they were saying. It may not reach that point, though. Brukel seems ready to follow Liam's lead, but if he changes his mind, who knows if Illith, Tirsog, and the others will follow Liam without Yabon's lead? Kalgan sighed. Brukel will not waver. He hates Bastira as much as Boric did, though for less personal reasons. He sees Guy's hand in every move to break the West. I think the Duke of Yabon would happily take Roderick's head, but even so, Liam may submit rather than risk a civil war and lose the West to the Tsirani. We shall have to see what passes. Which is all the more reason you must go to Criddy, Pug. If Liam dies, then Arutha is heir to the crown. Once begun, the king cannot stop the killing until Arutha is dead. Even Martin, whose claim would be blemished by his illegitimacy, and Carline would be hunted down and killed. Perhaps Anita as well. Roderick would not risk a western heir to the throne. Upon Liam's death, the bloodletting will not end until either Roderick or Arutha sits the throne of the kingdom uncontested. You are the most powerful magician in the kingdom. Pug started to protest. I know enough of the arts to know your skills from the events you related to us, and I remember your promise as a boy. You are capable of feats unmatched by any in our world. Aratha will have grave need of your aid, for he would not let his brother's death go unpunished. Criddy, Kas, and Tulan will march once the Tsirani have been dealt with. Others, especially Brukel, would join them. Then we would have civil war. Meacham spat out of the tent. He froze, holding aside the tent flap for a moment, then said, I think the argument is over. Look. They joined him at the opening. None had the Franklin's sharp eyesight, and at first they couldn't see what he was pointing out. Then, slowly, they recognised the cloud of dust hanging in the air, far to the southeast. It spread across the horizon for miles, a dirty brown ribbon that ran below the blue of the sky. The Franklin turned to look at the others. The armies of the east. They stood near the command pavilion, among a group of Lamutian soldiers. With Lorry, Culgan, Pug and Meacham was Earl Van Dross of Lamut, the former cavalry officer who had commanded the raid through the valley years ago when they had first seen the rift. He had gained the title upon his father's death less than a year after Pug's capture and had proven to be one of the kingdom's most able field commanders. A company of nobles was riding up the hill toward the pavilion. The king and Brukel stood waiting for them. Next to each lord rode a standard bearer who held the banner of that noble. Van Dross announced the name of each army represented. Rodez, Timons, Sadara, Ran, Sibon, they're all here. He turned to Culgan. I doubt there are a thousand soldiers left between here and Rilanon. Laurie said, There is one whose banner I don't see. Bastira. Van Dross looked. Salador, Deep Taunton, Pointer's Head. No, you're right. The golden eagle on black is not among the standards. Meacham said, Black Guy is no fool. He's already upon the throne of Crondor. Should Liam be hanged and Roderick fall in battle, it would be only a short step to the throne in Rilanon. Vandross looked back at the gathering nobles. 
Nearly the entire Congress of Lords is prison. Should they return to Crondor without the king, then Guy would be king in short order. Many of these are his men. Pug said, Who is that under the banner of Salador? It is not Lord Kerus. Vandross spat upon the ground. It is Richard, formerly Baron of Dolph, now Duke of Salador. The king hung Kerus and his family fled to Kesh. Now Richard rules the third most powerful duchy in the east. He is one of Guy's favourites. When the nobles were assembled before the king, Richard of Salador, a red-faced bear of a man, said, My liege, we are assembled. Where are we to camp? Camp? We make no camp, my lord duke. We ride. He turned to Lord Brukel. Marshal the armies of the West, Brukel. The duke gave the signal, and heralds ran through the camp, shouting the order to muster. The battle drums and war trumpets were shortly sounding throughout the western camp. Vandross left to join his soldiers, and soon there were few observers nearby. Kulgan, Pug and the others moved off to one side, keeping clear of the king's gaze. The king said to the assembled nobles, We have had nine years of the western commander's tender ways. I shall lead the attack that will drive the foe from out of our lands. He turned to Brukel. In deference to your advancing years, my lord duke, I am giving command of the infantry to Duke Richard. You will stay here. The old Duke of Yabon, who was in the process of donning his armour, looked stung. He said nothing save, Your Majesty. His tone cold and strained. He stiffly turned and entered the command tent. The king's horse was brought, and Roderick mounted. A page handed up his crowned helm, and the king placed it upon his head. The infantry shall follow as quickly as possible. Now we ride. The king spurred his horse down the hill, followed by the royal guard and the assembled nobles. When he was out of sight, Kulgan turned to the others and said, Now we wait. The day grew long. Every hour that passed was like a slowly unfolding day. They sat in Pug's tent, wondering what was occurring to the west. The army had marched forward under the king's banner, with drums and trumpets sounding. Over ten thousand horsemen and twenty thousand foot soldiers had advanced upon the Tsirani. There were only a few soldiers left in camp, the wounded and an orderly company. The quiet outside was unnerving after the almost constant camp noise of the previous day. William had grown restless, and Catala had taken him outside to play. Fantas welcomed the opportunity to rest untroubled by his tireless playmate. Kulgan sat quietly, puffing on his pipe. He and Pug passed the time by occasionally speaking of matters magical, but mostly were silent. Lorry was the first to break the tension, he stood and said, I can't take this waiting any more. I think we should go to Lord Liam and help decide what is to be done once the king returns. Kulgan waved him back into his seat. Liam will do nothing, for he is his father's son and would not start a civil war not here. Pug sat absently toying with a dagger. With the armies of the East in camp, Liam knows that an outbreak of fighting would hand the West to the Tsirani and the Crown to Bastira. He'll walk to the gibbet and put the rope round his own neck rather than see that. It's the worst kind of foolishness, countered Lorry. No, answered Kulgan. Not foolishness, minstrel, but a matter of honour. Liam, like his father before him, believes that the nobility have a responsibility to give their lives work, and their lives, if need be, for the kingdom. With Morrick and Erland dead, Liam is next in line for the throne, but the succession is unclear, for Roderick has not named an heir. Liam could not bear to wear the crown if he would be thought a usurper. Aretha is another matter, for he would simply do what was expedient, take the throne, though he would not wish to, and worry about what was said of him when it was said. Pug nodded. I think that Kalgan has the right of things. I do not know the brothers as well as he, but I think it might have been a better thing had the order of their birthing been reversed. Liam would make a good king, but Aretha would make a great one. Men would follow Liam to their deaths, 
but the younger brother would use his shrewdness to keep them alive. A fair assessment, conceded Kalgan. If there is anyone who could find a way out of this mess, it is Arthur. He has his father's courage, but he also has a mind as quick as Bastira's. He could weather the intrigues of court, though he hates them. Kalgan smiled. When they were boys, we called Arthur the little storm cloud. For when he got angry, he would turn to black looks and rumbles, while Yam would be quick to anger, quick to fight, and quick to forget. Kulgan's reminiscences were interrupted by the sound of shouting from outside. They jumped up and rushed out of the tent. A blood-covered rider in the tabard of Lamut sped past them, and they ran to follow. They reached the command tent as Lord Brukel came out. The old Duke of Yabon said, "What news?" The old Vandross sends word, victory. Other riders could be heard approaching the camp. We rode through them like the wind. The line on the east is breached, and the salient is rent. We broke them, isolating those in the salient, then wheeled to the west and rolled back those who sought to aid them. The infantry now holds fast, and the cavalry drives the Tsirani back into the North Pass. They flee in confusion. The day is ours. A wine skin was handed to the rider, who sounded as if his voice would fail. He tilted it over his face and let the wine pour into his mouth. It ran down his chin, joining the deeper red splattered over his tabard. He threw aside the wine skin. There is more. Richard of Salador has fallen, as has the Earl of Sildon, and the king has been wounded. Concern showed on Brukel's face. How does he fare? Badly, I fear," said the rider, holding his nervous horse as it pranced around. It is a grievous wound. His helm was cleaved by a broadsword after his horse was killed beneath him. A hundred died to protect him, for his royal tabard was a beacon to the Surani. He comes now. The rider pointed back the way he had come. Pug and the others turned to see a troop of riders approaching. In the van rode a royal guardsman with the king held before him. The monarch's face was covered in blood, and he held to the saddle horn with his right hand, his other arm dangling limply at his side. They stopped before the tent, and soldiers helped the king from the horse. They started to carry him inside, but he said in a weak and slurred voice, "No, do not take me from the sun. Bring a chair so I may sit." Nobles were riding up, even as a chair was placed for the king. He was lowered into it and leaned back, his head lolling to the left. His face was covered with blood, and white bone could be seen showing through his scalp wound. Kalgan moved to Roderick's side. My king. May I attend? The king struggled to see who was speaking. His eyes seemed to lose focus for a moment, then became clear. Who is speaking? Ah, the magician. Yes, Boric's magician. Please, I am in pain. Kalgan closed his eyes, willing his powers to ease the king's suffering. He placed his hand upon Roderick's shoulder, and those nearby could see the ruler of the kingdom visibly relax. Thank you, magician. I feel more at ease. Roderick struggled to turn his head slightly. My lord Brukel, please bring Liam to me. Liam was in his tent under guard, and a soldier was sent to bring him out. Moments later, the young man knelt before his cousin. My liege, your wound. Kalgan was joined by a priest of Dala, who agreed with his assessment of the wound. He looked at Brukel and shook his head slowly. Herbs and bandages were brought, and the king was cared for. Kalgan left the priest to his ministrations and returned to stand where the others looked on. Katala had joined them, holding William in her arms. Kalgan said, "I fear it is a mortal wound." The skull is broken, and fluids seep through the crack. In silence, they watched. The priest stood to one side and began praying for Roderick. All the nobles, save those commanding the infantry, were now arrayed before the king. More horsemen could be heard riding into camp. They joined the others who stood watching and were told what had happened. A hush fell over the assembly as the king spoke. "Yam," he said in a faint voice. 
I have been ill, haven't I? Liam said nothing, his face betraying conflicting emotions. He had little love for his cousin, but he was still the king. Roderick ventured a weak smile. One side of his face moved only slightly, as if he could not control the muscles well. Roderick reached out with his good right hand, and Liam took it. I do not know what I have been thinking of late. So much of what has happened seems like a dream, dark and frightening. I have been trapped within that dream, but now I am free of it. Sweat appeared upon his brow, and his face was nearly white. A demon has been driven from me, Liam, and I can see much of what I have done was wrong. Even evil. Liam knelt before his king. No, my king, not evil. The king coughed violently, then gasped as the attack subsided. Liam, my time grows short. His voice rose a little, and he said, "Bruca, bear witness." The old duke looked on, his face an implacable mask. He stepped over next to Liam and said, "I am here, your Majesty." The king gripped Liam's hand, pulling himself a little more upright. His voice rose as he said, "We." Roderick, fourth of that name, hereditary ruler of the Kingdom of the Isles, do hereby proclaim that Liam Condwan, our blood cousin, is of the royal blood. As oldest Condwan male, he is named heir to the throne of our kingdom. Liam shot Brukel an alarmed look, but the old duke gave him a curt shake of his head, commanding silence. Liam bowed his head, and his sorrow was heartfelt. He tightly gripped the king's hand. Brukel said, "So do I, Brukel, Duke of Yabon, bear witness." Roderick's voice sounded faint. "Yam, one boon, do I ask? Your cousin Guy has done what he has done at my command. <clears throat> I grieve for the madness that drove me to have Erland deposed." I knew his going to the dungeon was his death warrant, and I did nothing to halt it. Have mercy on Guy. He is an ambitious man, but not an evil one. The king then spoke of his plans for the kingdom, asking that they be continued, though with more regard for the populace. He spoke of many other things, of his boyhood and his sorrow that he had never married. After a time, his speech became too slurred to understand, and his head fell forward upon his chest. Brukel ordered guards to attend the king. They gently raised him and carried him inside. Brukel and Liam entered the tent while the other nobles waited outside. More new arrivals were gathering, and they were told the news. Nearly a third of the armies of the kingdom stood before the commander's pavilion, a sea of upturned faces extending down the hill. Each stood without speaking, waiting out the death watch. Brukel closed the tent flap behind and shut out the red glow of the sunset. The priest of Dala examined the king, then looked at the two dukes. He will not regain consciousness, my lords. It is only a matter of time. Brukel took Liam by the arm and led him to one side. In a hushed whisper, he said, "You must say nothing when I proclaim you heir, Liam." Liam pulled his arm from Brukel's grasp, fixing his gaze upon the old warrior. "You bore witness, Brukel," he whispered back. "You heard my father acknowledge Martin as my brother, legitimizing him. He is the oldest Condwan male. Roderick's proclamation of succession is invalid. It presumed I was the oldest." Brukel spoke quietly. But his words were ungentle. You have a war to end, Liam. Then, if you should accomplish that small feat, you have to take your father and Roderick back to Rilanon to bury them in the tomb of your ancestors. From the day Roderick is interred, there will be twelve days of mourning. Then, on noon of the thirteenth, all the claimants for the crown will present themselves before the priests of Ishap and the entire bloody damn Congress of Lords. Between now and then, you'll have plenty of time to decide what to do. But for now, you needs must be heir. 
There is no other way. Have you forgotten, Bastira? Should you dither, he'll be in Rilanon with his army a month before you. Then you'll have bitter civil war, boy. As soon as you agree to keep your mouth shut, I'm ordering my own trusted troops to Crondor under royal seal to arrest Black Gee. They'll toss Bastira into the dungeon before his own men can stop them. There'll be enough loyal Crondorians around to ensure that. You can have him held until you reach Crondor, then cart him off to Rilanon for the coronation, either your own or Martin's. But you must act, or by the gods we'll have Gies Lackey's brewing civil war within a day of your naming Martin the true heir. Do you understand? Liam nodded silently. With a sigh he said, But will Gies men let him be taken? Even the captain of his own guard will not stand against a royal warrant, especially countersigned by the representatives of the Congress of Lords. I shall guarantee signatures on the warrant, he said, clenching his gloved fist before his face. Liam was quiet for some time, then said, You are right. I have no wish to visit trouble upon the kingdom. I will do as you say. The two men returned to the king's side and waited. Nearly another two hours passed before the priest listened at the king's chest and said, The king is dead. Brukel and Liam joined the priest in a silent prayer for Roderick. Then the Duke of Yabon took a ring from Roderick's hand and turned to Liam. Come. It is time. He held aside the tent flap and Liam looked out. The sun had set, and the night sky glittered with stars. Fires had been lit, and torches brought, so that now the multitude appeared to be an ocean of firelight. Not one man in twenty had left, though they were all tired and hungry after the victory. Brukel and Liam appeared before the tent, and the old duke said, The king is dead. His face was stony but his eyes were red-rimmed. Liam looked pale but stood erect, his head high. Brukel held something above his head. A glint of deep fire reflected off the small object as it caught the torchlight. The nobles who stood close nodded in understanding, for it was the royal signet worn by all the Condwang kings since De Long the Great had crossed the water from Rilanon to plant the banner of the Kingdom of the Isles upon the mainland shore. Brukel took Liam's hand and placed the ring upon his finger. Liam studied the old and worn ring with its device cut into the ruby, still undimmed by age. As he raised his eyes to behold the crowd, a noble stepped forward. It was the Duke of Rodez, and he knelt before Liam. Your Highness, he said, one by one the others before the tent, nobles of both east and west, knelt in homage, and like a wave rippling, all those assembled knelt, until Liam alone was standing. Liam looked at those before him, overcome with emotion and unable to speak. He placed his hand upon Brukel's shoulder and motioned for them all to stand. Suddenly the multitude was upon its feet and the cheer went up, Hail Yam! Long live the heir! The soldiers of the kingdom roared their approval, doubly so, for many knew that hours ago the threat of civil war had hung over their heads. Men of both east and west embraced and celebrated, for a terrible future had been avoided. Liam raised his hands, and soon all were silent. His voice rang out over their heads, and all could hear him say, Let no man rejoice this night. Let the drums be muffled and the trumpets blown low. For tonight we mourn a king. Brukel pointed at the map. The salient is surrounded, and each attempt to break through to the main body has been turned back. We have isolated nearly 4,000 of their soldiers there. It was late night. Roderick had been buried with what honour could be afforded in the camp. There had been none of the trappings common to a royal funeral, but the business of war made it necessary. He had been quickly embalmed and buried in his armour next to Borick on a hillside overlooking the camp.
When the war was over, they would be returned to the tombs of their ancestors in Rilanon. Now, the young heir looked over the map, gauging the situation in light of the latest communique from the front. The Sirani held in the North Pass at the entrance to the valley. The infantry had dug in before them, bottling up those in the valley and isolating both the forces along the River Criddy and what was left of the salient. We have broken their offensive, said Liam, but it is a two-edged sword. We cannot attempt to fight on two fronts. We must also be ready should the Surani try to move against us from the south. I see no quick ending yet in spite of our gains. Brukel said, But surely those in the salient will surrender soon. They are cut off, with little food or water, and cannot expect to be resupplied. In a matter of days they will be starving. Pug interrupted, Forgive me, Lord Brukel, but they will not. What can they gain by resisting? Their position is hopeless. They tie up your forces that would otherwise be attacking the main camp. Soon the situation in Suruani will be resolved enough for magicians to return from the assembly. Then food and water can be transported in without interference, and each day they hold strengthens the Surani as reinforcements arrive from Kalawan. They are Surani and will gladly die rather than be taken captive. Liam asked, Are they so honour-bound to die then? Yes. On Kelowan, they know only that captives become slaves. The idea of a prisoner exchange is unknown to them. Then we must bring all our weight to bear upon the salient at once, said Brukel. We must crush them and free our soldiers to deal with other threats. It will prove costly, Liam observed. This time there will be no element of surprise, and they are dug in like moles. We could lose two men for each of theirs. Kalgan had been sitting off to one side with Laurie and Meacham. It is a tragedy that we have gained only a broadening of the fighting, and so soon after the Emperor's offer of peace. Pug said, Perhaps it is still not too late. Liam looked at Pug. What do you mean? Kasumi must have already sent word that the peace was refused. Yes, but there may still be time to send word that there will be a new king who is willing to talk peace. Who will carry the message? asked Kalgan. Your life might be forfeit if you return to the Empire. We may be able to solve two problems at once. Your Highness, may I have your leave to promise the Tsirani in the salient safe passage to their lines? Liam considered this. I will, if I have their parole not to return for a year's time. I will go to them then, said Pug. Perhaps we can still end this war in spite of the calamities that have befallen us. The Surani guards, nervous and alert, tensed at the sound of an approaching rider. They come, one shouted, and men seized weapons and hurried to the barricades. The southern earthworks were still intact, but here at the western edge of the former salient, the pickets had thrown up a hasty barrier of felled trees and shallow trenches. Bowmen stood ready, arrows notched, but the expected charge did not come. A single figure on horseback came into view. His hands were raised overhead, palms together in the sign for parley. And more, he wore the black robe. The rider walked his horse to the edge of the barricade and asked, in perfect Sirani, Who commands here? A startled officer said, Commander Watson. The rider snapped. You forget your manners, strike leader. He took note of the colours and devices on the man's breastplate and helm. Are the Chilipaningo so lacking in civility? The officer came to attention. Your pardon, great one, the man stammered. It is only that you were unexpected. Bring Commander Watuan here. Your will, great one. The commander of the Surani salient came a short time later. He was a bandy-legged, barrel-chested old fighter, and, great one or not, his first concern was for the welfare of his troops. He looked at the magician suspiciously. I am here, great one. I have come to order you and your soldiers back to the valley. Commander Watuan smiled ruefully and shook his head. I regret, Great One, that I may not. 
Word of your exploits has been carried to us here, and that the Assembly has called your status into question. You may be no longer outside the law by now. If you had not come under a sign of parley, I would have you taken, though it would cost us dearly. Pug felt a hot flush come to his cheeks. He had known it was likely the Assembly would cast him out, but to hear this still caused him pain. Ruefully, he knew that because of the training he had undergone, he would still feel a sense of loyalty to that alien place and would never fully feel at home in his native land. With a sigh, Pug said, What then will you do? The force commander shrugged. Hold our position. Die if we must. Then I will make you an offer, commander. You must decide if it is a trick or not. Kasumi of the Shinzawai carried an offer from the light of heaven to the Midkemian king. It was an offer of peace. The king rejected it. But now there is to be a new king who is willing to make peace. I would ask you to carry word to the holy city, to the emperor, that Prince Liam will accept peace. Will you do so? The commander considered. If what you say is true, then I would be a fool to waste my men. What guarantees are you willing to make? I give you my word as a great one, if that means anything still, that what I say is true. I also promise that your men will be given safe conduct back to the valley on promise they return to the Empire for a year's time. And I will ride to the valley entrance to your lines as hostage. Is that enough? The commander thought it over for a moment as he surveyed his tired, thirsty troops. I will agree, great one. If it is the light of heaven's will that the war end, who am I to prolong it? The Oxatukan have long been known for their bravery. Let it be said they are also worthy of honour for their wisdom. The commander bowed, then turned to his soldiers. Pass the word. We march. Home. Word that the Emperor would agree to peace reached the camp four days later. Pug had given a message to Watuan to be carried through the rift. It bore the black seal of the assembly, and no one would impede its swift delivery. It had been addressed to Fumita, asking him to carry word to the holy city that the new king of the realm would not require retribution, but would accept peace. Liam had shown visible emotion when Pug had read the message. The emperor himself would come through the rift in a month's time and would sign formal treaties with the kingdom. Pug had felt close to tears when he read the news, which soon spread through the camp, that the war was over. A great cheering could be heard. Pug and Kulgan sat in the older magician's tent. For the first time in years they had been feeling something like their old relationship. Pug was finishing up a long explanation of the Tsurani system of instructing novices. Pug, said Kulgan, around a long pull on his pipe. It seems that now the war is over, we can return to the business of magicians. Only now it is you who are master, and I who would be student. There is much we may learn from each other, Kulgan, but I fear old habits die hard. I don't think I could ever get used to the idea of your being a student, and there are many things you are capable of that I still cannot do. Kulgan seemed surprised. Really? I would have thought my simple acts beneath your greatness. Pug felt the old embarrassment from when he had been Kulgan's student. <laughs> you make sport of me yet. Kulgan laughed. Only a little boy. And you are still a boy to one of my advancing years. It is not easy for me to see an indifferent apprentice become the most powerful magician of another world. Indifferent was the proper word for it. At first I only wanted to be a soldier, I think you knew that. Then, when I had finally decided to devote myself to study, the invasion began. Pug smiled. I think you felt sorry for me that day when I stood alone before the Duke's court, the only boy not called. That is partly true, though I was the first to sense the power in you and the judgment was borne out no matter the amazing events required to bring your ability to fruition. 
pug sighed. Well, the assembly is nothing if not complete in its training. Once the power is detected, there are but two options, success or death. With all other thoughts banished, there is little to concern the student but the study of magic. Without that, I doubt I would ever have amounted to much. Kalgan said, I think not. Had the Sirani never come, there would still have been a path to greatness for you to follow. They sat and talked and were comforted by each other's presence. After a while they lit fires, for darkness was falling. Katala came to the tent to see if her husband was to join her and the boy at the celebration feast being given by King Liam. She looked inside and saw the two of them lost in conversation. She backed out and, with a faint smile on her lips, returned to her son. Chapter 31 Deceptions Thomas awoke with a start. In the pre-dawn darkness, something strange called to him. He sat up, every sense extended, trying to recapture what had awakened him. Aglarana stirred next to him. Since his return from the confrontation with Martin over the Sirani prisoners, he had been free of the alien dreams and the blind rages. He was no longer the boy from Criddy or the ancient dragon lord, but a new being possessing qualities of both. She came awake and slowly reached out to touch his shoulder. The muscles were relaxed, free of the tension that marked his grappling with an ancient dream. She breathed a long sigh, then said, Thomas, what is it? He reached up to cover her hand with his own. I don't know. Something odd occurred a moment ago. He sat with his head slightly turned, as if listening to something distant. A change. A shift in the pattern of things, perhaps. The elf queen said nothing. Since becoming his lover, she had grown used to his uncanny ability to sense events elsewhere, an ability unmatched by even the most gifted of the ancient spellweavers. A remnant of his Valheru heritage, this awareness had come fully into bloom since he recovered his humanity. She thought it strange, yet reassuring, that his Valheru powers had become more pronounced and acute only since regaining his humanity. It was as if some force had conspired to keep them blunted until he possessed the wisdom to use them. Thomas stopped listening. It is something to the east, a mixture of rejoicing and a great sadness. His voice sounded thick with emotion. An age is dying. He rolled off the sleeping pallet and stood, powerful muscles revealed to Aglarana's elven eyes in the dim light. He stood at the door of their sleeping chamber, looking out over Elvander, listening to the sounds of the night. Everything appeared calm. The scent of the forest, thick, sweet and heady, was overlaid with the faint hints of aromas from last night's supper and the smell of bread fresh from the oven for this morning's meal. Nightbirds sang, while daybirds began their pre-dawn warbling, and the sun prepared to rise in the east. The touch of cool air upon his naked skin was a caress to Thomas, and he felt more complete and at peace than he had ever been in his young life. Aglarana's arms went around his waist, and he felt her press tight against him. He could feel the beat of her heart as she held him close. My lord, my love, she said, return to our bed. He turned within the circle of her arms and felt the warmth of her body against his. There is something. He gripped her close, but gently. There is a feeling of hope. She could feel his heat as his desire answered hers. Hope. Would that it is true. He looked down at her face his senses as acute in the gloom as hers, drinking in the sight of her. Never lose hope, my queen. He kissed her deeply, and whatever awakened him was quickly forgotten. Liam sat quietly in his tent. He was composing the message he would send to Criddy when a guard entered and announced the arrival of Pug and Culgan. Liam rose and greeted them, 
and when the guards left, indicated they should sit. I am sorely in need of your wisdom. He sat back and waved at the parchments before him. If Aratha is to reach us in time for the peace conference, these must leave today. But I have never been much for letters, and I also confess to great difficulty in sharing the events of the last week. Kalgan said, May I? Pointing to the letter. Liam waved consent, and the magician picked up the parchment and began to read. To my beloved brother and sister, it is with the deepest sorrow I must tell you of our father's death. He was injured mortally in the great Sirani offensive, leading a counterattack to rescue surrounded soldiers, mainly Hadati Hillmen, auxiliaries to the garrison of Yabon. The Hadati sing his name and make sagas in his honour. Such was his bravery. He passed, thinking of his children, and his love for us all was undiminished. The king has also passed, and it has fallen to me to lead our armies. Aratha, I would have you here, for we now are at the war's end. The emperor is willing to make peace. We shall meet in the north valley of the Grey Towers in twenty-nine days' time at noon. Carline, I would have you take ship to Krondor with Anita, for there is much to be done there. And Princess Alicia will have need of her daughter. I will join you with Aratha once peace has been made, with love and sharing in your sorrow, I am your most loving brother, Liam. Kalgan was quiet for a moment, and Liam said, I thought you might be able to add something or other, to lend elegance to it. Kalgan said, I think you announced your father's passing with simplicity and gentleness. It is a fine message. Liam shifted uncomfortably in his chair. There is so much yet to write. I've said nothing about Martin. Kalgan took up a quill. I will copy this again, for your pen is a bit strangled, Liam. With a warm smile, he added, You were always one to prefer the sword to the quill. I'll add some instructions to the end, asking that Martin go to Krondor with your sister. Gardan and Fanon should also make the journey, and an honour company of the castle garrison. It will make it seem you mean to honour those who served so well in Criddy. Then... You will have ample time to decide how to tell Martin what you must. Pug shook his head sadly. I only wish you could add Roland's name to that list. Since coming to the camp, he had learned of the squire of Tulan's death. Kalgan had told him of what he knew of events in Criddy and elsewhere concerning his old friends over the last few years. Liam said, Curse me for a fool. Carline has no idea you're back, Pug. You must add that, Kalgan. Pug said, I hope it will not come as too much of a shock. Kalgan chuckled. Not so much of a shock as discovering you for wife and child. Memories of his boyhood and his tempestuous relationship with the princess returned, and Pug said, I hope also she has outgrown some of the notions she held nine years ago. Liam laughed for the first time since his father's death, genuinely entertained by Pug's discomfort. Rest assured, Pug. I have had many long communications with my brother and sister over the years, and I judge Carline a greatly changed young woman from the girl you once knew. She was fifteen years old when you last saw her. Think of your own changes in the last nine years. Pug nodded. Kalgan finished his copywork and handed the document to Liam. He read it and said, Thank you, Kalgan. You've added just the right note of gentleness. The tent flap opened and Brukel entered, his old, lined face animated with glee. Bastira's fled! How? asked Liam. Our soldiers must still be a week from Krondor, or maybe more. The old duke sat heavily in his chair. We found a hidden cage of messenger pigeons belonging to the late Richard of Salador. One of his men sent word to Guy of Roderick's death, and your being named heir. Now, we've questioned the fellow, a valet of Richard's. He's admitted to being one of Bastira's spies in Richard's court. Guy's fled the city, knowing one of your first acts as king will be to have him hung. My guess is he will make straight for Rilanon. I would have thought that would be the last place on Midkemia he would wish to be, remarked Kalgan. Black Guy is no man's fool, whatever else may be said of him. He'll be underground, no doubt, but you'll see his handiwork again before we're through. 
Until the crown is resting upon Liam's head, Guy is still a power in the kingdom. Liam looked troubled at the last remark, thinking of his father's dying declaration. Since Brukel's admonition to say nothing of Martin, everyone had spoken only of Liam's coronation, nothing of Martin's possible claim to the throne. Liam let these disturbing thoughts pass by as Brukel continued speaking. Still, with Bastira on the sly, most of our troubles are now behind, and with the war near an end, we can get back to the business of rebuilding the kingdom. And I, for one, am glad. I'm getting too old for much more of this nonsense of war and politics. I only regret I'm without a son, so I could announce in his favour and retire. Liam studied Brukel with affectionate disbelief. You'll never bow down gracefully, old war dog. You'll go to your deathbed scratching and clawing every inch of the way, and that day is years off. Who's talking of dying? snorted Brukel. I meant to hunt my hounds and fly my falcons and do some fishing as well. Who knows? I may find some comely wench hearty enough to keep up with me, say about seventeen or eighteen years of age, and remarry and father a son yet. If that young fool Van Dross ever gathers his wits about him and marries my Felina, you just see how fast he'll become Duke of Yabon when I retire. Why, why she still waits for him is anybody's guess. He heaved himself up from his chair. I'm for a hot bath and some sleep before supper, by your leave. Liam motioned he might leave, and when he was gone said, I will never get used to this business of people needing my permission to come and go. Pug and Kalgan rose from their chairs. Kalgan said, You had better, for everyone will ask it of you from now on. With your permission. Feigning disgust, Liam motioned they might go. The council sat in assembly as Aglorana took her place upon the throne. Besides the normal council, Martin Longbow was present, standing beside Thomas. When all were in place, Aglorana said, You have asked for counsel, Tathar. Now tell us what cause you bring before us. Tathar bowed slightly to the Queen. We of the council felt it time for an understanding. Of what, Tathar? asked the Elf Queen. Tathar said, we have laboured long to bring a peaceful, secure ending to this business of Thomas. It is known by all here that our arts were turned to calming the rage within, softening the might of the Valheru, so the young man who was transformed would not be overwhelmed in the course of time. He paused, and Martin leaned close to Thomas. Trouble? Thomas startled him with a slight smile and a wink. Once more, Martin was reassured that the mirthful boy he had known in Criddy was as much present in this young man as the Dragon Lord. Everything will be fine, said Thomas in a whisper. We have, said Tathar, come to judge this business done, for Thomas is no longer to be feared as an old one. Aglarana said, That is happy news indeed. But is this then cause for a council? No, lady, something else must also be laid to rest. For while we no longer fear Thomas, still we will not place ourselves under his rule. Aglarana stood, outrage clear upon her face. Who dares to presume this? Has there been a single word from any to suggest that Thomas seeks to rule? Tathar stood firm before his queen's displeasure. My lady, you see with a lover's eyes. Before she could answer, he held up his hand. Speak not sharp words with me, daughter of my oldest friend. I make no accusations. That he shares your bed is no one's concern save yourself. We begrudge you nothing. But he now has the means of acclaim, and we would have the matter settled now. Aglarana paled, and Thomas stepped forward. What means? he said, his voice commanding. Tatha looked slightly surprised. She carries your child. Did you not know? Thomas was bereft of words. Conflicting feelings ran through him. A child. Yet he had not been told. He looked at Tatha. Uh, how do you know? Tatha smiled, and there was no mockery in it. I'm old, Thomas. 
I can see the signs. Thomas looked to Aglarana. It is true? She nodded. I would not tell you until it was no longer possible to hide the truth. He felt a stab of uncertainty. Why? To spare you any worry. Until the war is through, you must put your mind to nothing else. I would not burden you with other thoughts. Thomas stood quietly for a moment, then threw back his head and laughed a clear, joyous sound. A child! Praise the gods! Tathar looked thoughtfully at Thomas. Do you claim the throne? Aye, I do, Tathar, Thomas said, a smile upon his face. Carlin spoke for the first time. It is my inheritance, Thomas. You will have to contest with me for it. Thomas smiled at Carlin. <laughs> I will not cross swords with you, son of my beloved. If you seek to be king among us, then you must. Thomas walked over to Carlin. There had never been any affection between them. For more than the others, Carlin had feared Thomas's potential threat to his people and now stood ready to fight if need be. Thomas placed his hand upon Carlin's shoulder and looked deeply into his eyes. You are heir. I speak not of being your king. He stepped away and addressed the council. I am what you see before you, a being of two heritages. I possess the power of the Valheru, though I was not born to it, and my mind remembers ages long gone to dust. But I can remember a boy's memories and can again feel the joy in laughter and a lover's touch. He looked at the elf queen. I claim only the right to sit beside my queen, with your blessings, as her consort. I will take only what rule she and you give, nothing more. Should you give none, still I will remain at her side. Then, with firmness, he added, but I will not stand down from this. Our child shall have a heritage unblemished by a sinister birth. There was a general murmur of approval, and Thomas faced Aglarana. If you will take me as husband, he said in the ancient elven language. Aglarana sat with eyes gleaming. She looked to Tatha. I will. Is there any who denies me the right? Tathar looked around at the other councillors. Seeing no dissension, Tathar said, It is permitted, my lady. Abruptly there was a shout of approval from the gathered elves, and soon others were coming to investigate the unusual display of activity in the council. They, in turn, joined in the celebration, for all knew of the Queen's love for the warrior in white and gold, and they judged him a fit consort. Carlin said, You are wise in our ways, Thomas. Had you done otherwise, there would have been strife or lingering doubt. I thank you for your prudence. Thomas took his hand in a firm grip. It is only just, Carlin. Your claim is without question. When your queen and I have journeyed to the Blessed Isles, then our child will be your loyal subject. Aglarana came to Thomas's side, and Martin joined them to say, Joy in all things. Thomas embraced his friend, as did the queen. Carlin shouted for silence. When the noise had died, he said, It is time for clear speaking. Let all know that what has been fact for years is now openly acknowledged. Thomas is war leader of Elvendar and prince consort to the Queen. His words are to be obeyed by all save the Queen. I, Carlin, have spoken. And I too say this is true, echoed Tathar. Then, the council bowed before the queen and her husband-to-be. Martin said, It is well I shall leave Elvendar as happiness returns. Aglarana said, You are leaving. I fear I must. There is still a war, and I am still Huntmaster of Criddy. Besides, he said with a grin, I fear young Garrett is growing overly content to rest and partake of your largesse. I must harry him along the trail before he gets fat. You'll stay for the wedding? asked Thomas. As Martin began to apologise, Aglarana said, The ceremony can be tomorrow. Martin conceded, One more day? I will be pleased. Another shout went up, and Thomas could see Dolgan pushing through the crowd. When the dwarf chief stood before them, he said, We were not invited to the council, but when we heard the shouts we came. 
Behind him, Thomas and Aglarana could see the other dwarves approaching. Thomas placed his hand upon Dolgan's shoulder. Old companion, you are welcome. You have come to a celebration. There is to be a wedding. Dolgan fixed them both with a knowing smile. Aye, and high time. The rider spurred his horse past the lines of Surani soldiers. He was still discomforted by the sight of so many of them passing to the east, and the recent enemy watched him ride by with guarded expressions as he headed toward Elvendar. Lorry pulled in his horse near a large outcropping of rock where a Surani officer in black and orange armor supervised the passing soldiers. From his officer's plume and insignia, he was a force leader, surrounded by his cadre of strike leaders and patrol leaders. To the force leader, he said, "Where lies the closest ford across the river?" The other officers regarded Lorry with suspicion. If the force leader felt any surprise at the barbarian's nearly perfect Surani. He did not show it. He inclined his head back the way his men marched from and said, "A short way from here, less than an hour's march, faster on your beast, I'm sure. It is marked by two large trees on either side of a clearing, above a place where the river falls a short way." Lorry had no difficulty identifying the house colours the man wore, as it was one of the five great families, and said, "Thank you, false leader. Honour to your house, son of the Minwanabi." The force leader stood erect. He did not know who this rider was, but he was courteous, and that courtesy must be returned. Honour to your house, stranger. Lorry rode forward, past the dispirited Tirani soldiers plodding along the banks of the river. He found the clearing above the small falls and rode into the water. The river ran swiftly here, but the horse managed to cross without incident. Lorry could feel the spray from the falls as the wind blew it back in his direction. It felt cool and refreshing after the hot ride. He had been in the saddle since before daybreak and would not finish his ride until after night had fallen. By then, he would be close enough to Elvendar to be intercepted by Elven sentries. They would certainly be watching the Tsirani withdrawal with interest, and one could guide him to their queen. Lorry had volunteered to carry the message, for it was felt that the messenger would be less likely to encounter trouble if he could speak Tsirani. He had been challenged three times during his ride, and each time he had explained his way past suspicious Tsirani officers. There might be a truce, but there was little trust yet. When he was clear of the river, Lorry dismounted, for his horse was tired. He walked the animal to cool it off. He pulled the saddle from the mount's back and was rubbing him down with a brush carried in his saddlebags when a figure stepped out from among the trees. Lorry was startled. For the figure was not an elf; he was a dark-haired man with grey at the temples, dressed in a brown robe and holding a staff. He approached the minstrel without hurry and seemingly at ease. He stopped a few feet away and leaned on his staff. Well met, Lorry of Tiersog. The man possessed a strange manner, and Lorry did not remember having met him before. Do I know you? No. But I have knowledge of you, Troubadour. Lorry edged closer to his saddle where his sword lay. The man smiled and waved his hand in the air. Abruptly, Lorry was filled with calm, and he stopped moving for his sword. Whoever this man was, he was obviously harmless. He thought. What brings you to the Elven Forest, Lorry? Without knowing why, Lorry answered, "I bring messages to the Elf Queen." What are you to say? That Liam is now heir, and peace has been restored. He invites the elves and the dwarves to the valley in three weeks' time, for there will they seal the peace. The man nodded. I see. I am on my way to see the elf queen. I will carry word. You must have better things you can do with your time. Lorry started to protest, but stopped. Why should he travel to Elvendar when this man was bound there anyway? It was a waste of time. Lorry nodded. The man chuckled. Why don't you rest here for the night? The sound of water is soothing, and there's little chance of rain. Tomorrow, return to the prince and tell him that you carried the message to Elvendar. You spoke with the queen and Thomas, and they were agreed to the prince's wishes. The dwarves of Stone Mountain will hear also. 
Then tell Yam that the elves and the dwarves will come. He may rest assured they will come. Laurie nodded. What the man was saying made a great deal of sense. The stranger turned to leave and then said, By the way, I think you'd best not mention our meeting. Laurie said nothing, but accepted what the stranger said without question. After the man was gone, he felt a great sense of relief that he was on his way back from Elvendar and that his message had been received. The ceremony took place in a quiet glade with Aglarana and Thomas exchanging vows before Tathar. No one else was there, as was the elven way, while they pledged their love. Tathar invoked the blessings of the gods and instructed them on their duty, one to the other. When the ceremony was complete, Tathar said, Now return to Elvendar, for it is time for feasting and celebration. You have brought joy to your people, my queen and my prince. They rose from their kneeling positions and embraced. Thomas stepped back and said, I would have this day remembered, beloved. He turned and cupped his hands around his mouth. In the ancient language of the elves, he cried, Belagrot! Belagrot! Attend us! The sound of hooves pounding the earth could be heard. Then a small band of white horses raced into the glade, ran toward them and reared in salute to the elf queen and her consort. Thomas leaped upon the back of one. The elf steed stood quietly, and Tathar said, By no other way could you have shown so well that you are now one with us. Aglarana and Tathar mounted, and they rode back to Elvendar. When they came into sight of the tree city, a great shout went up from the assembled elves. The sight of the queen and her prince consort riding the elf steeds was, as Tathar said, a confirmation of Thomas's place in Elvendar. The feasting went on for hours, and Thomas observed that the joy he felt was shared by everyone. Aglarana sat next to him for a second throne had been placed in the council hall, acknowledging Thomas's rank. Every elf who was not keeping watch over the outworlders came to stand before them, pledging loyalty and offering blessings on the union. The dwarves also offered their congratulations and joined in the festivities wholeheartedly, filling the glades of Elvendar with their boisterous singing. Long into the night the celebration wore on. Suddenly Thomas stiffened. A chilled wind seemed to pass through him. Aglarana gripped his arm, sensing something amiss. Husband, what is it? Thomas stared into space. Something strange. Like the other night. Hopeful, but sad. Abruptly, there was a shout from the edge of the clearing below Elvendar. It cut through the sound of the celebration, but what was being said was unclear. Thomas rose, with Aglarana at his side, and crossed to the edge of the huge platform. Looking down, he could see an elven scout below, clearly out of breath. "'What is afoot?' Thomas shouted. "'My lord,' came the reply. "'The outworlders! They withdraw!' Thomas was rooted in place. Those simple words struck him like a blow. His mind couldn't comprehend the Shirani leaving after all these years of fighting. He shook off the feeling. To what ends? Do they marshal? The scout shook his head. No, my lord, they are not staging. They move slowly, without alarm. Their soldiers look dispirited. They break camp along every mile of the Criddy and turn east. The guard's upturned face showed an expression of stunned but joyful understanding. He looked at those nearby, then, with a smile, said simply, they are leaving! A shout of incredible joy went up, and many openly wept, for it seemed that at last the war was ended. Thomas turned and saw tears on the face of his wife. She embraced him, and they stood quietly for a moment. After a while, the new prince consort of Elvendar said to Carlin, who stood nearby, Send runners to follow, for it may be a trick. Aglarana said, do you truly think so, Thomas? He shook his head. I only wish to make sure, but something inside me tells me this is truly the end. It was the hope of peace with the sadness of defeat mingled together that I felt. She touched his cheek, and he said, 
I will send runners to the kingdom camp and inquire of Lord Borick what's happening. She said, if it is peace, he will send word. Thomas looked at her. True. We shall wait then. He studied her face, centuries old, but still filled with the beauty of a woman in her first bloom. <sighs> this day will doubly be remembered as a day to celebrate. Neither Thomas nor Aglarana was surprised when Macross arrived in Elvendar, for they had ceased being amazed at the sorcerer after his first visit. Without ceremony, he stepped forward from the tree surrounding the clearing and crossed toward the tree city. The entire court was assembled, including Longbow, when Macross came to stand before the Queen and Thomas. He bowed and said, Greetings, lady, and to your consort. Welcome, Macross the Black, said the Queen. Have you come to unravel the mystery of the Outworlder's withdrawal? Macross leaned upon his staff and nodded. I bring news. He seemed to consider his words carefully. You should know that both the King and the Lord of Criddy are dead. Liam is now the heir. Thomas noticed Martin. The Huntmaster's face was drained of blood. His features remained impassive, but it was clear to Thomas that Martin was rocked by the news. Thomas turned toward Macross. I knew not the King but the Duke was a fine man. I am sorry for such news. Macross went over to Martin. Martin watched the sorcerer, for while he had never met him, he knew him by reputation, having been told by Aratha of the meeting upon his island, and by Thomas of his intervention during the Sirani invasion of Elvendar. You, Martin Longbow, are to go at once to Criddy. There you will sail with the princesses Carline and Anita for Crondor. Martin was about to speak when Macross raised his hand. Those of the court paused, as if taking a breath. In a near whisper, Macross said, At the last, your father spoke your name in love. Then his hand dropped, and all was as it had been. Martin felt no alarm, but rather a sense of comfort from the sorcerer's words. He knew no one else had been aware of the brief remark. Macross said, Now hear more glad tidings. The war is over. Liam and Ichindar meet in twenty days' time to sign a peace treaty. A cheer went up in the court, and those above shouted the news to those below. Soon all of the elven forests echoed with the sound of rejoicing. Dogan again entered the council, wiping his eyes. What's this? Another celebration without us while I nap? You'll make me think we're no longer welcome. Thomas laughed. Nothing of the kind, Dolgan. Fetch your brethren and have them join our celebration. The war is over. Dolgan took out his pipe and knocked the dottle from it, kicking the burnt-out tobacco over the edge of the platform. Finally, he said as he opened his pouch. He turned away as if intent upon filling his pipe, and Thomas pretended not to notice the wetness upon the dwarven chief's face. Aratha sat upon his father's throne, alone in the great hall. He held the message from his brother, which he had read several times, trying to understand that their father was truly gone. Grief sat heavy upon him. Carline had taken the news well. She had gone to the quiet garden beside the keep to be alone with her thoughts. Thoughts ran riot through Aratha's mind. He remembered the first time his father had taken him hunting, then another time when he had come back from hunting with Martin Longbow, and how proudly he had listened to his father exclaim over the large buck he had taken. He vaguely recalled the ache when he had learned of his mother's death, but it was a distant thing, dulled by time. The image of his father, enraged in the king's palace, suddenly came to him, and Aratha let out a slow sigh. At least, he said to himself, most of what you had wished has come to pass, father. Roderick is gone, and Guy is in disgrace. Aratha? said a voice from the other side of the hall. Aratha looked up. Stepping from the shadows of the doorway came Anita, 
her satin-slippered feet making no sound as she crossed the stone floor of the hall. Lost in his thoughts, he hadn't noticed her enter. She carried a small lamp, for evening had cast the hall into deep gloom. The pages were reluctant to disturb you, but I couldn't see you sitting alone in the darkness, she said. Aratha felt pleasure at the sight of her, and relief she had come. A young woman of uncommon sense and tender ways, Anita was the first person Aratha had known to see beneath his surface calm and dry humour. More than those who had known him since boyhood, she understood his moods and could lighten them, knowing the right words to comfort him. Without waiting for him to answer, she said, I've heard the news, Aratha. I am so terribly sorry. Aratha smiled at her. <laughs> Not yet over your own grief at your father's passing, and you share mine. You are kind. Word of Erlen's death had come a week before on a ship from Crondor. Anita shook her head, her soft red hair moving in a rippling wave around her face. Father was very ill for many years. He prepared us well for his death. It was a near certainty when he was put into the dungeon. I knew that when we left Crondor. Still you show strength. I hope I am able to bear up as well. There's so much to be done. She spoke quietly. I think you will rule wisely. Liam in Rilanen, you in Crondor. I... in Crondor? <sighs> I've avoided thinking about that. She sat at his side, taking the throne Carline sat in when at her father's side in court. She reached over and placed her hand upon Arathas, resting on the arm of the throne. You must. After Liam, you are heir to the crown. The Prince of Crondor is the heir's office. There is no one to rule there but you. Aratha looked uncomfortable. Anita, I have always assumed I would someday become Earl of some minor keep, or perhaps seek a career as an officer in one of the border baron's armies. But I had never thought to rule... I'm not sure I welcome being Duke of Criddy, let alone Prince of Crondor. Besides, Liam will marry, I'm sure. He always caught the girl's eyes, and as king he'll certainly have his pig. When he has a son, the boy can be Prince of Crondor. Anita shook her head firmly. No, Aratha, there is too much work to be done now. The Western realm needs a strong hand, your hand. Another viceroy is not likely to win trust, for each lord will suspect any other who is named. It must be you. Aratha studied the young woman. In the five months she had been at Criddy, he had come to care dearly for her, though he had been unable to express his feelings, finding words lacking when they were together. She was each day more a beautiful woman, less a girl. She was still young, which made him uncomfortable. With the war in progress, he had kept his thoughts away from their respective father's plans for a possible marriage, revealed to him that night aboard the Sea Swift. Now, with peace at hand, Aratha was suddenly confronted with that question. Anita, what you say is possibly true, but you also have a claim to the throne. Didn't you say your father's plan for our marriage was designed to bolster your claim to Crondor? She looked at him with large green eyes. That was a plan to foil Guy's ambitions. It was to strengthen your father's or brother's claim to the crown should Roderick die heirless. Now, you need not feel bound to those plans. Should I take Crondor, what will you do? Mother and I have other estates. We can live quite well upon the revenues, I'm sure. Struggling with emotions within himself... Aratha spoke slowly. I have not had time to weigh this in my mind. When I was last in Crondor, I learned how little I know of cities, and I, I, I know less than that of governing. You were raised for such undertakings. I, I was only a second son. My education is lacking. There are many able men here and in Crondor who will advise you. You have a good head for things, Aratha, the ability to see what must be done and the courage to act. You will do well as Prince of Crondor. She rose and leaned over to kiss his cheek. 
There is time for you to decide how best to serve your brother Aratha. Try not to let this new responsibility weigh too heavily upon you. I will try. Still, I would feel better knowing you were close by, you and your mother. He added with a rush. She smiled warmly. We will be close at hand should you have need of our advice, Aratha. We will likely stay upon our estate in the hills near Crondor, just a few hours' ride from the palace. Crondor is the only home I've known, and Mother has lived nowhere else since she was a girl. Should you wish to see us, you have but to command, and we will happily come to court. And should you wish to find respite from the burdens of office, you will be a welcome guest. Aratha smiled at the girl. I suspect I will be visiting with regularity, and I hope I do not wear out my welcome. Never, Aratha. Thomas stood alone on the platform, watching the stars through the branches above. His elven senses informed him someone had come up behind. With a nod, he greeted the sorcerer. I am, but. Twenty-five years in this life, Macross. Though I bear memories of ages, all my adult life I have been waging war. It, it seems a dream. Let us not turn this dream into a nightmare. Thomas studied the sorcerer. What do you mean? Macross said nothing for a time, and Thomas awaited his words with patience. At last, the sorcerer spoke. There is this thing which must be done, Thomas, and it has fallen to you to finish this war. I like little the tone of your words. I, I, I thought you said the war was finished. On the day of the meeting between Liam and the Emperor, you must marshal the elves and dwarves to the west of the field. When the monarchs meet in the center of the field, then will there be treachery. What treachery? Thomas's face showed his anger. I may say little more, save that when Ichindar and Liam are seated, you must attack the Sirani with all your forces. Only this way can Midkemia be saved from utter destruction. A look of suspicion crossed Thomas's face. You ask much for one unwilling to give more. Macross stood tall, holding his staff to one side like a ruler his scepter. His dark eyes narrowed, and his brows met over his hooked nose. His voice stayed soft, but his words were hot with anger. Even Thomas felt something akin to awe in his presence. More, he said, biting off the word. I gave you all, Valheru. You are here by dint of my actions over many years. More of my life than you will know has been given to preparing for your coming. Had I not bested, then befriended Ruag, you would never have survived in the mines of Mahmoudin Kadal. It was I who prepared the armor and sword of Ashen Shugar, leaving them with the hammer of Tolin and my gift to the dragon, so that centuries later you would discover them. It was I who set your feet upon the path, Thomas. Had I not come to aid you, years past, Elvendar would now be ashes. Do you think Tatha and the other spellweavers of Elvendar were the only ones to work on your behalf? Without my aid over these last nine years, you would have been destroyed utterly by the dragon's gifts. No mere human could have withstood such ancient and powerful magic without the intervention only I could make. When you were swept along upon your dream quests to the past, it was I who guided you back to the present. I who returned you to sanity. The sorcerer's voice rose. It was I who gave you the power to influence Ashen Shugar. You were my tool. Thomas stepped back before the controlled fury of the sorcerer's words. No, Thomas, I have not given you much. I have given you everything. For the first time since donning the armor in Mahmoudin Kadal, Thomas felt fear. In the most basic fiber of his being, he suddenly was aware of how much power the sorcerer possessed, and that should Macross choose, he could brush him aside like a nettlesome insect. Who are you? 
he asked quietly, controlled fear in his voice. Macross's anger vanished. He leaned once again upon his staff, and Thomas's fears fled, and with them all memory of his fears. With a chuckle, Macross said, I tend to forget myself upon occasion. My apologies. And then he grew serious once again. I do not ask this thing from any demand of gratitude. What I have done is done, and you owe me nothing. But know this. Both the creature called Ashen Shigar and the boy called Thomas shared an abiding love of this world, each in his own way, incomprehensible to each other as that love was. You possess both aspects of the love of the land, the desire of the Valheru to protect and control, and the desire of the Keep Boy to nurture and nourish. But should you fail in this task I set before you, should you stint in resolve when the moment is nigh, then know with dread certainty this world upon which we stand shall be lost, lost beyond recalling. This, on my most holy oath, is the truth. Then I shall do as you instruct. Macro smiled. Go then to your wife, Prince Consort of Elvendar, but when it is time, marshal your army. I go to Stone Mountain, for Harthorn and his soldiers will join you. Every sword and war hammer is needed. Will they know you? Macross gazed at Thomas. Indeed they will know me, Thomas of Elvendar. Never doubt. I shall gather all the might of Elvendar, Macross. A grim note entered his voice, and, for all time, we will put an end to this war. Macross waved his staff and vanished. Thomas waited alone for a time, struggling with a newfound fear that this war would last forever. Chapter 32 Betrayal The armies stood facing one another. Seasoned veterans eyed each other across the open valley floor, not quite ready to feel at ease in the presence of an enemy they had fought for nine years and longer. Each side was composed of honour companies, representing the nobles of the kingdoms and clans of the empire. Each numbered in excess of a thousand men. The last of the Surani invasion army was now entering the rift, returning home to Kelowan, leaving only the emperor's honour detachment behind. The kingdom army was still camped at the mouths of the two passes into the valley and would not leave the area until the treaty was finalised. There was still a cautious aspect to the newfound trust. On the kingdom side of the valley, Liam sat astride a white war horse, awaiting the emperor's arrival. Nearby, the nobles of the kingdom, their armour cleaned and polished, sat their horses. With them, were the leaders of the Free City's militia and a detachment of Natalie's rangers. Trumpets sounded from across the field, and the Empress party could be seen emerging from the rift. Imperial banners fluttered in the breeze as the procession moved to the head of the Surani contingent. Awaiting the Surani herald, who was walking across the several hundred yards that separated the opposing monarchs, Prince Liam turned to regard those who sat on horseback nearby. Pug, Culgan, Meacham and Lorry were accorded their position of honour by dint of their service to the kingdom. Earl Van Dross and several other officers who had distinguished themselves were also close by. Next to Liam sat Aratha, astride a chestnut warhorse who pranced in place out of high spirits. Pug looked around, feeling a giddy sensation at the sight of all the symbols of two mighty nations with whose fates he had been so closely tied. Across the open field he could see the banners of the powerful families of the Empire, all familiar to him, the Kedah, the Waxatukan, the Minwanabi and the rest. Behind him were the fluttering banners of the Kingdom, all the duchies from Criddy in the west to Ran in the east. Colgan noticed his former student's far-off gaze and tapped him on the shoulder with the long staff he was holding. 
Are you all right? Puck turned. I'm fine. I was just a little overwhelmed for a moment, engulfed in memories. It seems strange to see this day in a way. Both sides of the war were bitter enemies, and yet I have ties with both lands. I find I have feelings I've yet to explore. Kalgan smiled. There will be much time for introspection later. Perhaps Tully and I can offer some aid. The old cleric had accompanied Arthur on his brutal ride, not wishing to miss the peace meeting. The fourteen days in the saddle had taken a toll, however, and now he lay ill in Liam's tent. It had been a command from Liam to keep him there, for he had been determined to accompany the royal party. The Sirani herald reached a place before Liam. He bowed low, then said something in Sirani. Pug rode forward to translate. He says, "His Most Imperial Majesty Ichindar, ninety-one times Emperor, Light of Heaven, and Ruler of all the nations of Siranuani, sends greetings to his brother Monarch, His Most Royal Highness Prince Liam, ruler of the lands known as the Kingdom. Will the Prince accept his invitation to join with him at the centre of the valley?" Liam said. Tell him that I return his greetings and will be pleased to meet with him at the appointed place. Pug translated with the appropriate Sirani formality, and the herald bowed low and returned to his own lines. They could see the imperial litter being carried forward. Liam signalled that his escort should accompany him, and they rode out to meet the emperor in the centre of the valley floor. Pug, Kulgan, and Lorry rode with the honour escort. Meacham waited with the soldiers. The kingdom horsemen reached the designated place first and waited while the imperial retinue approached. The litter was borne on the backs of twenty slaves chosen for their uniformity in height and appearance. Their thick muscles bunched under the strain of carrying the heavy gold encrusted litter. Gauzy white curtains hung from gold inlaid wooden supports, decorated with gems of great value and beauty. The rare metal and gems caught the sun's rays and glittered brightly. Behind the litter marched representatives of the most powerful families in the empire, clan war chiefs. There were five of them, one for each family eligible to elect a new warlord. The litter was lowered, and Ichindar, emperor of the nations of Siranuani, stepped out. He was dressed in golden armor, its value immeasurable by Siranuani standards. Upon his head was a crested helm covered in the same metal. He walked over to Liam, who had dismounted to meet him. Pug, who was to translate, dismounted and walked to stand to the side of one of the two rulers. The emperor nodded curtly to him. Liam and Ichindar studied one another, and both seemed surprised at the other's youthfulness. Ichindar was only three years older than the new heir. Liam began by welcoming the emperor with friendship and the hope of peace. Ichindar responded in kind. Then, the light of heaven stepped forward and extended his right hand. I understand this is your custom. Liam took the hand of the emperor of Siranuani. Suddenly, the tension broke and cheers went up from both sides of the valley. The two young monarchs were smiling, and the handshake was vigorous and firm. Liam said, "May this be the beginning of a lasting peace for our two nations." Ichindar answered, "Peace is a new thing to Tsiranuani, but I trust we will learn quickly. My High Council is divided over my actions. I hope the fruits of trade and the prosperity gained by learning from one another will unify attitudes." That is my wish also," said Liam. "To mark the truce, I have ordered a gift prepared for you." He signalled, and a soldier trotted out from the kingdom lines, leading a beautiful black warhorse behind. A black saddle set with gold was upon its back, and from the saddle horn hung a broadsword with a jewelled scabbard and hilt. Ichindar regarded the horse with a little scepticism. But was awed by the workmanship of the sword. He hefted the great blade and said, "You honour me, Prince Liam." Ichindar turned to one of his escorts, who ordered a chest carried forward. 
Two slaves set it before the emperor. It was carved in gaggy wood, finished to a deep and beautiful shine. Scrollwork surrounded bas-relief carvings of Tsurani animals and plants. Each had been cleverly stained in lighter and darker tones, in nearly lifelike detail. In itself, it was a fine gift, but when the lid was thrown back, a pile of the finest cut stones, all larger than a man's thumb, glistened in the sun. The emperor said, "I would have difficulty justifying reparation to the high council, and my position with them is not the best at present. But a gift to mark the occasion, they cannot fault." I hope this will repair some of the destruction my nation has caused. Liam bowed slightly. You are generous, and I thank you. Will you join me for refreshments? The emperor nodded, and Liam gave a command for a pavilion to be erected. A dozen soldiers galloped forward and dismounted. Several carried poles and bolts of material. In short order, a large open-sided pavilion. Was erected. Chairs and a table were set up under the covering. Other soldiers brought wine and food and placed them upon the table. Pug pulled out a large cushioned chair for the emperor, as Arthur did for his brother. The two rulers sat, and Ichindar said, "This is quite a bit more comfortable than my throne. I must have a cushion made." Wine was poured, and Liam and the emperor toasted each other. Then a toast to peace was offered. Everyone present drank it. Ichindar turned to Pug. Great one. It seems that this meeting will prove more salubrious to those around than our last. Pug bowed. I trust so, Your Imperial Majesty. I hope I am forgiven my disruption of the Imperial Games. The Emperor frowned. Disruption. It was closer to destruction. Pug translated for the others while Ichindar smiled ruefully in appreciation. This great one has done many innovative things in my empire. I fear we will not see the end of his handiwork long after his name is forgotten. Still, that is a thing of the past. Let us concern ourselves with the future. The honoured guests from both camps stood in the pavilion as the two monarchs began their discussion of the best way to establish relationships between the two worlds. Thomas watched the pavilion. Carlin and Dolgan waited on either side. Behind them, more than two thousand elves and dwarves stood ready. They had entered the valley through the North Pass, moving by the kingdom forces that were gathered. They had circled around the clearing, gathering in the woods to the west, where they were accorded a clear view of the proceeding. Thomas said to both his comrades, "I see little to indicate trickery." A second dwarf, Harthom of Stone Mountain, walked over to them. "Aye, Elfling, all looks peaceful enough, in spite of the sorcerer's warning." Abruptly, there was a heat shimmer across the field, as if their vision swam and flickered. Then Thomas and the others could see Tsurani soldiers drawing weapons. Thomas turned to those behind and said, "Be ready." A kingdom soldier rode up to the pavilion. The Tsurani lords looked at him with distrust, for so far the only soldiers who neared the pavilion were those serving refreshments. "Your Highness," he shouted, "something strange is occurring." "What?" said Liam. Disturbed at the man's excitement, from our position we can see figures moving through the woods to the west. Liam rose and saw figures near the edge of the trees. After a moment, while Pug translated the exchange for the emperor, Liam said, "That would be the dwarves and elves." He turned to Ichindar. "I sent word to the elf queen and the dwarven war leaders of the peace. They must be now approaching." The emperor came over to Liam and studied the woods. Why are they remaining in the trees? Why do they stay hidden? Liam turned to the horsemen. Ride and bid those in the trees join us. The guard obeyed. When he was halfway to the woods, a shout went up from the trees, and green-clad elves and armored dwarves came running forward. Battle chants and cries filled the air. 
Ichindar looked at the onrushing figures in confusion. Several of his companions drew weapons. A soldier from the Surani lines dashed to the pavilion and cried, Majesty, we are undone, it's a trap! Every Surani backed away, swords drawn. Echindar shouted, Is this how you treat for peace, mouthing pledges while you plot treachery? Liam didn't understand his words, but the tone made the meaning clear. He gripped Pug's arm and said, Tell him I know nothing of this. Pug tried to raise his voice over the commotion in the pavilion, but the Surani nobles were backing away, surrounding the light of heaven, while soldiers were rushing forward from the Surani lines to join in, protecting Ichindar. Liam shouted, Back! Back to our own lines! as the Surani soldiers approached. The Midkemians quickly mounted. Pug heard Ichindar's voice carrying over the noise. Treacherous one! You show your true nature! Never will Suranuani deal with those without honour. We will grind your kingdom into dust. Sounds of fighting erupted as the elves and dwarves clashed with the Surani soldiers. Liam and the others raced back to their own soldiers, who sat waiting to join the fight. As Liam reined up, Lord Brukel said, Shall we advance, Highness? Liam shook his head. I will not be a party to treachery. He regarded the scene before him. The elves and dwarves were pushing the Surani back toward the rift machine. The emperor and his guards were circling, avoiding the fighting, keeping the thousand honour guards between the attackers and themselves. Runners could be seen disappearing into the rift. A moment later, Surani soldiers erupted from the rift. They rushed forward to engage the attackers. The collapsing Surani line held, then started to push the elves and dwarves back. Aratha moved his horse next to Liam's. Liam, we must attack. Soon the elves and the dwarves will be overwhelmed. There are ten thousand more Surani on the other side of that rift, only a step away. If you ever hope to end this bloody war, we must capture and hold that machine. Pug forced his own horse to the other side of Liam's mount. Liam, he shouted, you must do as Aratha says. Doubt still held the young heir. Pug raised his voice even louder. Understand this. For nine years you have faced only a part of the might within the Empire, only those soldiers belonging to the clans of the War Party. Until now, you have many hidden allies blocking a major effort against the Kingdom. But now this betrayal has inflamed the one man who can command unquestioned obedience from all the clans of the Empire. Ichindar can order every clan of Suranoani to marshal. You have never faced more than 30,000 warriors along all fronts. By tomorrow, those 30,000 can be back in this valley. In a week, double again that number. Lam, you have no idea how vast his powers are. Within a year, he can send a million men and a thousand magicians against us. You must act. Liam sat stiffly, the bitterness of the moment clearly showing in his expression. Can you aid us? I may. Should you open a path for me to reach the machine, but I don't know if I have the ability to shut off the rift. Other powers I have, but even if I overcame my conditioning and could oppose the Empire, and I killed every man on the field, it would avail little, for a greater host would still be but a step away. Liam gave a curt nod. Slowly, he faced Aratha. Send gallopers to the north and south passes. Call all the armies of the kingdom to arms. Aratha wheeled and shouted the order, and riders sped away toward both passes. Liam looked back toward Pug. If you can help, do so, but not until the way is safe. You are the only master of your arts upon this world. Indicating Lorry, Meacham and Culgan, he said, Keep them from the fighting as well, for they have no part in it. Stay back, and should we fail, use your arts to go to Krondor. Carline and Anita must be taken to the east to their grand-uncle Kaldrick, for the west will surely be Surani. He drew his sword and gave the order to advance. The thousand horsemen lumbered forward, a moving wall of steel gaining momentum as officers shouted orders, keeping the columns orderly. Then Liam signalled the charge, and the lines became ragged as horsemen rushed across the clearing towards the Sirani. The Sirani heard the rumbling of cavalry, and many fell back from the elves and dwarves to form a shield wall. Pug, Lorry, Meacham and Culgan watched while the kingdom horsemen collided with it. Horses and men screamed as long spears bent and broke. The shield wall wavered as men died, 
but others leaped forward to take their places, and the kingdom host was turned back. Liam reformed his troops and charged again, this time breaking through the shields. Pug could see the right side of the Surani forces rolled back before the horsemen, but the emperor himself rallied the balance of his soldiers, and the centre of the line held. Even at this distance, Pug could see the Surani nobles entreating the emperor to flee. The emperor stood with sword drawn, shouting orders. He refused to leave the field. He was forming his men into a tight circle, protecting the rift machine, so others could return to this valley from Kelawan. He looked and saw that soldiers were now rushing forth from the rift in greater numbers. Soon there would be enough of them to destroy the king's small force. A faint trembling could be felt beneath his feet. Then one of the Surani lords pointed behind the emperor. Ichindar saw hundreds of horsemen erupting from the trees to the north. The northern cavalry units were the first to answer Liam's call. The emperor directed newly arriving soldiers to the north line to meet the new threat. A shout from the left caused him to turn. A tall warrior, clad in white and gold, was cutting a sway through the Surani guards, heading straight for the light of heaven. All the Surani lords rushed to cut him off. A clan force leader stood nearby. He raced to the emperor and shouted, "Your Majesty, you must leave. We can hold only a short while. If you are lost, the empire is without a heart, and the gods will turn their faces from us." The emperor tried to push past him as the gold and white giant cut down another Surani lord. The officer said, "May heaven understand!" and struck Ichindar across the back of the head with the flat of his sword. The emperor crumpled to the ground, and the force leader shouted for soldiers to carry him through the rift. The emperor is overcome. Take him to safety. Without question, the soldiers picked up the supreme ruler and conveyed him to the machine. A strike leader rushed to the force leader's side, shouting, "Sir, all our lords have been killed." The force leader saw that the tall warrior was being forced back by the sheer number of Shirani soldiers intercepting him. But not until after he had butchered every senior war chief who had accompanied the emperor. A quick glance informed the force leader the emperor was near safety, as the guards carrying Ichindar disappeared from view at the far side of the rift. More soldiers came streaming through from the near side of the rift. Seeing no more time to waste, the force leader said, "I will act as force commander. You are acting sub commander. More men to the north." The man rushed off to place more men along the north line as the cavalry from the north pass bore down in a mad gallop. The attackers from the north hit the Surani position with a thunderous crash. The hastily erected shield wall wavered, but finally held. The force commander looked about and prayed they could hold until sufficient reinforcements arrived. Pug. And his three companions could see the northern elements of the kingdom army hit the shield wall. Spears shattered and horses fell, while screaming men were trampled underfoot. The wall still held, and the kingdom forces withdrew to reform for another charge. Liam's command was being pushed back, and he ordered a withdrawal so that he could coordinate his attack with the one from the north. The elves and dwarves under Thomas were among the Surani to the west and were causing them the most difficulty, though they were also being slowly repulsed. As the horsemen pulled back, the Surani's attention was turned to the elves and dwarves. Those behind the north and south shield positions left their posts to lend support to their comrades on the west flank. Seeing this, Meacham observed, "If the elves don't withdraw, the Surani will overwhelm them." As if he had been heard, the four observers could see the western confrontation broken off. Elves and dwarves retreated under cover of elven bowmen. Kalgan said to Pug, "This respite serves to strengthen the Surani." They could see the flood of Surani soldiers coming through the rift. If Liam does not reach the machine after the next charge, the Surani will gain in strength as we weaken. Pug said. He can bottle them up only if he can station bowmen at the entrance to the rift. A steady stream of bow fire through it should keep them back long enough to erect some sort of barrier. Then we might be able to render it inoperative. Lorry said, "Can't it be destroyed? The other way is fraught with risk." Pug sat quietly for a moment. I don't know if my powers are sufficient to destroy the rift, but I think it's time to try. 
As he started to spur his horse, a voice behind rang out, No! They all turned and saw a brown-clad figure standing, staff in hand, where no one had been a moment earlier. Even your powers are not equal to the task, Great One. Macross! Colgan exclaimed. Macross smiled a bitter smile. As I foretold, I am here when the need is greatest. The hour most grave. Pug said, What is to be done? I will close the rift, but I have need of your aid. He returned his attention to Colgan. I see you still have the staff I gave you. Good. Dismount. Pug and Kalgan got down from their mounts. Pug had forgotten that Kalgan's ever-present staff had been the one Macross had given him. Macross went over to stand before Kalgan. Plant the end of the staff firmly in the ground. He turned and handed the staff he carried to Pug. This staff is twin to that one. Hold it tightly and never for an instant release your hold if you have any hope of surviving your task. He regarded the conflict a short distance away. It is almost the appointed hour, but not quite. Listen carefully, for time grows short. He looked at Pug, then Kalgan. When this is all over, if the rift is destroyed, then return to my island. There you will find explanations for everything that has occurred, though perhaps not to your full satisfaction. Again, there was a bitter smile. Kalgan... If you have any hope of seeing your former pupil again, hold to that staff with all the strength you possess. Keep Pug in your mind, and never let the staff break contact with Midkemian soil. Is that understood? Kargan said, But what of yourself? Macross's tone was harsh. My safety is my own concern. Trouble not yourself about me. My place in this drama was as foreordained as your own. Now watch. They returned their attention to the battle. The northern elements of the kingdom army charged, and Liam and Thomas gave orders for their own units to join in the attack. The horsemen hit the shield walls again, and the Shirani lines broke. For a moment, the kingdom cavalry was in command of the field, and the Shirani collapsed inward. Then, as the advantage of the charge was offset by the milling swarm of foot soldiers who cut horses out from under riders or conspired to pull horsemen to the ground, the balance returned. A sea of battling figures could be seen around the rift machine. There was no organisation and little discipline. Men fought to survive, not for any gain in position. The sounds of metal clashing against hardened wood and hides rang through the valley. Everywhere the onlookers turned their attention, blood flowed, and the sound of death was terrible. Macross looked at Pug and said, Now is the time. Walk with me. Pug walked behind the brown-robed sorcerer. He held tightly to Macross's staff, for he believed the sorcerer's warning that it was his only hope of surviving what lay before them. They walked through the battle as if some agent were protecting them. Several times the soldier turned to strike, only to be intercepted by one from the other side. Horses would be ready to trample them, only to wheel away at the last instant. It was as if a path opened before them, and closed behind. They approached what was left of the Sirani line. A shield holder fell to a horseman's lance. They stepped over the fallen body and entered the small, relatively calm circle around the rift. Soldiers were still pouring forth from the rift, and the circle was widening. Macross and Pug mounted the platform to the far side of the rift, while soldiers rushed out of the near side. The soldiers seemed oblivious to the two magicians. Macross stepped into the void of the rift. Pug entered behind. Instead of the expected emergence into Kalawan, they hung in a colourless place. There was little sensation of direction. The place was without light, but not dark, only various shades of grey. Pug found himself alone, with only the sound of his heart beating in his ear to reassure him that existence had not ceased. Softly, he said, Macross? Macross's voice came to him. Here, Pug. I cannot see you. A chuckle was heard. No, for there is no light. What you see is a faint illusion granted by my arts, so that you might have some point of reference here. Without ample preparation, even your vaunted powers would avail you little in keeping your sanity. 
Pug, simply accept that the human mind is poorly equipped to deal with this place. What is this place? This is the place between. Here the gods struggled during the Chaos Wars, and here we shall do our work. Men are dying, Macross. We should hurry. Here there is no time, Pug. Relative to those who battle, we are frozen in an instant. We could grow old and die, and not a full second would pass upon the battlefield. But we must still be quickly about our task. Even I could not do this without spending a bit of energy to keep us alive. Energy will need to finish this business. We dare not tarry long, but there are a few things I would say to you. I have waited a long while for you to fulfil your promise. I could not close the rift without your aid. Pug spoke, though his senses rebelled at the grey landscape on all sides, and the disembodied voice that seemed a short distance away from him. It was you who turned the rift aside when the stranger came, and the enemy sought to reclaim the nations of Surinuani. Surely that took awesome power. He could hear the sorcerer chuckle. You remember that detail? Well, I was younger then. As if he knew it was an unsatisfactory answer, Macross added, "Then, the rift was a wild thing, created by the wills of those who stood atop the towers of the assembly. I only turned it to another place, balking the enemy's design, and that at great risk. Now the rift is a controlled thing, firmly anchored in Kelawan, managed by a machine. That which controls it, many intricate spells, keeping it in harmony with Midkemia." Keeps me from manipulating it. All I may do is end it, but for that I need help. Before we end this particular drama, I would say this to you: you will understand most things after you reach my island. But one thing above all, I ask for you to bear in mind as you hear my message. Please remember, I did what I did because it was my fate. I would ask you to think of me kindly. While he could not see the sorcerer, a pug felt his presence close by. He started to speak, but was interrupted by Macross's voice. When I am done, use whatever shred of energy you have left to will yourself to Kulgan. The staff will aid you, but you must bend all your efforts to that task. If you fail, you will perish. It was Macross's second warning, and Pug felt dread for the first time in years. What of yourself? Take care of yourself, Pug. I have other concerns. There came a sensation of change, as if the fabric of nothingness around them was subtly altering. Macross said, "At my command, you must unleash the full fury of your power. All that you did at the Imperial Games was but a shadow of what you must do now." You know of that? Again, there was a chuckle. I was there. And though my seat was poor compared to your own, I must admit it was quite impressive. Even I would have been hard pressed to provide as spectacular a show. Now there is no more time. Await my command, then let your power flow toward me. Pug said nothing. He could feel the sorcerer's presence before him, as if it were being defined for him by Macross. Again. He felt the sensation of twisting change around him. Suddenly, there was a blinding light, then darkness. An instant later, all around him erupted in mad displays of energy, much like those he had witnessed in the rift of the Golden Bridge. On every side, blinding colours exploded, primal forces he did not recognise. Now, Pug! Came Macross's cry. Pug bent his will to the task. He reached down into the deepest recess of his being. From there, he brought forth all he could of the magic power he had gained from two worlds, forces sufficient to destroy mountains, move rivers from their courses, and level cities to rubble. All these he focused. Then, like casting away something painful to hold, he directed all this energy toward where he sensed the sorcerer to be. There came an unimaginable, insane explosion of those forces, and the primal matter of time and space screamed in protest at its presence. Pug could feel it writhe and twist around him, as if the fundamental universe were trying to cast the invaders out. Then there came a sudden release, and they were expelled. 
Punk found himself floating in total blackness. He drifted, numb and without coherent thought. His mind was unable to accept what he had sensed, and he was close to losing consciousness. He felt his fingers go lax, and the staff began to slip from his hand. He clutched spasmodically at it from blind instinct. He then felt a faint tugging. His mind resisted the cool blackness that was trying to overtake him, and he tried to remember something. It was growing cold around him, and he could feel his lungs burning for lack of air. He tried to remember something once more, but it would not come to him. Then he felt the tug again, and a faint but familiar voice seemed to sound close by. Cargan, he said weakly, and let the darkness take him. The Surani force commander was alive. He wondered at that miracle, as he saw those around him who lay dead before the rift machine. The explosion a minute before had killed hundreds, and others lay dazed a little way beyond. He rose and took stock of what was occurring. The terrible destruction of the rift had not served to aid the kingdom forces either. Riders frantically tried to control near-hysterical horses, and other mounts could be seen running madly away, their riders thrown from their backs. All about, confusion reigned. But those at the edge of the conflict were less dazed than the others, and the fighting was resuming. There was little hope now that Kelowan was cut off to them, either of aid or of a safe return. Still, they numbered only slightly less than the enemy, and there was a chance that the field could yet be theirs. There might be time to worry about the rift later. Abruptly, the sounds of fighting stopped as the kingdom forces withdrew. The force commander looked about and, still seeing no officer of greater rank, started shouting orders to ready the shield wall for another assault. The kingdom forces were slowly regrouping. They did not attack, but took up position opposite the Tsurani. The force commander waited while his soldiers made ready the lines. On all sides, kingdom horsemen stood ready, but still they did not come. Slowly, the tension grew. The force commander ordered a platform raised. Four Surani grabbed a shield, he stood upon it, and they lifted him up. His eyes widened. They have reinforcements. Far to the south, he could see the advancing columns of the South Pass Kingdom forces. They had been farther removed from the Pali site, and were only now reaching the battlefield. A shout from the opposite direction caused him to look to the north. Lines of the Kingdom infantry were advancing from the trees. Again, he turned his attention southward and strained his eyes. In the distant haze, he could see the signs of a large force of infantry following behind the cavalry. The officer ordered the shield lowered, and his sub-commander said, What is it? Their entire army is in the field. He swallowed hard, the usual Surani impassivity broken. Mother of gods! There must be thirty thousand of them. Then we shall give them a battle worthy of a ballad before we die, said the sub-commander. The force commander looked about him. On all sides stood bleeding, wounded and dazed soldiers. Of the kingdom armies arrayed against them, only a third had fought. Fully twenty thousand rested soldiers approached four thousand Sirani half of them unable to fight at their normal efficiency. The force commander shook his head. There will be no fighting. We are cut off from home, perhaps for all time. There is no purpose. He stepped past his startled sub-commander and walked beyond the shield war. Raising both hands above his head in the sign of Pali, he walked toward Liam. Slowly, dreading the moment, when he would be the first Sirani officer in living memory to surrender his forces. It took only a matter of minutes to reach the prince. He removed his helm and knelt. He looked up at the tall, golden-haired prince of the kingdom and said, Lord Yam, into your care I give my men. Will you accept surrender? Yam nodded. Yes, Kasumi. I will accept surrender. Darkness, then a gathering greyness.
Pug forced his heavy eyelids open. Above him was the familiar face of Kulgan. The face of his old teacher split into a wide smile. It is good to see you are with us again. We did not know if you were really alive. Your body was so cold to the touch. Can you sit up? Pug took the offered arm and found that Meacham knelt next to him, aiding him to sit up. He could feel the cold leave his limbs as the bright sunlight warmed his body. He sat still for a moment, then said, I think I will live. As he said it, he could feel strength returning to him. After a moment he felt able to stand and did so. Around him he could see the assembled armies of the kingdom. What has happened? Lori said, The rift is destroyed, and the Shirani remain have surrendered. The war is over. Pug felt too weak for emotion. He looked at the faces of those around him and could see deep relief in their eyes. Suddenly, Kulgan engulfed him in a hug. You risked your life to end this madness. It is your victory as much as any man's. Pug stood quietly, then stepped away from his former master. It is Macross who ended the war. Did he return? No, only you. And as soon as you were here, both of the staffs disappeared. There is no sign of him. Pug shook his head, clearing away the fogginess. What now? Meacham looked over his shoulder. It might be wise if you join Lamb. There seems to be some commotion taking place. Laurie and Culgan assisted Pug, for he was still weak from his ordeal within the rift. They walked to where Liam, Aratha, Kasumi, and the assembled kingdom nobles stood waiting. Across the field they could see the elves and dwarves approaching with the northern kingdom forces behind. Pug was surprised to see the older son of the Shinzawai present, for he had thought him back on Kelawan. He looked a figure of dejection, standing without weapon or helm, and with head downcast, so he didn't see Pug and the others arrive. Pug turned his attention to the elves and dwarves. Four figures walked at their head. Two he recognised, Dolgan and Carlin. There was another dwarf with them who was unknown to the magician. As the four reached a place before the prince, Pug realised that the tall warrior in white and gold was his boyhood friend. He stood, speechless, amazed at the change in Thomas, for his old friend was now a towering figure who resembled an elf as much as a human. Liam was too exhausted for outrage. He looked at the war leader of Elvendar and said quietly, What cause did you have to attack, Thomas? The prince consort of the elves said, The Shirani drew weapons, Liam. They were ready to attack the pavilion, could not you see? In spite of his fatigue, Liam's voice rose. I saw only your host attack a conference of peace. I saw nothing in the Shirani camp that was untoward. Kasumi raised his head. Your Highness, on my word, we drew weapons only when we were set upon by those. He pointed at Thomas's forces. Liam turned his attention back to Thomas. Did I not send word that there was to be a truce and a peace? I answered Dolgan. I was there when the sorcerer brought word. Sorcerer? said Liam. He turned and shouted, Lorry, I would have words with you. Lorry stepped forward and said, Highness? Did you carry word to the Elf Queen as I bid? On my honour, I, I spoke with the Elf Queen herself. Thomas looked Liam in the eye, head tilted back, an expression of defiance upon his face. And I swear that I have never seen that man before this moment. Word of the planned Surani treachery was carried to us by Macross. Kulgan and Pug came forward. Your Highness, said Kulgan, if the sorcerer's hand is in this, and it has been in everything else it seems, then it may be best to unravel this mystery at leisure. Liam still fumed, but Aratha said, let it lie. We can sort out this mess back at the camp. Liam gave a curt nod. We return to camp. The heir turned to Brukel and said, Form a proper escort for the prisoners and bring them along. 
He then looked at Thomas. You, I would also have in my tent when we return. There is much we must explain. Thomas agreed, though he did not look happy at the prospect. Liam shouted, We return to camp at once. Give order. Kingdom officers rode toward their companies, and the order was given. Thomas turned away and found a stranger standing next to him. He looked at the smiling face. Then Dolgan said, Are you blind, boy? Can't you recognise your own boyhood companion? Thomas looked at Pug as the exhausted magician moved close. Pug? he said softly. Then he reached out and embraced his once lost foster brother. Pug! They stood together quietly amid the clamour of armies on the move, both with tears upon their faces. Kalgan placed his hands upon both men's shoulders. Come, we must return. There is much to speak of, and, thank the gods, there is now ample time to do so. The camp was in full celebration. After more than nine years, the soldiers of the kingdom knew they would not have to risk death or injury tomorrow. Songs rang out from around campfires, and laughter came from all quarters. It mattered little to most that others lay wounded in tents tended by the priests, and that some would not live to see the first day of peace or taste the fruits of victory. All the celebrants knew was that they were among the living, and they reveled in the fact. Later there would be time for mourning lost comrades. Now they drank in life. Within Liam's tent, things were more subdued. Kalgan had given a great deal of thought to the day's occurrences as they had ridden back. By the time they had reached the tent, the magician from Criddy had pieced together a rough picture of what had occurred. He had presented his opinion to those assembled there and was now finishing. It would seem then, said Kalgan, that Macross intended for the rift to be closed. Everything points to the terrible duplicity as having been used for that purpose. Liam sat with Aratha and Tully by his side. I still can't understand what would possess him to undertake such grave measures. Today's conflict cost over two thousand lives. Pug spoke up. I suspect we may find the answer to that and other questions when we reach his island. Until then, I don't think we can begin to guess. Liam sighed. He said to Thomas, At least I am convinced that you acted in good faith. I am pleased. It would have been a hard thing to imagine you responsible for all the carnage today. Thomas held a cup of wine from which he sipped. I also am pleased that we have no cause for contention, but I feel ill-used in this matter. As were we all, echoed Hartom and Dolgan. Carlin said, It is likely that we have all played a part in some scheme of the Black Ones. Perhaps it is as Pug has said, and we shall learn the truth at Sorcerer's Isle. But I, for one, resent this bloody business. Liam looked to where Kasumi sat stiffly, eyes forward, seemingly oblivious to what was being said around him. Kasumi, Liam said, what am I to do with you and your men? Kasumi's eyes came into focus at mention of his name. He said, Your Highness, I, I know something of your ways, for Lorry has taught me much. But I am still Tsurani. In our land, the officers will be put to death and the men enslaved. I may not advise you in this matter. I do not know what is the usual method of dealing with war prisoners in your world. His tone was flat, without emotion. Liam was about to say something, but a signal from Pug silenced him. There was something the magician wanted to say. Kasumi? Yes, great one. Thomas looked surprised at the honorific, but said nothing. There had been time only for the most superficial exchange of histories between the two boyhood friends, as they had marched to the camp. What would you have done if you had not surrendered to the prince's custody? We would have fought to the death, Great One. Pug nodded. I understand then you are responsible for preserving the lives of nearly four thousand of your men, and thousands more kingdom soldiers. 
Kasumi's expression softened, revealing his shame. I have been among your people, Great One. I may have forgotten my Surani training. I have brought dishonor upon my house. When the prince has disposed of my men, I will ask permission to take my own life, though it may be too much of an honor for him to grant. Brukel and others looked shocked at this. Liam showed no expression, but simply said, You have earned no dishonor. You would have aided no cause in dying. There ceased to be one when the rift was destroyed. Kasumi said, It is our way. Liam said, No longer. This is now your homeland, for you have no other. What Kulgan and Pug have said about rifts make it unlikely you shall ever return to Suranuani. Here you will remain, and it is my intention to see that prospect turn to good advantage for us all. A faint flicker of hope entered Kasumi's eyes. The heir turned toward Lord Brukel and said, My Lord Duke of Yabon, how do you judge the Surani soldiers? The old duke smiled. Among the finest I have ever beheld. Kasumi showed a little pride at the remark. They match the Dark Brotherhood for ferocity and are of nobler nature. They are as disciplined as Kessian dog soldiers and have the stamina of Natalie's rangers. On the whole, they are without question superior soldiers. Would an army of such provide additional security for our troubled northern borders? Brukel smiled. The Lamusian garrison was among the hardest hit during the war. They would be a valuable addition there. The Earl of Lamotte echoed his duke's comment. Liam turned to Kasumi. Would you still take your life if your men could remain free men and soldiers? The Shinzawai son said, How is that possible, your highness? If you and your men will swear loyalty to the crown, I will place you under the command of the Earl of Lamotte. You will be both free men and citizens, and will be given the charge to defend our northern border against the enemies of humanity who abide in the Northlands. Kasumi sat silently, unsure of what to say. Laurie stepped over to Kasumi and said, There is no dishonor. Kasumi's face broke into an expression of open relief. I accept, as I am sure my men will. He paused, then added, We came as an honor guard for the Emperor. From what I have heard said here, we have been used by this sorcerer as much as anyone. I would not have any more blood spilled on his account. I thank your highness. Lord Vandross said, I think a knight captaincy would be proper for the leader of nearly four thousand. Do you agree, my duke? Brukel nodded in agreement, and Van Dross said, Come, captain, we should speak with your new command. Kasumi rose, bowed to Liam, and left with the Earl of Lamut. Aratha touched his brother on the shoulder. Liam turned his head, and the prince said, Enough of matters of state. It's time to celebrate the ending of the war. Liam smiled. True. He turned to Pug. Magician, run and fetch your lovely wife and fine son. I would have things that smack of home and family about. Thomas looked at Pug. Wife? Son? What is this? Pug laughed. There is much to talk about. We can catch up with each other after I bring my family. He made his way to his own tent where Katala was telling William a story. They both jumped up and ran to him, for they had not seen him since his return. He had sent a soldier with the news that he was well, but busy with the prince. Katala, Liam would like you to join us for dinner. William tugged at his father's robe. I want to come too, Papa. Pug picked up his son. You too, William. The celebration within the tent was of a quieter sort than the one taking place outside. Still, they had been entertained by Laurie's ballads, and had enjoyed the exhilaration of knowing that peace had finally come. The food was the same camp fare as before, but somehow it tasted better. A great deal of wine had also added to the festive mood. Liam sat with a cup of wine in his hand. 
Around the tent, the others were engaged in quiet conversation. The air was a little drunk, and none grudged him that relief, for he had endured much in the last month. Kulgan, Tully, and Aratha, who knew him best, understood that Liam was thinking of his father, who, but for a Sirani arrow, would now be sitting here with them. With the responsibility of first the war, then the succession thrust upon him, Liam had not found time for mourning as his brother had. Now he was fully feeling the loss. Tully stood. In a loud voice, he said, "I am tired, Your Highness." Have I your leave to withdraw? Liam smiled at his old teacher. Of course. Good night, Tully. The others in the tent quickly followed suit and took leave of the air. Outside the pavilion, the guests bade each other good night. Lorry, Kulgan, Meacham, and the dwarves also left, leaving Pug and his family standing with Carlin and Thomas. The childhood friends had spent the evening exchanging histories of the last nine years. Each was equally amazed at the other's story. Pug had expressed interest in the Dragon Lord's magic, as had Kulgan. They expressed an interest in visiting the Dragon's Hall some day. Dogan allowed he would be willing to guide them should they wish to make the journey. Now the reawakened friendship glowed within the two young men, though they understood it was not what it had once been. For there had been many and great changes in both, as much as by the dragon armor and the black robe. This point was dramatized by the presence of William and Katala. Katala had found the dwarves and elves fascinating. William had found everything fascinating, especially the dwarves, and now lay asleep in his mother's arms. Of Thomas, she didn't know what to make. He resembled Carlin in many ways, but still looked a great deal like the other men in camp. Thomas regarded the sleeping boy. He has his mother's looks, but there is enough devil in him to put me in mind of another boy I knew. Pug smiled at that. His life will be far calmer, I hope. Arthur left his brother's tent and came to join them. He stood beside the two boys who had ridden with him to the mines of Macmordain Cadal so many years ago. I should probably not say this, but years ago, when you first came to visit my father, Carlin, two boys were overheard in conversation while they tussled in a hay wagon. Thomas and Pug both looked at the prince uncomprehendingly. You don't remember, do you? Arthur asked. A blond, thin-ribbed lad was sitting atop a shorter boy, promising he would some day be a great warrior who would be welcomed in Elvendar. Pug and Thomas both laughed at that. I remember," said Pug. "And the other promised to become the greatest magician in the kingdom." Katala said, "Perhaps William will also grow up to realize his dream." Arthur smiled with a wicked light in his eyes. "Then watch him closely." We had a long chat before he went to sleep, and he told me he wanted to grow up to be a dwarf. All of them laughed, except Katala, who looked at her son for a moment with worry upon her face. But then she too joined in the merriment. Arthur and Carlin bade the others good night, and Thomas said, "I too will be to bed." Pug said, "Will you come to Rilannan with us?" "No, I may not. I would be with my lady." But when the child is born, you must guess with us, for there will be a great celebration. They promised they would come. Thomas said, "We are for home in the morning. The dwarves will return to their villages, for there is much work to be done there. They have been over long from their families, and with the return of Dolin's hammer, there is a talk of a moot to name Dolgan king in the west." Lowering his voice, he added, "Though my old friend will most likely use that hammer on the first dwarf to openly suggest it in his presence." Placing his hand upon Pug's shoulder, he said, "It is well we both came through this. Even in the depths of my strange madness, I never forgot about you." Pug said, "I never forgot you either, Thomas." When you unravel this mystery on Sorcerer's Isle, I trust you will send word. Pug said he would. They embraced, saying goodbye, and Thomas walked away, but stopped and looked back, a boyish glint in his eyes. Still. I would love to be there when you meet Carline again, with a wife and son in tow. Pug flushed, for he viewed that coming reunion with mixed feelings. He waved to Thomas as he walked from sight, 
then found Katala regarding him with a determined look upon her face. In even, measured tones, she said, "Who is Carline?" Liam looked up as Aratha entered the command tent. The younger brother said, "I thought you would have retired by now. You're exhausted." I wanted some time to think, Aratha. I've had little time alone and wanted to put things in order. His voice was tired and troubled. Aratha sat next to his brother. What sort of things? This war, father, you, I. He thought of Martin. Other things. Aratha, I, I don't know if I can be king. Aratha raised his eyebrows a little. It is not as if you had a choice, Liam. You will be king, so make the best of it. I could refuse the crown in favour of my brother," said Liam slowly, as Erland renounced it in favour of Roderick. And what a fine kettle of soup that became! Should you want a civil war, that would be one way to get it. The kingdom cannot afford a debate in the Congress of Lords. There are still too many wounds to be healed between East and West, and Du Bastira is still at large. Liam sighed. You would make a better king, Arthur. Arthur laughed. Me? I'm little pleased at the prospect of being Prince of Crondor. Look, Liam. When we were boys, I envied you of the affection you gained so quickly. People always preferred you to me. As I grew older, I understood it wasn't that I was disliked. It was simply there was something about you that brings out trust and love in people. That's a good quality for a king to possess. I never envied the fact you would follow father as duke, nor do I now envy your crown. I once thought I might take some time after the war to travel, but now that would not be possible, for I must rule Crondor. So do not wish this additional burden of the entire kingdom upon me. I would not take it. Still, you would make a better king. Liam caught Arthur's gaze and held it. Arthur paused, frowned, then fixed his brother with a sceptical look. Perhaps, but you are to be king, and I expect you will remain king for quite some time. He stretched as he rose. I'm for bed. It's been a long and hard day. Nearing the entrance to the tent, he said, "Ease your doubts, Liam. You will be a good ruler." With Caldrick to advise you and the others, Culgan, Tully, and Pug, you will lead us through this time of rebuilding. Liam said, "Arthur, before you go." Arthur waited as Liam made a decision. I wish you to go with Culgan and Pug to Sorcerer's Isle. You have been there once before, and I'd like your judgment on what is found there. Arthur was displeased and started to object. Liam cut him off. I know you wish to go to Crondor, but it will take only a few days. There will be twelve days between the time we reach Relanan and the coronation. Ample time for you to join us. Arthur again began to object. Then, with a wry smile, acceded. Trust in yourself, Liam. If I won't take the crown, you're left with it. As he departed the tent, he added with a laugh. There's no other brother to claim it. Liam sat alone, absently sipping at his wine. With another long sigh, he said to himself, "There is one other, Arthur, and may the gods help me decide what is right to do."
Chapter 33 Legacy The ship dropped anchor. The crew secured the sails aloft while the landing party made ready. Meacham watched the preparation of the longboat. The magicians were anxious to reach the castle of Macross, for they had more questions than the others. Arthur was also curious, after resigning himself to the voyage. He found he also had little desire to take part in the long funeral procession that had left from Illith the day they sailed. He had buried his grief for his father deep inside and would deal with it in his own time. Lorry had stayed with Kasumi to aid the assimilation of the Sirani soldiers into the Lemusian garrison and would meet them later in Rilanon. Liam and his nobles had shipped for Krondor, escorting the bodies of Boric and Roderick. They would be joined by Anita and Carline, then all would convey the dead in a procession of state to Rilanon, where they would be laid to rest in the tomb of their ancestors. After the traditional period of twelve days' mourning, Liam would be crowned king. By then, all who would attend the coronation would have gathered in Rilanon. Pug and Culgan's business should be completed in ample time for them to reach the capital. The boat was readied, and Aratha, Pug and Culgan joined Meacham. The longboat was lowered, and six guards bent their backs to the oars. The sailors had been greatly relieved that they were not required to accompany the landing party, for in spite of the magician's reassurances, they had no desire to set foot upon the sorcerer's isle. The boat was beached, and the passengers stepped out. Aratha looked about. There seems to have been no change here since we last came. Culgan stretched, for the ship's quarters had been cramped, and he enjoyed the sensation of dry land under his feet again. I would have been surprised to find it otherwise. Macross was one to keep his house in order, I wager. Aratha turned and said, You six will stay here. If you hear our call, come quickly. The prince started toward the path up the hill, and the others fell in without comment. They reached the place where the path forked, and Aratha said, We come as guests. I thought it best not to appear invaders. Kalgan said nothing, being occupied with observing the castle they were approaching. The strange blue light that had been so visible when they had last visited the island was absent from the window of the high tower. The castle had the look of a place deserted, without movement or sound. The drawbridge was down and the portcullis raised. Meacham observed, At least we won't have to storm the place. When they reached the edge of the drawbridge, they halted. The castle rose above them, its high walls and taller towers forbidding. It was built of dark stone, unfamiliar to them. Around the great arch over the bridge, strange carvings of alien creatures regarded them with fixed gazes. Horned and winged beasts sat perched atop ledges, seemingly frozen in an instant, so cleverly were they fashioned. They stepped on the bridge and crossed the deep ravine that separated the castle from the rest of the island. Meacham looked down, seeing the rock walls of the crevice fall away to the level of the sea, where waves crashed through the passage between. It serves better than most moats I've seen. You'd think twice before trying to cross this while someone was shooting at you from the walls. They entered the court and looked about, as if expecting to see someone appear at one of the many doors in the walls at any moment. Nowhere was there sign of any living creature, yet the grounds about the central keep were well tended and in order. When no one was forthcoming, Pug said, I imagine we'll find what we're after in the keep. The others moved with him toward the broad stairs that led to the main doors. As they mounted the steps, the large doors began to swing open, until they could all see a figure standing in the darkness beyond. As the doors finished their movement, with a loud thump against the keep walls, the figure stepped forward into the sunlight. Meacham's sword was in his hand without thinking, for the creature before them bore a strong resemblance to a goblin. After a brief examination, Meacham put up his weapon. The creature had made no threatening gesture, but simply stood waiting for them at the top of the stairs. It was taller than the average goblin, being nearly Meacham's height. Thick ridges dominated its forehead, and a large nose was the focus of its face, but it was nobler in features than a goblin. Two black, twinkling eyes regarded them as they resumed their climb. 
As they came up to it, the creature gave a toothy grin. Its head was covered with a thick mat of black hair, and its skin was tinged with the faint green of the goblin tribe, but it lacked the hunched-shouldered posture of a goblin, instead standing erect like a man. It wore a finely fashioned tunic and trousers, both bright green. Upon its feet were a pair of polished black boots, reaching nearly to its knees. The creature said, grinning, Welcome, masters. Welcome. I am Gathis, and I have the honour of acting as your host in my master's absence. There was a slight hiss to its speech. Kalgan said, Your master is Macross the Black. Of course. It has been ever thus. Please enter. The four men accompanied Gathis into the large entry hall and stopped to look about. Except for the absence of people and of the usual heraldic banners, this hall looked much like the one in Castle Criddy. My master has left explicit instructions for your visit, as much as was possible to anticipate. So I have prepared the castle for your arrival. Would you care for some... Refreshments? There are food and wine ready. Kalgan shook his head. He was unsure of what this creature was, but he was not overly comfortable with anything that so resembled a servant of the Dark Brotherhood. Macross said there would be a message. I would see it at once. Gaffis bowed slightly. As you will. Please, come with me. He led them along a series of corridors to a flight of stairs that spiralled up into the large tower. They mounted the steps and soon came to a locked door. My master said you would be able to open this door. Should you fail, you are impostors, and I am to deal with you harshly. Meacham gripped his sword at hearing this, but Pug placed his hand on the big Franklin's arm. Since the rift is closed, half my power is lost that which I gained from Kelowan. But this should prove no obstacle. Pug concentrated upon opening the door. Instead of the usual response of the door swinging open, a change occurred in the door itself. The wood seemed to become fluid, flowing and ebbing as it fashioned its surface into a new form. In a few moments, a face could be seen formed in the wood. It looked like a bas-relief, with a slight resemblance to Macross. It was very lifelike in detail, and appeared to be asleep. Then its eyelids opened, and they could see that the eyes were alive, black centres showing against white. Its mouth moved, and a voice issued from it, the sound deep and resonant, as it spoke in perfect Sirani. What is the first duty? Without thinking, Pug answered, To serve the Empire. The face flowed back into the door, and when there was no trace of it before them, the door swung aside. They entered, and found themselves in the study of Macross the Black, a large room occupying the entire top of the tower. Gathis said, I take it I have the honour of hosting Masters Colgan, Pug, and Meacham. He then studied the fourth member of the party. And you must be Prince Arthur. When they nodded, he said, My master was uncertain if your highness would attend, though he thought it likely. He was sure the other three gentlemen would be here. He indicated the room with a sweep of his hand. All that you see is at your disposal. If you will excuse me, I will return with your message and some refreshments. Gathis left, and all four looked at the contents of the room. Except for one bare wall, where it was obvious that a bookcase or cupboard had recently been removed, the entire room was surrounded with tall shelves from floor to ceiling, all heavily laden with books and scrolls. Pug and Kulgan were almost paralysed by indecision about where to begin their investigation. Arafa solved that problem by crossing over to a shelf where lay a parchment bound with a red ribbon. He took it down and laid it upon the round table in the centre of the room. A shaft of sunlight from the room's single large window fell across the parchment as he unrolled it. Kalgan came over to see what he had found. It is a map of Midkemia. Pug and Meacham crossed over to stand behind Kalgan and Aratha. 
Such a map! Prince Arthur exclaimed. I have never seen its like. His finger stabbed at a spot upon a large landmass in the center. Look, here is the kingdom. Across a small portion of the map were inscribed the words Kingdom of the Isles. Below could be seen the larger borders of the Empire of Great Kesh. To the south of the empire, the states of the Keshian Confederacy were clearly shown. To the best of my knowledge, said Kulgan, few from the kingdom have ever ventured into the Confederacy. Our only knowledge of its members is through the empire and a few of our more venturesome captains who visited some of their ports. We hardly know the names of these nations and nothing about them. Pug said, "We learn much about our world in an instant." Look at how small a part of this continent the kingdom is. He pointed to the great sweep of the Northlands to the north of the kingdom and the far-reaching mass of land below the Confederacy. The entire continent bore the inscription Triagia. Kogan said, "It appears there is a great deal more to our Midkemia than we had dreamed." He indicated additional land masses across the sea. These were labelled Winyet and Novindus. Upon each, cities and states were delineated. Two large chains of islands were also shown, many with cities marked. Kulgan shook his head. There have been rumours of traders from far distant lands venturing into the trading ports in the Keshian Confederacy, or treating with the pirates of Sunset Islands, but they are only rumours. It is small wonder we have never heard of these places. It would be a brave captain who set his ship upon a course for so far a port. They were brought out of their study by the sound of Gathis returning to the room. He carried a tray with a decanter and four wine cups. My master bade me say that you are to enjoy the hospitality of his home as long as you desire. He placed the tray on the table and poured wine into the cups. He then removed a scroll from within his tunic and handed it to Kulgan. He bade me give you this. I will retire while you consider my master's message. Should you need me, simply speak my name and I will return quickly. He bowed slightly and left the room. Kulgan regarded the scroll. It was sealed with black wax, impressed with the letter M. He broke the seal and unrolled the parchment. He started to read to himself, then said, "Let us sit." Pug rolled up the large map and put it away. Then returned to the table where the others were sitting. He pulled out a chair and waited with Meacham and Arthur while Kulgan read. Kulgan shook his head slowly. "Listen," he said, and read aloud. To the magicians Kalgan and Pug, greetings. I have anticipated some of your questions and have endeavoured to answer them as best I can. I fear there are others that must go begging, as much about myself must remain known only to me. I am not what the Surani would call a great one, though I have visited that world as Pug knows upon a number of occasions. My magic is peculiar to myself. And defies description in your terms of greater and lesser paths. Suffice it to say, I am a walker of many paths. I see myself as a servant of the gods, though that may be only my vanity speaking. Whatever the truth is, I have travelled to many lands and worked for many causes. Of my early life, I will say little. I am not of this world, having been born in a land distant both in space and time. It is not unlike this world, but there are ample reasons to count it strange by your standards. I am older than I care to remember, old even by the elves' reckoning. For reasons I do not understand, I have lived for ages, though my own people are as mortal as yours. It may be that when I entered into the magic arts, I unwittingly gave this near immortality to myself, or it may be the gift, or curse, of the gods. Since becoming a sorcerer, I have been fated to know my own future as others know their pasts. I have never retreated from what I knew to be before me, though often I wished to. 
I have served great kings and simple peasants both. I have lived in the greatest cities and the rudest huts. Often I have understood the meaning of my participation, sometimes not, but always I have followed the foreordained path that was set for me. Kogan stopped for a moment. Well, this explains how he knew so much. He resumed his reading. Of all my labours, my role in the Rift War was the hardest. Never have I experienced such desire to turn from the path before me. Never have I been responsible for the loss of so many lives, and I mourn for them more than you can know. But even as you consider my treachery, consider my situation. I was unable to close the rift without Pug's aid. It was fated for the war to continue while he learned his craft on Kelewan. For the terrible price paid, consider the gain. There now is one upon Midkemia who practices the greater art, which was lost in the coming of man during the Chaos Wars. The benefit will be judged only by history, but I think it a valuable one. As to my closing the rift once peace was at hand, I can only say it was vital. The Surani Great Ones had forgotten that rifts are subject to the enemy's detection. Kolgan looked up in surprise. Enemy? Pug, this refers to something I think you need to explain. Pug told them quickly of what he knew of the legendary enemy. Aretha said, Can such a terrible being really exist? His expression betrayed disbelief. Pug said, That it once existed there is no doubt and for a being of such power still to endure is not beyond imagining. But of all conceivable reasons for Macross's actions, this is the last I would have thought possible. No one in the Assembly had dreamed of it. It's incredible. Tolgan resumed reading. It is to him like a beacon, drawing that terrible entity across space and time. It might have been years more before he would have appeared, but once here... All the powers of your world would be hard-pressed, perhaps even insufficient, to dislodge him from Midkemia. The rift had to be closed. The reasons I chose to ensure its closing at the cost of so many lives should be apparent to you. Pug interrupted. What does he mean? Should be apparent. Kalgan said, Macross was nothing, it seems, if not a student of human nature. Could he alone have convinced the king and emperor to close the rift, with so much to be gained by keeping it open? Perhaps, perhaps not. But in any event, there would have been the all-too-human temptation to keep it open just a little longer. I think he knew that, and was ensuring there would be no choice. Kalgan returned to reading the scroll. As to what will happen now, I cannot say. My seeing of the future ends with the explosion of the rift. Whether it is finally my appointed hour, or simply the beginning of some new era of my existence, I do not know. In the event, you have witnessed my death. I have decided upon the following course. All my research, with some exceptions, is contained within this room. It is be used to further the greater and lesser arts, it is my wish that you take possession of the books, scrolls, and tomes contained here, and use them to that end. A new epoch of magic is beginning in the kingdom, and it is my wish for others to benefit from my works. In your hands, I leave this new age. It is signed, Macross. Kalgan placed the scroll upon the table. Pug said, one of the last things he said to me was he wished to be remembered kindly. They said nothing for a time. Then Kalgan called, Gathis. Within seconds the creature appeared at the doorway. Yes, Master Kalgan. Do you know what is contained within this scroll? Yes, Master Kalgan. My master was most explicit in his instructions. He made sure that we were aware of his requirements. We said Arthur. Gathis smiled his toothy grin. I am but one of my master's servants. The others are instructed to keep from your sight, for it was feared their presence might cause you some discomfort. 
my master lacked most of the human prejudices and was content to judge each creature he met on its own merits. What exactly are you? asked Pug. I am of a race akin to the goblins, as the elves are to the Dark Brotherhood. We are an old race and perished but for a few long before humans came to the bitter sea. Those that were left were brought here by Macross, and I am the last. Kalgan regarded the creature. In spite of his appearance, there was something about him that was likable. What will you do now? I will wait here for my master's return, keeping his home in order. You expect him to return? asked Pug. Most likely, in a day, or a year, or a century, it does not matter. Things will be ready for him should he return. What if he has perished? asked Aratha. In that event, I shall go old and die waiting. But I think not. I have served the Black One for a very long time. Between us is an understanding. If he were dead, I think I would know. He is merely absent. Even if he is dead, he may return. Time is not to my master as it is to other men. I am content to wait. Pug thought about this. He must truly have been the master of all magic. Gathis's smile broadened. He would laugh to hear that, master. He was always complaining of there being so much to learn and so little time to learn it, and that from a man who had lived years beyond numbering. Kalgan said as he rose from his chair, We will have to fetch men to carry all these things back to the ship. Gathis said, Worry not, master. Retire to your ship when you are ready. Leave two boats on the beach at the cove. At first light, the next day, you will find everything placed aboard, packed for shipment. Kalgan nodded. Very well. Then we should start at once to catalogue all these works before we move them. Gathis went over to a shelf and returned with a rolled parchment. In uh, anticipation of your needs, Master, I have prepared such a listing of all the works here. Kalgan unrolled the parchment and began reading the inventory of works. His eyes widened. Listen, he said excitedly, there's a copy of Vitalis's Expectations of Matter Transformation here. His eyes grew bigger still. And Spandrick's Temporal Research. That work was thought lost a hundred years ago. He looked at the others, wonder upon his face. And hundreds of volumes with Macross's name on them. This is a treasure beyond measure. Gathis said, I am pleased that you find it so, Master. Kalgan started to ask for those volumes to be brought to him. But Aratha said, Wait, Kalgan. Once you begin, we'll have to tie you up to get you out of here. Let us return to the ship and wait for all this to be brought. We must be off soon. Kalgan looked like a child whose sweets had been taken from him. Aratha, Pug, and Meacham all chuckled at the stout magician. Pug said, There is no good reason to stay now. We shall have years to study these after the coronation. Look around, Kulgan. Do you mean to inhale all this in one breath? A look of resignation crossed Kulgan's face. Very well. Pug surveyed all in the room. Think of it. An academy for the study of magic, with Macross's library at the heart. Kalgan's eyes grew luminous. I had all but forgotten the Duke's bequest. A place to learn. No longer will an apprentice learn from this master or that, but from many. With this legacy and your own teachings, Pug, we have a wonderful start. Aratha said, Let us be on our way if we're to have any sort of start. There's a new king to crown, and the longer you tarry, the more likely you'll lose yourself in here. Kulgan looked as if his good name were impugned. Well, I will take a few things to study while on the ship, if you have no objections. Aratha raised a proclating hand. <laughs> Whatever you wish, he said with a rueful smile. But please, no more than we can reasonably lug down to the boat. Kulgan smiled, his mood lightening. Agreed. He turned to Gathis. Would you fetch those two volumes I mentioned? Gathis held out the two volumes, old and well-read. Kulgan looked surprised while Gathis said, 
I thought you might reach such an understanding and remove them from the shelves while you discuss the matter. Colgan walked toward the door, shaking his head slowly as he regarded the two books he held. The others followed, and Gathis closed the door behind them. The goblin-like creature guided them to the courtyard and bid them a safe journey at the door of the keep. When the large doors had closed behind them, Meacham said, "As fellow Macross seems to have raised five questions for each he answered. Kulgan said, You have that right, old friend. Perhaps we will gain additional knowledge from his notes and other works. Perhaps not, and maybe that's the right of it. Chapter 34 Renaissance Rilanon was in a festive mood. Everywhere banners rippled in the breeze and garlands of summer flowers replaced the black bunting that had marked the period of mourning for the late king and his cousin Boric. Now they would be crowning a new king, and the people rejoiced. The people of Rilanon knew little of Liam, but he was fair to view and generous with his smile in public. To the populace, it was as if the sun had come out from behind the dark clouds that had been Roderick's reign. Few among the people were aware of the many royal guards who circulated through the city, always alert for signs of Guy du Bastira's agents and possible assassins. And fewer still noticed the plainly dressed men who were always near when groups gathered to speak of the new king, listening to what was said. Aratha cantered his horse towards the palace, leaving Pug, Meacham and Culgan behind. He cursed the fate that had delayed them nearly a week, becalmed less than three days from Crondor, then the slowness of their journey to Salador. It was mid-morning, and already the priests of Ishap were bearing the king's new crown through the city. In less than three hours they would appear before the throne, and Liam would take the crown. Aratha reached the palace, and shouts from the guards echoed across the vast courtyard. Prince Aratha arrives! Aratha gave his mount to a page, and hurried up the steps to the palace. As he reached the entranceway, Anita came running in his direction, a radiant smile on her face. Oh, she cried, it's good to see you. He smiled back at her and said, it's good to see you also. I must get ready for the ceremony. Where's Liam? He has secreted himself in the royal tomb. He left word you were to come straight away to him there. Her voice was troubled. There is something strange taking place here, but no one seems to know what it is. Only Martin Longbow has seen Liam since supper last night, and when I saw Martin, he had the strangest look upon his face. Aratha laughed. <laughs> Martin is always full of strange looks. Come, let us go to Liam. She refused to let him ignore the warning. No, you go alone. That's what Liam ordered. Besides, I must dress for the ceremony. But, Aratha, there is something very queer in the wind. Aratha's manner turned more reflective. Anita was a good judge of such things. Very well. I'll have to wait for my things to be brought from the ship anyway. I, I will see Liam, and then when this mystery is cleared up, join you at the ceremony. Good. Where is Carline? <laughs> Fussing over this and that. I I I'll tell her you've arrived. She kissed his cheek and hurried off. Aratha hadn't been to the vault of his ancestors since he was a boy, the first time he had come to Rilanon for Roderick's coronation. He asked a page to lead him there, and the boy guided him through a maze of corridors. The palace had been through many transformations over the ages, new wings being added on, new constructions over those destroyed by fire, earthquake or war. But in the centre of the vast edifice, the ancient first keep remained. The only clue they were entering the ancient halls was the sudden appearance of dark stone walls, worn smooth by time. Two guards stood watch by a door over which was carved a bas-relief crest of the Condwan kings, a crowned lion holding a sword in its claws. The page said, Prince Aratha, and the guards opened the door. Aratha stepped through into a small anteroom, with a long flight of stairs leading down. He followed the stairs past rows of brightly burning torches that stained the stones of the walls with black soot. The stairs ended, and Aratha stood before a large, high-arched doorway. On both sides loomed heroic statues of ancient Condwan kings. To the right, with features dulled with age, stood the statue of Danis, first Condwan king of Rilanon, some 750 years past. To the left stood the statue of Delong, the only king called the Great, 
the king who first brought the banner of Renanen to the mainland with the conquest of Bastira, 250 years after Danis. Aratha passed between his ancestors' likenesses and entered the burial vault. He walked between the ancient forebears of his line, entombed in the walls and upon great catafalques. Kings and queens, princes and princesses, scoundrels and rogues, saints and scholars lined his way. At the far end of the huge chamber, he found Liam, sitting next to the catafalque that supported his father's stone coffin. A likeness of Boric had been carved in the coffin's surface, and it looks as if the late Duke of Criddy lay sleeping. Aratha approached slowly, for Liam seemed deep in thought. Liam looked up and said, I feared you might come late. As did I. We had wretched weather and slow progress, but we're all here. Now... What is this strange business? Uh, Anita told me you've been here all night and there is some mystery. What is it? I have given great thought to this matter, Aretha. The whole of the kingdom will know within a few hours' time, but I wanted you to see what I have done and hear what I must say before any others. Anita said Martin was here with you this morning. What is this, Liam? Liam stepped away from his father's catafalque and pointed. Inscribed upon the stones of the burial place were the words, Here lies Boric, third Duke of Criddy, husband of Catherine, father of Martin, Liam, Aratha, and Carline. Aratha's lips moved, but no words came forth. He shook his head, then said, What madness is this? Liam came between Aratha and the likeness of their father. No madness, Aratha. Father acknowledged Martin on his deathbed. He is our brother. He is the eldest. Aratha's face became contorted with rage. Why didn't you tell me? His voice was tormented. What right had you to hide this from me? Liam raised his own voice. All who knew were sworn to secrecy. I could not think of anyone knowing until the peace was made. There was too much to lose. Aratha shoved past his brother, looking in disbelief at the inscription. <sighs> It all makes an evil sense. Martin's exclusion from the choosing. The way Father always kept an eye on his whereabouts. His freedom to come and go as he pleased. Bitterness rang in Aratha's words. But why now? Why did Father acknowledge Martin after so many years of denial? Liam tried to comfort Aratha. I've pieced together what I could from Colgan and Tully. Besides them, no one knew, not even Fanon. Father was a guest of Brukel's when he was in his first year of office after Grandfather's death. He tumbled a pretty serving girl and conceived Martin. It was five years before Father knew of him. Father had come to court, met Mother, and married. When he learned of Martin, he had already been abandoned by his mother to the monks of Silburn's Abbey. Father chose to let Martin remain in their care. When I was born, Father began to feel remorse over having a son unknown to him, and when I was six, Martin was ready for choosing. Father arranged to have him brought to Criddy, but he wouldn't acknowledge him for fear of shaming Mother. Then why now? Liam looked at the likeness of their father. Who knows what passes through a man's mind in the moments before death? Perhaps more guilt or, or some sense of honour. Whatever the reason, he acknowledged Martin and Brukel bore witness. Anger still sounded in Aratha's voice. Now we must deal with this madness, regardless of father's reasons for creating it. He fixed Liam with a harsh stare. What did he say when you brought him down to see this? Liam looked away, as if pained by what he now said. He stood silently. Then I saw him weep. Finally he said, I am pleased he told you. Aratha, he knew. Liam gripped his brother's arms. All those years, father thought him ignorant of his birthright, and he knew, and never once did he seek to turn that knowledge to his own gain. Aratha's anger subsided. Did he say anything more? Only, thank you, Liam. And then he left. Aratha paced away for a moment, then faced Liam. Martin is a good man, as good a man as I have ever known. I'll be the first to say so, but 
this acknowledgement, my God, do you know what you've done? I'm aware of my actions. You have placed all we have won over the last nine years in the balance, Liam. Shall we fight ambitious Eastern lords who might rally in Martin's name? Do we end one war simply to begin an even more bitter one? There will be no contestation. Arath has stopped his pacing. His eyes narrowed. What do you mean? Has Martin promised to voice no claim? No. I have decided not to oppose Martin should he choose the crown. Arthur was speechless for a moment, in shock, as he regarded Liam. For the first time, he understood the terrible doubts his brother had been voicing over being king. You don't want to be king, he said, his tone accusatory. Liam laughed bitterly. <laughs> no sane man would. You have said as much yourself, brother. I don't know if I am a match for the burdens of kingship, but the matter is out of my hands now. If Martin speaks for himself as king, I will acknowledge his right. His right? The royal signet passed to your hand before most of the lords of the kingdom. You are not sick, Erland, deferring to his brother's son because of ill health and by reason of no clear succession. You are named the heir. Liam lowered his head. The announcement of succession is invalid, Arthur. Roderick named me heir as eldest Condois male, which I am not. Martin is. Arthur confronted his brother. <laughs> A pretty point of law, Liam, but one that may prove the destruction of this kingdom. Should Martin voice a claim before the Congress assembled, the priest of Ishab will break the crown and the matter passes to the Congress of Lords for resolution. Even with Guy in hiding, there are dozens of dukes, scores of earls and a host of barons who would willingly cut their neighbours' throats to convene such a congress. Such bargaining would end with half the estates in the kingdom switching hands in trade for votes. It would be a carnival. If you take the crown, Bastira cannot act. But if you back Martin, many will refuse to follow. A deadlocked congress is exactly what Guy wishes. <laughs> I'll bet all I own he is somewhere in the city at this very moment, plotting against such an event. If the Eastern Lords bolt, Guy will emerge and many will flock to his banner. Liam appeared overwhelmed by his brother's words. I cannot say what will happen, Aratha, but I know I could not do other than I have done. Aratha looked on the verge of striking Liam. You may have inherited the burden of father's sense of family honour, but it will fall to the rest of us to deal with the killing. Heaven's mercy, Liam, what do you think will happen if some heretofore nameless huntsman sits the Cond One throne simply because our father tumbled a pretty maid nearly forty years ago? We shall have civil war! Liam stood firm. Should our positions have been reversed, would you have robbed Martin of his birthright? Arthur's anger vanished. He looked at his brother with open amazement on his face. Gods, you feel guilt because father denied Martin all his life, don't you? He stepped away from Liam, as if trying to gain perspective on him. Should our positions have been reversed, I most assuredly would deny Martin his birthright. After thirty-seven years, what's a few more days? After I was king, firm on my throne, then I would make him a duke, give him an army to command, name him first adviser, whatever need be to salve my conscience, but not until the kingdom was secure. I would not wish Martin to play Boric the First to Guise John the Pretender, and I would do whatever must be done to see that would not come to pass. Liam sighed with deep regret. Then... You and I are two different sorts of men, Aretha. I told you back at the camp I thought you would make a better king than I. And perhaps you're right. But what's done is done. It does Brukel nerve this? Only we three. He looked directly at Aretha. Only our father's sons. Aretha flushed, irritated at the remark. Don't misunderstand me, Liam. I hold Martin in no little affection, but there are issues here much larger than any personal consideration. He thought quietly for a moment. Then it is in Martin's hands. If you had to do this, at least you did right in not making it a public matter. There will be shock enough should Martin come forth at the coronation, at least with advance warning we can prepare. 
Arifa moved toward the stairs, then stopped and faced his brother. What you said cuts both ways, Liam. Perhaps because you cannot deny Martin, you'll make a better king than I. But as much as I love you, I will not let the kingdom be destroyed over the succession. Liam seemed unable to contest with his brother any longer. Fatigue, a weary resignation toward what fate would bring, sounded in his words. What will you do? What must be done? I will ensure that those who are loyal to us are forewarned. If there comes a need to fight, then let us have the advantage of surprise. He paused for a moment. I have nothing but the greatest affection for Martin Liam. You must know that. I hunted with him as a boy, and he was in no small part responsible for my safety getting Anita away from Guy's watchdogs, a debt beyond repaying. In another time and place, I would gladly accept him as my brother. But should it come to bloodshed, Liam, I'll willingly kill him. Aretha left the vault of his ancestors. Liam stood alone. Feeling the chill of ages press in upon him, Pug looked out the window, reminiscing. Katala came to his side, and he came out of his reverie. "You look lovely," he said. She was dressed in a brilliant gown of deep red with golden trim at the bodice and sleeves. The finest duchess of the court could not match your beauty. She smiled at his flattery. I thank you, husband. She spun, showing off the gown. Your Duke Calderic is the true magician. I am thinking. How his staff could manage to find all these things and have them ready in two short hours is true magic. She patted at the full skirt. These heavy gowns will take some practice getting around in. I think I prefer the short robes of home. She stroked the material. Still, this is a lovely cloth. And in this cold world of yours, I can see the need. The weather had turned much cooler now that summer was waning. In less than two months, snow would begin falling. Wait until winter, Katala, if you think it's cold now. William came running into the room from the bedroom that adjoined their own. Mama, Papa! He yelled in boyish exuberance. He was dressed in a tunic and trousers befitting a little noble of fine material and workmanship. He leaped into his father's outstretched arms. Where are you going? He asked with a wide-eyed look. Pug said, "We go to see Liam made king, William. While we're gone, you mind the nurse and don't tease Fantas." He said he would and wouldn't, respectively. But his impish grin put his credibility in doubt. The maid, who was to act as William's nurse, entered and took the boy in tow, leading him back into his own room. Pug and Katala left the suite Caldrick had given them. And walked toward the throne room. As they turned a corner, they saw Laurie leaving his room, with Kasumi standing nervously to one side. Laurie brightened upon seeing them and said, "Ah, there you are. I was hoping we'd see you two before all the ceremonies had begun." Kasumi bowed to Pug, though the magician now wore a fashionable russet-coloured tunic and trousers in place of his black robe. "Great one," he said. "That is a thing of the past here, Kasumi. Please call me Pug." You too look so handsome in your new clothes and uniform," said Katala. Laurie wore bright clothing in the latest fashion: a yellow tunic with a sleeveless over jacket of green and tight-fitting black trousers tucked into high boots. Kasumi wore the uniform of a knight captain of the Lamutian garrison: deep green tunic and trousers and the grey wolf's head tabard of Lamut. The minstrel smiled at her. In all the excitement of the last few months, I'd forgotten I had a small fortune in gems with me. Since I cannot conspire to return them to the Lord of the Shinzawa, and his son refuses to take them, I, I suppose they are mine by rights. I will no longer have to worry about finding a widow with an inn. Pug said, "Kasumi, how goes it with your men?" Well enough, though there is still some discomfort between them and the Lamutian soldiers. It should pass in time. We had an encounter with the Brotherhood the week after we left. They can fight, but we routed them. There was much celebrating among all the men in the garrisons, both Sirani and Lamutian. It was a good beginning. 
It had been more than an encounter. Word had reached Grilanon of the battle. The Dark Brothers and their goblin allies had raided into Yabon, overrunning one of the border garrisons weakened during the war. The Tsirani had turned from their march to Zun, dashed northward and relieved the garrison. The Tsirani had fought like madmen to save their former enemies from the larger goblin host, which they had driven back into the mountains north of Yabon. Lorry winked at Pug. Having made something of heroes of themselves, our Surani friends were given quite a welcome when they arrived here in Vilanen. Being distant from the centre of the war, the city citizens felt little fear or hatred toward their former enemies, giving them a welcome that would have been unimaginable in the free cities, in Yabon or along the far coast. I think Kasumi's men were a little overcome by it all. In truth, they were, agreed Kasumi. Such a reception on our home world would have been impossible, but here... Still, continued Lorry, they seem to take it in stride. The men have developed a rapid appreciation for kingdom wines and ale, and they've even managed to overcome their distaste for tall women. Kasumi looked away with an embarrassed smile on his face. Lorry said, Our dashing knight captain was guested a week ago by one of the richer merchant families, one seeking to develop border trade with the West. He has since been seen often in the company of a certain merchant's daughter. Katala laughed, and Pug smiled at Kasumi's embarrassment. Pug said, he was always a quick student. Kasumi lowered his head, cheeks flushed but grinning broadly. Still, it is a hard thing learning that your countrywomen have such freedom. Now I see why you two were always so strong-willed. You must have learned from your mothers. Laurie's attention was diverted by someone approaching. Pug noticed a look of open admiration upon the singer's face. The magician turned and was greeted by the sight of a beautiful young woman approaching with a guard escort. Pug's eyes widened as he recognised Carline. She was as lovely a woman as her girlhood had promised. She came up to them and with a wave of her hand dismissed the guard. She looked regal in a fine green gown, with a pearl-studded tiara crowning her dark hair. Master Magician, she said, have you no greeting for an old friend? Pug bowed before the princess, and Kasumi and Lori did also. Katala curtsied as she had been shown by one of the maids. Pug said, Princess, you flatter me by remembering a simple keep boy. Carline smiled with a gleam in her blue eyes. Oh, Pug... You were never a simple anything. She looked past him to Katala. Is this your wife? When he nodded and introduced them, the princess kissed Katala's cheek and said, My dear, I had heard you were lovely, but the reports my brother gave did you little justice. Katala said, Your Highness is gracious. Kasumi had returned to his nervous posture, but Lorry stood unable to take his eyes from the young woman in green. Katala had to grip his arm firmly to recapture his attention. Lorry, would you show Kasumi and me about the palace a little before the ceremonies begin? Lorry smiled broadly, bowed to the princess, and accompanied Kasumi and Katala down the hallway. Pug and the princess watched their retreating backs. Carline said, your wife is a most perceptive woman. Pug smiled. She is indeed remarkable. Carline looked genuinely glad to see him. I understand you also have a son. William. He's a little devil. And a treasure. There was a trace of envy in Carline's expression. I would like to meet him. She paused, then added, You've been most fortunate. Most fortunate, Highness. She took his arm, and they slowly started to walk. So formal, Pug? Or should I call you Milimba, as I have heard you were known? He saw her smile and returned it. I sometimes don't know, though here Pug seems more proper. He grinned. You seem to have learned a great deal about me. She feigned a small pout. You were always my favourite magician. They shared a laugh. Then... Lowering his voice, Pug said, I am so very sorry about your father's death, Carline. She clouded a little. 
Lam told me you were there at the last. I am glad he saw you safely back before he died. Did you know how much he cared for you? Pug felt himself flush with emotion. He gave me a name. There is little more he could have done to show me. Did you know that? She brightened. Yes. Liam also told me that. <laughs> We're cousins of sorts, she said with a laugh. As they walked, she spoke softly. You were my first love, Pug, but even more, you were always my friend, and I am pleased to see my friend once more home. He stopped and kissed her lightly upon the cheek. And your friend is most pleased to be home. Blushing slightly, she led him to a small garden on a terrace. They walked out into bright sunlight and sat upon a stone bench. Carline let out a long sigh. I only wish Father and Roland could be here. Pug said, "I was also grieved to hear of Roland's death." She shook her head. <sighs> That jester lived as much in his few years as most men do in their entire lives. He hid much behind his raffish ways, but do you know? I think he may have been one of the wisest men I'll ever know. He took every passing minute and squeezed all the life from it he could. Pug studied her face and saw her eyes were bright with memory. Had he lived, I would have married him. I suspect we would have fought every day, Pug. Oh, how he could make me angry! But he could always make me laugh as well. He taught me so very much about living. I shall always treasure his memory. I am pleased you are at peace with your losses, Carline. So many years a slave. Then a magician in another land have changed me much. It seems you have greatly changed as well. She tilted her head to look at him. I don't think you've changed all that much, Pug. There's still some of the boy in you, the one who was so rattled by my attentions. Pug laughed. I guess you're right. And in some ways you are also unchanged, or at least you still have the knack of rattling men. If friend Laurie's reaction is any measure, she smiled at him. Her face radiant, and Pug knew a faint tugging, an echo of what he had felt when he was a boy. But now there was no discomfort, for he knew he would always love Carline, no, not in the way he had imagined as a boy. More than any tumultuous passion or the deep bond he had with Catala, he knew that what he felt was affection and friendship. She pursued his last comment. That. Beautiful blond man who was with you a few minutes ago. Who is he? Pug smiled knowingly. Your most devoted subject, from all appearances. <laughs> He's Laurie, a troubadour from Tiersog, and a rascal of limitless wit and charm. He has a loving heart and brave spirit, and is a true friend. I'll tell you some time of how he saved my life at peril of his own. Carline again cocked her head to one side. He sounds a most intriguing fellow. Pug could see that while she was older and more self-possessed and had known sorrow, much about her remained unchanged. I once, in jest, promised him an introduction to you. Now I am sure he would be most delighted to make your highness's acquaintance. Then we must arrange it. She rose. I fear I must go make ready for the coronation. Any time now, the bells will sound and the priests will arrive. We shall speak again, Pug. Pug came to his feet as well. I shall enjoy it, Carline. He presented his arm. A voice behind him said, "Squire Pug, may I speak with you?" They turned around and found Martin Longbow standing some distance away, farther back in the garden. He bowed to the princess. Carline said, "Master Longbow." There you are. I've not seen you since yesterday. Martin smiled lightly. I've had a need to be alone. In Criddy, when such a mood strikes, I return to the forest. Here, he indicated the large terraced garden. This was the best I could manage. She looked quizzically at him, but shrugged off the remark. Well, I expect you will manage to attend the coronation. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must be off. 
she accepted their polite goodbyes and left. Looking at Pug, Martin said, "It is good to see you once again, Pug." And you, Martin. Of all my old friends here, you are the last to greet me, except for those still in Criddy I've yet to see. You've made my homecoming complete. Pug could see Martin was troubled. Is something wrong? Martin looked out over the garden toward the city and sea beyond. Liam told me, Pug. He told me you know as well. Pug understood at once. I was there when your father died, Martin. He said, his voice remaining calm. In silence, Martin began to walk, and when he came to the low stone wall around the garden, he gripped it hard. My father, he said bitterly. How many years I waited for him to say, Martin, I am your father. He swallowed hard. I never cared for inheritance and such things. I was content to remain huntmaster of Criddy. If only he had told me himself. Pug thought over his next words. Martin, many men do things they regret later. Only a few are granted the opportunity to make amends. Had a Tsirani arrow taken him quickly, had a hundred other things come to pass, he might not have had the chance to do what little he did. I know, but still, that is cold comfort. Did Liam tell you his last words? He said, "Martin is your brother. I have wronged him, Liam. He is a good man, and well do I love him." Martin's knuckles turned white, gripping the stone wall. Quietly, he replied, "No. He did not." Lord Borick was not a simple man, Martin, and I was only a boy when I knew him. But whatever else may be said of him, there was no meanness of spirit in the man. I, I don't pretend to understand why he acted as he did, but that he loved you is certain. It was all such folly. I knew he was my father, and he never knew I had been told by mother. What difference in our lives had I gone to him and proclaimed myself? Only the gods might know. He reached out and touched Martin's arm. What matters now is what you will do. That Liam told you means he will make public your birthright. If he's already told others, the court will be in an uproar. You are the eldest and have the right of first claim. Do you know what you will do? Studying Pug, Martin said, "You speak calmly enough of this. Doesn't my claim to the throne disturb you at all?" Pug shook his head. <laughs> he would have no way of knowing, but I was counted among the most powerful men in Sirinuani. My word was, in some ways, more important than any king's command. I, I think I know what power can do and what sort of men seek it. I doubt you have much personal ambition as such, unless you have changed a great deal since I lived in Criddy. If you take the crown, it will be for what you believe are good reasons. It may be the only way to prevent civil war. For should you choose the mantle of king, Liam will be the first to swear fealty. Whatever the reason, you would do your best to act wisely, and if you take the purple, you will do your best to be a good ruler. Martin looked impressed. You have changed much, Squire Pug, more than I would have expected. I thank you for your kind judgment of me, but. I think you are the only man in the kingdom who would believe such. Whatever the truth may be, you are your father's son and would not bring dishonour upon his house. Again, Martin's words were tinged with bitterness. <laughs> There are those who will judge my birth itself a dishonour. He looked out over the city below, then turned to stare at Pug. If only the choice were simple, but Liam's seen that it is not. If I take the crown, many will balk. If I renounce in Liam's favour, some may use me as an excuse to refuse Liam their allegiance. God's above, Pug! Were this issue between Aratha and myself, I would not hesitate for an instant to stand aside in his favour. But Liam, I have not seen him for seven years, and those years have changed him. He seems a man beset with doubts. 
An able field commander, no question, but a king? I am faced with the fearful prospect I would prove a more able king. Pug spoke softly. As I have said, should you claim the throne, you will do so for what you judge good reasons, reasons of duty. Martin's right hand closed into a fist held before his face. <laughs> Where ends duty and begins personal ambition? Where ends justice and begins revenge? There is a part of me, an angry part of me, that says, Ring all you can from this moment, Martin. Why not King Martin? And then another part of me wonders if Father may have placed this upon me, knowing some day I must be king. Oh, Pug! What is my duty? That is something each of us must judge for himself alone. I can offer you no counsel. Martin leaned forward upon the rail, hands covering his face. I think I would like to be left alone for a time, if you do not mind. Pug left, knowing a troubled man considered his fate, and the fate of the kingdom. Pug found Katala with Lori and Kasumi speaking with Duke Brukel and Earl Van Dross. As he approached, he could hear the Duke saying, So, we'll finally have a wedding now that this young slowwit, he indicated Van Dross, has asked for my daughter's hand. <laughs> Maybe I'll have some grandchildren before I die after all. See what comes of waiting so many years to marry? You're old before your children marry. He inclined his head when he saw Pug. Ah, magician, there you are. Katala smiled when she saw her husband. Did you and the princess have a nice reunion? Very nice. Prodding him in the chest with her forefinger, she said, And when we're alone, you'll repeat every single word. The others laughed at Pug's embarrassment, though he could see she was only having fun with him. Brukel said, Ah, magician, your wife is so lovely. I, I wish I was sixty again. He winked at Pug. That I'd steal her from you and damn the scandal. He took Pug by the arm and said to Katala, If you'll forgive me, lady, instead I'll have to steal a moment of your husband's time. He steered Pug away from the surprised group, and when they were out of earshot said, I have grave news. I know. Liam is a fool, a noble fool. He looked away for a moment, his eyes filming over with memory. Ah, but he is his father's son, and his grandfather's grandson as well. And like both before him, has a strong sense of honour. The old eyes came into sharp focus again. Still, I wish his sense of duty were as clear. Lowering his voice even more, he said, Keep your wife close about. The guards in the hall wear the purple and will die defending the king, whoever he may be. But it may get messy. Many of the Eastern lords are impulsive men, overly used to having their petty demands instantly gratified. A few might open their mouths and find themselves chewing steel. My men and Vandross's are positioned throughout the palace, while Kusumi's Tsurani are outside at Liam's request. The Eastern lords don't like it, but Liam is heir, and they cannot say no. With those who will stand with us, we can seize the palace and hold it. With Dubastira hiding, and Richard of Salador dead, the eastern lords have lost their leadership. But there are enough of them on the island, with enough of their honour guards in and around the city, to turn this island into a pretty battleground should they flee the palace before a king is named. No, we'll hold the palace. No traitorous easterner will leave to plot treason with black Guy. Each one will bend a knee before whichever brother takes the crown. Pug was surprised by this. You'll support Martin, then? Old Brukel's voice became harsh, though he kept it low. No one will plunge my kingdom into civil war, magician. Not while I have a breath left to spend. Arthur and I have spoken. Neither of us likes the choices, but we are clear on our course. Should Martin be king, all will bow before him. Should Liam take the crown, Martin will swear fealty or not leave the palace alive. Should the crown be broken... We hold this palace, and no lord leaves until a congress has named one brother king, even if we're a year in that bloody damned hall. We've already picked up several of Guy's agents in the city. 
He's here in Rilanon, there's no doubt. If even a handful of nobles can win free of the palace before a congress is convened, we have civil war. He struck his fist into his open hand. Damn these traditions! As we speak, the priests walk towards the palace, each step bringing them closer to the moment of choice. If only Liam had acted sooner, given us more time, or, or not acted at all. Or if we could have caged Guy, if we could have spoken to Martin, but he's vanished. I've spoken to Martin. Brukel's eyes narrowed. What is his mood? What are his plans? He's a troubled man, as you may well imagine, to have all this put upon him with scant time to adjust. He has always known who his father was, and was resigned to take the secret with him to his grave. But now he is suddenly thrust into the heart of the matter. I don't know what he'll do. I don't think he'll know until the priests put the crown before him. Brukel stroked his chin. Or that he knew and tried not to use that knowledge for his own gain speaks well of him. But there's still no time. He indicated the group by the main door to the hall. You'd best be back to your wife. Keep your wits sharp, magician, for we may have need of your arts before this day is through. They returned to the others, and Brukel led Van Dross and Kasumi inside, speaking with them in low tones. Before Katala could speak, Laurie said, What is a foot? When I took Katala and Kasumi outside to a balcony overlooking the courtyard, I saw Kasumi's men everywhere. For a moment I thought the Empire had won the war. I couldn't get a thing from him. Pug said, Brukel knows they can be trusted to follow Kasumi's orders without question. Katala said, What is this, husband? Trouble? There is little time to explain. There may be more than one claimant to the crown. Stay near Kasumi, Laurie, and keep your sword loose. If there's trouble, follow Aratha's lead. Laurie nodded, his face set in a grim expression of understanding. He entered the hall and Katala said, William? He's safe. If there is trouble, it will be in the great hall, not in the guest quarters. It will be afterward the true grief will begin. Her expression showed she didn't fully understand, but she quietly accepted what he said. Come, we must take our places inside. They hurried into the great hall to a place of honour near the front. As they passed by the throng gathered to see the king crowned, they could hear the buzz of voices as rumour swept the room. They came up to Culgan, and the stout magician nodded greeting. Meacham waited a few paces behind, his back to a wall. His eyes surveyed the room, marking the positions of all within a sword's length of Culgan. Pug noticed the old, long-bladed hunter's knife was loose in its scabbard. He might not know what the problem was, but he would be instantly ready to protect his old companion. Culgan hissed. What is going on? Everything was calm until a few minutes ago. Now the room is a buzz. Pug leaned his head closer to Culgan's and said, Martin may announce for the crown. Culgan's eyes widened. Gods and fishes! That'll set this court on its ear. He looked around and saw most of the kingdom's nobles had taken their places within the hall. With a sigh of regret, he said, It's too late to do anything now but wait. Amos crashed through the garden, swearing furiously. Why the hell does anyone want all these bloody posies about anyway? Martin looked up and barely caught the crystal goblet thrust at him by Amos Trask. What? he said, as Amos filled it with wine from a crystal decanter he held. A archer might be in need of a bracer and a shipmate to share it with. Martin's eyes narrowed. What do you mean? Amos filled his own goblet and took a long pull. It's all over the palace now, fella me lad. Liam's a good enough sort, but he's got rocks for ballast if he thinks he can have a crew of stone cutters put your name on your father's tomb and then hush them up with something as petty as a royal command. Every servant in the parish knew you were the first mate within an hour after those boys finished work. It's all up in the wind, you can believe me. Martin drank the wine and said, Thank you, Amos. He studied the deep red wine in the glass. Shall I be king? Amos laughed, a good-natured, hearty sound, 
<laughs> have two thoughts on that, Martin. First, it's always better to be captain than deckhand, which is why I'm a captain and not a deckhand. Second, there's some difference between a ship and a kingdom. Martin laughed. <laughs> Pirate, you're no help at all. Amos looked stung. Blast me, I got you to laugh, didn't I? He leaned over, resting an elbow on the garden wall, while he poured more wine into his cup. See here, there's this、uh, pretty little three-master in the royal harbour. I've not had much time, but with the king's pardon being declared, there's plenty of good lads fresh from the brig who jumped to sail with Captain Trenchard. Why don't we cast off from here and go a roving? Martin shook his head. That sounds fine. I've been on a ship three times in my life, and with you, I nearly got killed all three times. Amos looked injured.、Uh, the first two times were Arthur's fault, and the third time wasn't my fault. I didn't send those Cerisian pirates to chase us from Salador to Renalen. And besides, if you sign aboard with me, we'll do the chasing. The kingdom sees a whole new sea for Trenchard to sail. What do you say? Martin's voice turned somber. No, Amos. Though I'd almost as soon sail with you as return to the forest. But what I must decide cannot be run from. For good or ill, I am the eldest son, and I have the first claim to the crown. Martin looked hard at Amos. Do you think Liam can be king? Amos shook his head. Of course, but that's not the question, is it? What you want to know is, can Liam be a good king? I don't know, Martin, but I'll tell you one thing: I've seen many a sailor gone pale with fear in battle, yet fight without hesitation. And sometimes you can't know what a man's capable of until the time comes for him to act. Amos paused for a moment, considering his words. Liam's a good enough sort, as I said. He's scared silly of becoming king, and I don't blame him. But once upon the throne, I think he could be a good enough king. I wish I could know you were right. A chime sounded, then great bells began to ring. Well, said Amos, you don't have much time left to decide. The priests of Ishap are at the outer gates, and when they reach the throne room, there's no cutting grapples and sailing away. Your course will be set. Martin turned away from the wall. Thank you for your company, Amos, and the wine. Shall we go change the fate of the kingdom? Amos drank the last of the wine from the crystal decanter. He tossed it aside, and over the sound of shattering glass, said, "You go decide the fate of the kingdom, Martin." I'll come along later, perhaps, if I can't arrange for that little ship I spoke of. Maybe we'll sail together again if you change your mind about being king, or you decide you're in need of quick transportation from Lenannan. Fetch yourself down to the docks before sundown. I'll be about somewhere, and you'll always be welcome in my crew. Martin gripped his hand tightly. Always farewell, pirate. Amos left. And Martin stood alone, ordering his thoughts as best he could. Then, making his decision, he began his journey to the throne room. By craning his neck, Pug could see those entering the great hall. Duke Caldric escorted Erlen's widow, Princess Alicia, down the long aisle toward the throne. Anita and Carline followed. From Culgan came the observation. By those grim expressions and pale complexions, I wager Arthur has told them what may come. Pug noticed how Anita held tightly to Carline's hand when they reached their appointed places. What a thing to discover! You've an elder brother in these circumstances. Culgan whispered, "They all seem to be taking it well enough." Gongs announced the Ishapian priests had entered the anteroom. And Arthur and Liam entered. Both wore the red mantles of princes of the realm and walked quickly to the front of the hall. Arthur's eyes darted around the room as if trying to judge the temper of those on all sides. Liam looked calm as if somehow resigned to accept whatever fate brought. 
pug saw Aratha whisper a short word to Fanon, and the old swordmaster in turn spoke to Sergeant Gardan. Both looked about tensely, hands near sword hilts, watching everyone in the room. Pug could see no sign of Martin. He whispered to Culgan, "Perhaps Martin has decided to avoid the issue." Culgan looked about. No, there he is. Pug saw where Culgan indicated with a bob of his head. By the far wall, near a corner, a giant column rose. Standing deep within its shadow was Martin. His features were hidden, but his stance was unmistakable. Bells began to chime, and Pug looked to see the first of the Ashapian priests entering the great hall. Behind, others followed, all walking in unison at the same measured pace. From the side doors came the sound of bolts being driven into place, for the hall traditionally was sealed from the start of the ceremony to its end. When sixteen priests had entered the room, the great doors were closed behind. The last priest paused before the door, a heavy wooden staff in one hand and a large wax seal in the other. Quickly, he affixed the seal to the doors. Buck could see that the seal bore the seven-sided device of Ishap inscribed upon it, and he felt the presence of magic within it. He knew the doors could not be opened save by the one who affixed the seal, or by another of high arts, and then at great risk. When the doors were sealed, the priest with the staff walked forward between the lines of his brother priests, who waited, incanting soft prayers. One held the new crown, fashioned by the priests, resting upon a cushion of purple velvet. Roderick's crown had been destroyed by the blow that had ended his life, but had it survived according to custom, it would have been interred with him. Should no new king be crowned today, this crown would be smashed upon the stones of the floor. And no new one made until the Congress of Lords informed the priests they had elected a new king. Pug marvelled how much importance could be attached to such a simple circlet of gold. The priests moved forward to stand before the throne, where other priests of the lesser orders were already waiting. As was the custom, Liam had been asked if he wished his family priest to officiate at the investiture, and he had agreed. Father Tully stood at the head of the delegation from the Temple of Astalon. Pug knew the old priest would be quick to take charge of things without question, regardless of which of Boric's sons took the crown, and counted it a wise choice. The chief Ishapian priest struck his staff upon the floor sixteen even measured blows. The sound rang through the hall, and when he was done, the throne room was silent. We come to crown the king," exclaimed the head priest. "Ishap, bless the king," answered the other priests. "In the name of Ishap, the one god over all, and in the name of the four greater and twelve lesser gods, let all who have claim to the crown come forth." Pug found himself holding his breath. As he saw Liam and Aratha come to stand before the priests, a moment later, Martin stepped from the shadows and walked forward. As Martin came into view, there was a hissing of intaken breath, for many in the hall had either not heard the rumor or not believed it. When all three were before the priest, he struck the floor with the heavy staff. Now is the hour, and here is the place. He then touched Martin upon the shoulder with his staff, resting it there as he said, "By what right do you come before us?" Martin spoke in a clear, strong voice, "By right of birth." Pug could feel the presence of magic. The priests were not leaving the claims to the throne subject to honor and tradition alone. Touched by the staff, no one could bear false witness. The same procedure was repeated, and the same answer given by Liam and Aratha. Again, the staff rested upon Martin's shoulder as the priest asked, "State your name and your claim." Martin's voice rang out, "I am Martin, eldest son of Boric, eldest of the royal blood." A slight buzzing ran through the hall, silenced by the priest's staff striking the floor. 
The staff was placed upon Liam's shoulder, and he answered, I am Liam, son of Boric, of the royal blood. A few voices could be heard saying, The heir! The priest hesitated, then repeated the question to Aratha, who answered, I am Aratha, son of Boric, of the royal blood. The priest looked at the three young men, then to Liam said, Are you the acknowledged heir? Liam answered, with the staff resting upon his shoulder, The right of succession was given to me in ignorance of Martin. It is a false bequest, for Roderick thought me the eldest Condoin male. The priest removed the staff and conferred with his fellow priests. The hall remained silent as the priests gathered together to discuss the unforeseen turn of events. Time passed tortuously, until at last the chief priest turned once more to face them. He surrendered his staff and was handed the golden circle that was the crown of the kingdom. He uttered a brief prayer. Ishab, give all before us in this matter guidance and wisdom. Let the appointed one do right. In a strong voice he said, That the succession is flawed is clear. He placed the crown before Martin. Martin? As eldest son of the royal blood, you have the right of first claim. Will you, Martin, take up this burden, and will you be our king? Martin looked at the crown. Silence hung heavy in the room as every eye was fixed upon the tall man in green. Breath was held as the throng in the hall waited upon his answer. Then Martin slowly reached out, and took the crown from the cushion upon which it rested. He raised it up, and every gaze in the room followed it as it caught a ray of light entering through a high window, scattering glittering glory throughout the hall. Holding it above his head, he said, I, Martin, do hereby abdicate my claim to the crown of the Kingdom of the Isles, for now and for ever, on my own behalf and on behalf of all my issue from now henceforth to the last generation. He moved suddenly and placed the crown upon Liam's brow. Martin's voice rang out once more, his words a defiant challenge. All hail Liam, true and undoubted king! Liam stood flanked by his brothers, one to each side, and the hall erupted into shouts and cheers. Hail Liam! Hail the king! The chief priest let the shouting continue for a time, then recovered his staff and struck the floor, bringing silence. He looked at Liam and said, Will you, Liam, take up this burden and be our king? Looking at the priest, Liam answered, I will be your king. Again the room sounded with cheers, and the chief priest let the din go unchecked. Pug looked and saw relief on the faces of many, Brukel, Cauldrick, Fannon, Vandross and Gardan, all who had stood ready to face trouble. Again the head priest silenced the room with the striking of his staff. Tully, of the Order of Astalon, he called, and the old family priest stepped forward. Other priests removed Liam's red mantle, replacing it with the purple mantle of kingship. The priests stepped away, and Tully came before Liam. To Martin and Aratha he said, All in the kingdom thank you for your forbearance and wisdom. The brothers left Liam's side and returned to stand with Anita and Carline. Carline smiled warmly at Martin, took his hand, and whispered, Thank you, Martin. Tully faced the crowd and intoned, Now is the hour, and here is the place. We are here to witness the coronation of His Majesty, Liam, first of that name, as our true king. Is there any here who challenge his right? Several eastern lords looked unhappy, but no objection was raised. Tully again faced Liam, who went on his knees before the priest. Tully placed his hand upon Liam's head. Now is the hour, and here is the place. It is to you this burden has fallen, Liam, 
first of that name, son of Boric of the Conduan line of kings, will you take up this burden, and will you be our king? Liam answered, I will be your king. Tully removed his hand from Liam's head and reached down to take his hand, gripping the royal signet upon it. Now is the hour, and here is the place. Do you, Liam Condouin, son of Boric of the line of kings, swear to defend and protect the kingdom of the Isles, faithfully serving her people, to provide for their welfare, weal, and prosperity? I, Liam, do so swear and avow. Tully began a long liturgy. Then, when the prayers were done, Liam rose. Tully removed his ritual mitre and handed it to the head priest of Ishap, who passed it along to another of Tully's order. Tully knelt before Liam and kissed his signet. He then rose and escorted Liam to the throne, while the Ishapian priest incanted, Ishap, bless the king! Liam sat. An ancient sword once carried by Danis, the first Conduan king, was brought to him and rested across his knees, a sign he would defend the kingdom with his life. Tully turned and nodded to the chief priest of Ishap, who struck the floor with his staff. Now it is past the hour of our choosing. I hereby proclaim Liam I, our right, true and undisputed king. The crowd responded with a roar. Hail! Liam! Long live the king! The priests of Ishap chanted low, and the chief priest led them to the door. He struck the wax seal with his staff, and it split with a cracking sound. He struck the door three more times, and the guards outside opened it. Before stepping out, he intoned the last phrase of the ritual of coronation. To those outside the hall not privileged to watch the ceremony, he announced... Let the word go forth. Liam is our king. Faster than a bird's flight, the word went out of the hall, through the palace and into the city. Celebrants in the street toasted the new monarch, and not one in a thousand knew how close disaster had come to visiting the kingdom this day. The Ashapian priests left the hall, and all eyes returned to the new ruler of the kingdom. Tully motioned to the members of the royal family, and Aratha, Martin and Carline came before their brother. Liam extended his hand, and Martin knelt and kissed his brother's signet. Aratha followed, then Carline. Alicia led Anita to the throne, the first of the long line of nobles who followed, and the lengthy business of accepting the fealty of the peers of the realm began. Lord Caldric bent a trembling knee to his king, and there were tears of relief upon his face as he rose. When Brukel swore his loyalty, he briefly spoke to the king as he stood, and Liam nodded. Then in turn came the other nobles of the kingdom, until, hours later, the last of the border barons, those guardians of the northern marches, vassal to no lord but the king, rose and returned to the stand with the others in the hall. Handing the sword of Danis to a waiting page, Liam stood and said, It is our wish that a time of celebration be at hand. But there are matters of state that must be attended to at once. Most are of a happy nature, but first there is one sad duty that must be discharged. There is one absent today, one who sought to gain the throne upon which we are privileged to sit. That Guy du Bastira did plot treason cannot be denied. That he did commit foul murder is unquestioned. But it was the late king's wish that mercy be shown in this matter. As it was Roderick's dying request, I shall grant this boon, though it would be our pleasure to see Guy du Bastira pay in full for his deeds. Let the word go from this day that Guy du Bastira is named outlaw and banished from our kingdom, his titles and lands forfeit to the crown. Let his name and arms be stricken from the roll of lords of the kingdom. Let no man offer him shelter, fire, food or water. To the assembled lords he added, Some here have been allied with the former duke, so we have little doubt he will hear our judgment. Tell him to flee, to go to Kesh, Queg, or Roldem, 
Tell him to hide in the Northlands if no other will take him. But should he be found inside our borders within a week's time, his life is forfeit. No one in the hall spoke for a moment. Then Liam said, It has been a time of great sorrow and suffering in our realms. Now let us embark upon a new era, one of peace and prosperity. He indicated that his two brothers should return to his side, and as they approached, Aratha looked at Martin. Suddenly he grinned and, in an unexpected display of emotion, hugged both Martin and Liam. For a brief instant all in the hall were silent as the three brothers clung closely to one another. Then, again, cheers filled the room. While the clamour continued, Liam spoke to his brothers. At first Martin smiled broadly, then suddenly his expression changed. Both Aratha and Liam nodded vigorously, but Martin's face drained of colour. He started to say something, his manner intense and remonstrative. Liam cut him off and held up his hand for silence. There is a new ordering of things in our kingdom. Let it be known that from this day forward our beloved brother Aratha is Prince of Crondor, and until such a time as there is a son in our house, heir to the throne. At the last, Aratha seemed less than pleased. Then Liam said, And it is our wish that the Duchy of Criddy, home of our father, stay within our family so long as his line remains. To this end I name Martin, our beloved brother, Duke of Criddy, with all lands, titles and rights pertaining thereunto. A cheer again rose from the crowd. Martin and Aratha left Liam's side, and the new king said, Let the Earl of Lamut and Knight Captain Kasumi of Lamut approach the throne. Kasumi and Vandross started. Kasumi had been nervous all day, for Vandross had placed a great trust in him. His Tsurani impassivity asserted itself, and he fell in beside Vandross as he reached the throne. Both men knelt before Liam, who said, My Lord Brukel has asked us to make this happy announcement. His vassal, the Earl Vandross, will wed his daughter, the Lady Felina. From the crowd, Brukel's voice could be heard clearly saying, And it's about time! Several of the older courtiers from Roderick's court blanched, but Liam joined in the general laughter. It is also the Duke's wish that he be allowed to retire to his estates, where he may seek the rewards of a long and useful service to his kingdom. We have given consent, and as he has no son, it is also his wish that his title pass to one able to continue in the service of the kingdom, one who has shown uncommon ability in commanding the Lamutian garrison of the armies of the West during the late conflict. For his many brave actions and his faithful service, we hereby approve his marriage and are pleased to name Van Dross, Duke of Yabon, with all lands, titles and rights pertaining thereunto. Rise, Lord Van Dross. Van Dross rose, a little shaken, then returned to the side of his father-in-law-to-be. Brukel struck him a friendly blow on the back and gripped his hand. Liam turned his attention to Kasumi and smiled. There is one here before us who was recently counted our enemy. He is now counted as our loyal subject. Kasumi of the Shinzawai, for your efforts to bring peace to two warring worlds and your wisdom and courage in the defense of our lands against the Brotherhood of the Dark Path, we give to you command of the garrison of Lamut and name you Earl of Lamut with all lands, titles, and rights pertaining thereunto. Rise, Earl Kasumi. Kasumi was speechless. He slowly reached out and took the king's hand, as he had seen the other nobles do, and kissed the signet. To the king he said, My lord king, my life and my honour do I pledge. Liam said, My lord Vandross, do you accept Earl Kasumi as your vassal? Vandross grinned. Happily, sire. Kasumi rejoined Vandross, his eyes illuminated by pride. Brukel administered another hearty slap on the back. Several more offices were given, for there were vacancies from the intrigues of Roderick's court and from deaths in the war. When it seemed all business was over, Liam said, Let Squire Pug of Criddy approach the throne. 
Pug looked at Katala and Kulgan, surprised at being called. What? Kulgan pushed him forward. Go and find out. Pug came before Liam and bowed. The king said, "What has been done was a private matter between our father and this man. Now, it is our wish, all in our realm know, that this man, once called Pug, the orphan of Criddy, has had his name inscribed upon the rolls of our family." He held out his hand, and Pug knelt before him. Liam presented his signet and then took Pug by the shoulders and bade him rise. As it was our father's wish, so it is ours. From this day, let all in our kingdom know this man is Pug Condwan, member of the king's family. Many in the hall were surprised by Pug's adoption and elevation, but those who knew of his exploits cheered lustily as Liam said, "Behold, our cousin Pug, prince of the realm." Katala ignored all propriety and ran forward to embrace her husband. Several of the eastern lords frowned, but Liam laughed and kissed her upon the cheek. "Come," Liam cried, "it is now time for celebration. Let the dancers, musicians, and tumblers come forth. Let tables be brought and food and wine be placed upon them. Let merriment reign." The festivities continued. Celebration had run unchecked throughout the afternoon. A herald next to the king's table read messages to the king from those unable to attend. Many nobles and the king of Queg, as well as monarchs of the small kingdoms of the eastern shores, important merchants and guildmasters from the free cities also sent congratulations. There were also messages from Aglarana and Thomas, and from the dwarves of the west at Stone Mountain and the Grey Towers. Old King Halfdan. Ruler of the dwarves of the east in Dorgin sent his best wishes, and even Great Kesh had sent greetings with a request for more meetings to settle peacefully the issue of the Vale of Dreams. The message was personally signed by the Empress. Hearing the last message, Liam said to Aratha, "For Kesh to have sent us a personal message in so short a time, the Empress must boast the most gifted spies in Midkemia. You'll have to keep your wits about you in Crondor." Aratha sighed, not happy at that prospect. Pug, Lori, Meacham, Gardan, Kulgan, Fanon, and Kasumi all sat at the royal table. Liam had insisted they join the royal family. The new Earl of Lamut still seemed in shock at his office, but his happiness was clearly showing. And even in this noisy hall, the sound of his warriors outside singing Thurani songs of celebration could be faintly heard. Pug mused over the discomfort that must be causing the royal porters and pages. Katala joined her husband, reporting their son napping and Fantas as well, exhausted from play. Katala said to Kulgan, "I hope your pet will be able to withstand such constant aggravation." Kulgan laughed. Fantas thrives on the attention. Pug said. With all those rewards being passed out, Kulgan, I'm surprised there was no mention of you. You have given faithful service to the king's family as long as anyone, save Tully and Fanon. Kulgan snorted. Tully, Fanon, and I all met with Liam yesterday, before we knew he was going to acknowledge Martin and throw the court into turmoil. He began to mumble something or another about offices and rewards and such, but we all begged off. When he began to protest, I told him I didn't care what he did for Tully and Fanon, but if he tried to haul me up before all those people, I'd straightway turn him into a toad. Anita, overhearing the exchange, laughed. So it is true. Pug, remembering the conversation he had with Anita in Crondor so many years ago, joined in the merriment. He looked back on all that had occurred to him in the years since he had first chanced to come to Culgan's cottage in the forests, and reflected for a moment. After much risk and many conflicts, he was safe with family and friends. With a great adventure, the building of the academy yet to come. He wished that a few others—Hotcha Pepper, Shimon, Kamatsu, Hokanu, as well as Almorella and Netoha—could share in his happiness. And he wished Ichindar and the lords of the High Council could know the true reason for the betrayal on the Day of Peace. And most of all. He wished Thomas could have joined them. 
So thoughtful, husband. Pug snapped out of his mood and smiled. Beloved, I was thinking that in all things, I am a most fortunate man. His wife placed her hand upon his and returned his smile. Tully leaned across the table and inclined his head toward the other end, where Laurie sat enraptured by Carline, who was laughing at some witticism he had made. It was obvious she found him as charming as Pug had promised. In fact, she looked captivated. Pug said, "I think I recognise that expression on Carline's face. I think Laurie may be in for some trouble." Kasumi said, "Knowing friend Laurie, it is a trouble he will welcome." Tully looked thoughtful. There is a duchy at Bastilla now in need of a duke, and he does seem a competent enough young man. Hmm. Kalgan barked. Enough! Haven't you had your fill of pomp? Must you go marrying the poor lad off to the king's sister so you can officiate in the palace again? Gods, they just met today. Tully and Kalgan seemed about to launch into another of their famous debates when Martin cut them both off. Let us change the subject. My head is a whirl, and we don't need your bickering. Tully and Kalgan exchanged startled looks, then both smiled. As one, they said, "Yes, my lord." Martin groaned while those close by joined in the laughter. Martin shook his head. Oh, this seems so strange. After so much fear and worry, such a short time back, why, I nearly chose to go with Amos. He looked up. Where is Amos? Upon hearing the seaman's name, Aratha also looked up from his conversation with Anita. Where is that pirate? Martin answered. He said something about arranging for a ship. I thought he was only making light, but I haven't seen him since the coronation. Aratha said. Arranging for a ship, the gods weep. He stood and said, "With your Majesty's permission." Liam said, "Go and fetch him back. From all you've told me, he warrants some reward." Martin stood and said, "I'll ride with you." Aratha smiled, gladly. The two brothers hurried from the hall, making quick time to the courtyard. Porters and pages held horses for guests departing early. Aratha and Martin grabbed the first two in line, unceremoniously leaving two minor nobles without mounts. The two noblemen stood with mouths open, caught halfway between anger and amazement. "Your pardon, my lords!" shouted Aratha as he galloped his horse toward the gate. As they rode through the gates of the palace, across the arched bridge over the river Rilanon, Martin said, "He said he would sail at sundown." That gives us scant time," shouted Aratha. Down winding streets they flew to the harbour. The city was thick with celebrants, and several times they had to slow to avoid harming those who crowded the streets. They reached the harbour side and pulled up their mounts. A single guard sat as if sleeping before the entrance to the royal docks. Aratha jumped down from his horse and jostled the man. The guard's helm fell from his head as he toppled over, slumping to the ground. Aratha checked him and said, "He's alive." But he'll have a head on him tomorrow. Aratha remounted, and they hurried along Rilanon's long dockside to the last wharf. Shouts from men in the rigging of a ship greeted them as they turned their horses toward the end of a long pier. A beautiful vessel was slowly moving away from the docks, and as they pulled up, Martin and Aratha could see Amos Trask standing upon the quarterdeck. He waved high above his head. Still close enough so they could see his grinning face. Ha! It seems all ends well. Aratha and Martin dismounted as the distance between ship and pier slowly lengthened. Amos shouted. Aratha. Amos pointed at a distant building. The boys who stood watch here are all in that warehouse. They're a little bruised, but they're alive. Amos, that's the king's ship! Yelled Aratha, waving for the ship to put back. Amos Trask laughed. I thought the Royal Swallow a grand name. Well, tell your brother I'll return it some day. Martin began to laugh. Then Aratha joined in. You pirate! Shouted the youngest brother. I'll have him give it to you. 
With a deep cry of despair, Amos said, Ah, Arthur, you take all the fun out of life.